Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. I'm Charles Severance and this is my open educational effort, MOOCs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, what this really is is a, a new kind of website uh, where it has open educational resources. You can just look at the materials, you can watch videos, um, but the interesting thing is if you log in then it becomes a learning management website. So let me give you a little bit of a tour of what we've got. Uh, by the time you see it, it will probably, this is an early version of it, so it'll probably be improved by the time you see it. But here we're not logged in, and it's got uh, some lessons. You can see each lesson. Uh, you've got some slides, some PowerPoint slides that I give you, chapters in the textbook. Uh, there's an assignment specification. You could use these materials. You could adapt these materials. They're basically Creative Commons materials. Um, and so... Uh, it's an open education resource and you can go through the various lessons and I can go through some lessons here. But the interesting thing happens when we go into, when we log in and log in with our Google account. So now I'm logged in and I see additional things. I see a threaded discussion. Right now I'm just using discuss for uh, this, the discussion and an assignment so you can track the, uh, the effort that you've done so far. And so these are each of the modules and the graded activities in each of the modules. You now are a student in the class. So simply by logging in to the exact same uh, website, you are now a student in the class. If you go into the lessons, you will see that in addition to things like the slides and the videos and the assignment specification, you can also see there's an auto grader. And so you can do an auto grader and do the request response cycle. And if you get this assignment right, it will update your uh, grade in the grade book. And so it has kind of brought to life interactive act aspects and tracking for yourself. And you can do things like peer grading. And if you do peer grading, uh, you will submit something. There's not a lot of people here yet because we're going to start promoting it. But then there will be people, once you submit your assignment, you'll be able to peer grade other people's assignments. And it still uh, functions as an open education resource site. You can also take the tools and the content and import it into your own learning management system using the capability of IMS Common Cartridge, where you take a cartridge of material. So this course and this website exports itself in the Common Cartridge format so you can put it into your learning management system whether that be Sakai or Moodle or Canvas or Blackboard or Desire to Learn or whatever. So in general, I welcome you. There's lots of ways to make good use for this website. And uh, I look forward to seeing how you use it and hearing about how you use it. Hello and welcome to our screen recording. In this screen recording, we're going to install the MAMP software for uh, the Macintosh. So we're going to download from MAMP.org. So I'm going to keep this. I don't quite know why a Macintosh is unhappy with that. And so I'm going to go into my downloads folder and here I have this folder and it's uh, MAMP Pro uh, 0401. Um, that's because I downloaded it twice. And so I'm just going to click on this. And it opens uh, an installation and I'm just going to accept all of the defaults here. Okay, so it's uh, been installed. So let's take a look at where it's at. So if I open Finder and I go to my computer and I go onto my hard drive, Applications, it's in MAMP. And I can start MAMP up. And this tells me a bunch. PHP Info here is really useful because it tells you about the configuration of the uh, system that you've got. Um, I've got um, I've got version 7 PHP and it tells me where the configuration is for this and so I'm going to um, I'm going to go take a look at the configuration file and I'm going to make sure I can I want to do control F and look for display errors. So this is the problem we have when we're doing development with MAP is that display errors is off, okay? And so I want to fix this by editing the initialization file 
and you got to go to the right one. Applications, MAMP, BIN, PHP, PHP 7.10, PHP INI file. Okay, oh, and by the way, I've got this little MAMP control panel. This is your MAMP control panel. Starts and stop, little green dots means that it's running. So I am going to run the Atom text editor. And I'm going to open a file. And I'm going to go to my Mac. Oh, wrong, wrong. My Macintosh applications, MAMP. Uh, let's see, let's see. MAMP bin PHP. MAMP bin PHP. PHP 7.1.0 conf php i and i yay i found the file so i open this up and it's a uh, nice little text file and this is the php configuration and uh, i'm going to scroll down here I'm going to use com um, look for display errors if you don't do this there we go so we're looking for this line that says display errors equals off um, it talks about this. Printout errors as part of the output for production websites. Do not, to, I mean, do not do this for production. Sure, but we're doing development on our local hard drive, and so we want to turn this on, because if you don't, you won't always see the errors. I'm going to turn up the display startup errors. I'm going to turn those on, um, and so I want we want as many errors as we can in development. Of course, if you were running in production, you would turn these differently, and so what I'm going to do then is I am going to then save this file. Command S, I've saved it. Okay, now the thing you've got to do at this point is you've got to stop MAMP and restart it. Stop the servers. Now the servers are stopped. And if I go to refresh this, it'll blow up because it's not there. But when I start these servers, it'll They'll come up, and I'll go to the web start page, and I'll look for PHP info. I can close these tabs now, and um, I should go down and look for display errors on and on. See, that's the success. That means that you are successful, and that's great. Okay, so let's then also write a simple little page. I just um, how do I get rid of it? Oh, I got to escape, I think. Yeah, there we go. So um, I'm going to make a little file. Hello from my first web page. Okay, so um, we're going to find out where this is at, localhost 8088, because this is now a web server running on your local computer. And if you go into your finder, it is, well, let me start at the top. Where's my computer? Come on, computer. MacBook Pro, hard drive, applications, MAMP, htdocs. That's the folder we want to be in, okay? That's the one we want to be in. So I'm going to take this file here I'm going to say save as, and I'm going to go to MAMP, uh, htdocs, htdocs. I'm going to make a new folder called first. I'll make a new folder, and then I'm going to save this as index.php. Save. It also nicely highlights it. So now if I hit refresh here, you'll see that I got this folder name first. And if I go into first, the slash, if I don't have anything there, it's as if I typed index.php. Because that's called the, for a folder, index.php is the default file that a web server, one of the several default files that the web server looks at um, to, uh, to load it. And so that's pretty much it. Uh, away we go. We have uh, successfully installed MAMP and changed the starting vari uh, startup variables and uh, written our first uh, little program. Okay, hope it helps. Hello everybody. Welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Today we're going to show how to install MAMP uh, for Windows. So I'm going to download it here. 
and I'm on Windows, so it put, takes me straight to the download. I'm just going to say, I'll go ahead and run. So now it's going to go ahead and run the application. I must say yes. English. Next. I'm not going to install MAMP Pro. That's nice that they give us that checkbox. So you can pay for MAMP Pro. I don't exactly know. I've never used it, so I don't know. Accept the license agreement. Put it in MAMP. Next. Next, desktop icon. Let's go ahead and run it. Okay, so now we're going to continue. And we have MAMP. We should also have this on our desktop. So it's coming up. So this is very important. You've got to allow this to happen because if you don't, um, well, let's check them both uh, so that MySQL can talk. Now this is HTTPT and I'm gonna say yes to both of those. And that's very, very important. And now that they're up, and so we can open the start page. And there we go. And you can take a look at PHP info. Um, and then you can look at PHP my admin. And literally at this point, if you've got something coming up here in, in PHP my admin, um, you have successfully installed uh, MAMP. So congratulations. <music> Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Now we're going to install Atom, the text editor. Uh, you literally could uh, do any text editor. Uh, I use Atom because I like it. It uh, works on Windows, Mac, and Linux the same way. But literally you can use any uh, text editor that you like. Don't use Notepad or Word. Certainly don't use Word. Um, because if you use Word, it'll mess your files up. Okay. We re really need a text editor with syntax highlighting and things like that. So it's uh, finished downloading and it's getting ready to install it. write right now our first PHP application. So I'm going to go ahead and get Adam started and I'm going to get MAMP started. So MAMP, I'm going to have to start these servers. I'm going to start the Apache server and our database server MySQL. So we'll get that started. So let's open the start page because there's a lot of good information we can get here. We can find out about our PHP configuration. And my favorite thing to do is to run PHP MyAdmin because literally if PHP MyAdmin is running and you come up with something that looks like this, you are in really good shape. Everything is running fine. Your database server is running and, and, and PHP is running. So I'll get rid of this. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to write our first application. And so I'll have Adam here. And... Um, so I'm going to do file, new file. And I'm going to call this um, h1 hello from a web page slash h1. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. File, save. 
and I'm going to go to a file called backslash c map htdocs. I've pinned it here to make my job a little easier. I found it once, drug it over here and pinned it so I can get right here. Now, this is the web document root for your web server and you can make folders here. So I'm going to make a new folder. I'm going to call this folder first. Make that folder. And I'm going to save this file call it as index.php. Index.php is a special name. It's a file that if you navigate a web browser to the directory, it will generally serve index.php. And now it's syntax highlight, highlighted this for us because it, it's showing this. Now, the way it works is I can go anywhere from localhost on down to the folder that I just made to the file I just made, index.php. And so you see that c colon backslash map htdocs is the top of a folder, web folder structure that's sort of from localhost on down. Okay? And so this is just an HTML page. We've seen it. You know, we can view source. This HTML page came from uh, PHP. Now, so far, we haven't actually run any code in this PHP. So let's go ahead and write some code. So, and show you how PHP can run code. So there's a tag called less than question mark PHP. And then a tag that's question mark less than, and it's already added that for me. And I can run code in here. So I can say something like echo, hi there, backslash n, semicolon. And I'm going to save this. And I'm going to run this code. Run it again. And so there we go. It says hi there. Let me put a space in here. So this is code. And basically what happens, now let me put a paragraph tag in here. Put a paragraph tag, some HTML. Put an end paragraph. Something else. And so what happens in PHP is when you drop into the PHP language on the server, it switches from just rendering this HTML to running code. But then in place of this, we get the string hi there. So let me save that and hit refresh again. And so this bit came from the executing code that ran here. And so inside this code, we can put in some logic. So we can say, you know, dollar $x equals 6 times 7 to make a variable. And then we can say echo the answer is, now the double quote was already there, sorry. slash end to put a new line in. So I'm going to save that. And now I'm going to hit refresh. Oop. So it looks like it didn't quite work. Um, oh, I got to concatenate this with a dot. Oh, no, this is supposed to be an X. That's why mistake file save refresh okay so you see this came hi there all this stuff came from the executing code so you can think of all this output as the result of executing this code and anything that is printed out during this code is uh, put out as the web page and so that's kind of the idea you put files and folders inside of this HT docs, and then you execute them by running them in a browser. Okay, so we have one last thing we've got to do, and it's a really, really, really important thing. Matter of fact, I make it an assignment. I think it's so important. So we just finished writing our first web application. Now let's go ahead and make a syntax in this error, in this application, make a syntax error. And we're going to make all kinds of mistakes. So I'm missing a semicolon there. So I come up here and I refresh it. 
And what happens here is we get an error. Now, I just put the error in so you kind of know what the error was. But the question is, what if this was like hundreds of lines of code and you had to figure out what's going on? Okay, so let's take a look. There is a setting. It turns out that printing errors on the screen is great for developers, but it's really bad for production systems. And so they default these systems when they install them to not turning on, not showing errors. So we have to find out how to change the errors. So we're going to go to that start page and then go to PHP info. And we are going to look at the loaded configuration. It's right here. C colon backslash MAMP config PHP 7.1.5. You got to remember this perfectly. 7.1.5. Okay. So let's open that file. File, open file. We're going to go to MAMP. I'm going to keep going back and forth. Is it in configuration? No, I think it's in. Uh, I got to keep going back. Conf PHP 7.1.5. Okay conf php715 this file right here is the file we're going to open and here we are now you're going to search down for a field named display errors so let's just scroll down here display errors i'll find it So it's turned off by default because it's security. Let's not find that one. Okay, so I think I found it. Okay, display errors off. So we're going to change this to on. And might as well display startup errors to on too. So there we go. So it's still going to log the errors. We'll talk later about where these logs are at. But now I am going to save this file. So I've changed that. And then I am going to stop the servers. You don't have to stop the servers very often. But in this case, we have to stop the servers because we've changed the basic server configuration. So this will take a moment. So they're stopped. Now let's start them. So they're coming up, the Apache server's up. And the MySQL server's up. And now let's, we can just refresh this page. Okay, so we can go down and we can look at where the display errors are. Okay, display errors on. Startup errors on, that's what we want to see. Okay, now that we've got these, when we hit this, instead of giving us a very nondescript, kind of not very helpful, it's going to say, oh, parse error on line six, unexpected echo. So now I can go back to my code here, close that, and go like, oh, line six, it was not expecting echo. So let's put the semicolon back in and save it. Now we can hit refresh and it works. Okay. So make sure to fix these and do it early. You will waste hours and hours and hours if you are just getting those 500 errors uh, while you're writing your code. So please do this and do it early uh, just to keep your sanity so that uh, when you make mistakes, uh, that you get some feedback as to what went wrong. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. In this we're going to uh, get started. We're going to learn a little bit about how to install XAMPP on uh, Windows. I'm using Windows 10 and so I'm going to go to the Apache Friends website and let me make this a little bigger. they got a great video here. I won't show it right, right now. Uh, so I'm going to download XAMPP for Windows. So I'm going to click here to uh, make sure the download gets started. Okay, so it's finished downloading and we're going to go ahead and run it. It's in the folder downloads if we wanted to take a look at that. So I've got my download running. 
Okay, so it says install it. Don't avoid into the program files because so the thing to do is install in the default location, which I will show you is C colon backslash XAMP. And I don't need a few of these things. I don't need Tomcat. I don't need Perl. I don't need fake send mail. Um, so I'll do that. I'm going to stick it in that default, which is a little inconvenient, but it's nice because uh, it uh, makes life a little simpler. Okay, so this will take a little while. So now that the installer is finished, I'm actually not going to start the control panel right away because I want to show you how to start it in case you uh, don't do this, although you can uh, just skip ahead and do that. So I'm going to finish the install. So the install is, is now complete. So I want to show you where it's been installed to. So I'm going to go up to my Windows browser, my local system, go to my C drive, and go into XAMPP. And so I'm in Windows C XAMPP, and uh, this is where it's installed. And if I scroll down here, I can find the XAMPP control panel, and I'll start that. Oops. It's asking me for which language. Now, when this first starts up, it's important um, to, if you're getting being given any uh, security dialogues, that you say yes to those security dialogues. It's a little tricky. So this is the control panel. And the things we're doing is the web server, which is Apache and MySQL. So I'm going to start those. Oh, let me do one thing here. I'm going to right click and pin this to the taskbar. So now this will stay down here. Okay. So I'm going to start the Apache web server. Now watch for red mistakes or watch for pop-ups and it's good. So it's, I got no red errors and it, and, and I think it's cause I'm running on my administrator account and I'm going to start the, the web server for, um, I mean the, the database server and that's running. And so that's really good. You may have some other try. Oh, I clicked the stop by mistake. I got to not hover over them and then, uh, okay. So, so there we go. We are, I've, I've got to get them both started. Okay. So now that they're both started, I can take a look at the details. And now this is the XAMPP dashboard. It's running on localhost. That means it's running on a web server that's running on my computer. And a couple things that we can do is we can look at the, Details of our PHP installation, uh, um, that's nice to have. Uh, we'll look at that in a second. You can also look at PHP MyAdmin, and this is how we talk to our database. And so uh, that the fact that this is running um, and it's successfully connecting and doesn't get error messages, that means we've got a very successful installation. This screen here tests a whole bunch of things. Okay, so one of the things that we need to make sure is uh, look for a variable called display errors. So let's go find that. It's right here. And it's on. If it's off, you have to change the configuration so it's on. So let me show you how you would change it. Even though XAMPP seems to uh, install with this the right way, uh, we, uh, we'll see in a second. This is something you want off in production and on when you're doing development to keep you from going crazy. So you go to this configuration for Apache and you pick the PHP configuration and then you scroll down. I'm going to use control F to find it. Display errors. Find next. And so it's, and I'll go down here until we um, find it to be on. Now this is exactly describing what's supposed to be on. For developers, you want this on and for production, you want it off. If we were going to change this, and there's a uh, display startup errors as well, we would save this. We can save it. We didn't, oops, come back, come back. We would save this, okay? And then we have to restart our Apache web server. So we'd stop it, and then they would start it back up. And then when we come back to the admin page, and then we go to PHP info and then we'd look for display errors and we see that it's on. So you shouldn't do development until that's on. 
Now, we, we didn't really have to change it, but I showed you how to change it if it was wrong. Okay, so I'll close some of these windows. We don't need the web page for downloading anymore. So now we're looking at the dashboard. And so what I want to do is I want to write a very, very simple program. So I'm going to start up my Atom text editor, which I assume you've installed. You can use any text editor you like. I just like um, Atom because it works the same on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So I'm going to make a new file. And I'm going to put some HTML into it. And now I'm going to save the file. File, save as. Now I have to put this file in a particular location. On my C drive, under XAMPP, under htdocs. And so this is all the stuff that this local web server, C colon backslash XAMPP, right, C colon XAMPP htdocs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new folder right here. I'm going to call that folder first. Now you'll be making lots of folders in here. Um, and then I'm going to save this file as index.php. So in the folder, first htdocs, first index.php, I've got hello world. Now I can go over here to this URL and take off dashboard and type first slash index.php. If I get this right, I should see that little file. Okay, and so there we go. Now I have created the first my first little bit of web code that's coming out through this web server. And um, so what I want to do now is I want to grab some of the code that's got some PHP in it just to test. Not that it's a big deal. Um, I got a little PHP in this uh, handout. That's the old handout that I'm fixing. Here's this. PHP code. I'm going to copy that. And then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to control. I'm going to curve there and go paste that in. Oops. Need to paste. Control A, Control V. There we go. And it knows it's PHP and it's got syntax highlighting. This is flat HTML. This is switching into PHP and doing some computations, doing a printout, and away we go. And so now I'm going to save this with Control S. You always know that. Um, that when that little blue dot there is you've got to save it um, or uh, it won't save correctly. So now I go back to my browser here and I hit refresh and it'll run that code. And so this part was from the HTML. This part is running PHP. It did a calculation and there is another paragraph. So um, I hope this has been helpful. Um, to get this installed, uh, you'll be doing a whole bunch with this. You'll be building databases. You'll be writing PHP code. And so we just have to get you going and get you up and running. Cheers. Hello, and welcome to our lecture on dynamic web content. In some ways, this lecture is the most important lecture of the course. Uh, you know, whether you end up writing in PHP or Angular or who knows what, um, a web application makes request response cycles. That is how a web application is different than say a desktop application, even though a desktop application, if it talks to any network resources, is also often making network re uh, requests that are request response cycles. So this may seem like, why do we even need to know this? But it turns out this is the thing you need to know. This is, this is what you will be comfortable with. And after a while, you'd be like, of course, I know how that works but this is the foundation of all web applications. And so the web applications that we are working with are <clears throat> sort of three layer applications. And in the modern world, there's all kinds of variations on this three layer application and I don't wanna get into right now, which is best and which is not. This is sort of the most basic. What we're gonna do is learn the basics and then later you can use a fancier user interface. So the way this works is, um, um, let's make sure I get my scribbling thing on. Come on. Okay. So you're out here, the end user. That's you, end user, and you're using a browser. And um, in that browser, you do a click of some kind. And that click goes across the network. And the first thing it encounters is a web server. And then that web server may actually form up some structured query language, like a select statement or something, talk to the database, read some stuff off the disk, and then send the rows back. And then PHP will format these rows up and send the page 
back to the end user. And <clears throat> so we as a developer eventually be writing PHP that creates SQL. So far up to this point, what we've been doing is we've actually been functioning as the database administrator, where we're using a tool like phpMyAdmin, we type SQL by hand, and then it goes back to the database, and then we see it in our user interface. But we are going to transition from the role of DBA to the role of developer, and then what we'll do is we'll write application software that will do the SQL on our behalf. And by now you're probably a little tired of writing SQL by hand, and when we start writing software, um, it's easier to write the SQL. <clears throat> So we, the SQL will help, help us write that software. So that's kind of where we're going. Um, and in a sense, it's a, it's a little more than that. And we have this web server that I just showed you that has PHP, MySQL, and Apache in it. And we got this network, and then we got the browser. And we have these requests and responses that are going back and forth. But then we're also going to learn how to do more intelligent stuff in the browser. HTML, CSS the document object model, JavaScript, and jQuery all work together along with the data and that comes back and forth between the server to then produce the user experience that we see in a web page. So the thing that we're learning about today is the hypertext transport protocol. And HTTP is what we call it. And it was one of the great inventions of Tim Berners-Lee and others at CERN when they first conceived of the web in 1989 and then 1990. Uh, it really was intended as a rather simple protocol to retrieve documents and images and PDFs and then navigate from page to page. And because it was a very small development team that was building the first web servers and the first web browsers, uh, they kept it simple. And frankly, we benefit greatly from that simplicity. And what we'll do is we'll even do this by hand, even though in the future, as we go from HTML1 to HTML2, uh, it'll be a little more difficult to uh, it'll be a little more difficult to do this by hand. But for now, we can do it by hand and learn how it does. The basic concept is you connect to a server, you navigate down and grab a document, and then you get the document back. And the other uh, tremendous innovation uh, was the URL. The URL, and the idea of the URL is it captures three basic ideas, and that is what kind of protocol we're going to use, HTTP, Hypertext Transport Protocol. That's mostly what you see on these, but that's not the only thing that you can see. A host that you're going to connect to, and then a document that you're going to retrieve. And so we split this out. This is how, this is where, and this is what. And that's the U of Uniform Resource Locator, is that uh, you can uh, know what to get, where to get it, and then how to get it all in one long string, as long as you tear the string apart according to the rules of parsing. So, the basic request response cycle is you have a page, you're looking at the page, the, in general it's not permanently connected to the server, you're offline in a sense, you're seeing the page, even though there's sneaky stuff going on sometimes in the background, but in a sort of very simple world, you're reading a page, then you click on a link, and then you go get another page uh, from that link. So let me just show you real quick how that works. So I go to a page, then drchuck.com slash page1.htm, and then at this point I'm not talking to the network, but at some point I will click on this link, and that will direct my browser to go get another. So sorry for the interruption. Uh, that lecture was being recorded, and I was late to the airport, and I had a small technical difficulty, and so I had to go to the airport, and I had to fly to South Korea. And uh, so we're going to pick this lecture uh, back up uh, from South Korea. So hi, and welcome to South Korea. So the last thing we were talking about before we had to get on the plane to South Korea was um, what goes on when we retrieve a web page. I'm going to start with um, drchuck.com slash page1.htm. And so, make it a little bigger so we can see it. So this is a page. We typed this URL into our uh, location bar, um, and it looked at HTTP, www.truck.com is the host that it goes to, and page1.htm is the page that it retrieves. And so at this point, we're not really interacting with the network. The more complex pages do have little background things that they're interacting with the network, but for now, we're not talking to the server in a traditional web page. And if I hover over here, you can see down in the lower 
left hand corner that it's telling me where it's about to go. This browser is an application running on my computer and it's receiving the clicks. When I click on my mouse, it sees that I've clicked on a designated hotspot, an href, a hypertext reference. And that href includes another page to go retrieve. And so the idea is, is that I'm going to click on this. It's going to retrieve a whole new page. And then in the blink of an eye, replace that with, replace what I'm seeing here with the text from that page. So here we go. It's connecting and it's retrieving. And so there's the second page. Okay. And we can click again. If we click on here, we can go back to the first page and we can go back to the second page if we like. So, now we're going to look at exactly what happens um, here in the uh, browser. When I first started, I was looking at a web page. So that's not how worry about how the page got here, but I typed a URL and I'm looking at a web page. And then this is an application, the browser application running on my Macintosh in this case. And then when I clicked on here, that is an event that happens locally that my browser application, in that case it was Chrome, receives the click event. And it looks at what I clicked on to decide what to do. And so then it makes a connection to the web server on port 80 and it sends a command, this get command. Now we'll take a look at that get command in some detail. And then the web server receives the command and it goes and reads the data, whatever it's going to do. It looks up page 2.htm, wherever that is, and then it sends that back to us. And the response includes some HTML. So HTML is the markup language that this page coming back comes back to us. And then our browser receives that data and then it parses it, looks for the less thans and the greater thans and the hypertext references, the anchor tags and the hrefs, it looks at all this stuff and then produces a second page for us. And so that's the request response cycle. Request, response. The page, some action, request, give, make a page, come, the page comes back and then it's rendered. That process that we just looked at, the request response cycle, is covered by a number of different internet standards. And the internet has been around a long time, since the 1960s, ARPANET, uh, internet, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they produced a lot of standards. And they created an organization just to, an organization just to produce these standards for uh, the internet work. And it's called the Internet Engineering Task Force. The standards are called Request for Comments, which is a bit of play on words with the idea that none of these standards are so perfect or solid that you can never comment on them. Even, even years later, we comment on them. And so if we were to look at this RFC 791, it talks about the low-level uh, inter internet datagram protocols. And, and so some of the early standards were about how we built the internet. But then there are more later standards that are things like how the web uh, and how web browsers interact with web servers. And so this is RFC 2616 and it talks about the HTTP 1.1 Hypertext Transport Protocol. So if you want to, go ahead and download this and look through it. And if you look far enough down, you will find in Section 5 how it is that you're supposed to send data if you want to request a new document from the web browser. And it's pretty simple. You connect to a server on port 80, and then you ask for the document. And there is a specific thing where you send the get command, you send the document you're looking for, and then you have to tell it which version that you're looking at. Your old, super old stuff was HTTP 1.0. HTTP 1.1 has been around for years. And now actually HTTP 2 is coming out. And so we have to start figuring that stuff out. Now, luckily with HTTP 1.0 and 1.1, they're simple enough that we can hack them. And so what we're going to use is a program called Telnet. Telnet is basically make a connection to this host, www.drchuck.com and port 80. Now ports are a way to have multiple applications responding to different kinds of requests. Port 80 is the default HTTP port. We might tell it to some other port. If we tell it to port 25, we'd be talking to a mail server. Now, if you're on Windows, if you're on Linux or Mac, this is going to work just as I show you. You can do this on Windows, but you might have to install something. So go Google how to install uh, go Google how to install Telnet on uh, Windows and you'll be able to figure it out. You'll install it and then you'll be able to on Windows uh, pretty much replicate this. Now, not all web servers want to talk this really simple protocol that I'm showing you right now. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to Telnet to port 80 and then we're going to type a carefully constructed command. I'm going to cut and paste this and then a blank line. And then the server is going to respond with 
the, some headers, metadata about the page we're going to get, and then a blank line, and then the actual page. And then you're going to see the connection is closed. This is exactly what's going on in the request response cycle between your browser and the web server. We're go getting back both the headers and the data. The, he the headers are metadata, like when this document was last modified, how to show the document. Text HTML says that this part down here is actually the HTML syntax. And so, um, and, and so if we look at this, we'd see images, etc. If we were retrieving an image, this stuff would look very different. We'd barely be able to understand it, but this would tell us that it was an image. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So let me run my terminal. Let me make it a little bigger. Now I'm gonna copy the thing I have to type really fast because some web servers don't like it when you don't type fast enough. So I'm gonna type, make it a little bigger, telnet www.drchuck.com port 80. The port 80 is important because the default port the telnet connects to, um, I got a typo here. Default port that Telnet type uh, connects to is not port 80, but web servers by default live on port 80. Okay, so as soon as I here, I connect here, I can type a command. And I'm gonna type the command that I typed, get, and then I have to hit one more new line. And then this is what came back from the server. First, it gives me some header information, and then it gives me the exact page. And so I'm, you know, sort of just hacking in the back door of this thing. But this literally is what the browser does. The browser makes this connection. It uses code to make this connection, like a socket library to make this connection. And then it sends a message. And if you were to look at the RFC that tells you how to do HTTP, it tells you exactly what the format of these things are. It tells you what these headers look like. 200 means that you, you found a document you were supposed to look for, et cetera, et cetera. So let me, for example, uh, make a mistake on this so you can kind of see how it works. Um, Telnet um, get blah ht, oops, http slash 1.0. Let's see what it complains about. Okay, so you see here that, that I did this and I gave it a URL and it somehow is unhappy with me, 400. So 200 is a series of HTTP codes. This 400 means it was a bad request. So let me type another one, and then it gives me a little HTML, which would say bad request. Um, so let me, let me do another one and make another mistake. Uh, that one's gonna work, sorry. Let me see if HTTP colon slash slash www.drchuck.com slash page 9.htm HTTP slash 1.0. I have to type this fast because, yeah, it got it, okay. I typed it too slow and it said, you're not really a browser. Browsers talk faster than that. So now I'm gonna run it again, and this time I've cut and pasted that so I can type it faster. Okay, Telnet, paste, type really fast, be like a browser. Okay, so uh, this is another error message. I wanted it to give me a 404 not found. It says, oh, there's a couple of other things. Um, but basically, you know, when you type bad errors or do this, the server and the browser are communicating using this protocol. And it's not so important that you know this protocol. It is important that you're able to understand roughly what's going on. So if you get an error code or something else, you have a basic understanding of what's going on in behind. And so I'll just call your attention to uh, uh, a fun thing you can see. If you uh, saw the Matrix 2 movie, you saw Trinity hacking into um, the power grid to shut the power grid down in the uh, uh, a critical moment of the movie. Uh, a former student of my mind was the one that actually wrote this. And the original script said that uh, Trinity was gonna be using some cool full screen interface to break in. And, and he said to the Wachowski brothers, he said, that's not how people break into computers. People break in using command line and crazy little stuff like that. So this is rewritten and this Nmap is actually software that people do use to break into computers. And so this is a pretty accurate, he actually set up some vulnerable computers and ran software to break into those vulnerable computers. And then they recorded the session and it was kind of impressive. And now it's become kind of a cool thing to actually try to make the breaking into computers seem more like it's really done. So um, not, not that I want any of you to have a future in uh, hacking computers, but you might have a future in protecting the security of computers and knowing all these sort of back-end uh, command line things is a kind of a sense. 
So now what we're going to do is we're actually going to play with this in the browser. Now, you're not going to have to do Telnet. In the old days, I mean, sometimes I would use that Telnet command to figure things out uh, when something wasn't working. But actually, the browsers have wonderful debugging capabilities. And so there is a developer mode that uh, the first real developer mode was a thing called Firebug inside of uh, Firefox. And uh, but since then, all the other browsers are building building native debugger modes. Sometimes you have to go in and tell your browser to show you de developer mode in the in the drop downs and each browser. So if you have to Google turn on developer mode in Chrome or turn on developer mode in Safari or turn on developer mode in Firefox, uh, you'll get it turned on and then you'll be able to use developer mode. And what happens is, is when you go into developer mode, you see a, a second panel that shows you network activity and various other things. And you can do things like inspect the headers of web requests. Okay. So let me just show you how this works in uh, Chrome. It's a skill that you will want to figure out. Now, you won't always have view developer mode or developer console here, but you might have to do something in the um, preferences to read that. There are a couple things here. I'm going to focus on looking at the network console. And, um, and, and so this network console will show me all the network requests as they go by. So I'm going to go back to page one. I'm going to hand type the URL into, and so you can see the request response on this. So, so here we go. It went and made a request and I can click on this request. Oops. That's not what I wanted. I can click on, I double clicked on it. So it actually did it. Um, and so you can see the headers. You can see that the URL, and this is directly from that HTTP. It did a get request. It asked for this page and it got a, uh, got a 200 okay. And from this address on port 80. So it saw how that all worked. The response headers, Remember, those are the things that we were seeing. We saw when in last modified date, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there also are request headers, which I didn't show you, that are part of you send the get request and then you send the request headers. And that communicates things like uh, what your default language is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to clear all this. I've disabled the cache and I'm going to click on second page. And we see that it makes a request here. So the key thing is to get to the point where you've seen the request. And now you take a look at the headers. We're doing a get again to the page 2htm um, Got a 200 OK. The response headers, the request headers. OK. And so you should be able to. And if you go to a more complex page, like uh, drchuck.com or um, web applications for everybody, let's do this. And I'll turn on the network console. And if I go to www.wa. 4e.com, you will see it's going to make lots of requests. So it requested the main page, it's some data, some CSS, etc. <clears throat> and it keeps requesting thing. And it looks like it made a total of 26 requests, 408,000 uh, bytes, took 8.3 seconds. And so I can actually look at any of these requests. And as your applications get more complex, you'll have to page through here. Now we can see that the original page was uh, just get to the main page. Uh, the response, you can see the HTML that came back. You can see the headers that we sent. We can see the headers that we got back. And here you can see things like uh, the language. Our preference for language is English. And so the request headers are uh, things that inform the web server. If I had a different preference for language, I could tell as I'm requesting a document, if this document's available in multiple languages, which language I prefer. And so you'll get used to scrolling through here. Some of these are just retrieving files. It's got a CSS thing. Um, here's the response. That's this data here. Um, you know, here's an image. This is what an image looks like. Um, the content type is an image slash PNG. So this is a response header. So again, you can dig through all this stuff and you don't actually have to write telnet commands. And you can figure all these things out. And so the, getting to know how this panel works is important for you to be a good software developer, a good web developer. So get used to it. Start figuring uh, this out. OK. So we have talked about this request response cycle. We've talked about how you do it by hand. We've talked about how you can watch it using the developer console. But this is really the only beginning. 
because I'm focusing on the part where it's going back and forth between the web browser and the web server, there's so much more. Things that we're gonna do in the browser like HTML and CSS and formatting and how to look up stuff in the document object model, how to run JavaScript and jQuery and then JSON, <coughs> so many other things. Then there is the whole PHP bit, how we're gonna talk and do code in the web server, running Apache and PHP extension and doing all the PHP code to format stuff and return it. And then we're gonna have to learn about the database server and, and you know SQL and how do we make tables and how do we join those tables together and how do we produce the data efficiently that the user wants to see. And so there's, there's a whole lot. And so what you'll see throughout the rest of this course is this picture in various forms. And what I just showed you was, you know, somebody clicks here and it goes and sends a request to Apache Apache would grab a file and send the response back and then the response is parsed and then shown to us. That's what I showed you. A simple thing, there's a file sitting on a server and we're requesting the file, the, H, you know, the get request goes in, the HTML comes back. And so that's the simple one. It's going to get more complex, right? By the time it's all said and done, we will, the worst case, you know, the very complex, so we'll send a, a get request. The get request will be PHP code, which will be run in PHP. Code will happen in PHP. Um, it'll call a database call with SQL. SQL goes across here. And then a row set or set of rows talks to the database, gets some stuff back, and then it comes back to the PHP code. Then the PHP code writes a bunch of stuff and sends it back. So the web page comes back at the, and it comes back as a response. So this right here is where the request response, the request response cycle is happening. And then that's sent into parsed and put on the DOM and the document object model is shown, but then some of the code's in JavaScript and then the JavaScript can change the document object model so your website page changes. And sometimes you'll even click something and that'll go into JavaScript and JavaScript will make its own request response cycle. I should probably change the color of that one, right? Right. JavaScript will make its own request. It'll make a request response cycle. That'll run some PHP. That PHP will do some database. It'll read some stuff. It'll come back, send some JSON back in this case. JavaScript will read the JSON, update the document object model changing your screen. So we're just at the beginning. We clicked a page. We did a get request. It was a flat file. It came back. It was parsed. It was put in the DOM and we saw it. But there is so much more to learn. So our modern web applications are going to start with this basis, the request response cycle. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we have let, yet to learn. As I said before, if you use a framework like Angular or um, Ruby on Rails, they simplify some of this. But at the end of the day, all they're doing is you're still doing request response cycles. You're doing some of the work in the browser, some of the work in the server, some of the work in the database. It's just kind of a changing style. And so everything that you learn about the request response cycle by writing PHP, MySQL, JavaScript applications is actually equally applicable to any framework that you're ever going to use. Okay. Hope you found this useful. See you on the net. Hello and welcome to my lecture about relational databases. My name is Charles Severance and this lecture, audio, video, and slides are copyright Creative Commons attribution. So relational databases are amazing things. Um, our learning management system here at the University of Michigan using Sakai has you know, billions of records. And you go try to log in and within a tenth of a second you're logged in and it has to go through billions of bytes of data in that tenth of a second. Or if you look at Facebook, it's trillions and trillions and trillions of amounts of data just to show you what your latest status update was. And what databases do for us is they uh, allow us to sp speed through all that data, discarding and getting down to the one little status update that's your status update that just happened three seconds ago. It's billions and billions of bytes of data. And there are many ways to speed that up, but relational databases for the past 30 years have been the mechanism to take very, very large amounts of data and drill down very quickly to the exact bit that you need. Um, it came from the 1970s, um, just, just as a way to make computers better for interactive processes. Before then, they sort of did 
batch processes where they read and read and wrote and read and and, and they couldn't randomly move around and look at their data. But as we built disk drives that allowed random access, we wanted to optimize that random access and make our ability to look at to pass through lots of data very fast without reading all of it on the way by. And so there's a lot of mathematics that underlie relational databases, and you can look at database normalization and third normal form and things like that. We're going to keep our life a little bit simple. Um, just understand that it's amazing. The stuff that we do with relational databases is amazing. Because of the math background that we have in a relational database, um, there are two sets of terms that you will tend to see used. And in different situations or different classes, we'll tend to specialize in these terms. The, the more common terms are database, table, row, and column, because that's kind of what they look like. But those who are more interested in the theoretical aspects of this will call them relations, tuples, and attributes. And so just understand that just because you switch and look at some different document, you start talking about attributes like, whoa, I'm confused. No, you're not. It's a column. Um, the, the essence of the math is that data sort of is at this intersection of an attribute and a tuple. A relation is the connection between those two things. And it's not something that matters too much to us, but it is the thing that makes these mathematically uh, powerful and the speed really comes from that underlying uh, mathematical elegance. So for those of us who are going to think of it in a less math-oriented environment, we can think of it as sort of like a super awesome spreadsheet, right? So this is kind of like our, our database. And then these things down here, tracks, albums, and genres, and artists, they're like tables. And then we have columns, and we have rows. Probably the one thing that's a little different, although we do it commonly, is there databases certainly understand the type of data in each column. And so, you know, something about this first row is telling us what kind of thing and what the name of that column is. In databases, it gets more explicit. And if you would do something like, say, this row is formatted as an integer, databases would get very explicit about that. But if we just sort of back off, if we just back off, we can see that it's a pretty simple concept to think of t columns, rows, and tables and a database, okay? So when you start building one of these applications, uh, something like a PHP application, we finally start talking in the next chapter about PHP. Um, we really often think of the, uh, the database kind of running one place, the database application, and this is the, the application that takes the request and response from our user, much like we've been doing, and we, the developer, we write that code, right? That's, we type in some new PHP, and um, at time, when we get to it, we'll send queries to a database. The database is like a separate process, could be on a separate server. This might actually be a network connection between here. And we send this language across. We ask for data, send a query across in the language SQL, and then we get a chunk of data back and forth, and then we format that and show it to the end user. And so that's how it works, is developer writes application that some of the things the application does is makes database queries. Other things does, you know, formats output and does, does various other things, right? So, um, but we're not going to do sort of, we're not going to do this part. No. We're not going to do this part until the next chapter, okay? What we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to function more like a database administrator. And in organizations, it's often the case that developer and DBA are not the same person. But for this class, you are going to be both a developer and a DBA. This chapter is more of a DBA thing. And we're going to use a database tool, and we're going to pretty much type SQL directly to the database. So there is this database client. We, PHP MyAdmin is probably the most common one that you'll use, but I'll show you also the command line a little bit. And, and we'll type SQL commands, and changes will happen. There's data in here and software and all kinds of really cool stuff in there. And so for this chapter, we are just working on this part of it, and we are a database administrator. We're doing things that in a production system, developers may not be able to do. And you might write code that might take weeks to go into production, and you have no access to the production database in a production environment. So the language we're about to learn is called SQL, or Structured Query Language. Some people, I think, have called it Simple Query Language in the past, but Structured Query Language. It is a beautiful language. It is a beautifully simple language. 
we're going to learn how to create data, read data, update data, and delete data in this language. And it's, it's very elegant, and everyone really should know this. There's lots of database applications out there. Uh, Oracle is the large, very successful commercial one that they have like a sailboat. You know, there's a sailboat that goes flying by. Remember the sailboat? America's Cup sailboat. Oracle sponsors that. So they're a very, very successful company. MySQL is an open source. It's owned by Oracle, but we kind of trust it. Um, there's another one called Mariah. MariahDB, which is a clone of MySQL. It's not owned by Oracle. And then Microsoft has uh, SQL Server, which is a very nice database. And um, people ha have favorites of these. Um, they, they have their favorites. Um, for this class, I just use MySQL because it's free and it's openly available. And it is very, very commonly used with PHP. And so we're just going to use that. There's lots of other ones that are, that are popular out there. I've used all these, Hypersonics, SQL, SQLite, and Postgres. But for this class, we're going to focus on uh, MySQL. And so if you've installed one of these XAMPs or MAMPs somewhere on your screen, there is a place that you can start this thing called PHP MyAdmin. If you are hosting your cPanel, there's going to be somewhere to click in the PHP MyAdmin. And so this, once you get in this PHP MyAdmin, this is going to be common. This user interface, once you learn this, is going to be common across most systems that support PHP and MySQL. So learning how to use it and learning how to be good at it is a worthwhile exercise. <clears throat> so we can take a look at our databases. And I'll, let me show you the one I've got here. So I'm running MAMP on my Macintosh. And I can run, oops, here, click. And I can run PHP MyAdmin. And so here I have that same screen. I can take a look at my databases. Now what's really happening is there's SQL going on back and forth, and we can type SQL commands here, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And so there we go. That is one way of making use and talking to SQL. So if you're running in the command line, there's a couple of different commands depending on the operating system. You may not be able to cut and paste these depending, so you may have to type these by hand. So let me just show you the one that I have to run on my Macintosh for MAP. Uh, it might take you a little while to figure out exactly which one. Uh, if you're on Linux, you're just going to type MySQL command at the command line, and the defaults will be fine. So let me just show you uh, what I do on my Macintosh. I type this long thing. Now, again, if you're having trouble cutting and pasting, just go ahead and carefully type that in. So it's going to log in as the use, root user and the root password. There is always security connected to these things. In our little development environments that we carry around on our desk, security is less critical. Um, and so now we're at a MySQL prompt. And if we say show databases, we will see the various databases. And this looks the same as what we did in our PHP MyAdmin. So I'll go back and forth for a couple of commands and show you sort of doing it both ways. But, uh, but in general, I'll, I'll switch pretty much to PHP MyAdmin. But if you're on Linux, you got to use this. Well. Not necessarily. On Linux, you might be using a control panel that comes with uh, like cPanel and, and MySQL admin. But I, I want you to be able to realize that these SQL commands can be typed in in lots of different user interfaces, not just the ones that I'm using. So here are some examples of the stuff typed in and you at this little MySQL prompt. And so like I said, the first thing that you're going to do in PHP My admin, I went and looked at the databases. And in my MySQL command line, I did show databases. It's kind of like hello world for databases. OK. And so there's some databases that you should leave, leave alone. Be careful. Don't, uh, don't go drop in those databases. Uh, a database is a collection of tables. And so the command to create a database. And then the command line, you've got to tell it which database you're using. On the, in the My, in PHP MyAdmin, you tend to navigate. So I'm going to create the database called people in a command line. And I'm going to use it. So I'm going to say create people. And I'm going to say use people. And then I am going to show tables, what tables are in there. There are no tables. Now if I switch for a moment to my 
MySQL admin and I hit refresh, you'll see my people database showed up there. That means this the, the command line is talking to the database server and my PHP my admin is talking to the database server. So if I go into people, I can see that there are no tables. There's no tables. There, I can create a table if I want. There's SQL. Yeah, and, and, and away we go. And this is the equivalent of use is I'm now in this database. So the SQL queries are going to be sent to that database. Okay? So that's just showing you the sort of equivalence between uh, PHP my admin and the command line. And so here we go. This is what it looks like. So now we're going to do a create table. I'm going to do, oops, I'm going to do this create table, create tables user. I'm going to do that one in PHP my admin, and I'm selected in the database people. Oops, forgot to see. Create table users. You got a column called name, which is a variable length character up to 128, and a column email that's variable length character up to 128. You'll notice I have a comma here, comma here and no comma there, and I say go. So this is going to submit the SQL to a database, and now you see I've got a users table, and I can look at the structure. I've got these columns, and it's the type, and all this stuff is starting to work, right? I can look at this table, and there's no data in it. Um, I can go into my command line, and the describe command is the way that you look for things in the command line. Okay, so I now have a table and a database, and I know what's in it. It's got two columns. So it's empty. There's actually some wizards that allow you to create this inside PHP MyAdmin. And so the next SQL statement we're going to look at is called the insert statement. And the insert statement, so SQL keywords, insert into, are actually just SQL. SQL is a little more verbose to make it a little more readable. And values is a keyword. Users is the name of a table. Then you have two parentheses lists. One is the name of the columns, and then one is the name of the values to put in each column, and there's a sort of one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of things you put in the values list and the number of things that you put in the columns list. Okay? So the insert statement inserts a row into the table. Okay? So I'm going to just copy this little guy. Oh, by the way, um, you may have downloaded my little cheat sheet to make it so it's easier to copy these back and forth. Um, hopefully, it'll work fine if we copy back and forth from the PowerPoint. We won't get sort of strange characters. So this time, I'm going to do it in this. So I'm in a table users, I'm in database people, and I'm going to type you know, insert into yada yada, and then I'm going to say go. And now if I took a look at the browse, you would see that I now have one row with this row as name and email. If I go back to SQL, I can grab the rest of these. And put them in. I actually need to put a semicolon at the end of each one if I want to do them all at the same time. And now I can say go. And it'll go ch -ch 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 and run all those. Yay. It ran them separately. And so now I have five rows in my database table. Okay? So that's the insert statement. You don't have to have all the columns. There are rules about what columns need to be there and what columns don't need to be there. Oops, we're going the wrong way. We can do a delete, and again, delete, delete is, delete from is the language reserved words, where is a reserved word, table, and then kind of a logical question, and this is a column where, so delete from users where email equals ted at umich.edu. Kind of easy, right? So let's copy that one in. Let's copy, copy that in. Copy that. This time I will go into here. Um, I'll put a semicolon at the end. And now I'll go over here and I'll rebrowse, and you'll see that Ted's now gone. So we're, we're, we have these two processes. One is this command line terminal, and the other is this PHP MyAdmin, and they're really talking to the same database. There can be literally many, 
many of these connections from your online PHP application, from you as the database administrator, from you as database administrator at the command line, they can all be connected at the same time. I'll speed us up, not keep doing that over and over. So we delete it, it's gone. Update. The update has, <clears throat> again, update is the keyword, set is a keyword, where is a keyword. So update the table users, set the, the column name to the value Charles, and then there's a where clause. You gotta be careful, if you don't leave this where clause, it'll do it down every column. If you don't put the where clause on, it'll do every column. So I say update, set name. So, so here we're gonna see this one here that's gonna select that one. So I switch to the SQL tab and then hit go. And then I take a look and indeed the name has been changed. So that's update. Retrieving records, this is kind of the reading of the information, um, is the select statement. And the generic one is select star from users. And this column here, this is all the columns that you want. Star means give me all the columns. Otherwise, you can list columns. And then there's a table. And then there's an optional where clause. So, so come back. So select star from users. I'll type this one in the command line. Select star from user semicolon. That pulls all those things out. And if I do select star from users where email equals csev.umich.edu, you see that I got just that record that is the one I'm looking for. Okay. So the select pulls out selected things. You can sort, select star from users order by email or select star from users order by name. Order by is a reserved word. Even though it seems like it's two words, it's one reserved word. Again, they're just trying to make it easy for us. So I can say select by email. So now it's ordered by the email column. Copy. Paste. Order by name. So that gives me the same stuff because the emails and the person's names are at the same order, but you get the picture. You can order by, and you can order by multiple things. You can order in descending. There's all kinds of things you can do. Another sort of operator that's interesting, and there's tons of these, I'm just giving you the high level, is uh, a like, and there's like a wild card. So the per percent, per percent sign, E percent sign, says, look, anything has an E anywhere in it. So I can go to, let me switch back to doing it this way. I can go in here and I can say, select star from users, where name like the letter E, somewhere in there, and then I type go. And then it runs, and so you can see I only got the two rows where the person's name has an E in it. So Caitlin and Sally do not have E's in them. Ooh. The limit clause. The limit clause is a great enhancement to performance. Um, if you think about um, all kinds of user interfaces that say this is the 1 to 25 of 1,000, next, back, next, back. That's what's going on here because if you if you retrieved all hundred thousand, that'd be very costly both for the database and the server. If you're only going to do show 25, use this limit clause, and you can start at the beginning or you can start like at 26 if you want. And so um, I can add this limit two that says the first two. Uh, limit one says start at, at zero base. Start at the second one and give me two more. So I'll just run this one. Select star from users order by email limit that's starting with the second one and going to. So we'll just go and type that into SQL. So it, it sorted it and then down, this is how it's in the in the middle of something. And so the and so the limit the, <clears throat> the limit is a starting row and a count or just a count. You can ask for a count, and that's how when you're on one of these page things, it says 1 to 25 of 10,000, because the database is actually very fast at being able to do this. So instead of selecting the actual information, we can ask for a count of a certain number of things. So let's just go in here. So 
So I can count four. There's four of them. And I could also do that. I'll leave that up to you with a cool where clause. That would give you one if it was going to do that. So at this point, it's like this is the summary of what we've shown you. How to insert, how to delete, how to modify, and how to retrieve. I'm giving you a couple of choices with the retrieval, like a where clause, like a limit clause, ordering, etc. And at this point, you're kind of thinking like, wow, why does every matey make such a big deal about this? And you honestly are sort of right at that point. And so that is basically the basics of SQL. Of course, we haven't gone to multiple tables or uh, foreign keys and stuff like that, but we'll get to that eventually. So, but this is why it's such a pretty language, because really at its core, these are the functions. And then we just sort of wrap this with increasing complexity, but these are the four basic things that relational databases. Welcome to the second half of our MySQL uh, lecture. This, uh, in the second half, in the first half we talked about the insert, uh, update, sele uh, select, and delete commands, the basic SQL capabilities. Now we're going to talk about some of the contracts that we're making with the database, uh, having to do with the types of fields that we can store. We saw varchar 128 in that previous lecture. So we're going to talk about the various kind of text fields, various kind of binary fields, numeric fields, date time fields, and then fields that we do things like our special auto increment. Um, and so when we start talking about strings, uh, it's important to realize that there are two kinds of strings. Um, string fields understand character sets. So if you have uh, oriental characters um, that, are, you know, that are more complex to store, uh, these char fields and varchars are actual characters. And so they can have a, a Korean name in them or something like that. Um, char is a fixed length field that allocates all the space. It's a, a, a tiny bit faster for smaller strings that are very consistent where, where they're pretty much going to be filled up all the time. They're known and so char. Varchar is more common because um, they, they allocate a little bit of space for how long they are but then they only use the amount of space that's used. So if you do a like char 10,000 every row is going to have 10,000 characters. Uh, taken up. So varchar is pretty common. Um, ch char and varchar can be indexed and used for lookups like when you log in uh, with your email and it wants to look your email up and it wants to index that so it's really fast so you tend to put uh, something that's going to be taken from the user in a varchar field. Um, then there are text fields and, and text fields are generally for paragraphs. Uh, textual information because there's lots of times in databases we store pages of stuff. Um, not pages and pages so much but like a single page like in one of these little text input areas you see in various systems where you got a little bold and italics. All that turns into one blob of text. And so these are larger, they're variable length, um, and they're generally not used to do uh, sorting or indexing or looking up. And there's sort of tiny text, text, medium text, and long text. Um, I tend to really mostly use the, the text one for fields. I, I don't even make large varchar fields uh, much anymore. I tend, if I'm not going to use them as an index, I tend to just call them text and be done with it. It's, I don't think there's a real efficiency problem, at least in the modern versions of MySQL, to just use text for lots of things. Um, there are these binary types that are actual 8-bit chunks of space. And they have no awareness or uh, no awareness of character sets, um, so you can't store anything other than you know 256 bit, 250 zero through 256 in each one of these 8 bit bytes. So they go up to, uh, and so there's a, a fixed and a variable length, but this is uh, seldom used, seldom used, but they're there, so you might see those. Now. Uh, you can also store large binary objects. And this would be a image, a JPEG image, or a GIF image, or a PDF, or a QuickTime, something like that. Um, you can store these in databases. You tend to find that you don't want to store objects that are too large in databases. You tend to find a place to store them on the file system and serve them out of the file system. Um, uh, and, and so you tend to only use these things, um, you know, two to five meg, you can you can go on Stack Overflow and say, when should I use a blob and when should I store a, it on, on disk? And it'll tell you that sometimes, 
And so real small things, so two megabytes, like if you're uploading images and you can limit them to two megabytes, it's not bad. But the problem if you make too much data in blobs, um, then you end up with backup problems. So you, you can't back your whole system up. The advantage is if you put it in the database, you back the database up and all your images are backed up. If you start putting really large files in, then your database backup gets really large. And so you, you don't want that. So it's sort of this balancing act as to whether or not you use blob. But the database is perfectly happy of putting a whole QuickTime file, 200 megabyte file in it. It stores it reasonably efficient, efficiently, but then it takes responsibility for making backups of those things for you. Integer numbers, very much uh, the, the kind of thing that you, you want to do. Um, lots of things that we do are integers, and integers are very, very efficient. They take up very little data. They're quick to compare. They're quick to sort, all kinds of things. And there are a number of different uh, integer sizes. Um, there is uh, tiny ints, which are sometimes useful for variables uh, that you know are going to have some 0 through 10 or something like that. But that's about all they're good for. Um, integer is, uh, is the common thing that's used a lot. And then really large integers can be done with big int. Floating point numbers can be stored. And these are stored in um, standard, standard floating point in 32-bit or 64-bit. And the 32-bit numbers tend to have seven digits of accuracy. And uh, the, the doubles, the 64-bit numbers, have 14 digits of accuracy. So that doesn't matter how many, the number of digits of accuracy is like that, because these are all represented as a power. And so there's not a lot of call for it, unless you're doing kind of scientific data, but it's, it's right there. But very little of what we'll do in this class, we'll use float. We're going to use a lot of dates. So there are um, timestamps. So one of the interesting things is timestamps. Timestamps are actually represented as a number, as an integer number of seconds since 1970. And if you look at the number 0, that's 1970, January 1st, something 1970. And then it's like a second is added. Now it turns out that this may overflow, depending on how big you make it. It might overflow, and we'll have a Y2K problem in 2037. But these are very efficient. They store very, take very little space. They sort wonderfully, and um, you can sort of look things up very, very nicely with timestamps. And it's a per second resol resolution. <clears throat> and so, uh, so that's good. Uh, there's time, there's date, and then there is date time as well. And these are all different features. And there's a built-in MySQL function called now that allows you to, in an insert statement, say, you know, this particular field. Just put the current time in because MySQL, MySQL knows what time it is. Auto increment is a very important feature. Um, when we get to the later lecture on database design, we will need these keys, these, these primary keys that are sort of the, the way we can most rapidly look up a particular row. And so we'll tend to add a special key field, like for this users field, we will have a user underscore ID, and it's going to be an, an unsigned integer. Not null is a thing that says it can't be empty. And auto increment says, look, we're not going to actually tell you what numbers to put in here. You just, every time a new record gets added, you just automatically increment it, and then the rest of the thing. So this auto increment says to the database, it's supposed to maintain the field. So let me show you a little example of that auto increment. Let me take this create table here. So I'm going to go into PHP, go home, go to databases. I am going to get rid of my people database by clicking here and dropping it. So if I do a refresh, and in home and databases, people is gone now. And I'm going to do a new create database. Using this command. So hit go. Oh, I've got to be in a database. Oh, 
I killed my database. Now I gotta create database people again. So go back to SQL, create database people. I didn't mean to get rid of it. I should just drop the table. That'll teach me a lesson. So now if I go back to databases, I've got my people database. And now I can create a table. A table I wanted to create called users. Say go. So there we go. So if I take a look at the database, I've got one table called users. And if I look at the structure of that, it's got three columns. One is a user ID name. These two are from before. But this one has auto increment. So let me show you what happens here in the SQL. Let me go back and insert some statements way from the very beginning. Way from the very beginning. Redo some of those insert statements with auto increment this time. Here are my insert statements. I'll insert in here. Now you'll notice, oops, paste the right way. I have two columns. There are three columns in this database now. There are, and I have only two columns specified, and I have Chuck and CSEV at umich.edu. And that's because the third column I have specified is supposed to be done automatically by the database. So I type go and I do a browse. And so now I can see this row, this row. This number was assigned by the database because that's my auto increment field. So Chuck C7 at umich.edu. So I can go back in this SQL now and I can stick another thing and I'll stick Sally in. Insert Sally. Again, no user ID. And I go back and now there are two records. It's pretty predictable. It starts at one, goes one, two, three, four, five. Now I'll put these other three in and you'll see it just assigns these numbers. Oh, actually, no, I'm going to go over here and uh, use people show tables, make sure I'm in the right spot. Yes, I am. And now I'm going to run. Oh, I should have put a semicolon on that. It's probably going to blow up. Yep. Uh, I need to put a semicolon on all of them. And that's okay. I'll do them one at a time. I'll do them one at a time. Copy, insert, semicolon. You see it's putting in one row at a time. Copy, insert, semicolon. Now I can say select star from users to see what's in there. And so you see in this that the user ID for the first two I inserted using PHP my admin is one and two. And then three, four, and five were these inserts that I did in this command line user interface. And if I go back here, and I hit the browse again, you'll see these are gone. Again, I'm just reemphasizing that this database administrator is talking to the database in one way or another way, and the application could be talking all at the same time. Or these are not the, this is not the database, and this is not the database. The database is a thing that we're all talking to, sending SQL commands to. So they're all sending commands to that same system. So this is auto increment, right? And we'll, we'll figure out why we need to do this. But the point there is that I can create this field by marking it auto increment. I'm saying, you take care of everything. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to come up with these numbers. I just want a number for each row. You know, there's it, sometimes it's not as perfect as one, two, three. It's just give me a unique number for each row. So there's a whole series of MySQL functions. We'll, uh, we'll run into these when we need them. Uh, the one we've mentioned so far is now, where you can put now in is a value instead of like having to put the current date in quotes. If you just mean right this minute, you put now in the uh, SQL query. Another aspect of creating these tables and setting up these contracts, this is what called indexes. And so everything we've done so far is like five, five lines or five rows. So it's really uh, really fast. And it's reading the whole thing. And we don't even notice that. But at the end of the day, if you had 100 million users and you were going to, uh, 100, user, 100 million user records and you were going to look it up by email, you would want to be able to just make an index so it can jump in more quickly. And so there are techniques to shorten this lookup so you don't have to go through the whole thing. And the two techniques are called hashes and trees. And so in MySQL, you can give it a couple of different index types. One is a primary key index. And that's what those auto increment folks are. They're they're very little fast. They're very they're exact match lookups. Good for numbers. They're really fast. And then there is the kind of classic index, which is 
I'm indexing a character field where I might do the entire match or a subset of a prefix of it, or I might sort it. And so it has to have a sense of what's nearby one another. Um, so it, it, the, these indexes also help sorting the order by work well. Full text is sort of like a search engine, and it's kind of a tweaky little creepy thing all by itself. Uh, not a lot of applications use full text search because there are significant costs every time you insert something. Um, and so it's it's used in highly specialized situations. So we'll focus, we'll use the primary key all the time for those, usually those auto increment fields, and then index for character fields that we're going to do lookups on or sorts regularly. So the two techniques we use for lookups, and this is pretty much the primary key index is good for this, and that's called hashing. And a hash function is it takes as input a large chunk of data and then runs a calculation to produce something smaller. And so the, the hash function is, you can go read up on hash functions, um, the, the various kinds of them. And, and what we do is instead of taking a long string, we reduce it down to a number. But the problem is, is that hashes might have collisions, right? So John Smith, when we run it through this function, might end up with two. And then Lisa Smith will end up with one. And then Sam Doe ends up with four. But if we run Sandra D through, we'll end up with two. And so we have to deal with what's called collisions. But when you do it, this can be very long and this can be very short. And it's a very efficient way to sort of not have to look to, to, to make the lookup table be based on these smaller numbers rather than make a lookup table based on these numbers. Now the key to hashes is they do not maintain order, right? And so that's 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 why in say a Python dictionary, which is exactly a hash, it doesn't maintain order for you even though that, that's counterintuitive. And that's because it's storing them and indexing them and looking them up in this very fast manner uh, using hashing. Now the other way to do this is when you need to have a sense of order. And so you could think of these as little spaces on disk, right? So we're going to look for, let's say, um, 10. And uh, what this is, is these are chunks of disk that it reads in, or maybe chunks of memory. But let's just pretend they're chunks of disk. And if you're going to read the whole thing, it'd be costly. But you read the first one in, and then you have, in effect, this is telling you ranges. Right? When you look at this 7 and 16, that says, go to this other place on disk if it's below 7. If it is between 7 and 16, go to this place in disk. And if it's above 16, go to this place. And so if we're looking at 10, 10 comes in here. And it doesn't have to read all, it doesn't have to read all the way through, cha-cha-cha-cha-cha. And it, it can go straight to here. And then it reads through this. And then it finds 10 doesn't exist. But And, and so this is basically, instead of, reading all the way from the beginning. And, and the key thing is, this there could be literally hundreds of these, right? And you could skip 50 easily and go right to the thing that you need. And then sometimes there's three levels of trees, and there's all kind of tricks to make these trees. But the basic idea is it saves us from doing sequential reading by we can read and then skip just to the part we want and then read what we want. And so given that the sequential reading could be very, very long, and the skipping is like two reads versus however many we have to point where we get to our stuff. Okay, so that's called a B tree index. And now what happens here, of course, is this this actually then the 12 points to some other area on disk, which is the actual data. So it reads here, it reads here, and it goes there, versus you know reading all the way through here and then having to go to, go to there. Okay, so. And when new records are inserted, like if we were to insert 10, well, let's insert 13 because it's easier to draw. It would look for where 13 goes. It would put 13 somewhere on disk. And then it would put it in here, and it would add it to this, 13, and then point 13 to that little bit of disk. Now, at some point, if it had to do a 3, the 3 would come in here, and then it would have to break this in half and put um, and make two little blocks and and, and fiddle around up here. So sometimes these have to be reorganized. So there is some cost when you're inserting data into one of these B trees, but it's beautiful because you can do super quick lookups and you can make things come out in sorted order very nicely and very easily. And so if we want to add an index, we can 
either add the index at moment of table creation. So here was our previous table where we're saying da 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 da, and we're saying index name. So that just says that's a contract that says, hmm, I'm going to use this name as a lookup, or I might sort on this name. So I want you to create these extra data structures so that sorting and lookup is really fast on name. I'm not, I, and by not mentioning that on email, I'm just saying, look, if I happen to sort on email, I know it's going to take longer. But if you can possibly waste a little bit of disk space with one of these indexes, you can save me some time because I'm, I'm, I'm communicating to you my use of this name might be different than my use of email. You can also, if you already have a table, you can add an index. And this is often when we're in the middle of a system and the system's slowing down, like, oh, wow, it's slowing down. Oh, let's go add an index and see if that helps. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just add the index to the table that I've already got. It's, uh, it's not too exciting. It works. So I'll go in here. I'll go to the SQL. Now, at the moment that I'm adding this index, it actually reads the whole table and makes all the index and puts all the pointers and makes it all work just nice. We don't care about, about all that detail. We just go, go, and it's done. We don't even really see much different, but all we know is that if we sorted by name, it's faster. Now, of course, there's only five records, so it sort of hardly matters in this particular case. That just means this sort of name is faster than this sort of email but it's meaningless because everything is fast. Oh, wait, bring that back down. So that's an index. And so this second half, you know, we, we actually, in the first half of this lecture, we learned how the basic language works. And the second half, we learned how we can sort of begin to establish contracts with our database system as to how these columns work and whether we're going to sort them and, and different things. And, and, and this is just the beginning. There are many more details, but you've hit the, we've hit the high points of the creation of uh, database tables and that kind of thing. So see you in the next lecture. Hello, and welcome to my lecture on relational database design in MySQL. What we're really talking about here is the move from one table to multiple tables. Uh, SQL with its select, update, insert, delete uh, provides basic CRUD operations and that's how we insert and maintain data in a database. But that's not really where the power of the database comes in. The power of database happens when we model material in different tables and then connect those tables with what we call foreign keys. Um, and it's this complexity and this separation of data and the, the smallest of connections and, and cheap, inexpensive connections that are uh, much cheaper than sort of scanning lots of data. You just jump to, the, to, to a bit of data somewhere on a hard drive. And it uh, allows us to handle, you know, billions of records uh, in a hundredth of a second. And, uh, and so it's all very clever. There's a lot of computer science involved. And database design, uh, I'm just going to talk about the basics of it is an art form that you get better with the more you do it and the more real production applications. Uh, people ask me often, how do you, what's, what's the best advanced class? And, and the answer is the adva best advanced class is to work on a real system and have good mentors that can help you because it's, it's hard, to, hard to know in advance all the things that you're going to encounter. So database design often starts with a picture that captures the multiple tables and the relationships between those tables. And it has to do with a problem space. This is a portion of a data model from a project that I have called SUGI, which is a learning tool hosting environment. And this is just a portion of the data model. And the data model pictures, and, and what this is, is each of these items is, you know, as a table, and then there's other tables, they give given names, there's data in these tables. And then there are connections between the tables, and these little roads uh, model the connections between the tables. And we'll, we'll talk all about this stuff in this next couple of lectures. Um, this can get really large. Uh, part of a project, another project I'm part of is called Sakai, which is an open source uh, learning management system. And this is just one, this is probably about one tenth of the data model of Sakai. This is the part that models assessments. And so, I had to zoom it way out just to see all the different tables. And you go like, why did they do this? It seems like such a simple problem. And the answer is performance. 
we build all these complex relationships and model the data based on the connections. And that's the important part of this, right? You know, here's like, you know, address, phone number, but the speed comes from carefully not duplicating data and modeling as much as you can that is, will affect performance with these connections. And so often if you're starting a new application, you need to draw a picture. And you draw a picture of the kinds of different objects in the real world that exist in your application. And the first and most basic rule of data modeling, and there is lots of subtlety to this, but the most basic rule is never put the same string in twice. And so in a learning management system, each user has a name, and my name might be Charles Severance. If you were to look through the database tables of a well-designed learning management system, and you looked all through all the tables, you hopefully would see the string Charles Severance when it refers to my name, one place. And then everything has to point back to that if it's going to display Charles Severance on the screen. You'd see Charles Severance displayed all over the place in the user interface, if it was you that was logged in. Um, but in the database, there should only be one copy. And if you start allowing there to be more than one copy of who the current logged in user's name is, and then you do that a little bit, and then you put 100 million users in, and then all of a sudden you've got a lot of data, and then all of a sudden you've got a lot of data to scan. And so it's so much easier to like have a little pointer to say, he's user 2012, and then bam, we've got user 2012. And so it just it has to do with efficiency. But we, we do want to separate out the, the re real world things in our database model. So here's a little model that I like to start with. It's a model from iTunes, Apple's iTunes. And we have a number of columns, and we have a user interface. And so we've got to separate out the user interface from the underlying storage structure. And so in this user interface, we're saying we're going to model tracks. And there's going to be how long the track is, what artist it's from, what album it's from, the genre of it, the rating, and the count. And you could just put this in a big, long spreadsheet. And I bet you've, you've tried at times to... <clears throat> model perhaps your DVD collection in a spreadsheet and you find after a while that it's really kind of weird and you replicate data and you start typing the same thing over and over and over again and it just doesn't make a lot of sense because you know eight to ten tracks come from an album and an artist an album artist combination and and so in, in in our database if we just put everything into one table then we would have to scan the whole table to find things so um, so what we have to do is we have to look through the data that makes up our application. Of course, this is far simpler than most applications. And we have to say, is this a new object that we haven't seen before? Like, you know, an album is a thing, a track is a thing, a artist is a thing. And so then you say, but or is the piece of data, you know, part of an part of this part of one object, or is it truly a different object? And so we basically would sit in a room, a whiteboard. And we would say, hmm, which of these things are separate objects and which of these things are parts of other objects? And so the other thing you say is like, what's the most basic and what's the essential feature of this application that we're building? And what is its core model? And you're going to relate all these things together eventually. And, and it doesn't matter where you start, but it's a little easier sometimes if you start at the right place. So let's just say that the first thing we're going to model is track, okay? And now we have to look at all the other things. Is, is an artist part of a track? No. Is an album part of a track? No, an album is a thing. An artist is like a person. A track is another thing. Uh, a genre, well, we'll figure that out. But certainly rating, length, and count, that's part of a track. It's clearly and obviously part of a track. So the next question is sort of what is the thing that's most related to a track? Well, I think it's probably album, right? An album really... It's, uh, a track is made up of many albums, so a track belongs to an album. And then we say, okay, uh, what does an album belong to? Well, an album belongs to an artist. So an artist make albums, so a track belongs to an album and it belongs to artists. Now the question might be, what does genre belong to? Where does a genre connect to? We could connect the artist to genre. We could say, you know, a Led Zeppelin is a rock artist. We could say, uh, Who Made Who, ACDC's album. That's a rock album. Uh, or we could say a track. And now this is a point where, as we're designing our application, it might make a difference. Um, 
you know, if if we decided that uh, ACDC was metal or rock, and then later ACDC made a Christmas album, could we? Can ACDC also be jazz? And so it's important where you connect these things. And so if you play with your iTunes a little bit, you will notice that every track, even on an album, can be of a different genre. And so the proper place to connect the genre is to the track because we can change every one of these independently. Even though this is four tracks, this is four tracks, this could be rock, this could be easy listening, this could be whatever. And by connecting genre to track, we can change these. Now, in this particular album, they're all the same. But we have now made a data model for this particular application. Okay, so now we have a picture of objects and how those objects are connected together. And this is going to turn into the table structure that we're going to use. And so now we're going to take how to take those relationships, those little arrows, and represent them in a database, right? We still need to keep track of who the artist is, what the genre is. We have to keep track of all these things, but now we've separated them out and we need to model those connections, right? We need to model those connections. If you are taking, we're taking a really super sophisticated database class, we talk at this point about the different forms of database normalization in first normal form and second normal form and third normal form and which one's better and why you do this and what it really means. That's great. That's some of the wonderful mathematics that underlies the power of what we're going to play with. But basically what we're going to show you is a light version of third normal form following pretty much one basic rule and that is always, I mean, <laughs> that's good. The, <laughs> the rule is never replicate a string. It's the Charles Severance example. You can have a learning management system with hundreds of tables and billions of records, but the word Charles Severance, as it refers to a particular user, should only appear one place. And what we do is we use numbers to act as proxies for those strings. Anywhere we want to put, this belongs to Charles Severance, this comment came from Charles Severance, Charles Severance ends up with a number, 12, and then we put 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, instead of Charles Severance, Charles Severance, Charles Severance. And so we don't replicate string data. We reference the data, we point at it, and we use integer numbers for this. Um, integers are very, they're stored very efficiently, they're sorted very efficiently, they're accessed very efficiently, and so we have numbers that represent these little arrows. And what we do to, to take Charles Severance is we add a little key to it. We call it the Charles Severance's key, so it'll be a little number field. So um, we'll see how this all works, okay? And so we create these places that have the, uh, a user's name, Charles Severance, then a user key, and then everywhere else we have the user key and we connect back to the user key. So if we were to model the relationship between artist and album in our little database here, um, we would have to add to the artist table a key, right? We'll call this artist underscore ID just by convention. I have my, my table names have capital letters in them, capital artist. My columns are all lowercase and artist underscore ID is the key in the artist table that is magically ACDC everywhere in this system. Even if we had hundreds of tables, we will use the number uh, two to represent ACDC. So when we're in a table, say like album, where we want to say, oh, who does this album belong to? And we want to say, I would like, this album belongs to artist ID two. So that's effectively the proxy for ACDC all over this database. And you can think of this arrow as having a direction. So artist ID points to a row in a different table, and that row is number two. And the same is true for Led Zeppelin, points to a row in this other, other table. So these are those arrows that we drew before. Now, this album also itself is, has rows, and we put a key here as well. And so each album has a number, and so anywhere we want to reference who made who, we don't put the string who made who, we put the number one. Same for Led Zeppelin four, we put the number two. So the idea is, is we can replicate these numbers very efficiently, put them all over the place, replicate them as many times as we want because numbers are short, uh, uh, highly compressible, uh, fast, all, all kinds of good things about numbers, okay? Now, I'm calling these things keys and it turns out that we have some terminology about keys and you just have to learn this, okay? Have to learn this. 
there are three general kinds of keys that we deal with, okay? The first kind of key is what's called a primary key. And that's the key we add to the table to generate this little number. So we call that the primary key of the entire row. The foreign key is the key that points to something, right? It point, it's one of these pointer keys. We'll see this in a second. The logical key is the key that the world would look this up, maybe the person's email, for example. So the outside world and the inside world. The primary key is generally just a number that's used inside the database from one table to the other table, okay? But the outside world knows who this user is, and this user might be, you know, c7umish.edu, yada, yada, okay? So the logical key is often a string that might be typed into a form on a web form. <clears throat> The relationships need to be done by uh, relationships need to be done using primary keys. Never use the logical key, which is a string, as your primary key. And logical keys, including people's e email names, change. And so, if you have that primary key all spread out around your database, and you got to change all the primary keys, it's terrible. So things like email may not change, but people do change jobs. They go to new places, and their email changes. And if you have a million records you want to change even that email one place. Now a foreign key is the way we model these arrows and a foreign key kind of has a start and an end. And so if album belongs to artist, we have to add a column to the album table called artist ID. So if there's a column in album ID called album ID in an album table, that's its primary key. Artist ID has a primary key in artist, but if we're going to have artist ID in the album table, that generally indicates it's a foreign key. It's a key in another table, right? It's a key in the artist table. So if it doesn't match album, that means it's a key. Now, you can name these things any way you want. You could call this X and you could call this Y and A, B, C. You can name anything you want and you can call your, you know, um, W and Q, right? You could name these crazy names. I don't name them crazy names. Because if you name your variables, your columns and your tables in a crazy, non-disciplined way, then your head will explode. So please don't have your head explode. So I have a convention here that's kind of borrowed from Ruby on Rails, mostly. The only part where Ruby on Rails and I differ is I don't, they call this field ID with no, without the table name. I like to put the table name there. And convention is style. So there's not like a perfect convention. I disagree a little bit with Ruby on Rails there. Um, this is not a Ruby on Rails class. Um, and so this is how I do primary keys. Ruby on Rails, I, I borrowed this convention from Ruby on Rails, but I don't like the primary key of ID on Ruby on Rails, but other things choose it as well. So now we have this concept of primary key, logical key, and foreign key. And so what we want to do is we want to take our picture and we want to turn it into tables. So we have to add some bookkeeping columns, some columns that are there just for the purpose of bookkeeping, okay? And we have to model these arrows, which means we've got to put a few extra things here and a few extra things here. So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna have to put something in this table extra to model this end of it. We have to put a primary key in every table so that we have something to point to. And then we're gonna have another thing in here that points to here, and then we'll have another column in here that points to there. And so we need to add bookkeeping columns. They're not the data. The data is like rating, length, count, title of the album, etc, 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 title of track. That's the actual data. These keys that we're going to add to these things are just to model the relationships between them. Okay? So if we just take a look at the track belonging to the album, so we have, you know, the track, its title, its rating, its length, and its count, and those are just the data items. And so those things Track becomes the name of the table, and then title, rating, and length, and count sort of become the data items right here. And we're going to mark title as the logical key. Now, it's still a string, and we're just saying, look, we might be looking these rows up by title, so be ready. So, we're, so it's, not, it's still a string. It's nothing particular special. Then what we do is we add, for bookkeeping, a primary key to the track and to the album just so we have a little handle to grab tracks as well. We don't have anything pointing to tracks, but in our application, eventually, we might be more complex and have something pointing at tracks. So we put these little primary keys in just almost automatically. 
And then we have a foreign key because we've got to model this relationship. So we put a, put a column in here and that column ends up being called album ID because it's telling us this is pointing to a row in the album table. And so when my naming convention, that column is named album ID. And so you can see this as a kind of mechanical process where you've got the stuff you want to talk about and then you put them in and then you add a primary key to each of the tables and then you add necessary foreign key columns as necessary at the starting end of these arrows. Okay? So, if we just apply this process over and over and over, we end up with four tables that are, are four objects. They all have primary keys on them. They all have logical keys. Not every table will have a logical key, but for now we've got logical keys for all the tables. And then for each of the arrows, we've got uh, starting points and ending points. So we have the track that it points to both a genre and an album, and then the album points to an artist. So you see it's kind of a very mechanical translation from the picture of logical relationships between the objects that our application is working with and the physical representation, the way we're going to put it in the database, because we have to model these arrows. Okay? Because the database doesn't have the arrows, we just have to say there's a column and that's our way of keeping track of the arrows. So now what we've done is we've created a database model that can be turned into tables. Okay, so now the next thing we're going to do is do SQL to create tables that achieve these kinds of things. And you can go along, there should be a handout that's associated, or you can take the slides and cut and paste some of this SQL to run in your PHP MyAdmin or whatever SQL gadget you've got. So um, you're going to create a database. We'll create a database called music. So you will use these things to make a database, keep it separate from our other databases that we've got running. And, um, and so we're going to run a series of create, uh, create table statements. And we're going to kind of work outward from artist back to track. So we have to establish the leaves of our little picture before we can work our way in. And so we work our way from outside in on these create statements. So we're going to create a table, and this is the same as a create table, but we're going to start using a few more specific things. So we'll say create table artist. Oh, come back. Create table artist. Create table artist and a primary key. Now, what happens is we want the database to manage the primary keys. We are going to tell it to automatically increment and provide it, which means we don't have to put these on insert statements because they will be given to us as they're inserted. If you're running this in code, um, you would insert the statement and then say, what key did I get? And that'd be okay. And so this is, artist has a name, okay? And so all this thing, integer, not null, auto increment, key, is communicating to the database, manage this for us, make it be integers, and keep adding to this number, add one to this number each time we put something in. Then what we do is we create a table called album and it's going to have a primary key, album ID, it's going to have a, a logical key uh, title, and we're going to tell it to index that title using a certain way. Uh, B-tree index is a index that's good for looking up um, entire strings or prefixes of strings as well as sorting. So we might want to sort by title, so we're going to use a B-tree index, okay? So that's how we indicate that it's a logical key. And you can have more than one logical key if you want. And now we also put a foreign key in. So artist ID is the, is, the, is the starting point of one of those arrows, and we call that an integer. Now the other thing that we do is we communicate to MySQL, and this is a place where different databases do things differently. And so this is pretty much MySQL specific syntax, or at least mostly specific syntax, where we're basically adding what's called a constraint, and that says, this is a foreign key constraint. My column artist ID is a reference, a foreign key, to the field artist ID in the table artist. So what's happening here is you're telling the database, telling MySQL, when you're inserting a record, when it's looking for artist ID, when you're putting a number in like two or four or five, it's going to check to see if it exists in this table artist. And if it doesn't exist, it's going to yell at you. It's not going to let you violate the constraint. Now, 
You're like, oh, that's kind of mean. No, you're the one that put the constraint in. So you're putting the constraint in, which tells the database, enforce the rule that I've decided to enforce on myself, right? If you don't want a constraint, well, don't, just don't put that in. But because we want to do this as a foreign key, and we want to do it sort of in a responsible manner, we're basically saying this points at this. And whatever number I put in this artist ID column, insist that there is a corresponding row that's there. Now, this on delete update and on update cascade, on delete cascade, on update cascade. What we're communicating there is if an artist ID row, or if a particular row is deleted from this artist table, it will go through all of the rows in this table and delete all the ones that have the corresponding artist ID. On delete cascade means that a delete in this will cascade into this where the artist ID corresponds. That's a way of ensuring that your database stays clean, and we'll talk more about that later. The same is true on update, which is much more rare, where if there was a row and it had it was number was four and we changed it to be 24, then in here we'd have a Wow, I'm making such a mess here. So if there was a row, something, and there was a bunch of fours down here that were effectively pointing, these are all pointing back, right? So there's an artist ID, and we somehow went into this table and changed that to 24, it would then correspondingly change all these to 24, okay? And so that's what on update cascade means, is if this artist ID number is updated in this table, it is updated in all the corresponding rows in this table. That's a more rare thing. It is less rare to take the row four, 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 there's a bunch of fours here, and a row four here, and if you delete this row, it goes through and cleans up all these rows. That's a, the far more con common thing, and we'll talk about that in a second. So this is all part of the create statement. There is three columns, album ID, title, and artist ID. We've, we've marked album ID as special because it's our primary key. We have indicated that uh, title is a logical key, and that artist ID is a foreign key. And so we're modeling all of that and we're exposing to MySQL. You could ignore both of these things. These are sort of optional. But usually the more you take what you know about your data and hint to MySQL as to how it's going to be used, the smarter things work out for you. Because MySQL is really smart, but if you don't tell it what you're planning on doing, it can't anticipate what you're doing. So if we take this pattern, and we create all these other things, right? We're gonna make a genre, then we're gonna create a track, right? And you got title, rating, and length, we got a primary key, yada, yada. We're gonna have logical key of title, and then we have two foreign key constraints. And we just kind of concatenate these things together. And when we're all done, those things will all be there. And so we fully modeled these four tables. We fully informed MySQL of the foreign keys, right? Okay, so that's cool. So we go through and we create all these tables. We have to create them in the right order because the foreign key constraints assume the table was created earlier, right? So, so if you haven't created the album table and the genre table when you're running this SQL, this SQL will blow up and say, whoa, table doesn't exist. So you got to do them in order and I've got them in an order that will work because I do artist, album, genre, track. As long as you do that in order, they will sort of build and then MySQL will make this web of connections as you're creating them. So you kind of run through all these things and you know here we got a, a artist ID and you can see that it's not allowed to be null, it's auto incremented, yada yada and off we go and it, there's indexes and all the things that you've told it to do are going to start showing up here. So then we do all these things. We got album, artist, genre, then we're going to make the track one. So that's all the track SQL. So we'll make that, and when we're all done, we have our track, right? And uh, the foreign keys are not well shown in uh, this view, but these and this and that are foreign keys, and away you go. Um, they are, MySQL is aware of them and will enforce them on insert statements. Now we're gonna start putting some data in. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna also put data in kind of from the outside in, um, and that's because when we're going to reference the artist Led Zeppelin, we need to know what the number is. And so we're gonna insert into the artist table, uh, Led Zeppelin, right? Insert into artist, name column. What's particularly missing is the primary key, but that's because it's gonna be automatically done by the database. And so the primary key is automatically done by the database. And if you take a look, 
It will insert the two records we've asked, and it will assign an artist ID form, right? So that the artist ID has been assigned, and away you go, okay? <coughs> and, and so now we know this. Now, in the manual work, you sort of have to keep this scribbling like, oh, Led Zeppelin is one and ACDC is two because you, you can't use the word Led Zeppelin anywhere else in this thing, and we're going to make tracks that belong to Led Zeppelin, right? Or albums that belong to Led Zeppelin. Now, in a program, there is a variable. You can basically say, oh, run this insert and give me like an X what that number is. And you can ask the database, what was the number that you just assigned after that insert? But we just have to go look at it because we're doing it in slow motion all by hand. But when programs do it, they like, boop, what was that number? And then they have the number in a variable, then they can put that number in later insert statements, which we're going to do by hand, and we just got to remember that Led Zeppelin is 1 and ACDC is 2. So we're going to start again, we're going to do the genre, we insert that, we end up with rock and metal, and so we now know what the little numbers are for rock and metal. Rock is 1, metal is 2. I never remember what these are. I don't have them written down on a piece of paper. I probably should write them down on a piece of paper. Hang on, let me get a piece of paper here and a pen for myself. So, one is Led Zeppelin, two is ACDC. Then on the genre, one is rock and two is metal. So here's my variables. I got this on a little sheet of paper now. So now I have two tables. I've got my artist and my genre. So we haven't made any foreign keys yet. We haven't made any foreign keys yet. Um, now we're going to insert an album. And if you recall in the album, right, we have a title, artist ID. We still have a primary key. Album ID is the primary key here. Don't worry about that. It's going to be done automatically, right? So albums, we're going to refer to albums too, and so we have to have a primary key. But artist ID is a foreign key in albums because we're in the album table. Album table. Okay, so we have to explicitly insert, because we're the ones that know which artist this album belongs to somewhere in our user interface, right? We've got, oh, then we're going to put something in for ACDC. So in, when we put into album, we've got to insert the title artist ID. We do not have to insert album ID because that's going to be done automatically for us. Then we have to put in the title and the artist ID. But we're not putting in ACDC. We're putting in two because we remembered that ACDC is actually 2. And the same is true when we do Led Zeppelin 4, Artist ID 1. That's ironic. It's not really 4, it's IV, it's a string, right? So Led Zeppelin is 1, and so we remember that. If we were running this in PHP, we would have a variable called dollar last insert or something like that. Okay, so you get the, the point. And, and these end up just being numbers. Now, if you had put 7 in here, it would blow up because it would say, look, I don't have an artist row of seven, and that's part of the constraint. So you have to put in legit numbers that you've put into these other tables. So that's why the order of these things is so important as you're building these relationships. You put the thing in, then you point to it. Then you put this thing in and you point to it, and you're connecting all these little guys together. Kind of fascinating. You gotta get it right. But when it works, it's glorious. Then we got the tricky thing. We gotta put all the tracks in. All right, so we got, uh, let's see, yeah, we got albums. So again, the track ID is the primary key, so we don't have to worry about that. All this stuff, track, title, length, rating, and count, that's just data. And then album ID and genre ID, that's modeling the little arrows, right? And so Black Dog is from album, oh wait, I forgot the album numbers, well, I should have wrote those down, but whatever, you get the point. So this is album two, album two, Album one, album one, it's genre one, genre one, and genre two, genre two. Now, I started by talking, I started talking by saying you're not allowed to, to replicate string data in more than one place. You can rep, we got, but we still got to replicate data because there are more than one track on an album. So we have to put albums in twice. Our, here's a track, here's a track, and it's on the same album. It's totally awesome to rep, replicate numbers because they're efficient. Strings are bad, numbers are good. We went through all these machinations just to get to the point where we're using numbers as proxies for strings. 
So you do all this stuff and now we have relationships. And it's hard to see, but if you carefully did everything, you now can effectively reconstruct these little arrows. These foreign key columns are the starting points of arrows. And then these are the lookups, right? So you can think of, you know, that links to rock, that links to rock, this links to metal, this links to metal. And so we are using these numbers here and here and also here as proxies for those strings. That's what we did. We, we worked really hard to make that happen. So now we have carefully built tables, we've defined the shape of those tables, we've put foreign key columns in the tables, and we've put data in the tables where we work from sort of the outside edge, oops, oops, we work from the outside edges in. So we insert these things, then we have these proxy numbers, and then we use the proxy numbers to represent these, these, uh, these pointer relationships, these, this points to that relationship. And so these little numbers model the pointers. Now we have to reconstruct it, right? We went all this effort to effectively create a highly compressed, highly performant representation of our data, but our user doesn't want to see number one when they see Led Zeppelin. They don't want to say, oh, what does this track belong to? Well, it belongs to artist number one. No, 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 they want to see Led Zeppelin. So we have to reconstruct this all back up. So this is the power, right? The power is we've got this efficient storage model and we've got to work across these foreign keys. We've got to sort of defeat the foreign keys as it were. We've got these numbers, but we don't want the numbers. We want the, we want the actual strings. And this is the join operation. This is part of SQL. Join is an SQL keyword. And there's an on clause that basically says, this is how I want the connection between these two tables to be made. The join says, I want to select from more than one data from multiple tables. And the on clause says, how all that data is going to be connected. Okay, so here is uh, a, a select statement with a join clause. Make sure my pen is working. And so here we want to basically see in our user in interface, we don't want to see that who made who comes from artist two. We want to see that who made comes, comes from ACDC. But it turns out that ACDC and who made two, who made who are in two separate tables. And so we have to reconnect the data. We're not reconnecting it in the database. We're only reconnecting it at the moment we're displaying it to the user. So we're going to retrieve rows. Select is the SQL that lets us retrieve rows. So we have a little different syntax here. We say album.title. That's table name dot field name. I want to see the album title and the artist name. So we're pulling fields from two tables from, that's standard SQL, album joined with artist. Join, the word with isn't there. So now we have two tables. There are two tables, table one, table two, that hold the data. So I want to, to get data from these two tables somehow glued together to create sort of a momentary view that is the data across both tables. And the on clause is an SQL keyword and it basically says when do I want to connect the rows? What, how is the, what's the definition of the corresponding rows? And this is like a, and all we basically say is I'm interested in these virtual rows to happen when the album's artist ID field, which is this field, is equal to the artist's artist ID field. Join these two rows together when that's true. You can join them all and then it'd be all combinations for both tables. You can try this, try this in your system without the on clause and it'll go, you will get four records, you get all combinations. The on clause reduces the combinations to only the ones that match. Okay, so that produces this output. Okay, now, if you want to sort of see a little bit more what's going on, we can change it. And the only thing we're changing in this one is we're adding this little bit right here. We're going to, we're going to look at this column and this column, which are the connector columns, right? So this is the foreign key from one table and the primary key in another table. So we're like, give me the album's title, give me the album's artist ID column, give me the artist artist ID column and the artist name. And the rest of this from album join, that's all the same as before. And so what we see in the output right here is we see these extra three things, these extra two things, which are the connector fields. And you'll see that the only thing we see is when they're equal. And that's how we link up the data in this table with the data in this table for the join. 
So normally we don't show these and we don't see this part right here. We only see the connected up data, but here we can sort of be a little more explicit to see the connected up data and see how the connections are being made. Um, and again, for a good time, uh, run this query by and take this on clause out and see what you see. Okay, see what you see. And so we can do the same kind of thing where we want to connect the genre ID to the genre, right? So we're going to select the track title and the genre name from track joined with the genre table. That means we're getting data from two tables, right? From track and genre. Some would actually just put a comma here, some variants of SQL, but we're not doing that one. They'll just say track comma genre because it's just saying it's really coming out of two tables. The on clause again says, show me the ones where this is the case, where the track genre ID, which is this field, is equal to the genres genre ID. And so again, out comes the information that we are looking for. And it gets get really complex. And this is where how you named your fields and track and tables uh, makes a lot of sense, can make a lot of sense, a lot more sense for you. Um, and it takes a while to type this in, right? But the patterns are real simple. And we're now going to create this output right here, which is effectively the output that we want to create. And note that there's replication. There's string replication because the user wants to see it this way, but we don't want to store it that way. So we're going to select track title, artist name, album title, genre name. Those are the things we want to see. That's part of a select statement. From the track joined with genre, joined with album, joined with artist. We're going to pull data from four tables. And we want to connect the data on clause, when to connect the data. And now we have to connect all of the little foreign keys. So if, if you recall, we had um, three little arrows. And you can this each one of these is one of our arrows. The genre arrow, the arrow between album and track, and then the arrow between artist and album. And then we put ands in between, and, 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 and. So that tells us how to link the tables. You could, you could do this again without the on clause and it'd be interesting. But basically, these get long, but they really are a simple pattern once you're set, once you understand. Um, I tend to start with uh, the thing I want and then I kind of go in the order, but the order really doesn't matter. Because all you're really saying is this is the superset of all, all the tables I'm interested in. And so I, have, um, I draw them in order, kind of starting from the most central thing and then moving out. Because I think of it as looking up things in those other tables. But you can put them in any order. The order is not essential. And so we went through all this process to create our user interface that had a bunch of replication in it. In the middle, there is a data model that doesn't have representation. So we stick it all in and we use join to uh, pull it back out. And we've done this and the value of all of this, of course, is not that it's easy. And if it were easy, we would just put it in a flat file separated by commas and use split or something. But that's what makes it perform. Now, the one thing in addition that we mentioned, if you go all the way back to when we created the tables, was the concept of on delete cascade. Okay. And so here we have um, the arrow that we originally were drawing this way because we were thinking of looking up the genre in the genre table. But you can think of this as sort of the parent row and a child row. And the key thing is if we are to delete this row using a statement like this, if we're to delete this row, that would break these references. When we say on delete cascade, what we're really saying is when you delete from a table, where there are references back to that table for the particular row or rows that you deleted, wipe out those child rows. So it's cascading, cascading a delete, cascading to the corresponding rows where it matches. That's why it's called on delete cascade. And there might be many, many tables. It just so if you deleted a artist, it would delete all the albums for the artist, then it would delete all the tracks for the albums, right? And so the cascade tells MySQL to keep our references clean. Now we don't delete that often and there's other tricks, but on delete cascade is a very, very nice thing to do 
to make sure that you don't end up with broken links so your joins keep working. And so after on delete cascade, it would wipe out those two rows and there would only be those two rows left. There's a number of choices that you can have in on delete cascade. Uh, you can uh, restrict, don't allow changes that break constraints, which means you can't delete that parent row. Cascade, which is what I just talked about, which means it adjusts the child rows. And set null means that you sort of empty out, you change the two to like null, which is not exactly zero, it's the, the lack of a value in SQL. So we've been talking about one-to-many relationships uh, for a while as a relational. There is one more sort of core representation that we have to figure it out uh, and talk about. That's many-to-many -many relationships. And uh, there's lots of situations in this world where these arise. Uh, the one we'll talk about is from a data model from some open source software that I write. Matter of fact, it's the software I write that I use to uh, host my web applications for everybody website called SUMI. And it has to deal with different courses and people in those courses. And um, so we'll have, uh, we'll see these kinds of connector uh, tables. The thing that we've been doing up till now is what's called a one-to-many. And that is when we have an arrow, they're, they're, when you look at those things, they'll often put some kind of annotation. And so this is like zero or one, and this is many. And so this, this, there can be many tracks for one album, many uh, in other, you know, many albums for one artist. And so there's this, this end is a zero or a one situation where there's one row here, but many rows. So you can have many foreign keys. That's the duplicates, right? So you can have one, 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 one. This is the many in the track table, and that points to exactly one key in the album table. You know, and so, and so that is reasonable. Here is this duplication, right? We get this duplication, one, 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 and there is one there. And so, actually, I probably should have this arrow going the other way. This is the many side, and sometimes they'll draw it this way. So if you have a, a mother with many children, there is one on one side and many on the other side. And so, so this is another one of those natural relationships that, um, that, that, that we have to uh, represent, right? Um, that's, that's a normal kind of thing. And that's what we've been representing to, up till now. But, and frankly, if you've been playing along, you know, artist mapping to albums, well, that's really a many-to-many -many relationship. And we kind of oversimplified it so that we could make it here. Um, but like books and authors or artists and albums, there really is what's called a many-to-many -many relationship. And the simplest way to think about this is there's kind of an infinite number on both ends, meaning that any number there can an author can be part of any number of books, and a book can be written by any number of authors. And there is no way with a single table. So if we're going the way we've been doing it, you can't take one table pointing to another table. And so we end up with this table in the middle, and we call it a junction table, or a join table, or a many-to-many -many table. And we basically break this many-to-many -many relationships into two many-to-ones. And so this is a one, and this is a many, and this is a many, and this is a one. And so by having a many-to-many, -many, we have a way to do this, and then we allow duplication. We don't allow duplication so, um, you know, author one can be part of book one, author one can be part of book two, author two can be part of book three, author two can be part of book five. What we don't do allow is duplication like one one. So we actually make a uniqueness constraint typically on these tables. So, but you can certainly, so that's, that's not allowed, but we can certainly have duplication in these columns. We can have duplication in these columns. But what we do is we make the primary key in effect be the combination of those two columns. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But the key... The key concept here is that we need to add another table, right? We need to add another table. We can't do it with just two tables. We have our books table. And these books is classic because it has a primary key, an ID field, a primary key, and away you go. And so this is what it looks like, right? We, we sort of draw a logical diagram that has this many-to-many -many on both sides. Um, and then we make this uh, table in the middle. And it doesn't have a primary key. It's rare to put... A primary key in here. What we do is we make the primary key, the, our uniqueness constraint and primary key be the combination. So we can have duplication in user ID, we can have duplication in course ID, but we can't have duplication of the combination of user ID and course ID. 
And so that becomes the primary key. It's like a composite primary key. Another important thing is, is sometimes we actually model a little bit of data at the connection point. Uh, in this case, we have a series of courses and a series of people, and we could have a role. So this role could indicate whether or not this relationship, it's not about the course, it's not about the person, it's about this membership that they have. Is that membership a student membership or a teacher membership? And so you can sometimes, but you don't model anything about the user, don't model it, you only about the relationship, this connection, because there's many, many connections. So let's take a look at some code that we're going to play with now. Uh, we're going to create our user table. By now, I hope this is relatively straightforward. We got a primary key, yada, yada, yada. We got some uniqueness constraints for email and and, and away we go. So we set those two up. Those are no different than if we were doing a one to many. The interesting part now is what we do in the membership table. And so we we certainly create a foreign key and we don't put a uniqueness constraint on that because there, we allow duplication in the user ID column and the course ID column. We do mark them as foreign keys using the normal thing. We say the user ID points to the ID, the user ID column in the, in the user table, et cetera, et cetera. So we put these two things in, that's helpful, with our on update clauses, of course. And then what we say is we say the primary key is the, con the what we're saying here is the combination, the primary key is the combination of user ID and course ID. And that adds a uniqueness constraint as well. It says, okay, we're, we're not gonna allow one one to be in this more than one row. Okay, so that's the picture of the tables that we build. It's really, it's not that different. It's just like we got two foreign keys going in no direct, in opposite directions and no primary keys. And we change, we don't have a primary key, but the primary key is a combination of the two keys. So that's good. So to fill this data up, we will uh, insert the data into the courses, right? Insert users into courses. Again, we don't put the primary key in. We have, don't have to because it's auto increment. And we'll do these these statements, and um, we'll get we'll get the primary keys now associated with these people. So that's just filling that data in and taking a look at it. And then what we have to do is create the connections. And so these connections are are all numbers because they're two foreign keys and a role. And so if we take a look now, we've got, we're going to insert into this member table, the user ID, the course ID, and then the role. These are the column names. And then the values here are course one, user one, I mean, user one, course one as instructor, user two, course one as student, user three, course one. And so this is where we're allowing duplication, but we're not allowing the duplication of those combinations. So user one is in course two, user two is in course two as the instructor, user two is in course three as the instructor, and three, three. So we got lots of duplication vertically, but we, and uh, in either of these columns, but we have no duplication vertically for the combination because the primary key of that table is the combination of those two values. And, you know, it's, it's really not all that complex once you get used to it. It's just really two foreign keys kind of pointing in opposite directions uh, in this memberships table. And when we get done with this, the membership table is just a bunch of numbers that captures it. And we don't have neither of those two things. Neither of these two things are the primary key. No, that's a foreign key. That's a foreign key, right? They're pointing away. Um, and then we modeled the role here. So that's the data that we end up with. These tables are very efficient because it's all numbers. It's three three numbers in this case. I hope there's sometimes you put a bunch of more data there, but uh, in general, you just put three numbers or a couple of numbers there. And they're very fast to scan, very fast to join against, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so once we have this, the join is pretty straightforward. The thing you think about as you're joining is in the one to many, you would join from this to this, and then you get like the genre names. But what we, we have to do here is we kind of join through the table. So if we're going to connect the users and the courses, we have to go user membership course. So we're joining through the table. We're using it to pull these records together to connect them because it's a connector. And so the join is pretty straightforward. Select username, member role, course title. That's the inf information we want. And we're actually pulling something out of this middle table. We're pulling this role, role column out. We're gonna, so we're gonna sort of join through from the user, joined through, I say, member join with course. And so, and then the on clauses are just the modeling of the connection, which is connecting the user ID and the course ID, right? User ID and course ID are connecting. And so it's just a simple on clause. 
member user ID is equal users user ID, member course ID equals course ID. The obvious connection, if you name the fields the way I suggest you name them, you're all good. <clears throat> and then I'm just going to order order these things by the, the uh, course title and the member role sending so that the, the teachers come first. We're going to, it'll do it mostly by course title, then it'll do second by role, and then within role it'll do it by um, username, username ascending. And so that way I get, that that's my little trick there to get the teachers to show up first in each class. So there's the PHP class, there's the Python class, and the SQL class, and you see all those memberships. And again, this is simple. <laughs> if you figured out everything we've done uh, so far, uh, it's not that hard. And so if you take a look at uh, my uh, this database, uh, you'll see in a nice data modeling um, thing where we see here, and each of these data modeling has a different way of doing this. This is a one relationship. They, it, it could be a zero or one. It may or may not be there, but in this case, it's going to be a one relationship. And this is a many relationship. That's a, an infinity or a many relationship. So if you model this table in some kind of an SQL modeling environment, it will see all the things that we've done. And in effect, what we built is a, a many to many relationship between these two tables. I'm not a very good artist. Okay, so. And if you take a look at the data that I data model, you can see that my data model has a too many to ones because it has a many to many relationship. It's a many to many relationship between users and context. Context is my word for course because um, it could be groups or could be sites or whatever. And then there's two foreign keys and you sort of see that and away you go and we get that many to many relationship. So this is really common. I, you know, I do a lot of work in educational technology, so it's not surprising that I use users in courses. So to wrap this uh, series of uh, lectures up, uh, databases are really important. And um, you might think that this is a trade-off and that you can say, you know what, boy, that's a lot of stuff. I don't want to do it. What you find is it doesn't take very long before your data gets so large that you can't do things, especially with online applications, you can't do things in a quarter of a second by reading data. If you just have one file to read and it's small, that's fine. But if you've got to read through and discard a bunch of information, reading flat files doesn't, uh, discarding information is really slow. Whereas databases leave these, by the time you've done all this indexing and primary keying and all that uniqueness, it's left trail. So it knows how to get to stuff super fast in ways that you don't understand. So in summary, it allows us to scale to reasonable and very large amounts of data. It means it's the way to build online applications. There's no real other good way to store it. Um, things like NoSQL, which you might hear of, um, they're good for some things, but the kind of shapes of data that we're doing, NoSQL actually is weak at. NoSQL is better for lots of documents with relatively low, low amounts of structure and links between the documents. And so we have to make a really strict contract. We build a, a really strong schema. And you know the schema decides what we show and don't show. And um, by giving a rich contract, we really can make it so the database can highly optimize using techniques that we can't even imagine to make this stuff go fast. And so you've learned a bunch about database design, but I will tell you that you can always learn more. And what I really enjoyed in my own career was the time at which I knew enough to talk to people who were smarter than me. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do here is get you to the point where you can be in a room and then sort of be amazed when you realize, oh, wait a sec, I learned something really cool uh, about databases because I understood the basic language of it. And now I'm listening to someone who is super awesome and way smarter than me. So. Hope you find it useful. Cheers. Hello and welcome to our lecture on HTML, the hypertext markup language. So we're going to place this in the context of our, of our request response cycle and sort of here's us in the request response cycle in our browser and what we're seeing. We make a click, it goes across the network to the web server, runs some code, maybe talks to a database, formats up some new stuff and we get the response, then HTML comes out and then that's parsed to make the DOM and that we, what we see is the document object model. And, um, and we're going to ignore most of that in this lecture. We are really only going to talk about this part here, and that is what this response is. It's HTML, and it is parsed, and it's read through, and it's used to construct the document object model, which then shows what we see. And so HTML is just a technique of 
using some special characters less than and greater than to add tags to indicate what we want to see, like the paragraph tag. Um, the paragraph tag, that's a paragraph tag. Strong tag makes things bold. Emphasize tag and a paragraph tag. And so we have these tags and we just mark up. We're communicating meaning. Um, if you're old enough to remember, uh, word processors used to have ways to look at the actual codes that were being stored in the word processor file. So the web is, the HTML and hypertext transport protocol and all that stuff is a relatively recent invention and we're doing so many cool things with it that it's continuously evolving and really, you know, we're, we're, we're less than, you know, we're in a 20 years old and so this it's a it, but it's we're doing so much with it it's continuously evolving so HTML and CSS uh, are really kind of at the edge looking back in the early days if we take a look at what HTML was really intended to do it worked on a next computer in the early 1990s um, and so this is the next browser which came from CERN and it had everything in a new window images were not shown in line um, and then there was the NCSA Mosaic browser, which was the first browser that was universally available on Unix, Windows, and Macintosh. And you see things like uh, gray background and blue links and highlighted links that it, you visited in purple. And so it, in the early days, it was nothing like what we see today. You know, in the early days, we were just amazed and happy that we could see a link and you'd click a link and something would happen. Um, but today money is to be made based on making stuff super beautiful and the number of pixels and how things line up and how things are shoved over and how navigation looks. And so today we need to create beautiful web pages, whereas in the old days we were just amazed to have web pages that worked in the first place. And of course computers have gotten much faster capable of handling video and images. And back in the old days images were costly, both for network bandwidth and for the time it took your computer to display them. And so now that just affected how uh, we did it. And it's kind of fun to use the Wayback Machine, otherwise known as the Internet Archive, uh, to go back and look at some of these older web pages uh, and realize that it's still amazing that a lot of them pretty much work. And in the good old days, uh, HTML was kind of a uh, wild west. The browsers did not want to show broken HTML as broken HTML, and so they compensated for it. And so in the old days, we had things like uh, tags that could be uppercase. We would have a paragraph tag that didn't finish. We would have uh, li tags that didn't finish. Um, we would have attributes that didn't even have double quotes in them. So there was all kinds of stuff. And literally, you can take this bad page and you could put it into a web browser and it will still display. So, so HTML, while it technically is a very precise language and you can make syntax errors, Browsers are extremely flexible in terms of parsing it. Now, you're not going to get predictable results. The browsers can go into what's called quirks mode. And so in order to create the standards environment that we have today, Tim Berners-Lee, one of the original founders of the World Wide Web, uh, helped found an organization called the World Wide Web Consortium, or the W3C. And it really decided that instead of just letting people write a browser and having HTML be defined by the browser, Instead, they would write a spec for what HTML was, and then multiple vendors could produce the, uh, the browsers. And it took, took a while um, for this to become successful, but uh, there was a need for every vendor to build a web browser, and so they, would, they worked with the World Wide Web Consortium in like the, the mid and late 90s, 95, 96, well, 94 through 98, 99, the World Wide Web Consortium created a lot of wonderful standards around the World Wide Web. Now, once we started having rules, then we tend to want to follow those rules. And so tags need to be lowercase. Um, attributes like this image source equals you have to have double quotes around them. You have to have open tags and closed tags, uh, open tags and closed tags. And so there's, there's a set of rules, and now we are much more precise about our HTML. And we try to write it as precise as we can so that we get the best performance and the best sort of rendering out of the browsers that we can possibly get. Because if you don't write precise HTML, then the browsers are going to make decisions as to how to render things. Whereas if you write precise HTML, then you really are in control of how the browser lays things out. So up next, we're going to talk about HTML itself, look at some HTML documents, and, uh, and take a look at the syntax of HTML. 
Welcome back. So let's talk about some of the basic syntax of HTML. The first thing is to look at the overall uh, document layout. And um, they start with an HTML tag. You might have a thing called a doc type up here. And we, we can put in one if we like. But HTML is the outer tag. And then there is a head tag and an end head tag. And this is sort of non-printing information. We set styling up. We declare the title of a page, perhaps load some JavaScript. And then the printable page of the con uh, content is in between a body tag. And mostly what we're going to talk about is the stuff that we put in um, as page content. So you'll find that there are special file names that uh, we use. Uh, it really has to do with the fact that what we do is we make a directory within the web server. And um, when we go visit the directory, the web server looks through a series of files that it's configured to look to. Things like index.html, index.htm, or index.php. And each one has a slightly different order and a slightly different set of things. It might even be called default.htm or default.asp if you're on a Windows box. Um, it is configurable, so different systems do things differently, but usually index.htm is probably the safest thing unless you're doing PHP, which we will be doing later in index.php. Um, and so those are usually the safe bet. Now, when you're viewing things off of disk, which we can do, if you download all the code that I've got in html.zip, then you'll have to open the index.html um, by hand. So we can put multiple files in the same directory, and then we can use them in what are called relative links. And so we can create easily create links between one file and another. And so you'll tend to see, if you look at the zip file, that you've got a whole bunch of files in the same directory. And with little anchor tags, they point back and forth between each one. And so, like I said, you got tags like the paragraph tag, the strong tag, and the emphasize tag. They have to start, they have to stop. But another thing that's really important about uh, HTML is the fact that most of the time we are logically marking up the text. And so we're saying we want this stuff right here to be a paragraph. But the end of the lines that we put in the HTML that we write are not really that important. What happens is, is depending on the width of the browser, if you change the width of the browser, the text will be rewrapped. Re and that's because there's still a paragraph, but we don't want to hard code it because we're not working on paper. Sometimes browsers are really large. Sometimes browsers are really small. Sometimes you're on a phone, right? And on a phone, browser's really small. And so you don't want to tell exactly how many pixels it is wide, except when you start doing really fancy layout. But in things like paragraphs, you just say, hey, make it a paragraph and rewrap it. And that also, the rewrapping then also changes how, how tall the pages are because the narrower pages, it kind of extends the page down. But the white space inside of the HTML is really generally ignored, um, and the lines are generally ignored. There are some tags, like the pre-tag, that changes that, so white space is, is respected and new lines are respected. But most of the time, we just let the browser uh, rewrap things, and it's good. You have beginning tags and ending tags. So here's a beginning tag, and then here's the ending tag. The slash is our indication of an ending, and they're paired. And they're also nested. So this P tag has a strong tag within it and an M tag within it. And that's totally OK, because this whole thing is a paragraph, and this is a piece of bold text. So they have beginning and end, and slash is the end. You can also have uh, self-closing tags, that have like an image tag that has like a slash, and that means that you don't have to have a, like a slash image over here. That's the same. You just put a slash here, and it self-closes. Um, another thing that you will get used to is the fact that you can put on the opening tag uh, attributes, so key value pairs. And the, it, you'll go define what the, you go read the documentation on the image tag, and it'll say, oh, put a source attribute on to say what picture, what file we want to display as the picture. The image tag is to show pictures, basically. So given that less than and greater than and other things are special characters, we have to have a way to print the special characters. So how do we print a special character? Well, we use ampersand LT semicolon, and there's a whole list of these things, HTML special characters. And you can look them up. And you don't, there's some that are kind of fun, like the, the special characters for the, de the deck of the cards. There's mathematical special characters. And you go look these up and you can find them. The key thing is you don't, you know, they're, they're cute. And you'll see that I'll use some of these arrows in the things that I'm doing. Um, but the key ones that you really need to know about are less than, greater than, and ampersand. And just 
because ampersand becomes a special character. Less than, greater than, or ampersand are really the special characters in HTML. And, uh, and so to represent less than, you do ampersand LT, ampersand GT, and ampersand ampersand AMP semicolon to get those things right. HTML comments, like in any programming language, any situation, uh, the start of an HTML comment is less, less than exclamation dash dash. It's a little clunky, but we just want to make sure it's really clear. And so dash dash less than uh, comments can go across many lines if that's what you want to do. So that works as well. Links is a critical element of HTML. It's uh, why search engines work. It's why, you know, when we were first, when I first saw it, I'm like, I click on a thing and there's a new page. Isn't that amazing, right? And so hyperlinks is the H in HTML. It's the H in HTTP. Um, and so it is, it is how we, in effect, use this thing that we're sort of just scribbling on to create knowledge that Google then can extract. And so the anchor tag, the A tag, is the tag that we use to, uh, to, to do these things. And so, um, you know, there's a header one, a paragraph, and the anchor tag has, this is the start tag, and this is the end tag. And so the text that's clickable is second page, and you can see that it's clickable right there. It is styled with a uh, underline and blue to indicate that it's a link. And, um, and so there's the href which stands for hypertext reference, and then it's an attribute, so it's key value with double quotes, and then this is another URL. And so that's like, in effect, putting that URL up and going into that next page, so it's a hotspot. Um, in the early days, and I'll show you a few of these, these links were like the coolest thing ever, and so we made them pretty colors, like the blue with the uh, dash. People didn't sort of when they first saw the web, they didn't know to click places, so we sort of dialed them quite brightly. And then because you were often scanning and searching the whole web, because the web wasn't so big in the beginning, we would mark them as purple after you'd been to it. So you could sort of slowly but surely work your way through the whole internet as it existed back in the old days and keep track of the ones so you didn't have to go back to the ones that you'd seen, uh, seen before. And that was an absolute link, and here's, a, here's one with a relative link, and that assumes that we are now in the same folder, same directory on the server, uh, where we have a href, and so here's the start tag, here's the end tag, and then first page is the clickable stuff. And you'll note that that is a purple link because I have already been there, because page one.htm was exactly where I just came from. And so you click on that, and then you can go back and forth, and those are the pages we played with uh, in the HTTP lecture. And so these absolute references are references that start with, you know, HTTP or HTTPS or whatever, and relative references don't. And so that basically means that this page one.htm file has to be in the same folder as whatever file we happen to be viewing right now on the same server. So if you want to switch folders or switch servers, you have to use absolute references. And if you are just moving between files on the same server, you can use relative references. Images are a big, are a lot of fun. Uh, in CSS, we'll see how to wrap text. One of my favorite things was to wrap text. There is an image tag, which we saw before. Image, and then the source equals is the attribute, and then in quotes, the name of the file. And, you know, it can either be uh, an image that's all by itself. In this case, it's this paragraph is what we're seeing. And you can see that this image is a tiny image, but it's sort of like Blah, 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 blah. The image right here works kind of like a character. You've got to be careful because the images can be really big. That's why I made a tiny image. And you could even, for example, in this case, I have an anchor tag. And the, the clickable part of the anchor tag is an image. So if you click right there, that will move you to um, lists.htm. And so you can make an image be a hypertext reference as well. Now we're going to do much more with these things. And this is just, at this point, the basics. Uh, lists are an important part of HTML. There's ordered lists and unordered lists. Um, and so the unordered list starts with the UL tag and ends with a UL tag. And then that sort of bounds the whole list. And then each list element starts with an LI, list item, and slash LI. 
And I want a little bit of spacing. If you don't put this, them in paragraphs, you don't quite get the default spacing. This blank line is really coming from the paragraphs. So I'm putting a list of paragraphs, basically. It doesn't have to be a list of paragraphs. You could make a little denser list with uh, a list of links or something, but I'm putting paragraphs in. Um, and so you can see that I have li to end li, li to end li. I'm putting some links in here, etc., etc. And so dot, 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 and it puts all the bullets in. It does the indenting automatically. We'll see in a bit how we can control all that formatting and do different things if we want to do those different things. But for now, we're just going to uh, play with the default formatting and learn the HTML which is our way of representing that we want a list on the screen, but we're not so fancy about exactly how it's supposed to look. So in HTML, we really are looking for the meaning of the page, not how pretty it is. Tables. Tables uh, have a bit of a checkered past. Uh, in the early days, uh, people tended to use tables to lay pages out on grids. Um, and they would just put, you know, a paragraph here and a paragraph here and then a paragraph underneath it, and they would move them to move them around, and they would put images in some of the table cells. And that's, that turned out to be really bad, and that notion of tables as graphic layout uh, is long gone, and we use CSS now, which is the next lecture. So, But tables were always a good idea for tabular data, and so if you have something that sort of makes sense, is like a list of cars with a, some make, model, and mileage columns and a list, then you mark them up. And so the table markup is pretty straightforward. We start a table with a table tag. And then we have a series of rows using the tr tag, tr to slash tr. And then if there's a header line, which can be formatted a little bit different, um, you know, we do a th to slash th. And then this basically says it's going to be a three column table because we have three table headers, one, two, three. And then we're going to put tds for the data. td stands for data, one, two, three. And so that's the Ford edge and then the mileage of that and on and on and on and on as, as we go. And so it's not hard to build them. You kind of have to keep track of how many of these things you've got. And there are tricks where you can make a table that has like four things, but then in one row this expands so that that's, I can't erase it, <laughs> can't erase it. So there are ways to do things where a, col a data element spans more than one column, uh, call span for example, but it's, we, the key to tables is that we use them for tables. We don't use them for arranging things that are not themselves row, 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 row. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to record some exploration of some sample code at um, www.webapplicationsforeverybody.com slash code slash html. And I really am intending that you will uh, these are very simple pages, but the idea is to look at them in developer mode and take a look at them and then you can see how the various things work. And, uh, and you can also then look at the source code and see, oh, here's how a pre-tag works. Um, or where's the pre-tag? No. Um, yeah. So we look at the source code, take a look at things, and um, and show that the line wrapping does not actually matter. We look at pre-tag in another one. So I'll record some walkthroughs of all this sample code, and but I encourage you to take a look at it because it has a lot of good examples of the basics of HTML. And so HTML is a continually evolving thing. It's a very creative space. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we have to be really tempted. Uh, we have to avoid the temptation of trying to make everything look pretty in the HTML, but instead delegate that to the CSS, which is what we're going to talk about next. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. In this screencast, we are going to play with some of the sample code and you can either download it and play with it on your own computer or you can look at it in your text editor or if you just want to browse it, you can browse it here um, and take a look at the version that I'm using. It's really been intended that you look at this in the developer tools um, and so you can do things like say inspect element and so here we are. We're going to this will also be a little more valuable even when we're doing CSS, but you can see the document object model. Now the interesting thing here is it shows something I'm always talking about is the difference between the document object model and the source code. So this is the document object model. It's kind of stylized. If you look at the source code, you have to say view page source. And so the source code, this is literally exactly what's in the file. If you go look at this file at a text editor, you will see this. And if you're looking at it here, it doesn't quite look exactly the same. And 
some things have been done a little bit differently. You know, they kind of got this extra stuff. And this is kind of after the browser has looked at it. And we start talking about JavaScript and changing some of this dynamically. You'll see this part is the document object model, but the source never changes. The source is what was originally downloaded when the server sent this back to us. So let's take a, a basic look at this. I'll, uh, I'll hide this unless I need it. Um, I'll go back and forth between the source. So we have a basic document, HTML with a head tag and a body, and then a header. And of course, here's our header. Uh, we're using default styling and paragraphs are an important part of things. I, you know, you don't, you can squeeze this up as much as you want. White space sort of doesn't matter, right? So this white space kind of doesn't matter here. Um, you know, the fact that this has got extra space, it doesn't much matter. Um, and, and so you can see an anchor to a strong tag that leads to a boldness. Now let's just go ahead and look at it here in the inspect. We'll go down here we'll find like a strong tag that's the bold we got an emphasize tag and if you look a little farther you'll see there is the anchor tag which is the whole anchor tag is this whole tag from the a to the to the slash a list.htm that's where we're going to go if we click on this text right here and so you can see now this is a relative link and it turns it into an absolute link and that's because the browser knows where we're at, and so it sort of prefixes everything up to um, that to the relative link. But that's nice because if we look in folders, we will see that these folders are all here. Um, here, let me go find you that folder. It's uh, pretty deep in my. Later, this will all make wonderful sense to you. They do a lot of stuff with web. Code. HTML. Okay, so here we have, after all that, here we have um, the files, right? And so this is index.htm, and index.htm is right there, and list.htm. And so if I click here, I'll go to list.htm, and that'll pull this other file up. And so these guys are all in... The same folder together it just means that I can use relative links to go moving between them. A tag that's really becomes more important especially as uh, when we're talking about uh, writing code inside HTML and showing people code is the pre-tag and so the pre-tag um, and you can I'll just say inspect to hop right down to where the pre-tag is. The pre-tag respects uh, spaces so all these spaces happen the new lines happen and it also shows it in monospace font. Now you can change all these things uh, once we get to CSS, but uh, pre-tag when we're printing debug out from, not, not in files like this, but uh, when running code, sometimes it's good to print debugging out in, uh, in pre-tags. So let's go to the next page. And so here's a whole series of things we're gonna play with. Um, this is a Uh, uh, unnumbered list. This whole thing is an unnumbered list from top to bottom. So when I highlight this, you see the whole beginning to end of the list. Then each item in the list has a start and end li tag, right? Down, down, down. You know, so here, here's this. We should learn about tables. And there's a href. There's another relative link. And so this is sort of my jumping off page to get to all of the all those other things, right? Learn about tables, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can see these. Um, we probably use just to take a look at the source code of this page. And so that's that's the source code that I typed in. And you can see the li tags, the p tags. I'm putting p's inside of li's to get space. Let's see if I can sort of show you that. So if you look at this, and you look at the li tag. Um, the li tag is that, and the paragraph is what actually creates the vertical and horizontal space, right? So that orange that you're seeing, that's paragraph, there's space that the paragraph tag has preset. Um, so that's how I do that, uh, putting paragraphs and hrefs. And so that's what this all looks like. So let's take a look at special characters. And so this is an interesting thing because it's not really what came out because less than requires ampersand LT, but it's kind of processing that. 
So let's take a look at the source code to this one because that'll be more instru instructive. So ampersand LT, ampersand GT, ampersand amp. This is an ampersand in HTML and then just the letters AMP semicolon. Semicolon is not special. There are only really three truly special characters, less than, greater than, and ampersand. Um, and you can put all kinds of fun stuff, clubs, hearts, and diamonds. And so you got the clubs, hearts, and diamonds, some arrows, stuff like that. What's nice is browsers just have these built in, although they're not necessarily the uh, sexiest or coolest things. Um, and I think what happens when I go back on this link is I go back to the list. So that's just special characters. And you'll notice that the default styling that says we've seen this one, and this is how the web worked a thousand years now, back in the 90s, is you sort of, oh, it's kind of nice that it's turning purple. And you'll notice that Google does this as well when you're doing Google searches. It actually lets the links change color after you visited them. Um, so let's take a look about links. We look at links. We, um, I'll view the source of this guy. Absolute link, a href, right? And then slash a, this is the clickable text, right? Between the beginning tag and the ending tag. The attributes are on the beginning tag. Um, another attribute that you can add, and I do it all the time, is target equals blank. And that basically is the way we say, open this up in a new tab. So you'll notice pop up in a new tab. And so that's where that one goes when it pops up. And so you can decide whether or not you want this to go in the same page back or in a new page. And then I gotta close the tab to get back. And now I'll go back because that's just a relative link to list.htm so I can go back and look at the next thing. Let's take a look at how images are represented. So um, So this is just a paragraph that has an image in it, right? So it's a paragraph, but that there's the image. Source equals medium.jpg. If you look in my folder, if you look in my folder, um, you see the image right there, medium.png. You don't see the suffix because Mac is trying to hide it from me. Um, and so that's just, you see the space here and here. Um, the image doesn't have any space. We could add some with CSS later, but the paragraph is what's adding that space. Then we have um, just a regular old paragraph. Not supposed to use a center tag. We'll get to the how to center stuff. So that's what that is saying right there. Um, and you can have an image that's right in the middle. So you see where that image is. I think of images, if they're right in the middle of text, they're like a giant character. And so that's, that's how that works. Um, and you can even sort of stick an image as the thing inside of a link. So here's the anchor tag. It's that bit right there. And then the anchor tag body is an image. And so if I click on that, it's going to go back to list.htm. You'll notice these all go back to list.htm so I can work on the next thing, right? Tables. Again, you're not supposed to use tables for laying out like blocks of text, which we used to do. We used to do things like use tables to draw borders around things, which we'll see in CSS. But now that's totally verboten. And you're supposed to look at tables in a way that they're you know nice and pretty. So let's do a view source here. So let's see, there's our table, our slash table, and a table row. Now let's take a look at the DOM. So apparently I didn't put a T body. We're supposed to put a T body in there and I didn't do it, but this is the DOM, the DOM put it in. That's put in by the parsing. And so clearly I made a little mistake in my HTML because I didn't put a T body tag. And so that was added by the browser as it was parsing and reading through this, like, oh, we forgot his T body. So it just like slapped one in for me. And I think the mistake is this is my header row. And I think that should be like a T head. So there I go, bad HTML, it's the story of my life. And then I've got the rows, and you'll notice that um, the DOM is kind of prettier. So sometimes I do this, the DOM is indented nicely. So this isn't really the source code. This is the data that represents this visual, right? It is the thing that you're seeing, um, but it is it read this from the file or from the server parsed it and produced the document object model. I only say that like a million times. 
Okay, so back we go to the list. We're making pretty good time. Um, so here's some really bad HTML. I'm going to view source on it. And again, you'll see sort of the difference between the document object model. When you're debugging these things, you will have to sometimes view source. Sometimes document object model will be the only way to debug it. And sometimes view source. So this is the one that's got bad stuff, like h1 is uppercase. This paragraph tag is not um, terminated. This ul tag is uppercase. This li is not terminated. I don't have double quotes here. So there's a series of mistakes that I've made in this HTML, but it looks pretty good. And you'll notice in the document object model, it's fixed all that. Now each one is lowercase. The p tag is finished. There are double quotes, meaning the document object model is not just your HTML source code. It's like the sensible parsed pretty version of the HTML source code, you know, and so, you know, this UL tag, these LI tags are now done. The UL is lowercase. Everything's lowercase. So it's like, I'll take care of your mess. I'll, I'll, I'll patch up and fix your HTML and then I'll display it for me and make sense of it. So the document object model is not the same. It is sort of like a sweet, awesome, better version of it. But this is what changes that. So let me just show you something, how I can change the document object model. Let's see. Let me see if I can change this text. I change the document object model. That changes. So I'm actually, but that didn't change the source code here, the source that it was retrieved to produce it. But I can change the document object model. And later in the class, we will write code that will actually change the document object model. So we'll change this. We'll call this be going to lists yet again. So I can change the document object model. Doop. So you see it changed it. So when we change the document object model, what we see in the browser changes, but the source doesn't change. Did I say that enough times? So let's click on this and go back to lists. Okay, so some HTML can be broken so badly so that it doesn't render at all. Whoops, that didn't work so well. I will, um, I'll do a view source on it. And then I will let you figure out why this doesn't work, why this doesn't show. You take a look at the source, you figure it out. Uh, I hope this has been uh, helpful to you. Uh, see you on the net. Hello everybody and welcome to our lecture on cascading style sheets, CSS. Of course, this follows right on the heels of our HTML lecture. Um, and it, there, I'm going to use a bunch of examples from webapplicationsforeverybody.com, uh, and you can just bring these up in your browser. Uh, it, I love to con place everything that we talk about in the context of the request response cycle, because that's the whole web applications for everybody. Uh, you, co of course, are out here. You do a click. It sends a request, a HTTP request, maybe runs some PHP, maybe talks to a database, gets some stuff back send some stuff back. This is the request response cycle right here. And the thing that comes back is HTML. And then that is parsed, put into the document object model. And the thing that you then see, the pixels you see on your screen are from the document object model. And so that's what we've been doing so far. And, and so far in that HTML lecture, we just talked about this, what the format was when you parse the response. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about, in addition to that, we're going to go and pull another file, a CSS file, CSS, and that is going to inform the document object model, and it's going to change how things look out here. And so, you know, it will, we'll have some CSS in the HTML, but we'll also have some CSS in separate files that make separate request response cycles. But so we're going to be putting files like our HTM files in here and our CSS files in here. So we're going to be serving them a little bit. But mostly what we're worried about is sort of the, the, the form, how to make the DOM look pretty. And that's sort of what CSS is all about. Um, really, we're coming up pretty soon to talking about, you know, PHP and what we do in the server. And we already did talk about SQL, even though we haven't yet connected all these dots. So we're coming close. We're going to get there. So <clears throat> in addition, I would like you to install... Um, this thing called Web Developer from Chris Pedrick. Uh, Chris Pedrick has been doing this a long time uh, before there were even developer consoles in browsers. Um, and it, it's funny that the developer consoles don't do what this does. And it, 
I don't use all of its features, but the, it has some wonderful features for CSS, in particular turning on and off various styles. And so it's a, a great way to sort of dig through CSS issues in addition to the Web Developer Console. And you can do a lot of sort of fine debugging, but there's some real nice stuff with Web Developer. It's just a plug-in for your, for your Safari or your Chrome or your uh, Mozilla browser or whatever. So please install that. Um, I recommend it. And uh, some of the assignments actually uh, require it. So, so like like I said in the HTML lecture, the HTML started out with we were just uh, amazed in 1995 when we could see a page with a gray background and blue links, and it was lists, long lists of links, and the links turned purple, and we would click on a link, and another page would come up, and we were like, holy mackerel, this is the future, right? And, and we were so happy. And, and it, it, you know, it, it, our curiosity was peaked. We did interesting things. But, you know, in the 10, 15, almost 20 years since all that, um, it's become a business. And in business, the look and feel for the average non-nerd user um, they don't care that there's a request response cycle. They just want to do a thing, talk to their friends or look up information or whatever. And so uh, it, it, the CSS is in the middle of this time frame that the ability to precisely lay things out and make pages beautiful uh, became super important for the web to take its, its sort of leap into commercial dumb. So if you look at the Yahoo web page, for example, um, this is just a screenshot I took a while back. They do studies as to how much white space is in between those two pieces. And they'll add a pixel and take away a pixel and they'll see how their revenue goes. And so these user experiences, these visual looks and feels are highly tuned and highly sort of taken care of. And so CSS needed to be able to precisely have a pixel perfect layout in every browser. And so CSS is a very, very precise thing. HTML has become precise, but we don't want to do our markup and layout in HTML. I showed you tables previously, and in really early versions of HTML, we used tables to, to create look and feel, and that was never good. So one of the things you can do with the Chris Pedrick uh, Web Developer plugin is you can show a page without CSS. And, and what you should expect when you see a page without CSS is it's, it's sort of beautiful even without CSS. It's beautiful in a, in a logical and a structure. And so here's, here's my web applications for everybody website, right? It's got some cool stuff. It's got these little things that go over there. It's got the little border. The color's gray here and it's a little lighter gray and this wraps around and it looks really awesome, right? Well, turn CSS off and you should still see a page that you could effectively navigate. It's like going back in time to a simpler time of, okay, I want to see this. This is really a list of links at the end of the day. And there you go. It's a list of links. And the default is I've already clicked on lessons. So lessons is purple now. And here's this video. And, and if you scroll up and down on this, I mean, it's really fun to go to a website and, you know, turn CSS off and see how good their HTML developers are and how pretty it is. And so it's supposed to be pretty in a simple way. And what's nice about this is it really leads to good accessibility, meaning some people do not see the graphics, they hear the page read to them. And this way, this is how it's read. And the simpler and more beautiful and elegant your HTML is, the easier it is for a person who doesn't has reduced visual a person who has reduced visual ability to understand your site. And that is, I remember the joy of hearing from people who were using the web and gopher in the early days, um, how they all of a sudden could go anywhere and see anything and do anything in a way that uh, that visually impaired people could never do for like hundreds of thousands of years. And it's joyful. And then what happened was, is we ended up with this really nasty markup. And then it, they're like, it was like the web was simple and they loved it. And then the web became ugly and nasty and HTML became nasty. And they're like, the world is horrible because now you go to all these cool websites, but I can't go to these cool websites because I'm visually impaired. And now we're back. We're back to that. We're back to beautiful HTML, simple HTML, and then beautiful web pages and CSS is the matter. Okay. I think I've done enough advertising for CSS and accessibility and beautiful HTML. So ultimately, if you look at how this thing is assembled in your browser, there is an HTML page that is 
uh, request, you know, pulled down. And then there is CSS, sort of both inside the document. Sometimes there's CSS in the document. If you look at this, not that it matters, there's a little bit of CSS in that document. And then a whole bunch of other CSS that brings all the beauty to this. Sometimes it even takes some JavaScript and whatever. And so we understand that the HTML does not have the beauty in it. The beauty comes from the CSS. And that is part of what we try to do is learn CSS. So if you're gonna be like a coder and you're not gonna be a graphic designer, you still need to know enough CSS so that you don't write horrible HTML, so that you know what a really good CSS developer is capable of doing on your behalf. And on large projects, including like Sakai, Sakai Project, which is an open source learning management system, um, this allows separation of concerns. And you can have people that specialize in the back end and the HTML, and then a web designer can, the, the web designer, so if you think of the developer usually, there's a back end, and then they generate, from the back end, they generate the HTML, and then the designer will build the CSS. The designer will often have skill enough to sort of tweak the, the uh, HTML if the developer built bad HTML. So they kind of meet in the middle of the HTML with the developer mostly being responsible for building the, um, the back end developer. And then the front end designer can then uh, you know, tweak the HTML a little and then tweak the CSS. And so this, the HTML is where the back end developer and the front end developer uh, come together. But it means that you can, um, it, it means that you can have uh, lots of people working and you can develop highly, highly specialized skill sets in larger projects. Uh, I know that my skill set is in this side. I am not skilled in this side, right? I can clunk my way through CSS and everything that you'll see is my CSS. And you'd be like, whoa, that's not very good. And if it even looks pretty of mine, I'd probably use Bootstrap and I cheated and found a CSS framework and I didn't build it, I just did it. Now there are people who are smart enough to build Bootstrap. That's, and they're, they can build such gorgeous websites. And my job is to build beautiful HTML that then they can add CSS to and make it super gorgeous. So the CSS basic syntax is different than HTML, right? HTML is less than and greater than. CSS has curly braces. I don't really know who invented the first. I should find that out and go videotape that person. But it has curly braces and semicolons, so it kind of looks like a little bit of C. Um, and it's really a set of rules. And it's not sequential, the, although the order does matter. Um, because what comes later has more importance than what comes earlier in CSS. But it's not like code that gets run. Um, and so the, uh, the anatomy of a CSS rule is that there is some kind of a selector. And in this case, the simplest selector is the, is the tag that we want to affect. We want to affect the body tag. Now, there's only one body tag, but you could have a P for a P tag and say, I would like to do this to all P tags. And so it, it's implicit, kind of like SQL, in that a body tag means for all body tags. It's, there's an implicit loop for the whole document. And we'll see how to reduce that later to it so it's not always the whole document. But for now, a tag means every, it, a, a tag there by itself means every tag in this document. And then there's a series of rules. And, um, and so, so this is really when to apply. This is sort of what thing, what aspect, and there's a whole list of aspects that you can have, and then what you want to do. I want to make the font size 100%, I want to use Arial, and then say in serif, etc, etc, etc. Holy mackerel, my little, my little pen is undoing itself. And so then these end in a semicolon, and you can have a bunch of these, right? You can have just one, you can have more, but that's the basic idea, is a CSS rule is go find a part of this document and paint it I like to think of this as like, go find a thing and then run a paintbrush over top of it that is this paintbrush. That is the paintbrush that you go select a piece of the document and then paint it yellow or paint it bold or whatever. That's kind of how I think about it. Now, I, I'll admit I am just, the, <laughs> I'm the really a very weak CSS developer and I need a cheat sheet. And if I'm gonna do CSS, having this, even a single page cheat sheet is super helpful for me just because I don't use it all the time. And, um, and so uh, there, the, the attributes like background color and the border dash bottom, you know, it, it, for me, they're all very self-explanatory. They're really easy to understand. Or if you don't understand them, you just Google and you go stack overflow. But like for me, I'm like, is it border bottom or bottom border? 
I just can't remember that stuff. And so I just have to have a cheat sheet whenever I, whenever I work. And this is, this is one cheat sheet that I happen to, happen to like. And these are the kind of properties that we're going to be playing with. Uh, color, the background color, how to align it vertically, how to align it horizontally, padding, which is space on the sides, etc., etc., etc. So there's just tons of CSS properties. And there's tons of great documentation on each of these CSS properties with little samples all over the place. And I have my own samples as well that I'll do some recordings and show you, walk you through like line by line on my sample code as well. But this is the kind of stuff that we're going to play with in CSS. So up next we're going to talk about how we connect CSS and HTML together. So welcome back. Now we're going to talk about how you use CSS within HTML, how you take these CSS rules and apply them to the various parts of HTML. And there are three basic ways that we do this. One is we take an HTML tag and use the style attribute and just put those little CSS key value, you know, CSS settings right there, very close. The other thing is you can put it in the background of the HTML document, usually in the head area. And the other probably most common thing, especially when the styles get large, is an external style sheet that's a separately loaded file with a separate request response cycle. So we'll start with sort of the the simplest but sort of least used of these things. And that is, like I said, you can put a style attribute on any tag. And you say any attribute, you know, you say it's got a double quote and a bunch of stuff and another double quote. And in there is a series of CSS rules that are basically CSS setting like border style colon and then the border style setting that you want. And so in here I'm saying I would like a solid border, I would like it red, and I'd like it to be five pixels. And that effectively determines how that particular uh, thing gets painted, right? Um, in this particular one, I said font family monospace for that particular paragraph. So this paragraph is painted with a font family monospace. And so you can just put these things here. I put on the body tag, I want an Arial sans serif font. So the whole body is not Times New Roman, except for the fact that this particular one is monospace. And so this is these two tags are rendering opinions about what the font's supposed to be. But because this one is closer, the monospace wins here, but the Arial wins everywhere else because none of these other tags render an opinion. And so that's kind of the cascading bit, meaning the closer it is, the more priority that it has. Unless, of course, they put important up here. And important is something we'll talk about later. Um, it's a You can make the farther away override the local, but it's, it's not something you want to use too much. If you're using important, that's a trouble. But don't worry about important right now. Just imagine cascading means the closer, the higher priority. Closer to the tag this, the statement of CSS is, then the higher priority that it is. So another place that you can put the CSS is right there in the header, right? So instead of putting it on a tag, we can use a style tag in the header. And so here we have um, the header of the document, right? The head, the body starts down here. And up here, we're going to set a set of rules. And now we're using the thing where we have to say which thing a tag it goes to. So now I can say the body tag, even though there's only one body tag. We want a font family Arial Sans Serif. And because they're all inheriting from the body tag, then all the paragraphs inherit from this and the headers inherit, etc., etc. So it's like body on down in this particular case. The header one, which is this, is blue. And paragraphs are supposed to have a solid border, red, five pixels. And so border style, border color, etc. And that means that each of the two paragraphs here are away you go. And I'm going to dig into the anchor tag. And here's my little anchor tag. And I'm telling the anchor tag that I would like to have a green font. And I would like no underline. The default is to underline them. If you look at uh, links, they're always underlined. I'm overriding that. And then I want the background color of that text to be light gray. And so this is a set of rules. All that HTML is down here lower down and there are no style tag. There are no style attributes on the tags because we have basically said for all paragraph tags, for all anchor tags, for all h1 tags, and for all body tags, and we put it up here in the top of the document. Now the problem is is lots of most websites have multiple pages and this gets really frustrating after a while. So you really want to pull some of those widely used or repeated things out into a file and include them. And all we do is take pretty much that same set of CSS rules and we put them into a file. And in this case, we'll put them in the same file, same directory, same folder as the, the HTML. Although it, you can put the, you can pull these things off of a website if you want. So HTTP colon slash slash or whatever. But you put a link in here and tell it's a CSS 
and it's going to be a style sheet, and then you give it an href, which is then going to pull this file in and sort of expand it as if it were right there in the middle of a style tag. And so it knows it's a CSS and it pulls it in. So that's how you change your HTML. So now if we take a look at the next example, we see that in this next example, we've got a link, right? And down here, we've got no style. Uh, ignore this little thing. That's how we're putting this little, uh, don't ignore that page. But in the real stuff here, you know, we've got this, we've taken our, uh, you know, we got our uh, pre-tag, we've moved it in, we've got some things here, we've got the, we got all that stuff that we've done, right? And, and if you look, here is that rules.css file. Rules has all that same stuff, h1, border color, a tag, all that stuff that we put in the head now is sitting in this rules file and we're just pulling it in right here in one fell swoop and it accomplishes the exact same thing, okay? And so this, including in a separate file, is by far a superior way to do it than putting it in the head tag. So, but sometimes you have to like change two things and you put them in the head tag and it's up, you know, you use all three of these ultimately, um, but generally you tend to start with a large amount of CSS in a file and then you tweak in the head and you might tweak on a tag here and there. And that, that's kind of how these three things tend to work together. And the whole cascading thing works out well. You, you can put the link first and then style tag second and then it kind of overrides some of the stuff that are in the linked. And then you can have something on a tag which overrides the stuff that's in the head. Unless, of course, it says important. So, as the world went from hacking look and feel in HTML to, you know, finely tuning look and feel in CSS, all these tags, paragraph, h1, body, they all had default styles that had kind of evolved and links and all that stuff that evolved. And a lot of pages de depended on those default styles working. And so they couldn't say, Welcome to CSS, and now all the styles, a paragraph that's unstyled will look terrible. Not that they look great. And so what ha we, we, we couldn't take the paragraph tag, they, everything had a style, that's the problem. All the existing tags had a something on them. So they had to make new tags, and the new tags that they made are the span and the div tags. The key to the span and the div tags is span is an inline tag that has no styling associated with it, no default styling. It is defined as having no styling, and the div tag is a tag that has no styling associated with it, but it's a block tag. And so we sort of use these to sort of mark text, but don't inherit, without inheriting any styling from some long ago 1993-94 defaults. Um, and so the span tag is, span tag here, that's kind of broke over line, the span tag has no styling except that styling which you add. In this case, I'm adding it with a style attribute. And the same thing is true for a div tag, right? The div tag, um, and, and also divs can be within divs. So this is a nested div, right? There's an outer div and an inner div. And basically you know that styling, um, the div has no style whatsoever, right? The span has no style whatsoever. So if you just put something in a span tag and you don't do any, you don't, you don't sort of render an opinion about what it looks like, the, di the span doesn't change it. It just is, it inherits from whatever else is there. And so if we take a look at this, right? So <clears throat> here we have a, 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 a P tag with a green border, one pixel border solid. Now, the interesting thing is you, you say, well, did the paragraph tag have styling? It turns out it does. It has some, some uh, margin in padding to make it look better, right? And so the paragraph tag is not an unstyled tag. It is expected to, to create blank space around itself. Um, and so, yeah, we got, so, so the paragraph tag has a default style. It's supposed to have a default style. But then if you look at the div tags that we've got here, like this div tag, this, this div tag, remember, goes all the way down to here. This div tag, I, I just put a blue, blue around so you kind of know what's going on, right? So this blue goes from here to here. But you can see right away that the div tags have no padding or margin or side of little white space to make them look prettier. And that's okay, you've got to do that. You've got to add the padding and the white space. They just start with nothing. It's just a block, right? And the span tag, this one here, changed it green because we put a style color equals green right there. And okay, so we did that. Um, <clears throat> and the div tag, and you'll notice, interestingly, these 
because the, the divs I'm using end up with a one pixel border as their style, meaning they started with nothing, you can even see that if you look really close, it's impossible, but you can zoom in. This orange border, the blue border takes up space and then the orange border's on inside of it and that's one pixel wide. So we're, I'm adding to these through the style attribute, I'm adding CSS to them, but they start with absolutely nothing and they kind of look ugly when you just like put something in a div, it's like right next to each other because they didn't want anything. Um, and again, they're nested and there's reasons because we'll use divs to say, this is the main body and then there's divs within the main body and then this is the navigation, this is the footer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have uh, divs are ways to describe blocks without adding CSS styling by default and then and it's as such letting you define all the CSS for these things. So these are cool. They're like the non-tags, the untags, the tags that don't cause anything to happen but let you cause everything to happen. So they're really important. <coughs> they're really important. So the next thing I want to talk about is making a sort of finer selection of which tags that you want to apply a rule to, right? A rule to. And so if we look at this tag right here, this is the body tag, and that basically says, I want everything from body to slash body, then everything inherits. So unless it's overridden, I want Arial Sans Serif to happen, okay? And I can do that with a paragraph tag, but I want to show you this other thing. So there is a way to mark a tag. Let's find this one. Where's first? First right there. So there's this ID attribute. An ID attribute is an attribute that was added kind of specifically for CSS as well. Um, and so the, you can only mark one tag per document with an ID. And then there's this class tag and you can mark as many doc tags as you want in the document with a class tag. And the, and the idea is, is like ID tags are for chunks like main page, like left navigation, top navigation or something that's only going to appear once on the page. And so if you want to sort, in effect, in effect, what pound sign first means is look through the whole document, find a tag. Where's div ID equals first? Where's that stop? Div, 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 right there, right there. Find the tag that's got an ID of first and then paint it with those rules. The class can happen more than once, once but more space, let's see, class is more space here, that's there, and so that basically says, let's change uh, clear and change color here, more space says look through all the document and find all the class, there's that, that paragraph, ooh, do I not close that paragraph, oops, mistake on my HTML, um, here, yeah, so, so that basically says change the margin left, that means shove this in, and change the margin right and shove it in, so we'll see all these things and loud and then you can also see a situation where when you put classes on you can have more than one and so this basically will respond both to the shout and to the loud class okay so let's take a look at what this page looks like so here we go it's a little busy so if we take a look at first it grabs this tag here the div tag is first right and then if we look at like more space, this more space is affecting this one and it's shoving it in both on the left and the right and that's because it's this paragraph more space. Okay, uh, shout, let's find the shout ones. Well, we can see them right here. They're all the loud ones. So that is red, no, that's shout and loud. Oh, here's one that's shout. Oh, entire has been shouted and all has been shouted. So you'll notice these guys are lowercase but shout is a text transform to uppercase. So you can even change the case of things. Um, and then in the, like in third, for example, where's third at? Third says for, within, so this says find the third div, which is right there, and find all the P tags within the third div, this P tag and this P tag, and then apply a background color yellow to all those, which leads to this right here, okay? And so pound sign means find ID and apply, dot means find class and apply. You can have multiple classes, right? Pull in the, the definitions from two classes, shout space load, go find the sh whatever's in CSS. Um, 
And then you can kind of have hierarchical things and we'll, this is quite useful because you can just, you don't have to get special. It saves you putting classes on, um, it saves you from putting classes on all the paragraph tags here. You don't have to do anything, but you don't, you're not affecting the paragraph tags outside here. You're only affecting the paragraph. I think of this as go find third and the paragraph tags within third and then do something to them and that way otherwise you'd be making more classes than you need to be and so it's it, it this is a very uh well liked technique for really fine tuning your selection your selector for css to touch only the things that you want to touch so up next we'll talk about images and colors and fonts and a few a uh, few other things so welcome back. Now we're going to talk about some making our stuff look a little prettier with images and how we can play with images, colors, and fonts. So uh, CSS and images are a lot of fun. Uh, we, we can fool around with them. We can move them around. Actually, this for me uh, years ago was the thing that in 1994 that made me fall in, uh, in love with the World Wide Web. So what made me fall in love with the World Wide Web was the ability to take a picture of me, and I love pictures of me, and then I float it to the right, and then I put a little border around here. And so that's what I've done with CSS. So let's take a look at how I've done that. So if you look, if you look in line here, uh, the navigation, which I'm, I only sh I'll show you in when I go through the code walk through how the navigation works. But at this point, at the end of the navigation is right here. And I put this image in. So if you were to watch this inline, the image is right there. But what I do is, when I say float, that actually, and there's other things that we'll see when we start looking at fixed and absolute positions, you can pull it out of the regular stream. And so this is like pulled out of here. It's as if it didn't exist. And it floats to the right, but then it's vertically aligned. So the next thing you see is this header one. This, this header one, CS, I mean, oh, there's a typo there. I gotta fix that. So I'll pretend that that was an H1 there, but that's okay. So this header at quirks mode, I should run this all through uh, the validator to make sure I'm okay. But okay, so the, the top box of this CSS and image is H1 is right here. And then this floats over, but then it top aligns. Now you can change this alignment if you like, but it top aligns here. And then it actually looks at the width, in this case, the width of the picture, but you can also control the width up here in the CSS. And then it carves out this space, and then I do a margin of one M. And so on M, so uh, uh, it, it, you, you sort of sometimes wish they would put default formatting on, but then they kind of tend not to put default formatting on because if they did, then you have to turn that off. And so I wanted some white space, and so I had to put some white space around it. And so I said, I'd like a margin of one M. And so that puts a little bit of space here and here and actually here as well. So you see that this lines up over there. And then that talks about what is a one M. So one M, you, I could have said five pixels, five PX, and that would have been fine. But one M is basically the width of the letter M, roughly. It's, it's sort of, it is a width that changes with the size and nature of the font. I think of it as the width of an M, and I think that might be a soft definition of it, but I don't think it's a precise definition of it. But that's what I did. So float right, hoist it, and sends it over here, and then shoves this over so that this text is now, this, it reserves this space so the text is, uh, is wrapped, basically, and then um, and then I held out some space just for prettiness, right? And so that's like CSS is making it look pretty. Um, now, what happens here is I, sometimes you want to basically force, after this float has happened, something back to the left margin. And there's this clear equals all that says clear any floats is what it's really saying. And, and so it means that even though this, if it wasn't for clear equals all, this next paragraph would have been kind of up in here. And then maybe it would have wrapped if it was long enough. And when you play with this, you can resize it and see how the wrapping changes. But no matter what the size is, after the BR clear equals all, this is going to format back to the left, the left nav. Right? So that clears that hanging wrap, that, that sort of... But you don't have to. You could just you could not do this, and then it would wrap and wrap and wrap, and then it would get longer and it would continue on. But if you want control over that, you can with the BR clear equals all. Um, and of course... You can have images right in line, and this was this is just from the HTML bit here. Um, there's nothing fancy CSS here. Images kind of are like big characters. 
I sized that one so it sort of fit nicely and you could even make this a clickable link. But that's really just, this part here is just HTML, not CSS. But I could have, if I wanted to, change the width and the height of this. That'd be kind of fun. Make this guy be like the width of an M and then you'd see it more like a character. So there's a bunch of colors and um, the colors have to do with, uh, there's uh, the simple thing for us simple folks. You know, we just put in things like red and green and stuff like that. And especially if you're doing a developer and you're just trying to get basic stuff working, I often use colors in my testing that like put the border red. I do that all the time to say, where was that div at anyway? So I'll throw a one pixel border around it, red border. Like, oh, that's where it is. Although the Chris Pedrick plugin has a thing where it puts one pixel borders around everything for you automatically. But whatever, these are not necessarily most uh, graphically beautiful colors, even though I like them because they're super primary in terms of primary colors and strong. Uh, and you'll see that I kind of use those colors in my slides a lot um, because I'm, I'm not a graphic artist, of course. I just like, oh, the greenest I can be is good. Um, so there's 16 official colors and, and they're here. Um, once you get a little more sophisticated, you can use precise colors from uh, like a, I think this is a, I don't know, 32 bit. Yeah. So this uh, precise colors are the ones that start with pound sign. And so pound sign, and these are hexadecimal numbers. This is, these two numbers are effectively zero through 255, but they're in hex. So hex is like A, B, C, D, E, F are actually numbers. 0 through 9, this is actually 10, 11, 12, 13, this is 15. And so E is bigger than 9, and F is bigger than E. But basically these are 0 through 256, that's a three, three tuple of 0 through 256 numbers. And so the more red you put in, the higher this is, the more green you put in, the higher that is, and the more uh, blue you put in, the higher that is. So RGB, red, green, blue. And if you're playing with like a slider inside your UI, you might be changing this, but you're just changing these numbers ultimately. And so you, you can um, find these things. Um, you know, so uh, white is all Fs. And uh, so if you turn it all on, it's white. If you turn it all off, it's black. The absence color is black, red, green. So you turn, that's max, max, and max. And so you can make sort of a pure red, pure green, and pure blue. Picking these advanced colors is sort of way beyond my ability as a graphic artist. And people will pick colors. There are sites that help you pick palettes for your pages, etc., etc., etc. There is also a, uh, it, sometimes these colors can have a transparency and there's a fourth set of two numbers that have to do with the, how transparent the color might be. Um, so fonts are also important. Uh, the default font is a Times Roman because that's what computers had in 1994. And I think it's they're ugly, especially on screens. They're not so bad on print, but they're ugly on screens. Um, and so I tend to want a sans serif font. I'm, it's too bad that they, and maybe they have changed in some browser default for sans serif. I just change it to sans serif all the time I want. Now, if you look at fonts, the font family is kind of a special tag in that um, you ask it a set of fonts. And what you're really doing is you're setting a priority. And the problem is, is depending on whether you're on Windows or Mac or which version of Windows or which browser or what fonts they've had installed, um, you can, you know, fonts might not be there. And so what you basically do is you basically say, okay, I would like this. I think this is a Microsoft font. And if that font's not there, then I would like this font. And I think that might be a also a Microsoft font. And if that font's not there, then there's Arial. See how much I know about graphic arts? I have no idea. I think this might be a Mac font. And if that font doesn't work, default into the fallback font sans serif. And there is always going to be a serif font, Times New Roman-like, sans serif, Arial-like, monospace, which is courier-like, cursive and fantasy, which are whatever. Um, and so all browsers are supposed to have those fallback fonts. And so you tend to see them here at the very end. And so when you see me, I usually will say Arial Sans Serif or something like that just to get Sans Serif. Although it's quite common, the more sophisticated a page is, the more likely. And the other thing that's that's increasingly the case is people are downloading fonts and having special beautiful web fonts. And then they download them and then they put that font in here, but then they probably still have fallback fonts. So font family is 
<clears throat> kind of a, a weird and unique and uh, glorious thing that leads to some really gorgeous web pages because so much graphic and arts work is going into making web pages beautiful and we're going way beyond the, the operating system installed fonts and having pages that download their own fonts. Things that you can do is set the things to bold, italic, text, text decoration. Remember, links have underlines and we can turn them on or off. Um, uh, font sizes are kind of troublesome in that you can you can set them to pixels, but then you're in danger if you get to a certain kind of a screen size or people start zooming the screen and stuff. And so you can tend to use these relative ones, but they're not as guaranteed they're not as guaranteed as you might like them to be. Um, and so just th these are a little bit tricky. Uh, absolute font sizes are a little bit dangerous. Um, I tend to just go like, here's my font. Here's the one that's a little larger, here's a little smaller if I need that. So most of the time I'm tending to do things that are like smaller. If I'm putting like a copyright statement and I don't want to distract from the main page, I'll just make it a little small. You know, I'll say, okay, make this, make this small or extra small. And you know, what if it doesn't turn out to be that much smaller? It doesn't matter. I'm just kind of trying to do. So I'm not an expert in how to use those. I tend to use them as simply as I possibly can because they're not as predictable as it would be nice that they were. So links uh, were in a big part of the early web and the it's called hypertext markup language, hypertext transport layer, hypertext, hypertext, hypertext. And so links got really special treatment. They used to be uh, blue before you clicked on them and purple after you clicked on them. The blue was to jump out at you and say, please click me. And the purple was to say, I've been there because a lot of what you did in the early web is you wandered from place to place to place to places like, oh, I found a new thing. Let me explore this. And so you're always like exploring by clicking links. Once we got to the point where people assumed the web, these links didn't need to be blue and garish colors to teach us these things because people just clicked on everything. And so it became more important to make things pretty. So we have a lot of control uh, as to how we style links. We can we can, we, get, we can say the A tag, we, we've already colored an A tag with just the A at the top. You can basically say an unvisited link is supposed to have the color black. After the visit, it's supposed to be gray. While you're hovering over top of it, it's supposed to have text decoration in none and be black, uh, white with a background of navy. And then active is not so heavily used. It's once you've clicked on the link while the page is loaded. So it's a way to kind of you know, maybe disable it or turn it a color so people think, oh, I better wait until this next page loads. And so when I do the recording, you'll see this. It's a lot easier to see this uh, dynamically. And so there's a whole bunch more samples that I have, and I'll record some walkthroughs of every single one of the samples. And so you can take a look at that at uh, Web Applications for Everybody or in the recordings. So this has been a zoom through CSS. Uh, you know, CSS is quite the art and science, and it's evolutionary. I mean, people are specialized in this. They're very good at it. It's a modern form of graphic arts. The basics are there, and I think every programmer who does anything on the web should know the basics of HTML. Uh, you know, they keep moving things better with things like nav tags and, and bootstrap, etc. cetera. Um, and, and while there will always be like edgy new things in CSS, and so sometimes you'll see CSS with like these moz, fields, which are for Mozilla, for the Firefox, but people are always pushing that boundary. And before you couldn't put rounded corners on things, but then the browsers added extensions to put rounded corners on things. And then everybody kind of agreed on that. So CSS is kind of always going to get better and better and better because for the mobile and desktop, they really want to create as beautiful experience as possible and use standards wherever possible. And so it's, uh, it's a, it, the basics are there. You can do so many wonderful things, especially if you pull in a, uh, something like a bootstrap uh, that just kind of cleans up the rough edges of HTML and makes it generally pretty and takes a lot of responsibility off of you. Um, but you can certainly make a lifetime study of CSS if you like. So I hope you found this useful. I will see you on the net. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. We are taking a look today at cascading style sheets. You can download the source code and unzip it on your computer if you like, or you can browse this code and um, just play with it in the browser because it's all static content. Uh, so it's just as easy to play with it in the browser. And of course, uh, we're going to want to take a look at this in the developer console. Um, it just makes a lot more sense to get into this. And so you uh, 
And so here we go. <coughs> We're taking a look at CSS. Uh, there's a couple of ways to do this. We, uh, we can see here, we can see the, the style attribute. Style color equals blue. And, um, and there's all kinds of various uh, CSS parameters. Color is the parameter and blue is one of the values. And you've got to look all these things up. One of the nice things that we can see is uh, we can see over here as we move between uh, elements in the document object model, we can see what the CSS values are. And so Arial Sans, like for example, this is cascading. The body on here is Arial, um, Arial or Sans Serif, and that means an Arial font. If we can get it, Sans Serif is a fallback font. And so that this H1, this little bit right here, this H1 is being colored. This it's color. This is ours. <clears throat> Browsers have their own default, so display block, font size, two em, which is twice as big as the rest of the font, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so those this came from the browser, and then this came from the style sheet. So these is this is cascading, um, and the bottom ones here are. are I mean, the, the, this is the most important one because this is the one we said that's closest, and that's how the cascading works. You saw that. You already saw that. And then the cascading is again, we take a look at this this little guy here, right here. And so the closest one is we want a monospace font family, but the body said the font family is Arial and Sans Serif, but this one has been overridden, and we can kind of see that, and that's why this particular text is monospace. Another thing we can do is we put border style. Now, when I'm working with this stuff, I tend to remember border a lot because it's a good way for you to, to mark something out and say, what am I doing here? And we'll see like when we're moving text around border, uh, solid border, a red border, and a five pixel border. And so that's what we see. And you can also see that um, there's some extra padding around there as well, or, or some extra margin. Um, and margin top, that's another one. I'll scroll this up a bit. Margin top throws five M's of space uh, above the above the text. And so this is a normal paragraph. We've got five extra M's. Now what's an M? M is the height of a character in the current font. And so M's is a really convenient measure. There's M's and pixels and, and percent. So, so margin before that's one M over here. The paragraph already has an M. Um, uh, mar uh, margin before, uh, and then, well, hang on, come down here. Down to here, we've, we've added the margin top. So this margin top overrode the, the margin top that was part of the um, part of the paragraph tag automatically. So, so that's these style rules. So let's keep on going. Uh, it, it, while this is technically possible, this would really be overwhelming to put a, a style on every tag. And so one of the things we tend to do is we want to put uh, style rules that are generic. So we'll say we would like the body tag, and this is a style rule. This is the selector body and then font family. And again, font family works as please give me the Arial font. And if, if that's not available, give me sans serif font. Curly brace, curly brace, H1 tags. When go through the whole document and paint H1 tags blue, go through the whole document, whole document, find every paragraph tag, set the border style to solid, border color to red, five pixels. So you see that every paragraph, and we're going to change our anchor tags to have green and have no text decoration because they're defaulted by to have, um, they're default to have underscore, and we're going to make the background color light gray. Why? Just so we see it. So you can see that particular thing up there. And the, then if you look down into the, the text here, we have paragraph tags and, and an anchor tag and no style equals down here. So what we've done uh, ignore that little part there. That's what puts this little thing in the corner. So that's not what we're talking about. Um, we put no style tags whatsoever, and we put all the style tags up here. But now we've also done something that all the paragraphs have to have the same style, which sometimes is what you want, and sometimes it's not what you want. Now what happens again now, if you have multiple pages, as we have here, it gets a little tiresome to put this text in every page. And so what's really common instead so now we have the same basic rough paragraph stuff here. Nothing in here. We have a pre-tag, of course. Uh, we have a paragraph tag. There's, there's no style equals on these things. But up in the head, we have one line right here that basically says, let's take a look at this style sheet. And um, if we were to look at the style sheet dot CSS, it is in the same folder. 
rules.css. It's in the same folder as that HTM file. And it's exactly the stuff we had there. It's just a set of, of selectors and then a select of key values. What we want color blue, border style, border color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so it really is the same as what we, what we showed before, um, except now that we have, a, we, ha we have to put this into every file and you'll see we'll put this now from now on in every one that I'm looking at. Um, and so, but now our problem is, is that we've done something with this to do all the headers, right? All H1s, all paragraphs, but we need uh, better ways to mark text. And so, um, <clears throat> and so we have these tags and these tags that, uh, we use just to put handles on. Um, and, um, in, in the old days, like this paragraph tag has this border, see that, that has the, the margin up there. Um, I mean, it has, has the border, but it has uh, this 1M margin. That's, that's that space that you're seeing that makes paragraphs look good. I mean, it's not a bad thing. Um, and so if, so if you look at that, uh, we have all this, the, these colors, we've got the strong tag. Um, by default, the thing used a serif font. I don't like that. Um, so let's get down to here and this, well, let's just look at it here. The span tag inspect element right there. Okay. So the first thing is, is the span tag is an inline tag that has no styling. The problem is, is before CSS, which is a long time ago, all these tags had default styling, but the span tag is an inline tag with absolutely no styling whatsoever. And then the div tag is a tag that a block tag that has no styling whatsoever, and it can be nested. So it's kind of like a paragraph tag, but with, it has no styling whatsoever. Now I've added a one pixel style, and you'll see that these div tags don't have any extra space, like the paragraph tags came with space. Now some people would go and turn off the space on a paragraph tag, and there's even CSS files that you can to to take all the styling default styling off tags. Um, but you'll notice these divs don't have any space. They're, they're really kind of a block. Uh, when I put these pixel on, you see the border. If you look really close, you'll see that there's a blue, a one pixel blue line and a one pixel uh, orange or Sienna line right there. Um, but the divs can be nested and um, they don't themselves start. So you'll notice that here, they don't start with any kind of uh, formatting that comes from the browser. Whereas if we look at paragraphs, there is formatting that comes from the browser. And so the div tag are, and um, the div tag and, and span tag are just our, our ways to put handles around blocks of text or chunks of text and then style those. But then we still have to figure out how to style, how to grab our handles and make it so that our styling doesn't just um, touch one thing. And so here I've got uh, a couple of things. I've got the body tag and I'm setting font family. You'll see me do this all the time. And now I have uh, a pound sign. And this says, go find all the tags name body. This says, go find all the tags with a attribute of first, ID equals first, ID equals second, and then class and shout. So if we take a look at the text, there is the notion of an ID tag. Okay, an ID tag that can is unique within the document. So we're gonna call this div first. We're going to call this div second and this div third, and they correspond to first, second, and third. Okay, and so you know, first is uh, <clears throat> first is monospace. What is it? First is monospace. Second is uh, green. So everything that's in this block that second has been green. Um, and then, so, but you can only have one ID name first. But class you can have all over the place. So we can have. We can put the more space class on a couple of different tags. So uh, this tag, more space, all more space does is uh, shove it in from the left and the right, uh, margin left and margin right. So it's kind of pushes this in. And so you can put this on here, you can put it in another place. And so the more space pulls in uh, something here. Um, so here's another paragraph that's got more space. That one has more space. This one has more space. See that one? And so you can put more space on as many times as you like. And then, you know, div third. Right. 
And so the hierarchical section means, in this case, this here, this one's a little bit, and loud is red, so where's loud at? So let's inspect that one. Inspect element. Yeah, so that's a, and this, the loud is not only red, but it's also forced uppercase, text transform to uppercase. Um, shouting and loud, and you can have more than one class on, <coughs> on a tag, and then you can be even more precise with your selection. This is basically, this says, find an, a third ID and then only paragraphs within that tag third make their background color yellow. And so that means that background color yellow does not apply to this tag, it doesn't apply to any, uh, this paragraph, doesn't apply to this two paragraph, but when you see div ID third, we have selected this paragraph and this paragraph, and they have a background color of yellow. So continuing on, let's take a look at a simple navigation bar. Now, there's this nav tag that's an HTML5 thing. And if you look at most navigation on pages, let's, let's go to the next one. They're pretty and they got colors and they move around and stuff. But what we don't, we want to be careful when we build our uh, HTML for these kinds of things to make them very, very simple. And so what I've got is a, a navigation is usually we describe it. We use a nav tag, which is a block tag that says, hey, this is our navigation, uh, useful for screen readers, etc. And then we're going to say we're going to have we're going to have two, a list of two, two links. And so that's what we're doing. Unsigned list, unordered list. Uh, and a list element that's just no paragraph here, just an just an include, uh, just a anchor tag. And we're going to put a class equals back and class equals forward so we can style these two things differently in the future. And so this is what this looks like with no CSS whatsoever. And so this is a nice, elegant, clear HTML. And so if you were just looking at this HTML, like a screen reader might be looking at, you can see what this really intends to mean. Now. Then what we do is we add a little bit of HTML to this. And so for now, we're just not going to bother. But in nav, navbar.css um, is the HTML or the CSS that, that makes this pretty. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff. And we'll come back and take a look at that in a second. Okay, And so, so there's our styled navbar. Um, so I'll come back in another video and pick up right here. So welcome back. Now we're gonna now we're gonna take a look at some more examples. We're not going to the one thing we're not gonna look at is exactly how this navigation bar works, at least until a little bit later. So the next thing we're gonna take a look at is how fonts work. And um, there's a couple of ways that you can put fonts into a file. Um, there are default fonts that every browser is required to produce, like serif, sans serif, monospace, cursive, and fantasy. And so they you don't exactly know what's going on, but they're they're often used as fallback fonts, and um, and so you can have those. There are any uh, any font that is on the system like Arial or Helvetica, and so if you're going to use Arial, not all systems have Arial, although most of them do these days. Um, and you have to have more than one font. Now another thing that's really common these days is to include um, a font somehow. You find out about a font, and here's a Lotto font. And you go look it up on the web and you find, oh, include this. And so I included this link because I found this really cool font, Lotto. And this extends the browser. The browser then learns about this font. It downloads the font, caches them, and keeps them in the browser. And then I can make a font that's Lotto. But I, just in case I'm off the internet, you know, and I can't download this thing, I have Sans Serif as a fallback for Lotto. So Lotto is a, a fancy font, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's, Arial and built-in fonts, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's that's how fonts work. Um, colors, there's a lot of cool stuff about colors. Um, there's a couple different things. We'll ignore the nav for the moment. Um, I'm just using span tags here. There's some default colors in the earliest of browsers. These days, uh, we have all these fancy ones. And you can go look these up and you just Google for HTML colors. And there's a bunch of names and then they're consistent across browsers, but there's, there's like 12 or so really solid names that are in all browsers since the beginning of time. Uh, but more modern browsers have uh, an, a, a better palette of colors, although really good graphic artists want to have uh, a much better control of, of colors. And so this is um, 
the pound sign says that this is a hexadecimal number and it's got two digits. Uh, hex means they go all the way up to F. So F is an A through F are numbers. Uh, 8B is the red level, 45 is the green level, and 13 is the blue level. And so this is a brownish color. Um, and then there's what's called web safe colors where you just have, uh, this ends up being 88, 44, 11. Um, but it sort of reduces the number of potential colors if you were mixing colors from various sources. Um, and so, and then in HTML5, you can see this color picker um, when you have a form, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, it's a color, a color form for modern browsers. And then you can pop up with this button, a color picker. And I've got a little thing to print out what the color would be. And so it just, when I pick the green, it basically puts 00FF, that's red, green, and blue. It puts that in into this thing, which then the program could use, um, you know, could read this or JavaScript could read it or a server code could read it. But right now we're just kind of playing with the picker and we pick a different color. And so that, that magenta is all the red, none of the green, and all of the blue. Um, and orange is all the red, some of the green, and none of the blue. So those are all just really strong colors. And so that's what's called an HTML color picker. Anchor tags. Um, in the old days, anchor tags were kind of funky. They were blue if you hadn't yet visited them, and they were uh, purple if you had visited them. And so this one I've obviously clicked on. And so we have a whole series of styling mechanisms that we can have um, if we take a look at these. Um, I have put these all in the inside of an ID tag of cool. So this is this is basically saying find the ID tag of cool and then style anchor tags to make them a font weight bold. So let's take a look here. So I got one one paragraph that has this this one here, and then I have a paragraph with an ID tag of cool, and that's basically so I don't have to style. Usually you wouldn't say I'm only styling the anchor tags inside of. Um, you know, if I'm only I'm only standing the anchor tags inside the a, pair, uh, a tag that has an ID of cool, but that way I can have the default on this one. That was my way of keeping the default. So normally you would just say a. So a uh, links is red. If it's visited, it's orange, and so this one's been visited, so you don't see the red. It means it's unvisited. Um, hover, you can change it. So you notice when I hover in. The text decoration goes away, the underscore goes away, and I have a, a color of text font color of white and a background color of navy. And then there is one last moment. Can I click on this one? Oh, I'll click. There's one last moment that's really hard to catch, and that is the moment of active. If it, the web was slow and you clicked on it, then it would tell the user, in the old days, this made more sense. Um, that it would turn red and then blink away. I don't know if we'll even see it. It kind of saw it. You sort of saw it. And so there was a color while you click on it. Yeah, there it was. Um, you might not see it uh, in, the, in the screen. But that's what, the, uh, ac that's what the, um, the active means is you've clicked on it, but it hasn't yet been retrieved. And then like a moment later, the whole page goes away. Another thing we can do is we can play with images. Okay. And so... Um, here is an image. Um, one of the things that's really fun to do with images is float them to the right or float them to the left. And then what happens is, is that the uh, image, the text is drawn around the image, so it wraps around the image. And you'll notice where I floated this left. Oh, I kind of got rid of everything. I floated it left before the H1. And so what happens is the H1, top of the H1 and the top, top of the image uh, line up, and then all the text afterwards um, uh, all the text afterwards wraps around it. And so you'll notice that I've got the image first and then the H1 second, and that what the float sort of disconnects the image from the normal line of flow, floats it over, and then takes this next thing and the next paragraph and use, saves the space for the image and shoves everything, shoves the margin over so that uh, it comes over here. Now, once you start floating images, you gotta learn about this clear equals all because if we want this next paragraph, like this one, we, want to, we, want, we don't want this paragraph for whatever reason to be on the image. Now, if it goes far enough, you see this, this, this paragraph here moves back to the left margin, 
and then this next one starts there. But if, if the browser is wider and the text is there's not so much text, we don't want this to be up in here. And so you say BR clear equals all. So between this paragraph and this paragraph, we do BR clear equals all. And um, you can put images right in the middle of the text like a character. You don't have to have them by themselves. And you can even make an image that's a clickable link. And so you can click on that image. Now, C in CSS stands for cascading style sheets. And so the idea is, is that the tag that's closest has more precedence than a further away tag, unless you say important, okay? So here we have some style. Um, here we have a, uh, a body tag, uh, border style of dotted, red and red, a border color that's red and important, and border width that's five pixels, background color, uh, which is kind of a grayish, that's that gray an extra padding. So we've got put some extra padding um, all the way around it and extra margin. Um, and so so if we take a look at this, we take a look at this paragraph right here, we see some things and we take a look at what we've got. So We've inherited this. We've we got a border style, a color. We, it wants to have a border color, a green, but it doesn't because um, yeah, this has a border style of solid. So the border style of solid is down here in the second style tag. So the second style tag has precedence because it's closer to the paragraph. And so we tried to, we tried to say border color green, but that one was overridden. So otherwise this would have a solid green border, except that this red important is up there, and so that it, the red important wins. And you can see it really easily here that this was overridden, and it, this is the one, this, this, this border color from the previous one is taking precedence, okay? And so this is the second one, and it would normally take precedence over this one, except that this important is, is sort of like it, it, it is overriding the one that's closer. So another example of closer, is the style tag okay and so here we go this is border this is the we're putting this i mean style attribute we're saying border style equals dash border color equals blue and so the border style equals oh, the border style equals dash holds on but our attempt to make the border color blue is overridden again by the red important right so important is up above that okay and so this this, this dashed is winning and this blue is not winning because there is an overriding red above it. I mean, there's an overriding red important above it. And so if you want to override an important tag, yay, we override an important tag right here. We basically say, I want a, a border style dashed. Come over here. Border style dashed, and I want the border color to be blue, and this is important. So now this one's closer, and it says important. So among all the important ones, the closest important one wins. So now we see that the border color actually takes here, and um, we are overriding the far away. This one, got, this one here from farther away got overridden because of this one. And so you can do that. Now, in general, while I've shown you how important works, you shouldn't do too much with important because usually you're taking CSSs from other places and and um, you're, you're you're patching it and you can end up with really inconsistent looks and feels with with important. Usually, when you see important, it means kind of something's wrong and you're fighting with a framework or something else. So let's take a look at some blocks. Um, and so let's see background color, my each one's color blue. And I'm gonna put some padding and a margin. Um, and so div P and H1 sort of live in a box. You have sort of like the actual, uh, so let's take a look at say this paragraph right here. That's probably the thing to do. This is just a plain old paragraph, nothing special, right? There we go, that's a paragraph right there. So. So let's talk about the padding and the margin, right? So working from the inside out, there is the actual text that is, and it's wrapped. And so if this, if I change the width of this, this whole block changes, right? It gets taller and narrower, but at some point, the in, inner part, it, this inner part right here, 
is uh, the inner part is however large it becomes. And that in this case, it's 318 by 38 pixels, right? And then what happens is we sort of work from the out, work from the inside out. So let's, I'll go down here and see the box model. So the inside of this, the actual text is 619 pixels by 19 pixels. And then I've asked to add 10 pixels of padding. And that is between this sort of text and the border. And then the border itself has a width. And I specified that border width. Um, right? I said I want a 5 pixel border width. And so the border width takes up 5 pixels. And then there is outside of that, there is margin. And so margin is space. Notice that the padding and the text itself has the background of the block. Border has its own color. And then the, the margin has the background of the color of the background document. Okay, so the, this is the margin here. It's the color of the background document, right? So content, padding, border, margin. And then what the padding inherits from the text in the box from a background and the margin inherits from the background document. And you can have different background colors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is an, uh, oh, by the way, this is an ordered list that we've got going on right here. Okay. So that's CSS boxes. We can change the size of these boxes. It's uh, it's a little tricky. So, uh, and so here we have uh, an auto sizing div where we're not mentioning anything about the height. Uh, if we take a look at the box model here, we see that this one is simply, you know, the size of the text plus the padding, plus the border, plus the margin. And that's sort of how, how that box gets sized. You can say that you want to set the size of the box. Okay. So I'm going to set that to be three M's. Three M's is three characters. Um, but if you look, I have too much in here. And so you'll see that even though this box is three characters tall, uh, it's four lines. And so the three would fit, but the fourth one doesn't. And so it just overflows. You can also, so three M's, it's good to set sizes in M's when you can, because then if the if someone makes the screen larger, oops, I didn't mean that. This one, if someone makes this larger or smaller. Now the problem is, well, I don't know about it, if we'd call it a problem, but in the old days, if you set a height in pixels and you zoom the screen, the box that where you set height in M's would zoom, and the one that you set in pixels wouldn't. But they decided to make zooming work. Otherwise, zooming. So many people made boxes in pixels that they made it so that the the zooming would pretend that pixels are really M's. So it kind of converts pixels to M's. But you're really technically you're supposed to avoid using pixels when you really mean uh, characters. If you want three lines, don't look at your font and say I'll make this 40 pixels in order to do that. And again, we still in this box we still have uh, overflowing text. And so we have a couple things we can do when we want to uh, change the overflow. We can tell a box that we would like the, the overflow to make a little scroll bar. And so here's, here's that same stuff. And you can see we got a little tiny baby scroll bar. And it, it didn't sort of blurp, blop out of the box, right? And, you, and even if the scroll fits, you see you get little scroll bars, but you can't scroll it because there's only one line there and it fits in the box. And then another thing that you can do is... you can uh, just say chop it off, right? Chop it off. Now, one thing with some JavaScript, you can put a little more here and that expands the box or pops a bylog or whatever, but we're not gonna worry about that for now. For now, we're just saying overflow hidden means lay this out as much as you need and then you know throw this text away. It's just not there anymore. Like where did all this, all this text go? But it doesn't show it because we told it to, to chop it off. Okay, so on to the next one. You can move these things around. Uh, this is a little messy. There we go. Let's make this a little different. Okay, so so by default, I'll show you the HTML in a second for this, or maybe just do view source. Let's do view source. Okay, so if you just say div div, they just follow after each other. Um, and I've given them border because to make them a little picture, give them some border, some padding, and some margin just so they don't touch each other too much. 
So by default, blocks just, so I got a little border both on all sides and a little bit of space between them and a nice. So they, you know, however big they get, this one gets bigger. And I put a width on them just so that, so that they wouldn't move around. And that's, there's a width on it right there, 10 M's, 10 characters wide. So they just follow each other. And then you can say, okay, you know, this block right here, this number three would lay out right here, but I have told the number three block I've told the number three block that I want to move relative to where you would normally be 20 pixels to the left and 20 pixels uh, uh, down from the top. And so this block, it lays out exactly as if it belongs right here. And then we shoved it over and moved it down. And, and it came over top of the number four block. And so there you go. And so the, the text afterwards, this number four block just comes next and it's it's basically, it's as if this laid out without that, without the position relative, and then this came afterwards, but then we sort of just shifted it, and that's why this overlaps, because this corner here is where three would have finished and with a normal layout. So you gotta be careful with relative. I mean, you don't usually wanna make it so that they uh, sort of blop on top of each other. Okay, and so now we're in four, and then we're gonna look at five and six. And so five is what's called fixed text, and you'll see I'm the five comes right here, but because I've got this as position fixed, this is fixed relative to the window. So it's 20 pixels up from the bottom and 30% of the way from the left margin. So you can see that this is 30% uh, of the way from the left margin and it's uh, the bottom of it is 20 pixels up from the bottom. And you'll see that that green box never moves. And that is because the fixed text is relative to the window. Um, and that's how we actually get this little link that never goes away. And so there's a link that never goes away. Um, absolute text, it's, I don't know why they call it fixed and absolute, but absolute text is a little bit different. It's relative to the parent element. And so in this div right here, the parent element is the body tag. And so when it's saying, I would like this to be uh, 40 pixels from the top and 30 pixels from the 30 percent of the way from the left that means it's relative to the body tag and so the body tag starts up here and so this has been sized 30 percent from there and whatever 40 pixels down and notice that that one goes with the scrolling right so that one goes with the scrolling and you'll also notice that between four five and six there's like it's as if there's nothing here but if you look at the document five and six are sitting there. And that's because they are plucked out of the normal rendering stream. And so they don't take up any space between four and seven. So they're, 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 they don't count in sort of the normal layout as the page is being laid out. And so, if, so <clears throat> here's number seven, for example, actually number eight. So here's number eight. And so this is, uh, positioned relative with a left of negative 100, uh, 1,000 pixels. And so in a sense, this stuff right here has been shoved off the screen to the left. And so that's that's what, how we often will put text on that nobody sees, just move it to the left. But it takes up the vertical space anyways, because it was just relative. It would have normally laid out here, but the left shoved it over there. And so that's basically uh, <clears throat> some some layout. And so uh, now we're going to talk about Z-index. Uh, let's take a look at the source code here. And so a Z-index is the ability to what happens when things overlap, okay? And so this is a div. Number one has a Z-index of 100. A number two has a Z-index of negative 100. Zero is sort of the background document. And it works out pretty straightforward. And I'm just moving these so they have to lay on top of each other. Um, you know, and so you see this, this one here is negative 100, so it's kind of behind everything. Um, this one is uh, positive 100, so it's in front of everything. And this number three is, um, yeah, it's in it. I just put that there to be in the original document at the, with no Z index whatsoever. And so it's behind this thing that has a Z index of 100, okay? And so that's Z-index, um, like this little note way over here by the right margin says, Z-index is uh, kind of tricky. Everyone tries to be on top. And 
um, you'll put z-index of 100 and then you'll find that the navigation put itself as z-index of 1,000 or something like that, right? And, um, and so z-index is hard to debug and hard to fiddle with, but at least now you know that z-index is the, when things look weird and they're overlapping in weird ways, z-index is what you're uh, taking advantage of. And so now we'll take a look at kind of how this navigation works, okay? And, um, and so here's a couple things that the navigation does. Uh, the body, of course, is font family, Arial Sans Serif. The navigation bar itself, the nav let's, I guess I'll do a view source on this so we can look at the navigation bar. Uh, the navigation bar itself, this block, it's a block tag, right? That has a position of light gray and I've given it a height of 3M, so it's like three lines. And if I zoom this page in and out, right, that bit gets bigger and smaller. I'll get back to 100%. Um, it's three lines tall, and I guess I didn't need to say Arial Sans Serif. I did that in case someone else wanted to change the body tag, I guess. Um, so then I have within, I want UL tags within the nav, and that's one of the nice things about this nav being its own tag. I can style just the ULs inside here. Okay, and so what I'm doing here is I'm saying uh, I, I don't want any uh, little... Uh, circles, little dots, little bullets. I don't want any of those. I want to take away any padding that it has by default. This is one of those things that this UL inherits. Um, let's go down here and take a look at this. And you'll see that um, this UL right here. Um, so what's happening is this is the things that I've said in my CSS and I'm overriding some default things. Uh, it's normally would be display. Uh, it's a display block, that's okay. Um, and so I, I, I overrode the, 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 the list type style. Um, and continuing on, uh, the list item inside of nav, that's what it is, nav and list item. I wanted, I wanted to make that. So let's, uh, let's inspect this guy right here. Inspect. So uh, if you look here, uh, so, and oh, and I've got a class of back, and so the, I have this position absolute, which is relative to the parent right here, and I have it 20 pixels to the left of that upper left-hand corner, and so that's how this comes over here. And, um, and then I have it colored dark blue because it's, in, it's a, a nav, an anchor tag within, an anchor tag within an li tag within a nav, that's what this is saying dark blue text decoration of none. And so that's where, that's where I get this color blue and no underlines. Um, and then this is the dot back. And so I use a back class to, to, to port, push it, port, position this right here. And then I use the forward class to position this relative on the right, 20 pixels from the right. And so that's how I make the navigation bar work. And CSS is really a, a, a lot of work. We, we learn a lot about CSS, uh, and, and this is just a really short introduction to get you a sense of what the basic mechanics of CSS are. Uh, thanks for watching. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my lecture on the introduction to PHP. We are going to go through this programming language really fast because I assume that you already know at least one other programming language, uh, perhaps Python. Uh, and so this is not so much about how to program, but this is the quirks that are uh, PHP. So it kind of helps to put PHP in a bit of a historical perspective uh, with the various languages over time. And so this is my little chalk talk on, uh, on PHP. And so long, long, long ago in, you know, the 1940s and the 1950s, we programmed in machine language and assembly language where we actually understood the real instructions of the computer. Um, and then the idea was more people could write code if we would have higher level languages. And so in like 1955, we had Fortran, which is my first language and still another language. And then um, we, we sort of had languages that end users used because that was those were the folks that needed to get work done. But the C language in 1972, which came out along with the Unix operating system, was this first language that was um, approachable enough. It's a pretty challenging language. I'd like to teach a class on it someday. It was approachable enough, but it was also performant. And so that was the interesting thing, is that new operating systems 
Um, PHP itself is written in C, Python is written in C, uh, Linux is written in C, and so C is sort of like the lowest level language that we use these days because it just, it's, it, we can do a lot more. And so what happened is the C became kind of new, the new base of languages and um, things like uh, Objective-C and C++ and Java and even JavaScript and C Sharp were all very derivative of that. And, the, and the, you can always know a language that is derived from, oops, that's derived from C because it uses curly braces for its control structures. Um, at the same time, there's other languages like Perl, which were even higher level languages. They were kind of end user languages to uh, Perl was originally for report generation and data analysis. And so um, the sort of high performance, although JavaScript is you know moderate performance, the high performance nerd languages up here at the top uh, were all very based on C and then Perl came out and Perl really influenced a lot of things. And Python and PHP are kind of like scripting, interpreted languages, not thought of as fancy uh, supercomputer languages or languages for super cool software developers. And, um, <clears throat> and so PHP is a, an interesting creature in that sort of Perl is written in C, Python's written in C, PHP is written in C. Um, PHP of those three languages took a lot of syntactic in inter inspiration from uh, Perl, but it also took syntactic uh, inspiration I mean, from uh, C, but it also took ins a syntactic inspiration from Perl. And so this kind of leaves PHP, which is the language we're talking about today, in a, an interesting, um, a schizophrenic kind of a situation. And we'll see that. And I'll try to point out where uh, PHP is uh, schizophrenic a little bit. So the syntax is inspired by C. We see semicolons. We see curly braces. We see no significant white space, although we always do it. Um, but also Perl is a big influence on it as well. So things like the dollar signs to start variable names and the, the heavy dependence on the notion of associative arrays. Now in the last six, seven years, PHP has been influenced increasingly by languages like um, Python, Ruby on Rails, and um, Java. Uh, just to kind of keep up. Things like the object-oriented patterns, etc., are more recent additions to PHP. And so they, they really take off of other languages, not sort of Perl and C. But the base, if you go back to like PHP 4, it felt very C-like with Perl weirdness. And we're not talking about the more advanced stuff in this lecture. We're talking about just the basics of it. So if you watch uh, my interview with uh, Rasmus Leerdorf, the creator of PHP, you will realize that PHP is a productivity tool. PHP is not a computer science exercise to make the most glorious and beautiful programming language. It is a language that makes you productive. And um, with that comes responsibility. With power, with great power comes great responsibility. And so they didn't worry about flexibility and syntax. If you wanted to do something, you knew what you were doing. So PHP is not a language of trying to coddle you in any way. If you type something and it works, you are kind of responsible for that. And so there's lots of like silent errors, silent auto conversions, etc. And I'll try to call those out in the rest of this lecture so you just understand that it does things and it's purposeful. It's purposeful because it assumes that you're a, a moderately good programmer and when you type, you know, X plus Y, you know what X is and you know what Y is and you know why you're trying to add them together. And so it's it really is a much more forgiving language, but you can get yourself in trouble if you make a mistake. You won't always catch it. And so a language like Java, which is a really good language for really large programs because it has all this rigor and enforcement and you make the tiniest mistake and it checks a million lines of code and catches the 14 places that that mistake was caused, um, that doesn't happen in PHP. If you make a mistake, you are responsible for it. So, so here is basically how PHP works. PHP is designed to be embedded in a web page. And um, there's this special tag and not a lot of other languages have used this less than question mark tag, which is switch into a programming language. So it's like originally it was called server-side includes where you would say, oh, here's some HTML, just like any old HTML, and oh, like, let's run some code on the server, less than question mark PHP, so run this on the server. And so this is like a little program running, and the output of this program 
is what replaces this. So when the program code runs on the server while this page is being rendered, it's like, write this out, write this out, run this code, and then write whatever comes out in the web page. So what we see in the web page is the HTML plus the output of this thing. And so that's how this works. And so if you take a look, if you take a look at the source code to this HTML page, you will see that, you know, it just it just intersperses it and you can't tell the difference between the, the text that came from the original HTML in this file and the PHP code. And so the output is just merged, this output is just merged into the PHP, I mean into the HTML and the, the browser when it reads this page didn't know what came from HTML and what came from PHP. And so there is the moment of the request response cycle where the HTML is delivered, the PHP is not delivered, the output you know, this code runs and it is replaced with whatever these lines are, this little bit right there, right? Okay, and so that's how this works is it's running on the server as the page is being delivered and then the browser gets it back. Now this is quite different than JavaScript, which is um, the source code of JavaScript is delivered to the browser and it runs on the browser, but in PHP, the source code runs on the server and the output of that, it comes back to the browser. Now I just put this in there just because people do this. I've seen people who know PHP is their only programming language do things on the command line that have nothing to do with the request response cycle. I don't recommend this. I, you know, I say that Python is the right language to do data analysis and computer maintenance tasks on your computer, et cetera, et cetera. But people do it in PHP. So if you ever see it, don't be super surprised. In maintenance tasks, sometimes people will write PHP scripts to connect to the database and run a long running thing from the command line um, because you can't run a long running process as part of a re request response cycle, uh, otherwise your uh, web server will time out. So up next we're going to start hitting on the basic syntax of uh, PHP and how we do semicolons, etc. So welcome back. Now we're going to go through some of the basic syntax of PHP. So PHP has a whole bunch of keywords. A lot of these are kind of taken uh, from uh, C. Uh, probably the weirdest thing when I write PHP that I, when I switch back and forth between PHP and other languages is the fact that the variable names start with dollar signs. Um, and you'll find this is annoying for a while, but you get used to it. Um, the lack of a variable with a dollar sign can be a kind of a weird thing because in different places like a, 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 a string that looks like this in, in PHP sometimes can be sort of like misinterpreted. But they all have to start, start with dollar signs followed by underscores and letters and numbers just like any other language. But just understand that they've got to have dollar signs. Um, and it turns out that I actually like it when I get used to it uh, because we're increasingly mixing PHP and JavaScript. In JavaScript, you can put dollar signs in the variable names, but we tend to avoid that so that then I can kind of be looking at a line of code and immediately know, like with dollar sign variables, oh, that's the PHP code that I'm working in and the JavaScript code, because JavaScript is kind of similar to PHP in case matters on variable names. Um, like I said, there is situ certain situations that um, you don't, if you omit the dollar sign, sometimes it freaks out more than others. And so in this case, it doesn't freak out. And in this case, it does freak out. And it has to do with the fact that there are these uh, predefined constants that you use this define statement to define. That, and the, so Y or X in this case with no dollar sign could be a predefined constant. A predefined constant could participate in an expression. And that ends up seeming like zero with no error. And then, it, but it's certainly not, you can't do an assignment statement to a predefined constant. And so just, Understand, and this is kind of a PHPism. When you forget the dollar sign, it may or may not blow up on you, and so you should mentally have a background thing in your mind, like, "Oh, wait a sec, what am I doing here? Look for the dollar signs." Um, you know, again, this is a, another weird thing. Depending on how your PHP con is configured, in early, early versions of PHP, this syntax was allowed, where this string maps to that in an array, and it actually sort of adds the double quotes here. Not all PHPs do it because you can compile PHP in different ways. So it's just, if don't omit the dollar sign. That's the lesson here. Don't omit the dollar sign. So there's a lot of things in PHP that I actually love and wish were in other languages, but not likely. All these other languages have their worlds and they love them and whatever. 
So string, literal, string literals can be single quotes or double quotes. Um, the backslash is used as an escape character. That's pretty typical among C-based languages. Strings can span multiple lines. You just start it, enter, 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 and then stop it. I love that. Um, the weirdness is, is that double-quoted strings are quite different than single-quoted strings. In a, a language like uh, uh, Python or JavaScript, they tend to be the same, um, and we have reasons to use them. And um, concatenation, I, I, these are different, and, they're, and PHP is the only language that does this. Concatenation is the dot operator, not the plus operator. Most other languages, and, it, and historically it had to do with the fact that uh, other languages that do object orientation use the dot in object orientation notation, um, but uh, PHP existed without OO, object orientation, and so it, it used the dot operator for concatenation. And I love the dot operator for concatenation, but no other language is ever going to adopt it, and so it's quite frustrating, even though I think it's the it's super elegant choice that PHP made. So, and I like the double quoted strings, but you gotta be, it's like, you gotta, you got to be responsible when you use the, the quick and dirty dollar sign substitution and double quoted strings. It's, it's again, with great power comes great responsibility. So here's some examples of double quotes. And, um, and so the, the fact that we have a double quote, I mean, you know, there's an echo statement which does the printing, a new line at the end, uh, just like most C-based languages, and Python has it, is also like this, uh, the new lines are rather explicit, and you've got to manage the, the notion that the, we come to the end of a line and we go to the beginning of the next line. Um, you can embed new lines in a multi-line string, so this one starts here and ends there, and there's a new line there and a new line there. Um, you can you know, put a new line in the middle, it's, it's the same. And this is probably the weirdest part that people don't understand and don't get so well. And that is in, in double-quoted strings, when there is a dollar sign, it looks for a variable with that name and out comes the 12. So this actually substitutes and puts the 12 in here. And so that's cool. I tend to only use it for debugging. It's kind of dangerous because you could you got to be careful not to introduce bad HTML into your output. So that's double-quoted strings. And so single quoted strings are quite different. Single quoted strings are really simple. They don't do any substitution, and uh, the the backslash is doesn't work uh, quite the same, right? So here's a single quoted string. Um, you can have embedded new lines that have new lines in them, and that so so that part works. Um, and you can one of the reasons I tend to use uh, single quoted strings is so I can use a double quote as a character. That's kind of nice. You can put a single quote into a, double, uh, into a single quoted string by backslash single quote, but a lot of the other backslash characters don't expand, and that's actually kind of frustrating. If I could change one thing, I would want the new line, new line to expand, but it doesn't. It actually prints out backslash n, and it doesn't do variable expansion, and that is a good feature of uh, PHP strings, that it doesn't do variable expansion, um, because that that can get you in some trouble. You can kind of end up in a mistake where you didn't mean for an expansion to happen. So I actually, when I'm writing code, I tend to use single quotes whenever I can and only use double quotes when I have an intention to use double quotes. So single quotes is my preference and then I use double quotes. And so if you look at some of my code, you'll see I'll be, I'll have a single quote, blah, 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 concatenate with double quote, blah, blah, blah. And so I mean, I use single quotes and double quotes very consciously in uh, PHP. PHP is one of my favorite languages for comments, uh, and that's because they just took all of the comment styles and made them work. And so there is a, a comment style with C++ where you say slash slash and it's a comment to the end of the line. There is a block comment that comes really out of C uh, that is slash star as much as you want to star slash. It's a multi-line comment. And then the shell style comment, which really comes from Perl, says anything after the pound sign is, um, is a comment. And so whatever language you come from, um, you can use the commenting syntax of it. I tend to, I, I definitely use this kind of comment and that kind of comment all over the place. We use this kind of comment for built-in documentation and that's really nice. And I tend not to use the pound sign. I just, I just want to think of PHP like C or C++. Um, PHP, yeah, PHP is actually getting like C++ in the later in the later versions. 
So I already mentioned that uh, echo is the, uh, uh, the way we print, but there's also this thing called print. Um, and it has to do with the fact that uh, shell scripts say echo and Perl said print. And so both of them work. They have subtle differences. Uh, echo is part of the language. It's a language construct. And print is actually a function, which only take one, one, takes one parameter, but with parentheses that are optional. So uh, I, in all my code, I don't quite know why I chose to do this. Maybe it's because I don't like Perl, um, but I don't use print at all. But, you know, you're going to look at code and people might want to use it. That's just my choice. I tend to use echo for everything. Um, it's shell script and print is from Perl. Neither of them are from C. <laughs> if there was something from C, I would probably prefer that one. Um, and so up next, we're going to talk about uh, operators and expressions and how we perform calculations in PHP. Hello and welcome back. We're going to talk about expressions now in PHP and how these things work together. And so there's there's a lots of things in uh, the PHP language that uh, that work like every other every other language plus multiplication is asterisk etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but the one thing that and I'll talk about this a bunch of times as we go through this the one thing that I think charming delightful and weird about PHP is how aggressive it is with uh, type conversion so here we have a plus and in some languages that might seem like concatenation and plus is a uh, is an arithmetic operator in PHP and it looks to its left and looks to its right and says, hey, I got the string 15 and I'm going to add it to the integer 27. You know, I'll just silently convert that 15 to a number for you. Away we go. So that's 42. And so you, most people would look at that. In most programming languages, you know, self-respecting programming languages, that would blow up, right? But not in PHP, because I guess you meant to do that. If you typed it, you meant to do that. So expressions are things that eggs the turn into a value, whether it's a string, a number, a floating point number, a true, false, boolean, um, and you can call functions during the order of, uh, during the evaluation, etc. And they can also produce like arrays and, and other things. So some operators of note, um, we'll talk about these, the post increment and post decrement. Uh, they're, they're subtle operators that are used in a few very specific places, string concatenation, which I love. Um, but no other language. Equality, or is double equal sign, because assignment is equals. <sighs> I, it's too late for that. We have too many programming languages that use double equals for the equals question, right? Equality is when you're asking a question. Is this, is this equal to, you know, is dollar $x, is that equal to 14? That's a question, right? That's the true-false. And dollar $x equals 14, means put 14 into the variable $x. Identity, we'll talk about this. It's the stronger than equality. It's equal in both type and value. Uh, e equality is also an aggressively converting uh, operator. It's saying like, if I can convert these two things, I got a string on one side and a number on another side, I can make them equal. I will make them equal and then give you a true false as to whether it's true. The ternary operator, most people think the ternary operator is tacky. And I agree with that, but I have to show it to you because there's a couple of places uh, where we canonically use the ternary operator over and over and over again. And so I, you've got to be able to look at that code and understand it. So again, side effect operators, again, one of these things where we try to avoid them in decent code, but every once in a while they are canonically used. So I have to talk about this. Uh, the bitwise operators come from C and they work pretty much the same as C unless you're writing uh, like a, an encryption bit or a hashing function, we tend to you tend not to need those, but they're there in case you need to write a hashing function or an encryption function. <coughs> so the the increment and decrement operators, there's pre versions of these in post where you can put it either the plus plus after a variable, plus plus after a variable here, dollar x plus plus. What this says is retrieve it and after it's retrieved incremented. So it's like pull the variable out and then add one to the variable that's sitting there in memory. And again, other than in certain canonical situations like for loops, we don't write this. We just write, you know, x equals x plus one instead. You say, okay, look, if I really want to add one to x, I will bust this out and I will talk, I will pull the variable x out in one expression and then I'll add x equals x plus one. There's this sort of notion in programming that you just don't show off your like, 
ooh, watch, watch the really crazy little thing I can do to confuse you. Because the reader of the program needs to be able to parse and understand what you've done. PHP really does not care the difference between this set of code and this set of code, right? 30 years ago, there might be a performance difference between this set of code and this set of code, but today there, I assure you, there's no performance difference. And this is easy for humans to understand. So we tend to not do this, bad, except later when I'll tell you it's okay. So whatever, there's rules, mostly bad, most of the time bad, most of the time do this, but you're gonna see code, you're gonna see code. And so I gotta show you the kinds of things that you're gonna see code so you understand it. I don't want you like, whoa, I look in some code and like, Chuck didn't explain that. So I feel this need. Okay, here's one of the things I love about PHP, but like I said, it'll never get to any other language because they always use the dot operator for object orientation, which I'm, whatever, we got it. So dot is concatenation and it is not just concatenation, it is string concatenation, which means it looks to its left, looks to its right. Now these are both strings and if those aren't strings, it turns things into strings like floating point numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, it's an aggressively type converting operator. So one thing I like about PHP is the operators have an opinion and they're gonna, you, you, you know, the concat a plus operator in Python concatenating a, well, you have to convert everything so it, it's, it's, uh, it's deterministic, but these just aggressively do type conversion. Now, the other thing that, to note on here is this little space is why this space, this dot does not add a space. The dot does not add a space. So if you want a space, you've got to add it explicitly. The ternary operator. Just don't, don't write code except in the one place that I'll show you later. Don't write code like this generally. And as a matter of fact, in Python, I mean in PHP 7, there is the, the null coalescing operator, which I'm not covering here, the double question mark operator. And when I re-record this in two or three more years, then I will not even mention the ternary operator. But the problem is, is that we are somewhere between PHP 5 and PHP 7. And this works in both PHP 5 and 7. And I am forever torn when I write code for other people to use, whether I should just like start using PHP 7. It's too early. But in a couple of years, there will be time and then we will all use PHP 7 and we will use the null coalescing operator. So go look up null coal coalescing. And if you decide that you want to write uniquely PHP 7 code, that's fine. For me, for now, I'm going to keep using the ternary operator and is null, etc. So, okay. Okay, 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 okay. So, um, so this ternary operator, like I said, in the future, we won't have to use it, but for now, you're gonna see code for decades that has this in it. So you gotta think of this ternary operator as this is an expression, I'll put parentheses around it, and it's gonna produce a value. Some value is going to be stuck into this variable when it's all said and done. And you can think of this as one of these two things is going to get put in, and the, there's a question mark that decides which, um, which is gonna happen. I should probably have a bigger screen for this. Right, so think of the, it's like this assignment statement has these two things in flight, and then we're gonna make a decision as to which one makes it. And this question mark is this bit right here. So you could think of these as, it's like an assignment statement, but only one of these two, one of these two things is gonna make it based on whether it's true or false. And this is a question. So we have a question followed by the question mark, followed by the value that the assignment statement is gonna get if it's true or false. And it's not really an assignment statement, it's this expression on this right-hand side. So if we look at this code, what this is saying is, it is going to assign large into message if www is greater than 100. And it's going to assign small into this message if it not, but that's not going to work. So it's going to end up with large, okay? Um, here we're looking for an even, an even number. If it's evenly divisible by two, meaning has no remainder, then it's an even number or an odd number. And so, so 123 is odd. And uh, this is, I mean, this is how we check for an odd number. And it's, I actually use modulo to check for even and odd numbers all the time. Side effect assignment. Again, these are simple contractions. 
Um, we find ourselves, uh, especially like when I'm creating SQL statements in PHP, uh, concatenating by appending to the end of a line. And so we write code, you know, so we, we start with a, a string and then we like add a blank to it. And we, you know, so the out equals hello and then out equals out concatenated with another blank. And so this is a contraction, right? And so what happens is, is you can say out dot equals and that says concatenate with myself, right? And so it's called a, a side effect assignment in that this out is sort of on both the left and the right side of the assignment statement, meaning that you know, this is out equals out concatenated with world. This is out equals out concatenated with backslash n. And so it's like hello world, right? Um, and so you can do this with uh, addition as well. Uh, this is concatenation operator. You can do it with addition operator. Um, again, um, I don't like doing this. I do do this as long as I'm going to do it for sort of more than a couple of lines. And you'll see code uh, that I've written, like a, that I'm doing like concatenate, 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 concatenate. And I don't bother using this whole thing. If I'm only going to do one line, I might not use that. Um, but again, you're going to see it. So again, use them sparingly. Pick your moments when you're going to use these things. I mentioned that PHP has aggressive type conversion. Um, it's uh, at times humorous when it uh, gets a little too aggressive in the, its type conversion. And so uh, the, the operators in PHP and the quality operators in PHP, they're sort of like trying to get to a point where they can achieve what you've told them to do. They don't want to give up. Um, and you can do this explicitly if you want. Other languages like Python and Java and C demand that you do this explicitly. So here we go with some uh, fun stuff. Uh, so division forces a floating point number. Uh, division forces a floating point number, so that's good. Python 3 float forces a floating point number as well. Um, here's a kind of freaky thing. Uh, the string 100 plus 36.5 plus true. True turns into a 1. So this it says, oh, I'm going to do some addition here. This turns into the number 100. It converts that to a float. So that ends up being 137.25. So there you go. Now we can use a casting operator like this and force that to be a string, but it really doesn't matter because this is going to force it to be a string anyways, and the dot is a string operator. You can also sort of cast this into a 9.9 uh, 9 to an int, which is going to truncate it, and so that's going to be 9 minus 1, which gives us the 8. Uh, and then, it, again, the string operation, uh, the string operation that we have here is converting this 100 so that it can turn it to 136.25. But if we get a string that's not a number, it's not even an error. So SAM plus 25 is 25. So this, if this doesn't convert, that's not really a traceback. That's not an error. That turns into a zero. So that's why this is 25. And the concatenation is like, oh, I got an integer over here. I'll convert that to a string. So that gives us the string SAM25. And so you kind of see how these operators, like, you told it to do it. It's going to do it. If it, it can find a way to do it, it, it would rather do what you said, even though you might be crazy. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not making a value judgment. It's not like, whoa, that's crazy. Why'd you even do that? So this, if we compare this to Python, you know, we do these concatenations, and when in Python we have to be really explicit. So to because we use the we don't have a separate concatenation operator, so we have to convert things to string, and we have to convert things to integer, and um, you know, so that that's that's sort of the key difference is that in PHP it it tries to guess what you meant, and it just goes ahead and does what it is that you meant. Um, true becomes one. So I'm, here we're concatenating a, a string x, string y with the variable, the constant true, which is a Boolean variable. True becomes 1, false becomes 0, but if it's being concatenated with a string, false is nothing. One of my, some of my most frustrating time uh, debugging PHP is when I'm um, printing debugging output, and I print a variable and it's got false in it, and I can't see it because false is basically invisible. Okay? So... Uh, equality versus identity. Uh, the double equal operator is a type converting operator and it's aggressive in its type conversion. So if we look at this bit of code right here, it looks at the 123 and the string 123 
and it converts that to a number before it uh, does the equality. So this becomes true. Um, if, if we see this 100 plus 23, which is a string, that be, that's also true. Um, here we have false. Um, I think the zero becomes the Boolean and that becomes true. And, and this one here is uh, kind of crazy in that five is less than six becomes a true, which becomes a one in this equality. And then the string two minus the string one, these go get turned into integers and that becomes a one. And so this overall question mark becomes true. Okay, and so that is the equality operator and it's, it's, it's really trying to aggressively convert its operands um, to figure this stuff out. And if five is less than six, is triple equal true? Triple equals is equal in type and value. So it, it's equal, equal with no conversion, basically. And so the five less than six is a true, and this is a true on that side. So this also evaluates to true, okay? So identity is really important. Um, they talk about it even in the documentation because functions sometimes return false as an indicator that something either went wrong or whatever in the case of stirpose, which is looking for a string within another string, it returns false if it didn't find it. Sometimes this would return negative one in some languages, but it returns false. And the problem is, is false can be converted to zero. So you can't, to tell the difference between the string matching on the first character, which is the zeroth character and not matching at all, you have to use the triple equals operator. And so even in the documentation, it's reminding you, use the triple equals operator. So for me, I always use the triple equals operator if I'm using true or false, and later we'll learn about null. These are predefined constants that can be turned into numbers so easily because true turns into one, false turns into zero, and null turns into zero in anything that might want to compare integers. And so that's, that's really dangerous. And so, um, we just use triple equals. Don't overuse triple equals, just use it when you need it. And so here's some examples of what works and what doesn't work with triple equals. So, we're, and we'll use stirpose as the example. And so we're gonna look to see if the, the, the letter W, the string WO is in hello world. And so it tells us that that starts at position six and strings are zero based. And so that's position six. Where's HE? Well, that's in position zero. And here's the one that kind of drives me nuts. If you say, where is the letters ZZ in this string? That's gonna return false. But look what we see. We see nothing. I have stared at lines of code like this for a long time. So always just in the back of your mind when you're doing PHP, say that echo doesn't show false. Var dump, var underscore dump, which we'll see in a bit when we get to arrays, does show false. So just know that false doesn't print. True turns into one, false doesn't print. Okay, so here we have the problem where we need to use the triple equals. So if we say, oh, is the string, where uh, this is asking where is it, and this is gonna be in position zero because HE is the first character there. And we're asking, is it false? But we're using double equals. So that's gonna do type conversion. It's gonna see an integer on one side and false will be turned into a zero and it's going to become true. Um, yeah, it's not false, right? And so, uh, so we're gonna get the wrong answer basically. And so this will get us the right answer because this is gonna return false and false is equal to false. And so this just says that when you're comparing with false or true, you use triple equal. And so this basically will give us zero on this side because that's where it's found it. And <clears throat> not triple equals, it's not. And so it's gonna be there. And then, um, <clears throat> and then this is gonna give us back false and the triple equals is not gonna convert that. And so that's gonna make this thing be false. I mean, that's gonna make this thing be true. And so it's gonna give us the right answer. And here we go. You can't use print, you can't use echo, you can't use print r, which we'll use when we get to arrays. None of these things show false. Only thing does is var dump. That shows, if you do a variable, you will see false. So remember that. And use, when you're really stuck debugging, use var dump as the, as the, it'll, it's ugly output and it's not pretty, but you can't always find false when you need to. So up next, we're gonna talk about control structures. Uh, 
ifs and fors, etc. Hello and welcome back to Control Structures. This is our last little segment of our introduction to PHP. So uh, as I've been saying, PHP is heavily influenced by uh, the C language. And uh, so the logical operators are pretty much taken straight from the C language, double equals, not equals, less than, greater than, less than or equal to. Um, double ampersand is and, so that's and, or, and then exclamation point is not. <clears throat> the, of course, assignments like dollar $x equals four, that's the assignment. So a single, single equals assignment and double equals is the question. It's asking the question, is answer 42 without changing 42? And of course, the classic problem is only putting a single equal sign here, which turns this into an assignment statement, but not a syntax error, so avoid that. Uh, we use curly braces to indicate the beginning and end. We, if then else, uh, you have to put parentheses for those of you coming from Python. Um, the other thing from Python is or, and, and not are the uh, logical operators, and we have these sort of short versions of them. And so um, Python just uses words for those, and that's actually something that messes me up when I'm going back and forth between C-based languages and um, Python. A white space does not matter, like all uh, C-inspired languages, uh, and of but of course, uh, so these two things are completely equivalent except that uh, your friends will not like you if you write code like this. And so we are very disciplined in our coding to put indents and, um, you know, so that you can easily match things up so you know where blocks start and stop. So all those Python indentation techniques that you learned hold you in good stead. It just doesn't cause syntax errors if you use a tab instead of a space, although you want to still be consistent in your tabs and spaces. Um, there's a number of different coding styles for C-style languages. Um, there is sort of the original coding style, which we call the Kernighan and Ritchie. I call it Kernighan and Ritchie for the original uh, white and blue textbook that was written when C was introduced in the 70s. Um, it's the language that what I learned it from. It's a beautiful thin book. Like my, I like my books to be thin. Um, and k &R is a more compact. And what they do is we put the uh, starting brace on the same as the if. And then we put the ending brace to line up with the if, and then we put the new starting brace on top of the else, and then the ending brace ends up. And this is good for if you were typing cards, which um, I actually never coded C on cards. I did code Fortran on cards, but not C. And cards, or if you had a really tiny terminal, um, and sometimes you do. And so this is a more compact. Um, a more expansive for younger people who think that screens are all gigantic, uh, tends to like the idea of lining up the curly braces. I, I, I don't, I, I can't argue that one of these is somehow better than the other. I personally prefer this. I prefer the compact because I want to see as much concept on the screen as I can, even if my screen is large. Um, and so, I, and the other thing I don't like about this is it turns this simple else concept into three lines. But if you run into an organization and in the Sakai project that I work on, uh, we have a million lines of code and some code is this way and some code is this way and you just accept it. You should learn to read both styles and you learn, should learn to write both styles and don't argue. It's perfectly okay to have a personal preference and it's perfectly okay for that personal preference to be different than other people's personal preference. That's my personal preference. That's okay. It's fine. So a multi-way branch uh, where is uh, like most uh, languages, um, in that it basically is checking the ifs one at a time and the moment that something becomes true it executes that code block and it doesn't come back and doesn't check any of those other things. It doesn't even check them. So if more than one of these is true, the only the first one that's true is going to trigger. And so we construct them very carefully in the order, especially if you put more than one else if, the order matters because you don't know which order they're going to be. I mean you know that you, it's not like uh, uh, PHP looks at all of them simultaneously. It literally sequentially checks, then it checks again, then it checks again, and so it, uh, so away you go. And so that's how the multi-way and it's uh, else if concatenated, but really else if is its own its own keyword basically. If you have only one statement, and statements of course in uh, in in uh, PHP are ended with a semicolon. If you have one statement, you can leave off the curly braces. These two things are equivalent. Um, I, I wouldn't, th these things are, I would probably never do this else if, no, neither of these are particularly good code style. I mean, I'm just showing you because you can do it. I tend to only allow myself to use the 
um, if on the same line, if it's really short and this is short and I don't want it to go long, if I have to spread it across two lines, I always put curly braces on it. And so I, again, you're just trying to make life easy for the person who's reading your code. And the and 99 times out of 100, the person reading your code trying to figure out what you're doing is yourself or maybe someone trying to help help you. So we should put a lot of energy into making our code readable. In terms of looping structures, uh, there is a top tested while loop where it's asking a question and it's a zero trip loop in that um, it functions the first time when it first encounters it, it really functions kind of like an if statement. And if this is false, it skips completely, which means it never, it potentially, if the, the statement is false, it won't execute the loop body even once. In the sec, we'll see a one trip loop, minimum one trip. So it functions as a, as a, a um, functions as an if statement. Uh, this particular loop is bad because it's an infinite loop, infinity, um, meaning that it's going to run forever because this is going to stay true. Fuel is greater than one and we're not doing anything to fuel, so we make an infinite loop, which is going to run out your battery or crash your computer or who knows what. Um, and so that's like a, a badly structured loop. With a while loop, you have got to do something that has to do with your iteration variable. And so in this case, it's going to run until this, you know, true, 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 false and then it's going to get out and finish the loop uh, because we are modifying the uh, uh, iteration variable as we are progressing through the loop. And so with a while loop, we'll also see in a bit how you use a break that gets out of the loop. So you, you have got to manage the exit from the loop. If you don't, um, it's not going to be all that smart for you. Um, there is in uh, PHP a one trip loop. Uh, it's rarely used, um, but I'll just cover it here just so you kind of know it. I, I don't think I've written a one trip loop, a do while loop in, uh, I'm not sure I can recall when I used one of these things. But the, the, the difference is, is it's got a do at the top and it's got the test at the bottom. And so it's a one trip loop, which means it doesn't check the, the question that's down here at the bottom that's true or false until it has made it through the loop once. And so that's why it's a one trip loop. So even if this is false, the first time through it has executed the loop before it even knows that it's false. Now, um, here we are using in this, uh, it's going to, you know, we are doing, again, we have to manage the iteration variable. And this is a situation where I'm using the pre-increment. And so if dollar count has in it a, a four, well, let's, let's, no, let's make it be a two. Let me clear this and do that again. So if the count variable has a, a two in it, it comes in and it adds one to count. That's what the plus plus count means. And then it takes this three and it participates in the less than or equal to five, which in this case is going to be true. So it's going to go up and run the loop again. When this loop becomes, uh, when this comes in and count is four and it comes in here, it adds one to it and then the five participates in it. And so then that becomes um, a false and then the loop finishes. So it just kind of comes down here. Now when we start looking at break and continue and the ways we can sort of bump, well, actually continue, it turns out that it's important that we um, use this uh, post increment or pre increment in this particular thing because if you continue, you want to make sure that the iteration variable is updated. And so there, again, I tell you not to use these things, but this is a canonical place that we tend to use these. And then this is a counted loop. And so uh, this is a for loop. This is a, a, a weird little syntax. It's got parentheses and it's got colons. And I remember when I first saw this, it seemed super crude, but after a while, you just kind of get used to it. You just have to remember that the first part before the first semicolon is what runs before the loop starts. It's like helping you construct a while loop, basically. Before the loop starts, it, it initializes the precondition for the loop. Then it's like a top tested. Uh, the second piece is a top tested uh, question that is, as long as it's true, the loop is going to continue. And if it's false before the loop starts, it's a zero trip loop. And then count plus plus is the thing we do at the end of each iteration or before the beginning of the next iteration. And this, of course, is a good place where we do use the plus plus. If you said count equals count plus one here, they'd be like, oh boy, you apparently didn't get the memo because we always say this. And we've said this since the 1970s when we first started using um, C. 
And so that basically is going to run this and uh, it's going to start count from one and count is going to go and, and when count is six, this is true. So it runs one more time when it's six, but then count becomes seven and this becomes false and then it skips out. So that's a counted loop. Um, and so it's, it's pretty elegant. You just construct a counted loop. You create a variable that is your iteration variable. You initialize it in the first part. You check its ending value in the second part and you make sure that you add one or subtract one or whatever it is that you need to do for your loop. There is a for each loop, which we'll see in the next section. We talk about arrays that is a, a non-counted loop that goes through you know, all the items of things. Um, that's a very nice loop, uh, but sometimes you do need a counted loop. So like most C-based languages or C-inspired languages, the, we have a break and break is an executable statement that basically says when this runs, it it breaks the loop that it's in. If there's a couple of loops that are sort of a loop inside of a loop inside of a loop and there's a break inside this, it actually only breaks out of the inner loop. It doesn't break all the way out to the outer loop and so it's the innermost loop. In this case, I've only got one loop so it is the only loop. It when If, if this code executes, it's like magic jump and gets out and runs, jumps to the line afterwards. It basically says, we're done with this loop, leave. Now all the other iterations have run, run and then so it, when it would come down and say count five, this becomes true, so the break happens and it just does done, even though it would have run until 600, um, you know, if we'd have just left it to its own devices. So that's again, people might say this is not structured programming. I hope among decent people we've stopped arguing about that. I'm sure at some coffee shop somewhere they're gonna argue about whether or not this is structured programming, whatever. This is really, it gets to code that is direct and easily understood. Um, continue is to, it doesn't exit the loop, it exits the current iteration of the loop. And so it, it says, okay, I'm not gonna finish this iteration, but I'm not gonna stop the loop. I'm gonna go right to the next thing. And what's important is that when the continue goes up, it runs the, the third piece in this case. And that's why um, back in that while loop, if you do a continue, you have to put the increment in the while bit um, because um, you wanna make sure your iteration variable moves ahead. That's why we tend to use instead of while, uh, do whiles or while do's for um, counted loops, we tend to use for loops for counted loops because the continue works perfectly and, um, <clears throat> and the loop continues. And so if this is basically saying if it's uh, um, even, the, the, you know, divide by two, look at the remainder, uh, continue. So, we're, so it's going to run this 10 times, but it's only going to run this five times on the odd ones, count one, three, five, seven, nine. So the, the even ones ran, they just ran the continue. So it just went up. And so it didn't print this. That didn't happen on the even uh, iterations through the loop. And so that's a quick summary of uh, zooming through PHP. Uh, we will next talk about arrays and other aspects of PHP. This is really just the uh, core language. PHP arrays are very flexible and they're very, very powerful. They're sort of like Python dictionaries, but way better. They're better than Java hash maps. They're, they're associative arrays, basically. Or associative arrays are the notion of key value pairs. And in uh, PHP, they're completely untyped. We'll talk only a little tiny bit about untyped arrays. But associative arrays are very powerful and flexible data structures, especially in a language like PHP, that sort of is an untyped language that a variable can take on uh, any old type. So uh, if we think about classic lists, we can make an array. This array has two elements. Um, in this case, we're creating an array named stuff, and high is the first element, and there's the second element. Arrays are zero based if you're using integer indices, and so sub one is actually the second thing. So when we print out a uh, dollar stuff sub one, square bracket operators are the you know lookup or index or sub. I read them as sub. So stuff sub one is actually the second item, and that's kind of like Python lists if you're familiar with Python. Um, the thing that's like Python dictionaries, and it's the same structure. It's the array is the array in um, PHP. We'll get to uh, classes and objects later, but um, key value arrays um, are just key value arrays. And you can actually have integer keys inside of an array and string keys and other kinds of keys and arrays all at the same time. We tend not to do that very often because uh, it confuses us, and so we don't want to be confused. And so in this case, uh, the the um, the little arrow 
I call that maps to. So the key name maps to the value Chuck and the key course maps to the value WA4E. And then you can look up based on the key stuff sub course is the way I read that. So that says go in the array stuff, look up the key with the string course and pull that out. And so it prints out the thing that's in there as web applications for everybody. Uh, arrays can get a little complex. These are super simple ones. And so we uh, need to print them. And uh, there's some very convenient ways to print arrays in PHP. The print underscore R, I think the R stands for recursive, I don't know, uh, will dump out an array. And if, and if there's arrays within arrays or other things, it prints them out nicely. And if you're doing this in HTML, you want to print out a pre-tag. So pre-tag is the, the tag that uh, respects new lines. And so there's new lines at the end of each of these things. And so I tend, if I'm going to print it on a web page, print out a pre-tag, print the array, and then print a slash pre so that you actually see them. Otherwise, it'll all get run together on a big long line in wrapped, which is uh, readable, but not pretty. So I won't show the pre's uh, going forward, but just if you want to print this stuff on a web page, you want to enclose it in a pre-tag. Um, and so again, we can print this stuff and it's uh, really good for debugging. We can print an array that has integer indices, so sub two and sub nine. Now, the other thing that this kind of shows is that the integer indices do not have to be dense. They do not have to be zero, one, two, like a Python list. You can think of them as it's really a key value array and it has integers as can be keys. And that's sort of, it makes perfect sense. Um, there is another way to dump stuff out that's a lot more verbose called var underscore dump. And um, I tend to do print r if I'm just looking for what I know is in the array. If I'm a little more concerned about is this an object or whatever, var dump gives you a lot more detail. It says it shows you both the, um, you know, the, the key name maps to a five character string with the value Chuck. The key course maps to a five character string with the value SI664. And so the var dump is uh, much more uh, detail, but it's, it's uh, if, you, if you know what you're looking for. Uh, var dump also is the one thing that prints out false. Um, one of the hardest things that bugs me, and I've wasted lots of hours in PHP, is printing out false and not seeing it. So false, and if you print it out with an echo statement or a print R, it prints nothing out. So if I'm just going to set the variable thing to false, I echo one, that comes out, I print R false, and that is nothing. That's the problem here, right? That's the problem here, that nothing prints out. It doesn't say, oh, I'm printing a thing out and it's false. It doesn't say that. So the echo two comes out, but var dump is good because var dump is not only telling us the type, but it's also telling us the type and value. And so at some level, if I'm printing variables out, I might, if I think they might be false, I tend to use var dump rather than print. So you can build and up an array dynamically. You don't have to put all of the stuff in the parentheses in the constructor. You can append to the end of the array, which basically is, is adding integer indices. So VA and then empty brackets means put it at the end. So stick hello at the end and stick world. And so we end up with zero and one um, in that particular array. You can also build them up by key values. So you can say, here's my array, stick in sub name and stick in sub course and print it out. So you're building that out. And so it's actually, it's really often more common to build these arrays up and start with an empty array and then put stuff in it. Or you can use the kind of array parenthesis uh, syntax as well. We have a lot of different ways of looping through arrays. Uh, there is sort of a determinant loop, meaning a loop that will go through all the key value pairs. And so here we start out with a, an array that has a two end items, a key name maps to Chuck and a key course maps to SI664, and that's in the array. And so the for each, so the for each is the, you know, give me an array and I'll, I'll loop through all the elements in that array. So for each stuff as is part of the key, as part of the, as, as a keyword of PHP. And then you have two iteration variables and you mark it this way, you, this maps to, but $K is an iteration variable and $V is an iteration variable. And it will take on the success of K, um, K will take on the success of values for the keys, and simultaneously V will take on the success of values of the V, uh, the, of the val the V will take on the success of values. And so this print, this, this loop is going to print out twice, and 
um, it's going to print out key and value. Now the interesting thing is if you're coming from Python dictionaries, the arrays stay in order and we'll see later we can sort them, etc. And so it's deterministic that we put name in before course and so name comes out um, and course comes out second. Name comes first and course comes second. Whatever order you put them in, PHP maintains <coughs> that order. <coughs> If you do a indexed array with a for each, the k ends up being the uh, integer, right? The, the key is the integer, and it will do a for each loop and go through and give you the index position. Remember <clears throat> that unlike Python, uh, you have to, uh, you, they don't have to, Python lists have to be com compacted, meaning no gaps, but you can't have gaps in PHP arrays. You can build a counted loop. And this counted loop is um, <clears throat> is basically the for loop has you know an, an initial position, a check to see when to stop the loop, and then a, a a change. And we talked about this in the previous lecture. So because arrays are zero based for i equals zero, zero i less than count of stuff i plus plus. So that means that i is going to be zero, one, two, whatever until we get past count of stuff. And count of stuff is two. And that's why we say less than here, because we can't look at the sub two element, we can look at the sub zero element and the sub one element, and then we just index and pull the stuff out, dollar i. Now this counted loop assumes that it's compact, or no gaps, right? Because that's, if, if we're generating, if, if, if you, you could, in here, you could have, you know, an element two and an element four, and this would not work. But the, the for each loop would work, the previous for each loop, this would work if the values were, you know, if the positions were two and four. Now you wouldn't get it if you built the array this way. You know that this is going to be position one. That's going to be, I mean, zero and one. Um, so this will always work. This would only work if you absolutely knew that the array was compacted and started from zero and went up with no gaps. You can make arrays of arrays. We don't think of these as two-dimensional arrays. We think of this outer array as. Um, this outer array from here to here has three elements, and one has a key of paper, first element is paper, pens, and misc, and it just maps to, and then this is a constant. So from here to here is another array, and from here to here is another array, and then from here to here is another array. And if you want to grab something out of the middle of it, you can say products sub pens. Well, you can think of this right here. That little expression is this array right here. So that is an array. And if you just printed that out, you would print that array out. Oh, echo doesn't print it very well. Print R would be better to print that out. And then you can say sub marker, and then that goes into here. And so sub marker gets this string. And so that's what prints out as markers. Okay? So that's how arrays of arrays work. They're not really kind of two-dimensional arrays in the classic sense. And what we'll you'll find after a while is that you have arrays that have arrays, or objects that have arrays, or arrays that have objects, and we create rather complex data structures, especially when we're doing th with things like talking to web services and pulling uh, data structures across the web. They're often pretty complex, a mix of arrays and um, arrays and objects. And so uh, up next we're going to talk about array functions. So now let's talk about functions and arrays. There are a lot of functions that deal with arrays, and part of this is because uh, PHP started out so long ago and was not an object-oriented language, and so it, uh, it has to pass, uh, do a lot of things that are not sort of natural in the language, and object-oriented patterns are more natural, as we'll see. Object orientation is coming to PHP. I mean, it's here, but things like arrays still kind of throw back to the pre-object oriented. So you'll see a lot of array functions that have array underscore in front of them, and that's a way of namespacing them to keep them uh, out of colliding with other things. Um, some of them don't have counts. Uh, some of them don't have, like count doesn't have array underscore in front of it, and it's, it's for used for various things. So here is a series of array functions that we'll talk about. There's far more. Uh, array functions that do things like merging and searching and flipping and doing whatever. Here's some that I tend to use a lot. So, um, so the first thing that we often need to do is check to see if a key is present in an array. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, here, so I'm going to make a little simple array, just append name and course and have a map. Um, array key exists is asking whether the key exists or not. 
Um, and so that's asking the question, is this key in this array? And that returns us a true or a false. And in this case, it says it does exist. Now there's another way to do this called is set. And is set is a little stronger than just whether the key exists or not. If the key exists, is set is true. And if the value under that key is not null, then this is true. And so we often use this in the form, or you'll see this all over the place, is a ternary operator. So this is a true or a false is set name, that's going to be true, and then this is the true piece of the ternary operator and this is the false piece of the ternary operator. So what this basically does is this echoes this string right here, which is right there. On the other hand, this adder is not in the array, so it's not in the array, and so it's going to turn this to false, which means the false part of this is what's going to echo out, and so that happens. And so this is set is a common idiom that you just have to get ready for, have to get used to. The is set ternary operator combination is used heavily throughout PHP. In the future, and the future is sort of the present, um, in the future there will be a more elegant way to do this. And um, so what I mean by future. So uh, PHP 7 has a new operator that makes this syntax a lot more elegant. It's called the null coalescing operator, and it is the double question mark operator. And the PHP documentation does the best job of explaining this, and um, it really basically does the exact same thing as that little ternary operator does, except with a lot more succinct syntax. So the, the, what the ternary, uh, what the uh, null coalescing operator is, it's either checking is the key present and is the value not null. So it's really checking two things. And it just is really a way to, um, as they say, even in here, it's syntactic sugar to make it look better. And I'll tell you what, I really like it. Now the problem is, is can you use it? And so PHP 7.0 has been around for a while. I've got most of my servers upgraded to PHP 7.0. But because I write code for other people, when I'm writing code for myself, I can use PHP 7.0 because my server is 7.0. But I have not yet indulged in writing this code because I still want my code to run on various PHP 5s and maybe who knows when someone can tell me when the safe time is, is to assume that everybody's to PHP 7, which is a good thing. And we all should get to PHP 7, but it's not there. And so this is the more elegant way to do this if you can assume PHP 7. And you won't see, other than this, you won't see in the rest of this course any PHP 7 um, uh, syntax. And so here we go. We make an array, we put two things in, and we're going to do an assignment statement. We're going to use the double question mark operator, which is really kind of like a, it's homage to the old Terranier operator. And so what we're doing is we're assigning, if, if, if this exists and is not null, this is assigned into name. And if it's not, either null or doesn't exist, then that's a sign. So it's kind of like a, a Python get operation. And so name comes out to be Chuck. So I echo name equals Chuck, and so that's true. And that this, this, the not found, because adder is not present in my array, adder is then not found. And so this is a way more elegant than this same thing. It is, these two things are the same, um, but prior to PHP 7.0, and if you are writing code that might have to run on pre-PHP 7.0s, um, you're going to need to do that. You're not going to need to write this older code. And that's, there's no more succinct way to do that. We saw how you can use array key exists, but that's kind of long as well. This is, this is pretty. I mean, this is one of my favorite things about PHP 7.0. And unfortunately, I can't use it yet. So, but that's okay. Okay. So there's a couple other things we can do. We've got the uh, count, which just tells you how many items are in the array. Uh, because uh, so many things in PHP, a variable can have many different types. There's a series of functions that ask what type it is. So the isArray function gives you a true false if that variable $ZA is an array. And in this case, the answer is yes, it is. It's an array. And away we go. Um, okay. So, there, because the PHP arrays maintain order, um, there is ability to sort them. The strange thing is, is the worst sort that PHP has is the one named sort. Because what sort by itself, and it actually changes the array, um, and so sort by itself changes the array in place, 
So if the array before the sort had this in it, it's going to sort it by the values, not the keys, sorted by the values, not the keys, and it's going to produce an array that is integer based. And so it, it actually wipes out the keys, but the values are now, now sorted, and they're given 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, if you wanted to write a counted for loop to go through them afterwards, then this is a cool way to do it, because the counted for loop wants an, ar an array that's integer indexed and dense, compact, with no gaps. But I almost never, ever do that, because if I made a key value array, now if I made an integer key array, then sorts just fine, but if I'm, I'm so often I'm making key value arrays, um, so I don't use it. But there are thankfully other ones, and uh, for those of you who are coming from Python, uh, boy, it's a lot, it's nice to have these uh, uh, sort functions that just do what you want to do. Okay, and so here we have that same array, that same array, we print it out, comes out, right? Then we can do a case sort that says sort by keys, and then we print that out. Oh, isn't it pretty? Sorting by keys, pretty, pretty, pretty. And then we have a sort. I don't know why they call it a sort. I would call it v sort to sort by values. Then we print that out, and now it's sorted by values. This is like, why are you making me in other languages do this stuff? It's their associative arrays. I want to be able to sort it by. Uh, values and I want to be sorted by keys. Just let me do it and because it stays in order, once you've sorted it, it stays in order so life is simple and you can sort them however you want. So that's cool as heck. A lot of what we do in these languages is processing strings and splitting strings based on spaces or other characters. The, for I don't know, the historical accident that led to this being called explode. It might be because Perl called it explode. I don't know, I can never remember Perl because I don't want to remember Perl. But the function is explode, and because PHP is not object-oriented, you gotta pass both the string and the delimiter in. Um, and this is the delimiter, so break this on spaces, and that's the st string, so it just chop, 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 chop. It just breaks it into pieces and then sends us back, as the return value, it sends us back an array with the pieces. So if you want the the, zero, one, two, third word, there you go, it's, you know, dollar temp sub three. So that's the third word. So another place that we see arrays in PHP is in the parsing of URL parameters when uh, we hit a, in the request response cycle. So just a little example of this, here we go with a URL. So this is a big long URL, it's just a, a normal thing, it's part of HTML, but you can also put parameters. You put the question mark at the end of the URL, and then you have key value pairs, x equals two, and if you have more than one, you put an ampersand, and a second key value pair. What happens is PHP puts this into an array, a global, a super global array called $get. And a lot of times we do use these, uh, PHP uses these big uh, global arrays, it's all uppercase, trying to tell you that dollar underscore get is a special thing, it names it with an underscore, and so it just, you would have to write code to parse all this stuff, but it magically parses it and puts it in key value pairs in the array dollar underscore get, and here we see it both with var dump and with, um, with dollar get, and I'm putting it in a pre-tag so it looks a little nicer, so the print art comes out nicer with the uh, uh, the variable, so we can see everything. But that's you can hit that URL, you play with it, and you can change these values, and you can see that these values change. And so it's a way of communicating from the end of the URL into PHP code. And the way you can kind of think about this is the the request is going in and has x equals two on the end of it, and part of this thing where we always say parse the request. You know, it figures out which PHP code to run, and then it actually takes these x equals two and it places in $get, and that happens before the script starts. And so that is something that is defined at the beginning of the script when it all starts, okay? So we've talked through a whole bunch of features of arrays. We've talked about the functions that you have to use for arrays. Uh, you know, how wonderful they are, the different kinds of sorting that you can do, uh, and how the arrays work when uh, they are part of a URL as well. So we'll find that uh, arrays are just a really foundational data structure in PHP, and uh, we'll keep learning more and more about how to use arrays. Hello, and welcome to our lecture on functions and modularity. So why do we use functions? Well, certainly we accomplish so many things in PHP using functions because 
It's not uh, strings, for example, are not objects. And so we pass strings into functions all the time to do basic string manipulation. And of course, as our uh, application gets more complex, we're going to write a lot of functions ourselves uh, to reuse perhaps for ourselves and perhaps for other folks. Um, I think it's a mistake in uh, computer science to basically say that writing functions is important. I mean, it's an important skill, but it's not like you have to write them if you don't feel like it. Straight line code is fine. Uh, the, the key is, is there will come a time when you'll write, want to write functions. You'll just want to not repeat yourself and be like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this similar thing over and over again. I'll turn a parameter in. I'll pull this stuff out because i got to use it here and in this other file, etc. And so it's just, it's just the goal of not repeating yourself, and it greatly increases the reliability of your programs uh, when, you, when you use it. PHP has a, a language. Uh, the function calls are a little harder to remember, and so I really kind of need uh, Google all the time when I'm programming. And so, you know, I'll say, hey, what's the string replace function? I, I know right now that it's str underscore replace, but I don't always know the order of the parameters. So Google is very good at finding you on the first click right to the kind of documentation that you need. Um, you know, and so you're hitting the stir replace and there you go. And it's like, oh yeah, the search replace and then the, the subject. And so if you look at this particular call, this is a non-object oriented style of a call in, uh, in an object oriented language like uh, with uh, strings as objects in a language like Python, you'd say string dot replace old new. Um, here you have to pass the string in as one of the parameters. I would hope that someday in a future version of PHP, they would give us the alternative of a string being an object, but who knows if that's going to happen. But there's tons of uh, string manipulation functions. Here's just a couple, you know, uh, reversing a string, repeating it and concatenating it to itself twice, uh, sending it to uppercase and asking how long it is. Okay, so sterlet. You'll notice they often start with str and that is the pattern of how you have global functions that um, really would make more sense as part of an object, but they're not. So there you go. Uh, to define your own functions, uh, there's a keyword called function, and um, you give the function name an option list of parameters, and then a starting curly brace and an ending curly brace, and then the function is the body. And of course, it's the store and repeat pattern where the, as, as PHP runs this code, it is simply remembering this new greet thing. It's like, okay, that's what you want me to do later whenever you say greet, and then you invoke it. So it runs and runs the code, comes back, runs it again, comes back. And so this is the invoking of a function or calling of the function. And this is the defining. The top part is the defining of the function. <clears throat> and so that's the syntax. It's the word function followed by the name of the function, optional parameters, and then a curly brace block that is the body of the function. Uh, function names are very similar to variable names. You can't start them with a dollar sign. So that means letters or underscores, and then the rest of it can be letters, numbers, or underscores. You don't want to define your own function that overlaps an existing function. So be careful about that. Case does not matter, but please don't count on that. Um, always write your code in a way that case matches, because who knows, in some future version, uh, things may be different. Uh, return values, uh, like most C-based languages, the return statement takes a, a, a value and it replaces in the expression. And so here we have this expression that's being evaluated, greeting concatenated, function greeting concatenated with this string space Glenn. And so as uh, PHP is evaluating this, it's like, oh, I got to go call this code. So it calls the code. And, and this happens just return hello. And the return, the, the return bit sort of replaces the function in the uh, in the expression that's halfway through being evaluated. So hell gets hello gets concatenated to Glenn, and then out comes hello Glenn. We do the same thing. The hello replaces the greeting, and then it becomes hello Sally. And so the return, basically within an expression, replaces the function call value with the return value. And you can, you know, this is just one line. Keep it small on a slide. The return statement can, is an executable statement. You, can, you don't have to be the, it doesn't have to be the last line. It can be anywhere within. And when it executes inside of a function, it both stops function execution and determines what the residual value in the original calling expression is going to be. 
Arguments are simply variables that are, they're sort of not really real variables. They're placeholders that are aliases in a sense. So in the, this particular bit of code, if we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to take the language in as a, as a parameter. Now dollar $lang sort of doesn't exist as a variable. It is an alias in the first call to the string quote es quote. And then it runs and does the thing and it returns in this case, you know, hola Glenn. And then the second time, it is an alias to quote fr quote. So it's not a real variable, it is an alias to that which is the first parameter in the call. And, uh, and away we go. <coughs> I like how PHP does optional arguments. You simply say, if this argument doesn't exist, in this case, if, if lang is not pres presented as a, if it's missing from the arguments, <coughs> set it to es. So that's the default. The ES is the default in this particular thing. And sometimes we actually have a default value. In this case, we'll just assume Spanish is our default language. Or you can say false, and then you can check to see if it's false. And so sometimes we set the default in a way to know if it's submitted in your code. And then you have an if statement to say if it's false, da da da. And then you can know what you want to do if it's uh, if the if the statement wasn't of the parameter wasn't present. And if you put the parameter in, then, then this part here is ignored and it just is the alias for the first parameter to the function call. <clears throat> Normally in most languages, you, we do what's called call by value. And that is that because this variable is an alias to the call, in this case, val is a variable in, in the outer uh, scope is 10. Um, we get to see the 10, the 10 comes in, but it is that we don't remain connected to the val. So in a sense, you can see the, at the moment it comes to here, it actually makes a copy of its parameter. And then 10 is working here and this becomes 20 and this becomes 20. So the return value is 20. And so dval ends up with 20 comes into dval and then we print out 20. And so that's fine. But we notice here in this line that val is unchanged. That's the key to this. And the call by value, which is the normal way most uh, variables are passed into functions unless they're arrays or objects, but just a variable like 12 or a string, it's a copy, Co copy as it's called so that you can, you can actually modify this on the left hand side. And that's not modifying the original. That's to reduce the potential for side effects of a function. You just don't want the function to be able to do something to mess with the variables outside the function. And it's, it's, a, it's a good way to sort of draw a really solid boundary around the function and, and pass something in and get something back out and not have it mess with our variables. It's like just an isolation. Um, and so call by value is pretty typical. Um, what's cool about PHP is they also uh, give an option to call by reference. And so when you say call by reference, and this is sort of a throwback to C, although C doesn't use, it uses the ampersand, but not in the exact same way. Um, you basically put an ampersand in the parameter and you are then as the writer of the function notifying the outside world that you are planning on changing this first parameter. And when you want to change the first parameter, you just put it over here on the left hand side. And so, you know, real thing is a 10. So val comes in as a 10 but it's not only 10, but it's also dollar $val. So now dollar real thing is equivalent within the function to dollar $val. It's not a, an alias to the value of dollar $val, it is equivalent to. So what happens is, is of course, this becomes 10 because it is equivalent to dollar $val. And then 10 times three is 30. 30, it goes into real thing. We have no return value, which is totally okay. But then we come back and we notice back here that $val has tripled. And that's simply because we ran this assignment statement inside the function. And we said, we're going to mess with that. Give us the actual variable, not a copy of the actual variable. It's important because as you're reading the PHP documentation, you might find that the sort function takes an array as a parameter and it is telling you right here that it is planning on changing it. And so you, that's a clue to you when you're reading documentation that that parameter is going to be altered. And so you're going to sort this array and it's going to rewrite that array in place. So you know that that's going to happen. Up next, we'll talk a little bit more about how the function is isolated from the rest of the code, how that function can break out of that, and other aspects of uh, PHP modularity. 
So welcome back to our lecture on scope and modularity of functions. So what we mean by scope is we mean the idea of if you're inside of a function and you do something to a variable, how broadly will that affect it? And the default is um, you're very isolated. We call it namespacing. So you can have a variable x out in the outside world and you can have a variable x inside of a function and they don't affect each other. So that's the normal scope, right? So even though in this case I have uh, I mean, the normal scope is there's kind of this isolation and you can either pass stuff in and get it out by a return and then sort of what happens in here is just hidden. It's like isolated. And in this case, because I've got Val outside and I've got Val inside, it seems as though they're a match, but they're not the same thing because they don't cross this boundary. And so if we look at this code and we take a look at it, uh, we see that it comes in, you know, Val is 10. Then it runs this code, comes in this val, which is different. You can say like this val is the val, you know, try zap underscore val, because it's the one inside try zap. Doesn't work that way. And so we set it to 100 here, and we come back, and it's still in this outer context. So there's outer scope and inner scope. This one got set to 100. It really did. But outside, it stayed 10. And so that's normal, and that's exactly what you want, because you might have very different programmers writing this code than this code, and you don't want the choice of variable names inside that function to have any effect on the outside world, because a lot of people use the variable i for counters, or count for counters, or you know who knows what. And so you just don't want to do that. On the other hand, sometimes you want to very explicitly share the namespace. And you have to do this on a variable by variable basis. You can't say that all the variables in this function are shared with the outside world, but you can say that a particular one is. And the way you do that is with this global. You say global val. And so that says that this particular value, you know, we have this little thing. It's all isolated. We have kind of the in of the parameters and the out of return. But val has this special little road to the outside world. So val is connected to the val in the global scope. And this is the global scope out here that's not inside any function. And so that just means that these two things are connected. And so we set the global val to 10 here. We run zap, comes in here, it runs this, and we set the global val to 100. And that is the same thing. And so when we come back, it's 100. And so that just means that you're sharing it. And of course, be, be very careful. This is really a it means that your functions begin to have side effects and it should be something that you and the outside rural programmer, if you're different, need to greatly agree on. Because if you start making global dollar i, if you put global dollar i and people start using your code and you're changing their, they're in a loop outside here and you put a loop in here and then their loop blows up because you changed the value of i, they're not going to be very happy with you. So don't ever do that. As a matter of fact, we just want to use these things so rarely um, because you want to do anything but that. If you can pass it as a parameter, or you can send it back as a return value, and if you want to change it, you pass it by reference. If you really, 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 after all those things, can't think that you, you, know, you think you just can't do it with anything but a global variable, we, I tend to write really long, ugly global variable names to sort of punish myself for even thinking about using them in the first place. But sometimes they're the way to solve it. They really are. Uh, it's not elegant, but you got this problem and you got to pass something and it's not really part of the return value and you want to be able to peek in to see what the last error. You see things in PHP like, show me the last error. Well, that's got some global value, but somebody made it a really long thing. I tend to use all uppercase and make them long and use underscores and have them multiple words just so that within my function, you don't, I don't, unintentionally hit one of your variables like dollar $x or dollar $line or dollar $handle or dollar $json or something like that. I never would do that. It's got to be super long. And then when I document it, I say, oh, and this touches this global variable and sets this. And if you want to look at it, you can look at it. Sometimes I pass information into functions and sometimes I take information out of functions with global variables, but I use them very, very rarely. And when I do, I give them horribly long names. So one of the things that we do inside uh, uh, PHP is PHP evolves over time, and uh, and that's nice. Uh, you know, PHP didn't have object oriented capabilities, and then it did. Uh, certain cool functions that uh, people had to write over and over again eventually were added. But each of these things were added at a particular version of PHP, and so you don't know what version you're running. And 
often we write code that we're going to share with other people and so we have to check sometimes what version we have or perhaps you just have a function and I've got a bunch of code like this over time you can throw it away because the ver everyone's version catches up um, but for example uh, ray combined doesn't exist in all values of PHP and you can call this function called function exist that's a function it's kind of inception because we're going all the way down you say hey does this function exist and you pass in a string so it's not like a function reference and it looks in all the functions and finds if it's there if it is you know it gets back a true otherwise a false now usually you don't just print this echo out usually what you do actually is you define the function you do nothing here and then you actually define the function and so it's a way for you to put in com backwards compatibility code if you want to use a uh, function that may or may not exist in the version your customers are going to be running, you can say, if it doesn't exist, define it, and then write in PHP something that does what array combine does, and then when they run it on a version of PHP that has array combine built into it, then they just start using the default one. And then, like I say, a few years later, you throw the code away because you say, I've got to use PHP 7 for everything. And there is some stuff between PHP, you know, even in the versions of PHP 5 that were added and then coming to PHP 7, um, which is a great language, um, but we can't, we got to be careful because not everyone is running uh, PHP 7. So when you look at the uh, documentation of PHP on the php.net, you will see that uh, it tells you often what versions this particular function works in. And so this one is version greater than PHP 407 and at this point everyone's at least on PHP 5 but again so this one you probably wouldn't want to do but you get the idea that they're trying to communicate to you that this is not in every single uh, version and so that's a function there the other thing that's interesting is PHP is sort of a moving target the you know we will have your desktop PHP which will be a particular version with a particular set of plugins and then you'll move it to a server and then something will stop working. You're like, well, what version am I running on this server? What functions? And, and it just, sometimes you have to probe the implementation of PHP or the instance of PHP that you're working with. And so they have built into PHP this function called PHP info. And literally, you will commonly write this three line thing um, in a PHP file to dump out the PHP internal configuration. And it's a lot of information. And if you did my very first assignment, you've actually already looked at it because we wanted to figure out if display errors was on or off. And we wanted to make sure display errors was on. By the way, quick little advertisement, please make sure display errors is on for all your sanity when writing PHP. And so those are just some screenshots that come out of this and it tells about where it was compiled, what options it has. It goes into detail about various, what things are in it, what software is configured as part of your PHP, what's missing, what's present, all your display settings etc 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 and so it's super useful as you're trying to say why doesn't this thing work the way that I'm expecting it to work um, and so that's you, you often have to do that to figure out something and all that output all those tables and little gray and blue that all comes out that's all just coming out of that function literally you write three lines of code and it dumps all this stuff out for the configuration and that's because it turns out to be important from time to time for you to kind of peer into your PHP environment. So now let's talk a little bit about programming in multiple files. And it's, it's kind of like functions, but it's also just a, a version of modularity. And so there's a couple of PHP statements that allow you in one PHP file to pull in the contents of another PHP file. There are four basic variations. There's the include and the require. Uh, the difference between include and require is include is a non-fatal error, but often your PHP will complain anyways. So you, sometimes you have to put this in an if statement to see if you really want it to be optional. You have to say if file exists to see if it's there and then include it. Um, the, the more interesting ones are the once versions. And so usually if you're pulling something like the header of a document in, you just use the include to say, I want to put it here. But if you're pulling in a library code that just a bunch of functions or maybe some objects that are being defined, you can use the require once. And what that does is if it's above you somehow already been required, um, you don't require it again. And so it just is a way to say that you can say, I need this set of library functions. And then later, maybe in another library function, it says I need this set of same set of library functions. And PHP will figure out if it's already been included and then not include it twice, which is a really nice feature. So let's talk a little bit about how you might use this as you're developing a website. So here is 
web applications for everybody, my happy little website. And as you move between and you, you know, you come here and you're on this page and then you click here and you go to this page. And it looks like this top navigation bit just doesn't change. It looks like a desktop application. And so it really does change the full request response cycle. Now I'm not talking about, you know, Ajax or in browser stuff, but in this case, the URL changed. We went from one URL to another URL. A full request response cycle happened, but we want to basically put the same stuff at the top on every page. Could be hundreds of pages, literally. And so how do we do that? Well, that's what we use these requires for, or includes or requires. Um, in this case, require wouldn't matter, require once, it doesn't really matter because we're going to demand them. So what I've built is I have built in this particular website in the same folder as index.php, I've got a file called top.php and nav.php. So at top.php, it doesn't produce any output. It's all the CSS and JavaScript and setup. The, the header part and the title of the page and all that comes out. And then the nav.php issues the, the navigation bit. So the nav.php is all this part. And then I'm done and I'm going to have the body of the document that comes up here. That's this body. And then I've got some stuff that's got to be at the end of every page. So I switch back into PHP and then I require some footer. So, so there's an index.php, a top.php, a nav.php, a foot.php, and they're all in the same folder. And now I've separated these things out into modules. Um, sometimes you could make these functions, and as we increasingly move towards more object-oriented, you'll see some code that uses functions for this. But the classic way to do this is uh, with uh, require statements. So now here's another page, right? Here's the install.php. And so what the install.php does is it requires that same top to get the CSS and JavaScript environment right, the same nav to put out the pretty little nav bar, and then we have slightly different HTML, which is the body of it, the part that you see, and then we make sure we require the footer, which in this case, if you go down far enough, I think this one has a copyright on it and some stuff so that there's a copyright at the bottom of every page, and there's a little bit of JavaScript that happens at the bottom of every page, and like analytics tracking and stuff like that. So you see this pattern where now you just keep replacing this middle part, and that's really the content of the website. This middle part gets replaced over and over and over as you move from one page to another. And so that's one of the ways that we do these, um, these pages that have to have repeating elements on them uh, over and over. And so that's a quick run through functions in PHP, how we make new functions, the different forms of passing like default values, and also including and requiring files as well as scoping and uh, dealing with the fact that PHP is changing, how to figure out what you're, what's in your PHP, what version you're running using PHP info, and then using function exists to sort of patch your PHP if uh, certain things are not present in the version of PHP that you're using. Hope you found this useful. Cheers. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Today we're going to learn a little bit about NGROC. NGROC is a way that we can get our assignments auto-graded and perhaps you are in the lesson where um, we're doing this grading of the guessing game, right? We're grading the guessing game. And we have to put some code here. And the problem here is that we have to have this code running on our laptop or our because this server is on the real internet and it can't talk to your laptop. And so what I've got is I've got some code running here and it's in my applications MAMP HDDocs ASSN subguest subbroken.php. And so I'm running MAMP so that code right there is the same as what I'm seeing here. And so if I type guess, you know, I can say guess equals 42. Well, or I get missing guess parameter and our guess equals 42. Yay, I'm right. Okay, so the problem is if I just take this URL and I put it in the guessing game, I mean if I put it in the auto grader, this auto grader is running out there in the internet somewhere and it can't connect to localhost because your localhost is not also on the internet. So we have to find a way. So this is going to blow up really badly and this shows you something about the test. When things blow up, sort of look from the bottom up and look for toggle. And this, it looks icky. You have to read it. This looks like it might be like a bug, but it's not. It is a, um, it can't connect to port 808088, connection refused, this URL. So don't just assume that the autograder is blown up. Sometimes the autograder like gets an error 
and it shows you what it is and it tried to retrieve your file and it couldn't so you know some, something went wrong okay so uh, so that's the that's the problem we've got to get to the point where this we can't use this localhost URL but as I've said there is this wonderful piece of software called ngrok and what ngrok does basically is makes it so that anyone on the real internet can talk to your laptop so over here is where the server is this is where your MAMP is this is you and your right so you're running MAMP over here right MAMP over there and this is the auto grader right here the auto grader cannot talk to your local host it can't do that that doesn't work but you can run a piece of software that effectively exports your local host to this place called ngrok.com and then the auto grader can talk to that and I'm going to show you how to do that now to get this to work you've got to download some software so let's do that let's go to download now it's different from Mac and different from Windows so I'm going to download it and does it's a pretty small piece of code and I'm going to put this in it's going to be in my downloads folder where's the downloads folder there's the downloads folder and it's a zip file there might be different install processes for Windows but you'll get to the get point where you have this ngrok running okay so so we have this running on localhost and we've downloaded ngrok so what I've got to do is I've got to start a terminal window or command prompt if you're on Windows and I have to get myself in that terminal window I have got to go into that downloads folder and in Macintosh it's user downloads and I do an ls minus l and I can see that this ngrok is here and this was the zip file and I can start it by saying dot slash ngrok it's important that I don't have to run ngrok in the same as where my code's at because ngrok is basically forwarding port 808088 48s to the, the web so I'm just going to say dot slash ngrok HTTP, we're going to fake the HTTP protocol, and localhost 80, the 8888 port on this localhost. And if all goes well, NGROC is going to wake up, and then it's going to tell you an address. Now the key to this is that this address is only going to work while this NGROC program is running. A program is running now and forwarding all these connections. So the thing to do, and you'll get a different one of these every time. And so if I go here and I go to NGROC.io, you will see exactly what happens if you go to localhost 8088 see all that stuff and my assignments are sitting here in assignments I can go to assignments and I can go into the guest folder and now I'm here except this URL is a real URL this is a URL that can run anywhere on the internet this URL can only run on a browser that's running on my computer sitting at my my localhost so now I can use this guest.php and I can turn this into oops the auto grader so I got to go back and I got to launch the auto grader and give it this URL so now I'm going to say run this this is a real URL anywhere on the internet including where this auto grader is running from because this auto grader is really running somewhere on the internet so what happens is when I hit evaluate go back to that. When I hit evaluate, this is going to connect to NGROC and NGROC is going to send data to your computer and the request response cycle is going to come back. Now interestingly, if you watch, you can see this happen here. And so you've seen I've already done some get requests. And there's actually a little there's actually a little monitor guy that I can put up over here, 127.0, that's another word for localhost. And this is actually allows me to inspect the data that's going back and forth here. So my auto grader talks to the NGROC, NGROC talks to your computer in a reverse way, and you're watching this data that's going back and forth. And that's what's going on here and here. Okay, so both of these are talking. So I'll just leave this, um, let's make this a little more narrow now so you can kinda, let's put this maybe way over here so you can see it, oops made it too small no it's not looking good okay okay we'll watch it over here 
So now I am back where I'm going to do my evaluation. You can watch action happening over here. Now one of the things about this assignment, depending on who you are, it gives you a different number. And so that's why you've got to change this code. So I'm supposed to make 37 be my correct answer to get full credit. So I'm going to evaluate it. And you can see it's, it's talking. See, it went, it went talking. Uh, didn't find Chuck Severance in the title tag. Guess is too high. Now, the key is, is you're like, oh, what's wrong? Look at the toggle. Okay. So it's like, did not find Chuck Severance in the title tag. Well, oh, that's because it's Charles Severance. Okay. Um, looking for your guess is too high. It says your guess is too low. You see, it, it's always trying to tell you as much as it can. I'm not trying to make this tricky. Okay. And so the problem here is, is this code that I've got, that's guess code, um, has got 42 is the right answer. So I can fix my program by making 37 be the right answer. 37, 37, save. Now I can rerun the test and I should pass that stuff. And these errors went away, but Chuck Severance is still not in the title tag. So I changed that, Chuck Severance. And I rerun the test and I got passed. Okay, so there we go. Everything is good. I don't know what that internal error is. That's probably because I'm an instructor. Yeah, but um, so there you go. So that's the basic idea of how you run NGROC. And the way you finish this when you're all done with this is you just hit Control C. So remember this AFA 30 something. Okay, so I'm going to hit Control C. And now this URL ceases to work. Right, this one will blow up because I'm not there on the other side, so it doesn't find it. If I run NGROC again, I start the tunnel back up, but you will notice I will get a different number, 5EB something. So, so this address no longer works, but this one does. So you can start and stop NGROC as many times as you want, but you sort of have to realize that every time you start and stop it, you're going to get a new you're going to get a new address. Now you can actually pay money to them to get more permanent addresses, etc., etc. But as long as you know how to switch back and forth and get the right address, it should be it should not be difficult whatsoever. Okay. And so uh, there we go. I, I hope this has helped you understand how to use NGROC uh, so that you can uh, do the uh, uh, send your assignments from your laptop web server all the way to the autograder on the internet. Hello, and welcome to another recording for Web Applications for Everybody. In this application, I'm going to talk to you about how to use NGROC to turn in your assignment for one of the auto-graded assignments. Now, the idea is, is you're talking to the auto-grader, and it's going to talk to this website, and you've built your code, and so you're, you built your code on your computer. Your computer is here, so it's on localhost, something, something, something. You know, and so you can say question mark guess equals 12, right? So there you go. So your guess is too low. But the problem is, is that you can't take this URL localhost, you can't take that URL, and you can't put it into here. Oops, I messed up. Got to copy that again. Copy. Paste. So this server, web applications, is going to call localhost. The problem is that localhost doesn't work. Okay, localhost on your computer is in effect firewalled from the rest of the world. So this is not going to work. This is going to blow up, blah, 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 blah. And so it's blowing up terribly. Okay. And so the, the problem is, is that you need to have a real address for this code right here. And that's where NGROC comes in. So we're going to go to ngroc, ngroc.com. Now ngroc is free, and um, basically the idea is that this code's running on your laptop, and your laptop is normally blocked from the world coming in. Your laptop doesn't have a real address, a real domain address, and ngroc makes it temporarily so that your, your code can be viewed. It doesn't move it, it just makes it so it can be viewed, okay? And so we're going to install this software on your laptop so that my server can can run and talk to yours just temporarily and then you'll shut that off. So let's go ahead and download this. I'm going to download the Windows version of NGROC. I'm going to have to go ahead and open that. So now I've got NGROC and I'm going to put this on my desktop so I can use it from the command line. 
and then close this window and then close this window. Okay, so I'm going to use this in the command line, so I'm going to type command. You can actually put this in any folder that you want. I'm just putting it in my desktop. So here I am in my desktop, and if I do a dir, you'll see that ngrok is here. So if I say ngrok HTTP 80, and 80 is the port that you're currently running on. 80 is the default port for a web server. So ngrok will start up, and then ngrok will assign us a temporary address. And so I'm going to grab this temporary address and then copy it, and then I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go to that address. Okay. And so this is the same as um, this is the same as <clears throat> what's on my computer. So if I take this URL, PHP Solutions, right here, and I copy that and I add it to the end of ngrok, see, it is going to go from with a real address now. So what's happened is ngrok has temporarily given you an address. And so now I can take this URL and copy this and go into my auto grader and put it in and now it will run it. And, and you can see while it's running it that, I made that a little too small, you can see while it's running it, there we go, well you can see while it's running it these request response cycles that are going back and forth. Okay, and so that's one of the cool things about ngrok. I can rerun that and you'll see these things go as my server talks to your application. See, it's doing stuff. Now, I mean, it doesn't have certain things, it's got the guess wrong, etc., etc. So this version isn't the right thing. But the idea is, is that you can take something on your local host and then you can export it and get a temporary domain name for the code running on your laptop, and then you can hand that in. And then once you're done with that, once you're all completed, you just come in here and you hook your deconnect yourself back off the internet. So now nothing can talk to you. And so the, you had this temporary opening uh, for ngrok, and now you just shut it down. Now you'll note, I hit up arrow here and run it again, that every time you connect with ngrok, it will give you a different address. So this one I had 2A89 something, now it's 80. So, and I'll type control C because I don't really want to do it. It gives you a different address every time. So you'll get used to this. It will be not too tricky after a while. It'll make a lot more sense to you, okay? Hope this has helped. Cheers. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. In this presentation, we're going to talk about how to submit your assignment to an auto grader. Now, we don't use the auto grader until later in the course. And in the first assignment, this guessing game assignment in this course, we have a lot of documentation about how to use the auto grader. And so the idea of the auto grader is that you're going to submit your running application to the auto grader. And the auto grader is going to send requests to your application and look at the responses. The problem is, is if you've got your application running on your local host, which is the way you uh, are doing that, um, you can't simply pass this localhost value into the running applications, okay? Because localhost is a very special address, and localhost only works from the browser that's running on your computer talking to the server that's running on your computer. So localhost is not sort of an external address. And so we have to temporarily give your server an external address. Now, normally your server is firewalled away from incoming connections. And so we have to kind of break an opening through the firewall. And there's a couple of different uh, applications that can do this. One of them is called ngrok and one of them is called local tunnel. In this video, I'm going to demonstrate uh, the use of local tunnel. So local tunnel is a, a little weird in that um, local tunnel is a little hard to install. Okay, so here's the local tunnel website. You're welcome to use this website, but this NPM stuff on your computer, you might, it's hard to get to the point where NPM is working. If you're a already sophisticated web developer and you have NPM, which is the node package manager, then fine, this is really great and this is really easy. So this makes sense to you. But I'm expecting that most of you are not going to know how to, uh, not gonna want to uh, run it. And so I built a local tunnel for Macintosh 
that makes it so that it's a sort of a single click install. So here we go. I'm going to uh, click on this and it's going to download this zip file. And I'm going to show this in the finder. So here we go. And I'm going to double click on the Macintosh document. And so this is unexecutable. So I'm going to put that in the downloads folder. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a terminal program. And I am going to go into my desktop. I'm going to do an LS and, um, oh, not desktop, downloads. So I'm on downloads, do my LS. It's always good to do an LS to make sure you're in the right spot. Here's the LT Mac file that I just downloaded. And so what I'm going to do is just run this command dot slash LT Mac minus port 8888. And so it just happens that my MAMP runs on port 8088 locally. And what this is going to do is this is going to copy uh, everything on port 8088 out to the internet and give us a temporary uh, domain name. So this domain name is really important. And so I can basically take this URL and re just replace the localhost 8088. You don't have to put the 8088 on because it's actually taken the port as well. And so now I have this slash WA free solutions guest guest PHP. And now I can hit this. Now this is the exact same thing. It's really my local URL. But it's my stuff running on my server. It's just it has a temporary domain name just long enough for you to turn in your assignment. OK, so then what you do is you copy this. First, you want to get it working like this in your browser and make sure that it comes back with the page you expect to come back to, because if it doesn't work here, it's not going to hurt work here with the auto grader. Now, this is particularly solution and I'm supposed to make my my right answer be 50. And so this auto grader is not going to work very well. OK, it's going to got, give me full credit. And so it's trying to find some things and it's telling me with these toggles, you can always look and see what it's complaining about, see the pages. And so even if I made all kinds of mistakes, 72 <laughs> percent with all these mistakes. And so that ought, that went ba right back into my assignments. And so uh, uh, away we go. And so that basically uh, summarizes how we use local tunnel. You can also use NGROC, but how we use local tunnel to submit running applications to the auto grader. Hello, and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. In, in this video, we're going to show you how to turn in an assignment that's using the auto grader. Now, the idea is that somewhere you've got yourself your assignment that's running. You're running here. To say the guest assignment and it's you know working on your local host it's running in MAMP and everything's running fine and now your job is to turn it in now you can't just put the uh, local host in here you can't just put local host in there because if you do then it can't connect because local host only works kind of talking from the browser inside your server to the web server that's running inside your server so you have to get a temporary domain name. And there's a couple of different pieces of software. One of them is NGROC. The other one is called Local Tunnel. And um, I've got, you can go to localtunnel.me and go through their installation processes. Uh, they, they require a bit of work, okay? And so, um, so there's, if you don't want to do that, I've got a download and there'll be documentation on this. WA4E.com downloads ltwin.zip. And so this will download a copy that I've made already quite simply ready for you to go. And so this is my local tunnel for Windows. I'm going to put this on my desktop. You could put it in any folder that you wanted. Um, and now I'm going to do what's called, I'm going to run local tunnel. So you could, you could go NPM. You have to install a bunch of stuff before NPM works. And so that might be a little long, but you're welcome to do it. Um, you're welcome to do anything you want. So command, so I'll go to the command prompt and I'm going to go into my desktop and I'm going to do a dir. Those things are all sitting there on, on there on my desktop. And I'm going to run uh, uh, lt-win and then I'm going to say I'd like to run this and I'm going to copy port 80. So what's going to happen is it's going to take everything that's on port 80 and give it a outside your firewall 
uh, temporary uniform URL. Okay, so this is a URL, and I'm going to grab this URL. So I'm going to copy that, and now I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to put it in. And so you see that what's happened now is that what's on my web application, so this is my first folder, that's my PHP, and so this is this MAMP server that's going out here. Now the nice thing about this is this is a real live global URL as long as this program is running. So I can take whatever the URL is here. I can take PHP solutions, not the localhost part, just that part, and I can add it to the end of this URL, right? And then that is the same. So this URL and this URL temporarily are the same. But it, the difference is, is now the outside world can see this URL. So once you can do this and run your application, so let's go here, control C. Um, let's go back and run the auto grader again. And then put that in and then run the auto grader. Yeah, so that's working a little better, but it's doing various things and I've got the wrong number because my guess is supposed to be 50. So I'm not really, this one doesn't fully meet the specifications and uh, so I got only partial credit, okay? So that basically shows you how to use uh, local tunnel. So now we're gonna talk about form processing in PHP. PHP's goal is not just as a programming language, but it's a programming language to implement web applications. And so it takes some effort, puts effort into making dealing with things like uh, forms in HTML as easy as possible. And the way it does this is these super global variables. It takes things like um, parameters on the URL and post data and puts them in what are called super globals. And the reason they call them super globals and they give them a, um, a name like uh, dollar underscore get is that even inside of functions these are present you do not have to use the global keyword to get at them and so they're they're sort of decided from the outside in that it's global you can make a global variable in a function if you want as we've talked about but these super globals are sort of automatically made global and so we talked about this in the last section where we you know we took a look at the get data you put a parameter on the uh, end of a URL and that is copied nicely into the key value pairs in the dollar underscore get. And we can use something like print r and var dump. Of course, we enclose them in pre-tags um, to take a look at what's in um, this. So if you look at how this works on the request response cycle, you know, you click with the URL, it goes in, the get with x equals two shows up, that goes into the web server, which parses the request and pulls these values off as key value pairs. And there's actually lots of rules for what these things are formatted. X equals two is just the simplest of them. Um, and then the super global array dollar get is produced and it is created before your, the first line of your code starts. And then of course we are doing the printout and it comes back and we see that. And so, so that's just part of the infrastructure that's provided to us by PHP. Now, the web would be kind of boring if we always just had to put these parameters on. So there are many ways to send this kind of parameter data into a web uh, script running on the server. And one of them is a form. And so form is an HTML tag, uh, starts with form and ends with slash form. And um, if effectively there's this input tag which creates open little boxes. So you basically say, oh, put a place for the user to type something, an input area of text and the name, and, and the name will end up be part of the key value pairs that are submitted an ID is actually part of the CSS, which says that if I want to access this form, I'm going to use the ID of guest. So name, this, is, this part is for the server, and this part here is for CSS. Now one of the things that you do is you put these labels in. The label is just a tag to say that this information is the label for that, and that's useful for screen readers and other things. So a text field opens up a little box here, and the submit field says, send the data to the server, which is kind of like an href, an anchor tag. It's like clicking on the text, the anchor tag, so it causes request response cycle to go in to the browser, uh, to the server, from the browser to the server. So when the form is uh, first, uh, we go first to this web page and we take a look at the information, we kind of, oops, come back. 
We take a look at the information. It comes down, it, pa it, uh, it paints the form, and, and it paints this. And then we move our cursor in and we type 12, and then we press the submit button. And then that submits back to that same URL, except now it adds the parameter guess equals 12. And that guess came from this parameter, and the 12 came from what we typed in. And so that's how, uh, using a GET request, data is moved from a form into the server. Now, form1.php runs on the server, and it PHP parses it and puts it in the $GET, and all that other stuff. It's just a way to get the parameters off of the screen rather than teaching the user to type stuff up in here. Okay? So, this is that code that we're doing. Um, <clears throat> we can see what the GET array is, and the GET array is this global array. Uh, this is kind of review because we've already seen this in the, in the previous lecture, but we'll just print it out. And the, the, the field that starts here ends up on there. The name is guess, and then it is parsed and put into the dollar $get, and this name guess ends up as part of the dollar $get array, and the value, whatever the 12 is, that you put in here ends up here. And so that's how you take a user input area and get it into your program via a GET request. So um, up next, we're going to talk about the other way that we send data in from other than a GET request, and that is the POST request. So we've talked about how we can use the GET with forms, and now we're going to talk about how we send POST data to the form. And it works pretty much the same way. We make a form out here, and then we tell it to send the data via POST rather than via GET. It's kind of like send it in a different envelope. And so we send it via POST, and the data that comes in via POST ends up like the dollar $GET in a variable called dollar $POST. Now we'll talk in a bit kind of the technical differences, um, but from an HTML perspective, it's super trivial. All you have to do if you want to um, send the data via POST rather than GET is say method equals POST on the form. It's going to do the exact same thing as it would with the GET. Now one of the things that you'll notice right away is there is no x guess equals 12 question mark. And that's because the data is no longer being transmitted on the URL. And it comes in because we've asked it to come into in the post variable, so it shows up just the same as key value pair, and the key is be based on the name variable, I mean the name attribute on the input tag, and the get is empty, right? So the get's empty because we didn't use a get, and we didn't put anything on there. You can actually have both get parameters and post data, but in this case I didn't put anything on the URL, and the browser didn't put anything on the URL because I said, please transport this data using post, not get. Now, it turns out that post is generally more common uh, uh, than, and so you don't see too often the URL getting ugly with lots of stuff at the end, but there will be times when you do it. And so there are just two ways to send it. On the GET, it sends it on the end of the URL and it sends a normal GET request, just like we've been looking at so far. Um, what happens with the POST is it actually makes the connection, the HTTP connection, and then adds the data at the, as, on that connection, and that's why it doesn't show up as part of the URL. And it allows the POST, um, because it's part of the connection, not part of the URL, you can send a lot more data in POST. And that's why we tend to prefer it. So if you think about how the GET works, the GET works, you know, the browser sends a GET, and it actually just adds the parameters to the end of the URL that it asks for. Um, and there's some headers of, of information that it sends, but that's the GET request. Whereas if you tell the browser to do a POST, it sends the command POST as part of the HTTP request, no parameters here, and then some header information, and then a blank line, and then key value pairs here. And, and there's a lot of complexity about how this actually works. They're uh, URL encoded and MIME encoded and all these kinds of things, form encoded, um, right there, form URL encoded. But for the simple one, in the case it's just a key and a simple value, it's key value, and then the ampersand would be here, and there's all kinds of encoding that happens. But the difference is, is that the reason you don't see it on the URL, you see it on the URL in GET, and you don't see it on the URL in POST, because it just sends it as part of this overall connection that closes the connection, and then the code of form3.php starts to run. And so it's just, that's the mechanics of how we, it gets transferred to the server, right? The mechanics are it goes in, it is, instead of being on the URL, it comes as sort of an extra bit on the end, it parses it and puts it in the POST request, and then our code starts up in the server and runs. So this is a pretty complex summary of the rules of when you would use GET and when you would use POST. 
the key thing is, is that if you're modifying data, you should never use a get. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that uh, search engines will follow get URLs, um, but they won't follow post URLs. So if you're deleting something or inserting something or say adding a comment to a blog post or something, that should be a post request, um, never a get request. The only time that you would actually do a form of the get request is kind of like a search field or a lookup field um, because they're supposed to be what are called idempotent, which means if you hit them twice, they're supposed to roughly contain the same material. So if you have a, you know, um, part number equals one, two, three, four, and you hit that URL, it should give you part one, two, three, four's page. And if you hit it again, it should still give you part one, two, three, four's page. It might give you a slightly different like inventory level or something, but the idea of idempotent is you're not supposed to get different information when going to the same URL. The other thing is, is there is a limit about how much data you can send on get. It, each browser does it differently and it changes over time. So there's not, there's not a number. Uh, it's, it's bigger than you probably need ever for normal things. It just means if it stuff gets a, above a certain size, like if you're like typing a paragraph, <clears throat> you almost always should send it as a post. You know, if you're typing uh, a part number or something. And so given that you're probably typing a paragraph, you're probably sending that data in to modify something. So rule number one of if something's being created or modified, always use post. So up next, we're going to talk about a number of different form input types beyond just this text and the submit button. Okay, so let's just run through some of the form input types beyond just input type equals text and input type equals submit. So text is the basic one that just opens up a little box. Password is a, a, gives you a box that hides the type characters as you type, but it doesn't encrypt it going to the server. It just hides it from people looking over your shoulder. Radio buttons, text boxes, selects and drop downs, and then text area. So we'll take a look at these. Um, so you can find out all kinds of things on these forms, uh, form, form fields online, uh, but we'll just kind of hit some of them. So the basic text field, uh, here's a text field, the name, the ID, you can tell it like size to tell it how wide it is. Often you do this in maybe CSS, um, but the, the type equals password simply allows you to type text, but doesn't, sh it's for your, over your shoulder, but it does not encrypt this. So I typed one, two, three, four. Right, so the, the name of this is password, so it comes down here. But the one, two, three, four comes in plain text. There's no security between you and the server, unless of course you're sending it over HTTPS, but um, there's no magic. It just means that it shows asterisks uh, while you're typing. Um, and, uh, and so let's see, the, the, this is just another input type equals text, name equals Nick, away you go, okay? And so password versus text is, is really identical except that it shields what you're seeing on the screen. A radio button is quite interesting and useful in a lot of situations where you want to choose one and only one of two or more options. And it's, it's like something that you're looking at on your car and you're picking which preset station and you hit one and it turns it switches. So only one of the stations, you might have five presets on your radio and only one can be active at a time. And so the way it works is, um, of course you have a form tag, you have a form tag outside of all this, but is what, what you do is if you make a type equals radio and then you use the same name. And you, and you can actually scatter these all over the place and it's a little bit weird. Um, but basically what happens is, is that um, you, you, you pick one of these, you press the little dot button, and then the other one goes away. And so what happens is no matter where these are in the field, if they all have the same name, only one of them can be checked. Now you can say checked here in the HTML to say which is the default when the screen is painted. And then what happens is you put a different value, value equals AM or PM, and then what happens is whichever one is checked, and in this case it is this checked, you get the value based on the name of the of the form field and the, the key that's the key is the name of the form field and the value is whichever one was checked and so you just put in whatever you pick these strings and then you look and you say oh it was the second one that was checked or whatever so that's how you figure that out it's a pretty good user interface really when you want to choose from a set of two or more options with only one allowed to be in to, to be selected and the browser does that but you got to keep the name consistent or it's going to be weird. You can kind of make some really crazy looking forms. The browser will look no matter where they're at. They don't have to be next to each other. They don't have to be physically close to each other. They just have to have the same name value. And so 
Now a checkbox is a situation where you have a series of things that can be all turned on or off, right? And so, um, let's change the color. And so here we have a checkbox. Any of these, any combination can be on or off. Type equals checkbox. We give them each a different name because you can check any combination of these things. And again, you can indicate which one is defaulted, including any, any combination. You don't have to have any of them checked if you don't want. Um, you can have all of them checked, any combination, because they are independently checkable. Um, and, uh, and so you, you can give a value, right? And you give a different name, right? And so in this case, if you check class one, if you check this one, it does this, and class one will be SI502 based on the value. And if you don't have a value and click it as in class three, you will get the string on. The default value equals on. And so it sends that in. And so you can tell in your code, did class one, did the class one checkbox get checked? Yes or no. And you can put those values in, or you can just leave the value off and then it will say, oh, if the if, I, I tend to just say if it's if it's set, is it is set in the in the array, then that means that class three was checked. And again, with just like radio boxes, good style says they should be close to each other, but the browser really doesn't care about that. Whatever it is that you're doing that's crazy, you can put those things together any way that you want. Um, a drop down is also a nice used all the time in uh, lots of situations. Um, so it's a select tag. You give it the name on the tag. Uh, this ID, of course, is just part of CSS that hooks back to there. And then you have a series of options. You have option value equals value, value, value. And really what you're doing is you're going to press this drop down, and then you're going to pick one of these things, whatever it is. And then if that's picked and you hit submit, then that chooses, in this case, what goes in for soda. In this case, I didn't change anything. And so soda is zero because that was what was there. Okay, and you get to pick this name. You get to pick all these values. You obviously want to make them different, or unless you want that. And so you just get back whichever value it is as they select the selector box. You can pick a default that's different than the first one if you like, right? And so in this case, uh, we picked a default that was the selected one. Now you can only have selected on one of the tags. And in this case, it just starts out from the, from the browser, it comes back selected. It, with peanuts is the pre-selected one. You could move it, you don't, it, it just starts there. And this would be a situation, you know, perhaps that was the, the previous value if you're changing on update screen or whatever. And you can sort of see how snack equals peanuts, snack equals peanuts is what's be, is sent in the server on a uh, drop down or option select box. Text area is the kind of thing where you're going to type some text. There are uh, JavaScript plugins that allow turn into this in bold and turn this stuff into editors. But underneath it all, uh, what you're really doing is you're building a text area. So the text area is a little bit different because it doesn't have a value equals. So most of these other things have a value equals in the tag itself. The text area is for long blocks of text. And so it's sort of like start of text area, text, and then end of text area. And I get some rows and some columns to give it some width to make the right size. And then I give it a name. And so then if when it submits all this, it takes the whole thing. And it can be quite a bit of stuff, right? I, it, with new lines and all kinds of stuff in here. And then it bundles all that up and sends it in to you in one key, the about key, in the array, the post array that comes in. And so that's how the text area works. And the default data that comes up when the, is what you put in. And you don't have to put this in if you don't want. And then this thing will be completely blank and you fill it in. Or you can have default data or something like that. The multiple select is kind of tacky. Most people don't use it because it's really bad user experience. And it's actually hard because it, it it's something that is sometimes inconsistent on different sort of versions of the server. Uh, you can kind of Google for uh, passing form uh, values, an array of form values in through PHP and be like, oh, make sure your setting is this, that, and the other thing. But the basic idea is that if it were easy and it were a good idea, this is how it works. So given that it's not easy and it's not a good idea, just don't do it. 
but I'll just tell you how it works anyways. So you're basically saying we're going to put, pass an array of, of values in, and so now you have a thing. All these can be checked. It's a, it's a multiple select. You're saying it's a multi-select right there. That's Don't do it, but there it is. It's a multi-select. Um, and any of these can be sent, and so what will happen is you will get in the code, you will get not just a value but an array of values, and then CSS and HTML were the ones that were uh, selected. In this case, it would have been CSS and HTML were selected, and you have to kind of control click as you move around. And so it's just a bad user experience all around. So let's get off this slide, because it's not a good one anyways, right? Um, and then of course, the submit button. Now, uh, some, uh, some things about the submit button are, um, so we've talked about the submit, but you can also put a name equals if you're gonna have more than one submit button, so that's cool. And you can put a value equals. Now, this value equals is a little weird on the submit button because it also gives the button some text. I, should, I could have called this, you know, XYZ, and XYZ would have shown up here. And so you can tell it, but then what happens is this value is also part of the, submit, uh, the submitted post data, and so you get in the key value, you get that particular data. Um, and so this way, if you had a couple of different buttons, you would have different values for them, and then you could have, you know, submit, you know, add, delete, does whatever, and you could have different buttons, and you could detect in the same form one of multiple buttons by looking at the name. Now, what I tend to do is I tend to name each of my buttons differently, so I just check to see if it exists, but the, because the text is not something the user controls, um, it just happens to be the value. It's a little inelegant. Now, another thing you can do when you want to put more than but one button here, right? You want to put more than one button. We got a button, put a, another button. You can also, if you want, this is just a little trick, turn a button into effectively an href by using a bit of JavaScript. We're not doing JavaScript yet, but this is like a baby JavaScript. This is basically saying on click, when this button is clicked, you say location href equals, and then in single quotes, a URL, and then say return false, and then that turns this into functioning kind of like an anchor tag. It doesn't actually submit the form. This return false is what makes it so it doesn't really submit the form, but that is a quick way to leave a page with a nicely styled button rather than an anchor tag. Some people just put a, an anchor tag here that looks kind of ugly, and we'll play with that uh, going forward, and we'll use that in uh, you know how to, uh, to write maybe a cancel button or something like that. Okay, so um, HTML5 uh, is now pretty much the standard, and there's a whole bunch of new input types that HTML5 uh, creates, and they're pretty cool. Uh, we won't go into them in great detail. You know, feel free to go research these on, the, on your own. Um, what happens is, is that the, there, there's just these types, and, and older browsers do not actually freak out by these types because they're actually variations on the text area, right? I mean, not, uh, input type equals text. If, if a br the browser looks, if historical browsers look at a form and see an input type they don't understand, they just treat it like text. But if it's an HTML5 browser, it sees these others and away it goes. And so if we take a look at this, we have a type equals color, and that brings up a color picker. Each of these is different in every browser. And um, you can see that it sends a hex color, right? So that is, just like in CSS, that's a hex color. Um, you can make a date picker, and it creates a date picker in the, in the style of the browser, and then it sends you a text string. So all these things turn into text strings eventually. So type equals date turns into a text string. Type equals email. This is a field that has some default validation in it, really, meaning that if you don't type a valid email, it won't let you submit. It'll give you a little error message, and it will stop you from submitting. It won't send it to the server and let you check it on the server. It'll actually demand it before it actually submits the button. So you hit submit, and it'll complain, it's unhappy, I don't like that, fix it before you submit it. So that's in-browser validation, okay? Um, you can say type equals number, and then um, if you give it the, a range of numbers, you actually get this little thing. You can also type a number in there, and again, if you type 99 in here or something and you hit submit, it'll give you an in-browser validation error and tell you that uh, the data is wrong. Similarly, a URL is like a text field, except that the browser will demand a legitimate, valid HTTP colon, HTTPS colon, or whatever. And just to sort of emphasize how the HTML forms fall back to text forms, I made a type of flying with a name equals saucer, and that just that doesn't care. It treats it just like a text field where 
saucer and yes, get passed to you. So it's not like it freaks out and blows up. And that's what actually happens for all these things in browsers that don't implement HTML5. So up next, we're gonna talk about data and validation and film forms back in, et cetera, et cetera. So more advanced stuff on HTML forms. So now we're gonna talk about some more advanced topics about data security, HTML entities, how to main, keep people from sending you bad data in forms, et cetera, et cetera. The first thing let's talk about is um, persisting form data. Now persisting form data is something that we sort of just expect and we expect that it would be magic. Especially when the forms try to fill things in automatically from your credit card to your address and stuff like that. That's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just a basic form field that gets uh, persisted. And so let's just say you're running this thing, it's a guessing game, and you put 20 in and you hit the submit button. When it comes back, normally, well, in this form three code, it's black, blank again. And that's because the browser doesn't remember the old post data and stick it back in. That is all done in the application. So it's important that you have to write code. So if you are seeing a thing where you put in 20, you press, you know, you put in 20, you press submit and you come back to a page and the 20 is still there, like your guess is too low, that took some effort on the part of the application to, to restore the old data um, back into that form field. Um, but it's not that hard to do. And so what we're going to do is, we're, this is the code to, to do that restoring, and, and here's how it works. Um, so as the script starts, we're going to create a variable called old guess, and we're going to ask if the post, if post sub guess is set, then we're going to make old guess be the old guess, the old data post data, or we're going to put a blank in there. So old guess is either going to be if we're responding to a post request that has that data in it, it's going to be that old data. Otherwise, it's just going to be a blank. And the rest of this is all the same. It's just a form, you know, label, name equals guess. And then we add to this a value equals, value equals quote, this is HTML. And then we drop into PHP and say, oh, insert the variable old guess right here in the output. Now, I'm using a thing called a, a PHP contraction that basically is instead of saying less than question mark PHP echo dollar old guess, which I could say and then question mark, that would be, you know, if I put that in double quotes, that would just pull that value right in there and put it back in there and, and in the HTML it would come out. We do this one thing so often that there is this contraction, this less than question mark equal, which is exactly the same. These two things are the same. And so this is a contraction to pull out, stick between this quote and this quote, go into PHP and pull out the value of old guest string and stick it right there. And so that's how the old guest shows up in there and the 20, the 20 is then um, persistent, right? That's how this 20 shows back up. Oops, go back up. That's how this 20 shows back up is it was put in there in the value equals by the PHP itself. And so the PHP looked, said there's old data, I will re-echo that old data. So that seems simple enough, except the technique I just used is very dangerous. And it has to do with the fact that if we are echoing on our page data that the user typed, that includes characters that have meaning to HTML, like double quote, less than, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so if I basically enter into this form, uh, form four, I enter a, a double quote, and then some HTML, if I come back, it's gonna be crazy and th that this will have taken over my HTML. It kind of escapes from the text area. And let's take a look at how that happens, right? What happens is if you're just echoing the data that the user sent you, you know, it, it, here's the quote, here's the quote, and this is the exact user the data sent you, right? And so, so that's what they put in. They typed in double quote, less than, B, die, 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 et cetera. And so what happens here is this, 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 this part here came from the variable because it came from the user and all this other stuff came from the template. But when the browser sees it, it's not how it looks at it. The browser looks at it as, oh, this is the end of the value. There's a blank value. It just sees this as the input tag. And then it sees this as more HTML and away you go. And then this does, that's a syntax error, but it doesn't matter. 
And that's sort of how this thing takes over and uh, you end up with bold and, and this, this turns into text and you can see that there. If I had worked a little harder, I could have actually hidden that as well. Now what people are not usually intending to do here, that people don't just want to put the word die die in bold. What they want to do is put in some JavaScript to steal cookies or something like that. And so you got to be careful to never display user entered content without what's called escaping it. And so this is probably the biggest weakness in any web application is not properly escaping data that's coming back from the application that originally came from the users. Luckily, in PHP, there's a real easy way to see to do this. So there's a function called HTML entities that in effect encodes the old guess and it does things like turns double quotes, a double, oops, nope, wrong thing. A double quote becomes ampersand Q U O T question, uh, semicolon, right? And so by, by turning these dangerous less thans and greater thans into their HTML entity versions, which is the ampersand, the ampersand version of it, as we talked about in the HTML lecture, then it works out okay, okay? And so if you do the same thing and you do the same thing with form five, it, it, it creates this in a way that the value equals double quote, double quote. Well, this is what ends up being printed out because of HTML entities. That's a double quote. And yes, there was a double quote in what was typed, but this comes back out as ampersand quote, greater than, less than, ampersand greater than, die, die, less than, greater than, slash B. And so what happens is this comes back exactly the way the user types it. That's coming back. <clears throat> now I happen not to have, I, it kind of blew up here. That's sad because I didn't do HTML entities in my pre-tag that I was dumping my data out of my debug print. And so I still have a security hole in my debug print, which is actually something you should worry about. Um, as you got HTML entity stuff that's even in debug print. Um, but basically by calling HTML entities, we get this version of the string, which basically maps any dangerous character into the entity version of that character. And so you'll never see a double quote or a less than or a greater than. And HTML and A is just built into PHP. You call it as a function and you will see us do this over and over and over again from now on to the rest of the class. Less than question mark equal HTML entities, HTML entities variable name, end of story. Done. Okay, so now you that's called HTML injection. HTML injection, and it's, go ahead and Google that. How to avoid HTML in, in, injection in PHP? And they'll say entities. So that's one of the issues of how not to sort of put a security vulnerability into your program by echoing raw data from the user. Now you also want to, before you process the data, you want to actually take a look at it and make sure it's passing a few sanity checks before you're allowing it to run. Things like let's make sure that this particular post value is non-empty. It has a, a, a non-zero string length, or it is all numbers, meaning it's not the word Fred, or has a, it's an email address. Let's check to see if it's got an at sign in it, etc. And so there's a set of, there's sort of this pattern of before you handle and process your post data, which we're going to start doing and like stick it in a database, you want to run some data validation on it to do some basic sanity checking to make sense of it. And so this is part of the guessing game, right? The guessing game that you got to write, and it's it's going to do all of this sanity checking, meaning it, it, it's, it, 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 if you give it a number, it actually checks the guess, but you want to do some checking to make sure that it's okay. And so here's just a little bit of sanity checking with, we're not doing post data, we're doing get data here, but um, you kind of come in here and we're going to do some, some checking. First, we're going to do an is set. If it's not there, then we're going to say missing guest parameter. So you, you, you want to tend to, to write this in an order where you catch the thing that would, uh, the thing that's the, the worst problem. So if you don't even have a get parameter, why are you going to check for its length, right? <clears throat> and so, so then I'm using a series of else ifs, right? And so if it's not set, print this out. If it is set and it's too short, we put out a short message, else if it's not numeric, then we're gonna say your guess is not a number. Um, and at this point, we got good data. So kind of from here on, we got good data. 
If the guess is less than 42, it's too low. If the guess is greater than 42, it's too high. And if you make it all the way through all these, like uh, this, this gauntlet of error checking, and you get the right number, it says you're right. Now, so one thing, and so that's, that's basic before you do the work. And so the, before you do the work, you do the sanity checking, and then you can say your data is safe. Now, the interesting thing here is, this is just sort of a PHP thing. Less than is doing a numeric comp. This is get sub guess is a string and 42 is a number. And so PHP is automatically converting that to a number for you. And so that's a benefit that you don't have to like convert it to a number. If it's less than, it's just gonna convert it in a way that can, co can do a, a comparison. And that works quite nicely in PHP. And it's rather succinct, but you sort of have to remember, I meant to do that, right? You gotta be careful that if you didn't mean to do that, that you don't do that. So what we'll talk about next is some conventions for uh, processing this post data and how we structure our whole script called Model View Controller to, uh, to process the data in the same pattern uh, each time. Okay, so now we'll talk about a concept called Model View Controller. But what we're really talking about is a pattern. Um, there are many ways that you can structure your PHP applications. And uh, sometimes you use a framework like Symfony or Laravel and they, they prescribe a very precise structure for your PHP code. Or you just go wild and just write PHP code however it comes to your mind. And so this is that little guessing game. And you know, it it's just starts with HTML. This is just, just some, this is PHP, like the old wild west and woolly PHP. You know, the first line is title, does some stuff and then it drops into PHP and does some printing and then it ends with a paragraph and then it's done. And so, you know, you're, you're sort of dropping in and out of HTML and in and out of HTML, you're doing some computation, you're doing some whatever. You just kind of put it together the way you want. And if you are doing mostly static work, like just HTML mostly with a few little things that you were sticking in, it's okay, because PHP is like a templating language with little tiny bits of code in the middle of it. That's not all bad, right? But as your application gets more complicated, you end up doing quite a bit of work handling this incoming data. It's not just a guessing game. If everything was as simple as a guessing game, this would be a fine coding style. And so that's where this notion of model view controller and the discipline of thinking carefully about where you do what inside your PHP scripts. And like I said, you might be using a framework, oops, you might be using a framework to uh, do some of this. Uh, which will give you some really clear structure about when you can do computation, when you're supposed to talk to the database, and when you're actually generating the output. So, I have a pattern that I use, and it is a highly simplified version of Model View Controller. Uh, and you may or may not like my pattern. I'm going to use it for the rest of this class. But at some point, you will run into some other pattern. But for now, it's a really nice way to, to do a simple Model View Controller without doing it in a bunch of files. One of the things I don't like about the other approaches is they tend to put little pieces of the model view controller in many different files. And I think for beginning programmers, that makes it a little, little uh, complex. But, so, so this is how I do it. This is how I organize it. And I write a lot of code this way because I like simplicity and ease of understanding and ease of use. But I also like discipline at the same time. But if you choose to use a framework like Laravel or Symfony or Cake or whatever, no problem, it's fine with me. And all the skills that you're learning here apply equally, it's just where you put the code is a little different in those frameworks. So, I think I made it clear. These are just, they're not rules. They're the rules I'll follow, but they're suggestions. And the way it basically works is, if you're writing a script that's gonna handle incoming post data, <clears throat> you have the page output, and the page output is the template is at the bottom. So this is like a template. And at the top, you handle the incoming data. So you handle the incoming data at the top, and then you print the output at the, at the bottom. And the key is, is that you produce no output here at the top. You know, you handle the data, you produce no output. You, you start as the first line of the file as question mark PHP, because you do your coding at the top, and then you do your templating at the bottom. And so you tend to have as little code down here as little code down in the bottom as you can, and you really just have markup and you put variables in. Sometimes you sneak a for loop in or something like that, but you tend to put the bulk of the code that's handling any incoming data above where you even start the first line of code. And this is a pattern of the model view controller. 
And so the idea of the model view controller is that you um, separate out the different aspects of the request response cycle from the time that the user uh, clicks their button, right? So, you know, the, the user clicks a button and the controller is in charge of all this. The controller is like the orchestrator. The model is the data storage. So the controller like, sends all the data back to the database. And then there is a new user interface. The view is the what you see, and that goes back to the user. So it's sort of controller, model, view, controller, model, view, controller, model, view. The controller is like the orchestrator of this. The view is the output. The model handles the data, and the controller routes it. And you'll see what will happen is the controller will also sometimes say, We've handled everything in this script. We're going to send you to another script. And that's what routing is, is the, the movement from, from one script or one page to the other is also part of controller. So it's orchestration and routing. And this will all make more sense as our examples get more complex. This is just getting started so that you'll begin to understand some of the terminology that I can use when I'm showing you some of them with more complex. And so the way it works is the top part is the silent part that handles the incoming data and the bottom part is the part that produces the output. Now some of the output comes from the processing and so there is a bit of data that is passed between the model and the controller. And the way I think of it is I always like to be able to draw sort of a line. And below this line is when I start output and above this line is when I do the majority of my processing. But I have to pass some information from above the line bit to the bottom line bit. And so in this case, I'm building a guessing game and it's going to pass this variable old guess and message down across this line and then I will pull that data out in here. Okay? And so, so the, the thing that is passed, there's a chunk of data that is created at the point of view of devolving processing and that's passed through and we call that, oops, got to push the button, call that the context. Okay? And you'll hear this in other frameworks, they talk about the context that the, the controller passes to the view, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so this top part is the model, handles the incoming data, prepares the context, and the view is renders the output using the context as its input. And so another of the simple rules is above this mysterious magical line, you're not supposed to produce any HTML, right? No HTML. And below the line, you can have little bits of code, like I've got this if statement, that's not a terrible thing, but certainly no database activity. So all the database happens up here, all the SQL happens up there, and then it's just sort of simple rendering with, you know, maybe a loop or an if, but not something that actually talks to the database. And that's, that's how I implement Model View Controller. So if we look at the top part of this, the model part of this, remember that the goal of the model is to do no output, but pass down a context. And so the thing that this guessing game is going to need is what the previous guess was, so it can put it back in the little form field, and a message as to whether or not the post data was high, low, or bad, right? And so one thing you'll see in all my model view controllers is there's sort of a big if statement, and I'm saying, is there any post data? And part of that is because the first time this script runs, it's a GET request, and so it just produces the output. So in effect, the, on a GET request, a GET request does this and skips everything else. And then once you submit the data with the POST request, then it comes back in, and the data is here, and then this is for the POST request. So this is the GET request. The GET request sort of skips this, and the POST request does it. Actually, the GET request does these two lines. And so the GET request says the old guess is blank and the message is false. And so that's the context. If it's a GET request, the context is simply old guess and message. Now, if there is some post data, if there is some post data, we're going to just add zero. I'm not going to do very, I didn't put a bunch of validation in here. Um, I'm just adding zero to it to turn it into a number, although I kind of don't need even to do that. If old guess is 42, it's great, uh, great the message is great job. In the previous example, I was putting echo statements in here. So now, in this model view controller, you're not allowed to use echo statements. So we have to pass the message down. And so the message is either going to be great job, too low, or too high. Um, and that's going to be passed down into the template. So these two variables, whether it's a get request or a post request, these two variables, old guess and message, are the context that's being passed between the model and the view. And now if we take a look now at the view, we take a look at the view, 
And so the view is really the start of the HTML. So it has the HTML tag. We could put a doc type in there as well. The head, blah, 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 body, blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, we might put a little bit of logic here to just put this paragraph out, checking to see if that message was false or not, because if there was no message, we don't want to print it out. And so this is not, this is okay in the, in the, in the view part. It's really just checking something and continuously issuing output. That's no big deal. And then we also have in here the uh, printout of the old in between the, uh, in between the values, right? I think there might need to be a double quote there. Um, I should fix that. Um, and so that's the thing. And so you can see the context comes in here and the context comes in there. And so this from here to here is really almost all HTML with a few little dynamic bits that are set from the context. Okay, and so, uh, and so that's the, the code there. This is the top part, passes down the old guess and message. Uh, when you pass it and you see that it will show you the old value uh, when it's done. So, we've talked about GET requests and POST requests. We've talked about HTML entities, data validation. We talked about the various form fields, uh, the new fields in HTML5. And we talked a little bit about Model View Controller. Model View Controller will make sense as we in do increasingly sophisticated amounts of work in that top part that is the silent kind of processing for each of the scripts that we do. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Today we're playing with a bit of the code, sample code from the, from the course, uh, doing some of the form code. So let's take a look at the forms. Uh, form1.php, the idea of a form tag in, in um, HTML is to describe some input that allows the user to type in or interact with and then submit data back to the screen. So you have to think that at least the way this is, works is it comes through with a GET request and prints this out and then it when we hit this submit button it goes to a new request response cycle. So, um, so there's the source and let's go into developer console so you can watch what's going on. Um, take a look at the network. Okay, so when I hit enter and do the original GET request, so there's the GET request or forms.php, form1.php, and it just runs this code. And there's no PHP in here, but it's HTML, and so it just prints that out. And then, basically, the form describes a bit of text area that says, oh, we're going to put an input area, type equals text. And then this name equals guest tells, tells the, form, the browser how to submit this data that we're going to enter to the server. And ID equals guest. The fact that I use the same one doesn't matter. I'm using the ID has to do with marking this label, has to do with semantically marking up your code for accessibility. Um, and that is that we can look, when we're visually looking at this, we can know that, oh yeah, this seems to be associated with that. But for a screen reader, they want a more accurate and clear association. So this ID, that's really just for CSS. Name equals guest, name equals on input tags are the things that are sent to the server. So input type equals submit. Uh, shows a submit button and type equals text gives us a little spot. So if we say 12 and then we press submit, it is going to do another request response cycle, right? And going to run this code again, except at this time, it's going to add this parameter question mark guess equals 12. And so that's how that works. And now inside of our PHP code, we are going to want to be able to take a look at that. And PHP has some magical variables that are super global called dollar underscore get. And what dollar underscore get does, let's take a look at form 2.php. Well, I'll just leave the guess equals 12 on. What form what dollar get does is dollar get takes and PHP parses these key value pairs on the query string after the question mark and then gives us things in here. And if I put like ampersand x equals 42, then it would give me guess equals 12 and x equals 42. And so then this allows us inside of our PHP code to sort of detect the time when it's coming in with just no parameters versus parameters are being sent. And we, so there's no parameters and we're printing out an empty array. And we, as the developer, are giving our user a easy way to send us data. And it just concatenated on. And so that's, that's form2.php. Form3.php says we, there are two ways to send this data. One way is as parameters. But this gets kind of ugly and there are reasons not to do it and you're not supposed to modify data. Now guessing in a guessing game is probably okay to use as a get. But 
All we have to do to switch to sending the post instead of get is to say method equals post. So the form is exactly the same, constructed in exactly the same way. And we have get parameters and dollar underscore post is a new thing. Now I'll take off this guess equals 12 and switch to form 3.php. And so I did, that's a get request. So if I take a look here, that was a get request. So if I come here and I hit the enter key, I, that forces a get request to that URL. Hitting refresh doesn't, all, as we'll soon see, doesn't always force a refresh. If the last operation was a post, it redoes, does the post. If the last operation was a get. But in this particular bit of code here, view page source, in this particular bit of code, we have told it that we want to send it the data that's you entered by the user, like our one, two, three, <coughs> is sent by via post. And so you'll see that if we look at what's going on here, it sent a post to this URL, and if you cruise down, the data was actually sent as part of what's called form data in a format called URL encoded. And we could look at more detail, but the first thing you'll notice is it's not on <coughs> the URL as a question mark, as a query parameter. And that's because it's actually sent as part of the the connection. The connection connects to WA4E.com on uh, port 80, sends post to that URL, and then it sends these request headers. These are actually part of the what, what is sent. And then a blank line and then form data is sent. The response headers are what come back to our application after the in the request response cycle. And basically, just like with get, Dollar post is created for us before the first line of our program, and it just handles this stuff, and it's all magic. You make a form, and then when the post happens, dollar underscore post has key value pairs that are properly set for us. Okay, so let's take a look at form dot The one thing that you'll notice here is my previous guess was 123, but it didn't show up here. It's so often that forms put their old data there. 125 submit. Where'd the 125 go? We kind of expect that the 125 is going to be there, but it's not. And it turns out that we have to just explicitly put it there. And so it's so common that developers grab this post data as it comes in and echo it back right there so you can actually modify it. So if your guess was something, you know, long and you wanted to change it, right? It's not there. I wish it were changed. And so in form four, we show how to solve that problem. So let's go to form four and view the source of form four, which of course is also over here. And so what we're gonna do is, we're, we know this code is gonna run once to do the get, and that just is, is drawing the form. That's when I hit this enter key and it draws it and it sends a get, sends a get, right? We, when I hit the button, because method equals post, it's gonna send us a post request and the key is, is I just have this input tag and I add value equals and then this little bit of stuff. And this is a contraction for PHP to print out the var this variable. And the variable is, if there is data in post sub guess, I'm going to take that data, otherwise it's a blank. And so if I do a view source here, in this value here, there is no data because that was a get request, the post is not set. But when I do a dollar, when I send a post like, hello, this is not a number and hit submit well it comes back and so if i now do a view source on this page you will see that my php code particularly put this in right here using this little bit right here to say oh generate the html but replace this little variable old guess and whatever's an old guess which came in in posts of guess okay now, the nice thing is now I can fix this. I go, oh, I typed that wrong, and now it works. And so the idea of, here is a is a post still, but the idea that this stuff is persistent is not something the browser does for you automatically. Sometimes the browser does auto fill in, which is tack E um, of, uh, of certain fields. It does auto fill in of those fields, but in, their, in my browser, they're yellow, which is different than the server uh, restoring the data. Okay, so that's cool, that's easy, but in doing this we just violated the first and most fundamental rule of PHP application security. And the first and most fundamental rule of PHP security, and you can um, you can go and Google uh, like 
cross-site scripting and learn more about this. Cross-site scripting, oh, blah, blah, blah. It's XSS injecting, blah, blah, blah. Go ahead and read all that, okay? And it's nasty. And how did we just <laughs> allow the user into our backyard? Well, the problem is, is this post sub guess right here is data that came from the user. Whatever I typed here shows up here. And so if I am clever, I can actually make old guests contain sort of a snippet of valid HTML. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my old guests start with a double quote. And I'm going to say double quote slash, and that's going to end the input tag. And then I'm going to start another input tag, type equals submit value equals monster. But notice that I only have the opening quote and not the close quote. Uh, let's put a BR tag in here, or an HR tag. So there's an HR tag as well. And so when I submit this, you're going to see what happens. So now I have this monster button. And the monster button is something that I created. And I could do something evil with this little monster button. Now, how did that happen? Well, let's take a look at the view source of this. And you can see with syntax coloring. Now this part here came out of my PHP and this part here came out of my PHP, but all this stuff, all that stuff there came from me typing. But the browser, when it sees this, it's like, oh no, that's not good. And so then the browser sees that as an input tag. It sees that as an HR tag, even though this came from me, sees this as an input tag and this is the input tag, even though this last part of the input tag came from the PHP. It doesn't know the difference. It just can't tell, okay? And so that's really bad because this could do something like take your bank account cookies and send them to my evil server if I was super clever and did this. So this is called cross-site scripting, which means that I have typed something into your application. Hopefully I get someone else to stumble into my typed in stuff. So you're viewing somebody else's information. And then in that information, it is stealing something from you. So that's really bad. So this is like, this is like terrible, terrible PHP. Good news, not hard to fix. Let's take a look at form5.php. There is this function called HTML entities. And as long as you print out HTML entities of that value instead of the value directly, then you're generally safe. And that has to do with this. So let's go to form5.php and let's type that same, same thing here got it here. Okay, we're going to type this same thing and we're going to submit it. And it's going to be like, okay. And now if I do a view page source, it'll be far more clear as to what is going on. So this part came from my PHP. This part came from my PHP. This part came from the user. But what HTML entities did is it saw dangerous characters like double quote greater than less than greater than, less than, single quote, uh, double, uh, that's double quote, and it turned them into these things called HTML entities. And HTML entities are a sort of ampersand form of those characters. But now, even though the browser knows that's a quote and it shows it as a quote right here, it does not then allow this user to escape and start entering HTML into my background document. You can actually note that this kind of messed up because my debug output messed up, right? Because my pre-tag is still printing that value out without filtering it. So be careful because I fixed this error. I mean, this error right here, but I didn't fix uh, that error right there. Okay, so just rule number one is if this data came eventually or at any point came from the user, just wrap it in HTML entities. You can wrap things in HTML entities that didn't come from the user. It doesn't harm it. Um, it's harmless but uh, always for user data, wrap it. I tend not to wrap everything in HTML entities uh, so that I can kind of mentally know uh, where I was getting user data. So that is a zip through uh, some of the forms sample code for web applications for everybody. Uh, we'll talk about some of these others uh, in an upcoming video. So uh, again, I think, hope, hope this was helpful. Hello everybody and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Uh, I'm going through some of the sample code in the form section of the course. Uh, right now I'm just going to go through a few of the extra form, form fields and literally my, this page is not the greatest 
You can Google all these form types, away you go. So um, here's the code we're looking at. Uh, we have your basic text, and you notice I'm using this label for uh, pattern over and over and over again, just because I'm trying to make my markup semantic. You notice I'm not perfect at that. Um, the, the next type that we're going to talk about is the password, blah, and then the password is you know, you know, super secret, secret, the most common password. Um, and so password is just like a text field, except that it doesn't show it while you're typing. Now, if I'm going to submit this as a post variable, look, it the secret just goes in plain text. It goes into the PHP in plain text. If I was to do a view developer console and watch the network, what was that? Credit card. So if I type in the password for secret, and I press submit, and I look at the post that just happened, it sent the password across the network in plain text. So password is really only uh, there for you to keep people from shoulder surfing as you're typing the password. Okay, so nickname is another text. Okay, this is a radio button. And so type equals radio. And radio button is like a, uh, you know, a, a station selector on a car radio. And the idea is that no matter how many of these things there are, there only can one can be turned on at the same time. And you do this by naming it type equals radio, but then grouping them by having the same name. Remember, name is what's sent to the server, key value. And then different values. So value equals AM is what's going to be sent to the server. If this one is checked, value equals PM is sent to the server. If this one is checked, and then there's an optional attribute that just says checked, which indicates when this first is refreshed that PM is going to be the default one that's checked. So if I hit AM and press submit, then you can see when equals AM. And so it really picked among the things when equals AM from the source code. Okay, so that's that one. Uh, check boxes. Check boxes are uh, independent, so you can have any combination of check boxes that you want. Um, all of them, none of them, whatever. So they each have a different and distinct name and a different and distinct value. Um, if the value is not given, then on. The string on is what's sent. So I'm going to see all three of these, class one, class two, and class three, are going to be checked from that checkbox. Okay? And on is because I didn't specify a value, but most of the time we're just doing an is set to see if this key is set in the dollar post as compared to looking at the actual value, but it depends. Okay, so the next the next two examples are drop downs. And again, I got a label um, and I have the name of the data that's going to be submitted and then option, 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 option. And those options effectively in order pick these things. And then when we hit submit, three, if I pick Mountain Dew, then three is going to be sent. In this next one, all we're doing is we're picking a selected one so that it's not the top one, right? Peanuts, I can change it to chips or cookies if I want to. And then in this one, snack equals chips is what's going to be sent. In this one, soda equals three is what's going to be sent. So let's go ahead and submit that. And so soda's three and snack equals chips. And so that's how uh, the drop down works. Um, text areas. Text areas are cool in that they don't have a value equals like most. You just put the existing text that you want in between text area and slash text area. Name is how it's going to be sent. Um, you can put like blanks in here, blah, blah, blank, blah, blank, 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 blah, 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 blah. Okay. And now if I um, hit submit, you'll see all this is bundled up into a single value, right? So this is the about and it's a string and it has new lines and all the spaces and whatever. And that's why you can write little paragraphs in here. Now there's all kind of plugins that will turn this into something that turns into bold because I could say, <coughs> and I'm not filtering this very well, so it's gonna look bad. <coughs> And so, uh, so I submit some, some HTML and look at that, it's bold. Now the danger is, is I could submit some JavaScript and ugly stuff. And so there's another filtering anytime. I'm not, I'm clearly not filtering 
this stuff when I'm just using print R. And so, you know, this is a dangerous page because uh, HTML could come out. Um, the last thing is something that you pretty much, well, second to last thing is a multiple select. And so this is sort of like the option value, except you've said it's multiple. And it actually sends an array of codes because they can all be turned on at the same time. This is generally a horrid way to do um, user interface. And let's see if I can get it. An option doesn't work. I can never remember. Not control doesn't work. Command works. So now I've got two of them done. This is a terrible user I because no one, including myself, knows how to use it. But when you send it, you get an array that tells you which of the things were checked based on this thing. And then the last little trick that will show, we got a, a submit button. And in this case, we got a name and a value. So the value in, in submit buttons is a little bit weird in that it both changes the text on the button and it sets what is sent. Most people just name their buttons different names. So this name equals do post and check to see the existence of the, of the button in the post data to figure out which of more than one button, if there are more than one button, rather than looking at the value because the value is often translated if you have a multilingual application, submit would not be the text that was here. So checking for the text is uh, a little problematic. And then we have one more little trick and that is how to turn a button into an anchor tag. And that is you say input type equals button, on click is a bit of JavaScript, and then you simply say switch this browser to um, this particular URL and then don't submit the form. That's what return false is. And you'll just see we will use this for escape or cancel or done or all kinds of things to get out of a form without actually submitting the form. So if I click this, it's going to take me back to web applications for everybody. So that was a really quick zoom through the sample form code and I hope that it was helpful to you. Okay, so welcome again to Web Applications for Everybody. We're doing a bit of code walkthrough. Right now we're in, uh, talking about the forms topic. And so what I wanna talk about is this model view controller pattern, but, but I'm start with some code that sort of I've used before, this guess code, guess.php, where we're supposed to guess a, play a guessing game. Guess equals 14. It's, um, oops, I did a minus sign there guess is too low. So I want to take a look at this code. And so this is kind of a typical crude basic PHP script, a bit disorganized. It starts with some HTML because that's what they are. Is it's a template and it drops into PHP and then does some logic and then puts a bunch of echo statements. And it, what it does do well is it, its structure overall top to bottom is not what I like. And I'll show you in a second how I want to restructure it. But it does do a pretty good job of you know checking to see if there's a guess parameter and complaining if there's not, checking to see if the guess is too short. This is all input validation that's doing a pretty good job of. In my next application, I'll have it better structured, but I won't do this validation. And then I once I know by the time it gets to here, I know that I've got at least sane data and it's a number, it's, not, it's the right length and it exists. And then I can say if it's too low or too high. And otherwise, if it's equal, then I say congratulations. So this is nice little error checking here and nice structure with else ifs, I like that. But the fact that I just sort of like intermingle my PHP with my HTML gets a little bit sort of confusing after a while. And so, and, and this is not either the greatest application, but it demonstrates quickly and simply this notion of what I call well, what the world calls model view controller, and this is my really simple implementations of model view controller. You can go Google model view controller, and you can view controller, and you can read so much stuff about model view controller. Oh, I even use that slide in my talk. And the whole idea of model view controller is, is that when you're doing the request response cycle, there are three basic things that happen. One is, the data model gets updated, the database, the back end, et cetera. You generate a new page, and there's this thing called the controller, which decides what to do with the model data, what next screen to pick, what how to respond to the incoming post data. And so the, I would call it controller model view rather than model view controller. And that's kind of like the picture that uh, Wikipedia is showing you here. And you can read and read and read and read and read more about model view controller. And there's whole frameworks that do model view controller, but what I do to keep it simple so that you know model view controller in kind of this low level sense, and then when you move to a framework that's more advanced, then you can just use the framework to do all the model view controller magic. So in model view, so this is kind of like the model. And so what I do is I always start my PHP files that are gonna do data processing 
in PHP, not in HTML. And the model is handling the incoming data. And the view, there's always a line in every one of my scripts where you see, oh, I've switched from the model to the view, at least the ones that process data. So above the line, the idea is you talk to databases and do your data processing and handle post data. And below the line, you just mostly generate output. That doesn't mean that you don't sneak a little PHP in here, because PHP is both a programming language and a templating language. And in this case, I'm just deciding if the message is not false, print it or print out the old value in the form using the HTML entities and the uh, less than question mark equal uh, uh, for the echo. So, so the idea is there's always this line above which we are completely silent and below which we don't do any major data operations. We can do loops and whatever, but we don't talk to the database, we don't do that thing. And so that's my discipline. And controller is the whole script. And if we get later in more sophisticated things, we'll see that we're doing routing decisions. We're sometimes moving after we process the data, we send them to a different script. And so orchestration and routing is the function of controller. So this guessing game, guess MVC, this guess MVC is going to look like every other guessing game we've made. So if I say 12, now it's a post. If you look, it's, it's going to be a post, so it's not going to show up here. So the old guess was 12, and it says too low, and guess is 12. Okay, and um, if, then I can change it, 123, it's too high. How about 121? So all this stuff is working. But if you look at it, what's happening is old guest, if, and a get request, so let me do a get request by just hitting it and hitting enter. So I do a get request. There is nothing in post, so old guess is false and message is false. And there is a thing that's passed between the model and the controller, and the model and the view. I call that the context. And that's really, in this case, it's just two variables. Old guess and message are set and then fall into the template, passed into the template. In other frameworks, we're more explicit about constructing a context and rendering a template with that context. But I'm keeping it really simple by saying context is what falls through from here to here. And we have to do it in a get request because it's going to run these two lines of code and then skip all the way down to here. So old guess is nothing and message equals false. And that's why there is no guess here and there's no message. But then when I say 12 and I hit a post request, it is going to be, this is going to become true. And now there's no error checking. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep this simple so it fits on a screen. So error checking would go up here. This is actually the logic of the guessing game. I'm just converting this to an integer by adding a zero to it. That's kind of quick and dirty. And then I'm checking to see if it's 42 or less than 42. But what I'm doing is I'm not putting echo statements here. I'm setting the message and then letting it fall through into the template. So there will be silence up here. There will be a bit of silent work that you don't even see up here where message and old guess are being set right here. And then it falls in and then it renders it and away you go. And so that's the basic idea of model con view controller. And we'll talk about this a bunch, especially when we have more interesting stuff to just looking at the guess. Um, and especially when this, we get like two to three pages of code up here, it's important to really mentally separate the, the brains of your code from the look of the code. So model at the top, view at the bottom, okay? So I hope that has been helpful to you. Uh, uh, see you on the net. Hello and welcome to our chapter on PHP and object-oriented programming. So one thing about PHP is we look in the history of it, it certainly did not start out as an object-oriented programming language. Um, in the beginning that was just saw, thought of as too much of a sort of fancy computer science notion. And so PHP 4 uh, was not object-oriented programming, 3 and 2 were not, and then 5 and now 7 are of course object-oriented. And what's happened in the PHP community is there's this uh, amazing flip from uh, you know, being kind of against object-oriented programming to being very pro-object-oriented programming. And so uh, while a lot of the stuff I'll teach in this class doesn't use object-oriented programming heavily, it uses kind of a more traditional way, um, if you look at a framework like Symfony or Laravel, uh, they will be talking objects crazy. And, and if I was to switch this course to Symfony and Laravel, I would literally have to teach object-oriented programming almost the first lecture. Um, but now we'll learn it sort of in the, I think the better time to learn it is after you've learned the language and done a little bit of stuff. Um, but the libraries, 
I prefer the object-oriented pattern. It is a little more complex to understand at the very beginning, and that's why I don't like teaching it right away for beginning users. But um, it's certainly very popular, and everything's kind of trending in that direction in PHP. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, I think that's a good thing, uh, particularly because I don't think PHP should be the first language that you learn. So what is object-oriented programming? Well, it's, it's a pattern. It is just a way of kind of organizing our code and data um, that sort of, instead of saying, oh, I got this big program and it's got some variables in it and I've got some code and some ifs and some loops and stuff like that. Um, what we say is we are going to sort of create little silos of data and, and code, and then we're going to kind of connect them together. And that, that's, that's the high level of it. And so mostly what I want to accomplish in this lecture is teach you about some terminology so that from now on, when we talk about portable data objects, PDO, I can say, oh, and that's a class, and that's a method, and that's an attribute. And then we made the object. I want to be able to say that, and I want you to understand it. So, so think of this as not so much building skill in how to build object-oriented hierarchies or da-da-da-da. That will come in time. It's really so that I can just use these words in, in plain conversation, and you will understand them. And so the, the big words we're going to learn are class, which is a template for uh, some data and some code. Uh, uh, object or an instance, which is you take this template and I use the cookie cutter. The class is like the cookie cutter and the object is like the cookie. So one cookie cutter can effectively stamp out many cookies and that's the perfect model for it. Inside of a class and object are methods and attributes. They're being defined in the class and they're being created in the object. So classes sort of take up almost no space by themselves. They just are a template that when we want to, we can make an, an object. So the class kind of determines the characteristics of things, right? Uh, it's just, okay, this is going to have uh, some functions in it that do this, this, and this. It's going to have some data that does this. This data is private. This data is public. It's a blueprint. It's a cookie cutter. It's a way to make things. It's a generic. It's a generic sort of description of something. Then what we do is we instance the class, or we construct the class, or we create the class. And then we can instance it many times. We can have a variable called x, which is this class. We can have a variable y, which is another, another version of that class, another copy of that class. And so it's like, take the class, stamp out a cookie, and use it. Take the class, stamp out a cookie. Put one frosting on one cookie and different frosting on another cookie, and that's totally the instances are the cookies, and the template, or the cookie cutter, is the class. A method is just... A, a, a word we use to dis we distinguish functions inside classes from functions elsewhere. And so a class has methods, but these are really functions that only live inside the class. And so you create a function outside the class and it's named XYZ. And there can only be one function called XYZ in the whole system, in all of PHP. But you can have a class called, you know, dog, and it can have a function XYZ, and a class called cat that has a function XYZ. This is namespacing or siloing. If you think about it from just a functions perspective, it would be like a local variable, except what this is, is within a class, it's a local function. And that's, so we, it's different enough that we, it's just a function. And you look at the syntax, you'll see that it's just a function. Now, um, when I talk about things like uh, string functions, which are really, really, really important, um, or date functions or whatever, you see kind of this weird pattern. And I, one of my most challenging things in PHP is to remember what the order of the parameters of the string function, in particular string replace. Um, and that's because these libraries were built in PHP 1, 2, and 3, and they were non-object-oriented programming like libraries. So all functions are global when you don't have object-oriented programming. You don't have methods that live inside of classes. And methods inside of classes is a beautiful thing. You will eventually understand how beautiful that really is. But before object-oriented programming, we, we needed a way to sort of keep the, the concept of subtract, right? You want to subtract uh, two strings. Do you want to subtract two arrays? Do you want to subtract two dates? Do you want to subtract two whatevers, right? Um, and so what, what we did, and every language does this, is you tended to put like a prefix on. So every, you know, the create, date underscore create, or date underscore add means that I'm going to do some addition having to do with dates, or I'm going to create a date. And if I'm going to do a string, I'm going to do string underscore add, string str underscore, str underscore this, or str underscore replace. And so we, ha we sort of created these little islands of sort of namespacing by just putting prefixes on. But you'll notice that they forgot, they don't put it on every single thing because some of those even predate, right? So go back all the way to Python 1. 
And so that's pre-object orienta object orientation. And when you're reading documentation, you will kind of know that when you see a set of functions that all have the same prefix, like, oh, that's kind of from the old days. Now that we have object-oriented programming, we're going to start seeing some of the library code being wrapped both in an object-oriented set of uh, functions and methods, as well as a non-object-oriented. So this is that same date-time stuff, except now it's kind of in a class. And so what you see here is there's a date-time class, and that is like a little, you know, isolation, and there's other things that are out here like PDO and other classes, etc. And so inside here, we can use things like a function named add, and so that is not a global function named add, that's a function named add inside the date time class. And so this are, these are the methods down here. And so it's, uh, it's really convenient because now we can um, name these methods in a way that makes the most sense to us as programmers, both as the creator of the class and as the user of the class. And so an important part is to sort of be able to recognize when you're looking at object-oriented documentation and when you're looking at non-object-oriented documentation. And so just like much of uh, PHP's documentation, it's very good about telling us what version that this works in. So you can only use the date time class above PHP 5.2. That's actually a pretty safe. PHP 7 is not everywhere yet, but PHP 5.2, you kind of want to be at PHP 5.2 at this point in time. That's a pretty safe bet. So if we look at the sort of coding pattern, um, you know, you're, you're doing various uh, things with this. And so in the non-object oriented, you, you know, say date, whatever, set the time zone and call a global function called time. And time is, gives you seconds since 1970. And it, uh, now this is actually adding seven more days worth of seconds. We're doing a date calculation. We're formatting it. Today's date, um, today's date formatting in one, one year, month, date. And then we have to pass in the next week, which is, you know, next week from now, whenever that was, and format that. So you see in a non-object in pattern, you tend to have to add extra parameters that are the data. And in the string, we saw that, right? You had to put the, the, the search string, the replace string, and the thing you were modifying. And in OO, an object-oriented pattern, you don't need that. So let's take a look at how this works. So we're going to create a new variable called now, and that's a new date time. This now is a class, and this is our first instance. That's an object. Now is an object. It is, we have taken the date time and like stamped out a cookie, and that is now in now, okay? And we can make many instances from one, um, from one template. And so we make another one, which is, you know, we look at the documentation, it says, oh, you can say today plus one week in a string, and it gets to the next week. And, and now here's, the, so the new is this new thing that says, take the class and stamp. It's the stamping action. Constructing is what it's called. Um, and so, <clears throat> and, but now what we can do is we can access the methods. And this little, pramp, this little thing here, the arrow, is a, says, here is an object. Go find the format method in the object and pass in the format string. And then here's a different object. Go find the format method in it and pass in this string. And so that is how we are formatting different values. We're formatting the, this variable, and then we're formatting this variable. Now we're achieving the exact same output between these two, two bits of code here. Um, and so the nice thing, one of the things I like about it in a very, very simple example, a very, very simple example is if I was going to look at this thing and take a date format, well, which order of the parameters? Do you give it the variable that has the date value in it or the format string first, right? Here it's really clear. This is the, the next week value, the variable. We know the format method and there's only one parameter. And so this is where I like OO uh, patterns better than non-object oriented patterns. So let's talk a little bit, uh, coming up next, talk a little bit about how we make one of these things ourselves. So now we've learned a little bit about object orientation in general. Now we're going to actually look at the syntax to build our own object. Now my, my goal in showing you all this is not necessarily so that you're going to write a whole bunch of objects. I just want to see enough of it to help cement the definitions of methods and attributes, classes, objects, and instances. So we'll start by taking a look at how you might solve uh, a problem, a data structures problem, without using object orientation. And this is, you know, in PHP for years, we, we could avoid object-oriented programming and complex data structures by just using arrays in super clever ways. And so let's just imagine our, what we're doing is 
we're creating a data structure about people. And they might have a full name or a given name and a family name. And so here we're going to have two uh, variables of two people. And, um, and so the first one has a full name and an uh, office. And the second variable, Colleen, has a family name, given name, and a room. And so we're having, allowing some variation within this structure because different people have different things. And so we want to write a function called get the person's name and take one of these as parameters. And what we basically look for is if there is a full name in there, that's what we're looking for. And if there's a family name and a given name, we're going to concatenate those two things together with a space. So this is just a bit of code so that we can tolerate different structures in these arrays. And so, and it's a really simple example. And so we're going to say, what is get Chuck's person name? And that gives me the full name, Chuck Severance, pulling this piece out here. And then get me the person name for Colleen. Well, Colleen is different, but it still concatenates those two things together and gives me a blank. And so we don't have to worry in our main code what format these two things are in because we're sort of compensating for that. And this is one of the things that objects allow us to do is sort of capture things and just call a function to take care of the work. And so we don't have to write if statements or anything like that. Otherwise, we'd be putting if statements down here, yada, yada, and be four or five lines of code every time we want to do it. So we put it in a function and reuse that. Of course, this is a pretty silly one. So let's just look at how we might do that in an object. And this introduces the notion of attributes. So we are making a new class. So if you take a look at the new class, we have a new keyword called class that's like the word function, except we're telling it we're beginning a new class. And so we're going to create a class called person, open curly brace, and then we can have some variables in here. And the, we'll talk more about the public stuff. What public means is this variable can be accessed by code that's outside the class, not just inside the class. So we're going to have a full name, a given name. Now you'll notice these are not strings. We're not really making an array here. We're making an object. And so full name, given name, and family name, and then uh, room. And then we're going to add a function, and we name it differently. We're, we're, we're going to, this is going to be a get name within person, right? And so we don't have to have the variable, the functions quite as long. And we're not even going to push it, put any parameters in because the data is already part of this object. And so the this variable, dollar this is a special variable. You don't have to define it. It actually points to the current instance of the object, and it'll make more sense a little bit lower. So get name looks up the checks to see if the full name is not false and returns it. If the family name and the given name are not false, it concatenates those two things together and returns that with a space, and away we go. Same kind of basic logic, but but the big deal is the this, and that's to look at these variables, but they're not class variables, they're instance variables. And this points to the current instance. Okay, points to the current instance. So now, if we come down here and say, let's make a new person. So this new is the construction. Take the person template, make a thing that's shaped like this. It's shaped like all this. Make one and stick it in the variable Chuck. And here's a new little uh, operator. Chuck arrow full name is changing. So now there's a, a Chuck variable out here. And there is a full name inside here. And we're putting something in that full name. And we're putting something in the room, putting something inside that. Now what we're going to do is make another instance, make another object from the class slash template. Make Colleen equals new person. So that means let's make a new Colleen variable. And it has all these same things in it. It has all the methods in it. And we're going to put the family name in and uh, the given name in and then the room in. So now at this point in the code, we've got two variables, two objects, two instances, one class. Um, and now we can say, let's get the name from the Colleen variable and then let's get the name from the Chuck variable. And it does all that same thing. And so if we look at what's going on right here, this runs this code, get name runs. And at this point in time, this is equal to Chuck. So Chuck is out here, and Colleen is out here. This points to the current one that we're using. It's this one here. OK, so we're calling get name within Chuck. That, while that get name is running, this points to Chuck. A moment later, we're calling get name within Colleen. And when that code runs, this points to Colleen. Okay, so this is sort of like whichever the current instance 
or object. Instance and object are the same thing. Class is the template. Instance and object are the same thing. Okay? And so that is kind of like how the object-oriented stuff works. And we'll, we'll kind of hit this a little bit more, but you get the basic idea of the arrow operator, the new operator, and the concept of this. Dollar this is a variable that is only defined within a method inside of a class. And that's why methods and functions are different. So let's also, now that we sort of know some of these new ideas and we've seen our own class, let's take a look at some of the kind of things that will happen as you're reading PHP documentation. So we've already talked about um, the little arrow operator that basically says go find the method or attribute within this particular instance. But there's also a way to access things in the, inside the class and that's the double colon operator. Colon, colon. Okay, and so these two things are important and so let's take a look at some documentation. So if we look at this date time again, we see some constants. And so these are constants that are given to us by the class. And so there's Adam, they're namespaced. So that's, to me, 80% of the fun of this is namespacing. So we can name something whatever makes sense, a cookie formatted date. The word cookie has all kinds of meaning in HTML and HTTP and all these other things, right? But we can use cookie, date time, colon, colon, cookie. These are class-wide constants. They're not methods, and so this is the class name, not an instance name. This is go look something up in the class, and that's the thing we're looking up, and so that grabs this RFC 822 bit, which is really just a predefined string that pulls that stuff out. So double colon accesses class-wide things, things that are part of the template, not part of the, the instance slash object. Then another thing that we look at is you look at the, there's a couple of methods that have special names. And so the first one we'll look at is the one that's underscore underscore construct. That basically says is when PHP is going to construct a new date time, call this function. And we'll see how to do that in a bit. So it's the new operator that goes to construct. Now, what the, when you're reading the documentation, it just means that you can read all the parameters that you're allowed to have. And you can see, oh, I could do a date time, I can have a string, I can do this, I can do a date time for a particular date. And you can go read this documentation for the construct method, and it tells you what you're allowed to put in the parentheses when you're making a new object from the class template. Okay, so underscore, underscore, construct documents how the new operator functions. Don't know why they didn't call that underscore underscore new. That's a, a good question to ask. Um, another thing to look at as you look at documentation is uh, the notion of static. And static is a way that you can mark something as, in a sense, belonging to the class, but not to the instances. Well, actually, it also belongs to the instances as well. And so, um, let me clear this. When you see static, that kind of is in the way there. When you see static, you get a, um, you, you can call this function, this get last errors function, you can call it with the class name. So date time colon colon get last errors. And so this is a way of creating global library code um, that uh, can be run from the class, but it, it, we're taking advantage of the namespacing of the class. And so it's common to have a number of things called get last errors, but that's date, get last errors within the date time class. Now the key difference when you're writing a, a class, which we're not gonna write too many of them, is you can't use dollar this in static code um, because it, it's running without an instance existing. And so that you can just run it. Um, and there's also static variables that you can put into a class. Though, so the simple thing from reading documentation is when you see that word static, you expect that you're going to call it this way with the name of the class, colon, colon, then the method name, rather than, you know, dollar $x arrow method name. So, um, you know, another, another thing, here's a normal method that's not a static method, and so we're going to access this method using the arrow. So we make a new date time in the variable z, and then we access the format method. And you can see the parameters that you're allowed to put by reading the documentation.
that has those things. And so you go in, in PHP document, click on that, and then you'll go be able to read what are the kind of things that you can pass in as parameters uh, to this function. Um, there are some really cool things. Most of what I just talked about, the concept of static and methods and class-wide class static code, that's common across most OO languages. We'll see that over and over again. There are a few little weird things that are really quite cool in, in PHP, having to do with uh, object lifecycle in web applications. And so uh, PHP's object orientation, uh, it was, PHP was one of the last languages to become object oriented. And by the time it became object oriented in PHP 5, it was already a widely used and heavily used and well understood language. And so there's some just some Really cool features. I won't go into them, but every time you see one of these underscore underscore uh, methods, it's usually sort of part of the bookkeeping of objects themselves. So up next, we'll talk a little bit about object lifecycle. So now I want to talk a little bit about object lifecycle. The idea of the object lifecycle is we define a class and then we start making objects slash instances. And we want to, within our class code, um, jack into or hook into the moments where objects are being created and objects are being destroyed. And we call the, the moment of object creation the new operator constructing the object. And that's because it reads the class and then makes the object and then says, here's your variable. Um, constructors are used a lot because they nicely preset things and you know you want some internal consistency in your object. So you set things up, set things up. Uh, destructors are seldom used. They're only used if we uh, have taken some critical resource while, um, while the object was alive and we want to make sure to give that critical resource back before the object variable goes away. So the primary purpose of cons constructor is to set up instance variables that have all the proper initial values so that the object is created in a coherent way. And so let's take a look at how this works. Um, so we're going to make a, a class and this isn't really going to do much of anything useful. Um, we're going to name our class party animal, and we are going to create a special function. I mentioned before that underscore underscore construct is our bit of code that jacks in to when the variable is being created. Uh, this is just a normal method, function something. The indenting is not so pretty here. And then function destruct is saying, hey, let us know, let us run a bit of code, and we're just going to put an echo statement in so we can take a look at how that works. Okay? So, we say echo one, right? And we do a construction. And so what the construct does, the new operator causes this to run. So out comes the word constructed. Okay. And then we print out two and then we construct the second one, which runs this constructed code again. Then we print out three and now we call the method. So we've got two variables X and Y running here and we call something. So it runs this little bit of code in and, and dollar this in that case, THIS, it points to $X at that point, and it prints that out, and then we're all done. This is the end of the program, and so we print out the end. But then what happens is work happens after the end of this program where $X and $Y are being wiped out and thrown away. And because we have registered an interest in the moment of destruction, we are informed of that. And all we do is print, hey, we've been called, but that is when PHP is deallocating our objects and throwing them away. But I mentioned that construction is very commonly used and destruction is rarely used. I just put that in to show how we in the class can ask PHP to do various things on our behalf. So I've already shown you that you can have many objects from one class. Uh, each object has its own distinct variables and we just make these with the new operator over and over and over again. And so here is another object, um, and we're going to actually take a parameter. We're going to have one variable called protected, and what protected means is that it can't be accessed outside the class. So the other thing we had was public, which we were able to mess with public. And so this is, the code in here is inside, and this code out here is outside. So what you can't do is you can't say high dollar, dollar high lang, because lang is something that is the domain of the class itself. It's an internal variable and we just don't want anybody messing with it. Now, the outside world will need to set it, 
So what the outside world can do is on the constructor, it passes in the language that we're interested in, and then we store it lang, we store it in this lang, and so this the high variable is out here. And then we put the language in, ES is in there. We can't touch it, but we have set it. So a lot of the things that constructors do is set up the initial values that the class needs to function. But now it's in there. So we've made a hello gadget that knows Spanish, that knows that we're interested in Spanish. So when we're saying, hey, do this greet code, it, it doesn't need a parameter, right? We don't have to pass a parameter in because hi already knows that Spanish is its language. And so it just looks in the instance, pulls out the language, and then does the logic the way it wants to do the logic. Okay? And so that's passing in a variable in the constructor that's copied into a protected area inside the class, but then used inside the methods. So protected means it's okay to use it here, but it's not okay to use it there. So again, hitting on all these class is a template, method is a function that's inside of a class, an object is the actual thing we, it's a variable, and the constructor is that which you call with the moments created. So the next thing I want to talk about is how we do inheritance from one object, from one class definition to the next class definition. So the next topic is inheritance. And the idea of inheritance is you take a class and you want to make a new class. You can think of it as extending it and adding a little bit of special sauce to a class. And it's a really a, a, a good pattern, much like functions of not repeating yourself. If you have some functionality, in like a base class or in like a core class, and then you're going to specialize it a little bit. Um, it's just another form of how not to repeat yourself and how to structure your code. Now, a big problem that people have when they do object-oriented programming is they figure that if they're not doing inheritance, they're not cool. Um, and I will say that's absolutely not true. If you go for five years and you never do inheritance, it's important to understand it, but don't feel bad. You could write objects, you could use objects, and never do inheritance. You're using inheritance when you're using library code because we use it a lot. When you the, the day that you start writing a sophisticated piece of library code for other people to use, you'll be like, oh, thank heaven for inheritance. But don't feel like the goal... I mean, one of the biggest mistakes people make in object orientation is just trying to, like, overuse inheritance. So, understand it. But don't feel like you got to show off and use it just to use it. <clears throat> so we have a parent class and child class. The child class inherits everything from the parent class except that which is overridden or added in the child class. Another word for this is subclasses. It's class and a subclass. I think of it also as extending. In some languages like Java, they use the word extend to say extend this thing. Okay, so here we go. So let's take a look at that code that we wrote before. Um, and again, this is a silly, silly example so that I can fit them on a screen. You know, I don't want to... There's, there's, but remember the class hello from before. It's got a language. We construct it and get the language and we have a greet, right? And so now what we're going to do is make a new class. So that class is there the way it was all along. So just assume that code's there. And now what we say is class social new class extends hello. So what that basically does is that pulls in all of hello, the language, the attribute language, the constructor, and the greet method is all pulled in. You don't have to repeat that at all. And we're going to add one function, a function called by. And so this is the logic for the function by. And so now we can create a new social passing in ES, which is really calling this constructor that's been inherited from the hello. And then we've got a high variable, hi, and it's got a greet method, but this greet method has really been inherited from the hello. And then we have a by method, and that is the part that we've added in the social class. And so that's how that works, is that it really is pull all this stuff in, fill up that class with all the stuff that's in the hello class. You could still make a hello object or a social object. Hello didn't stop existing because we added it. We just copied it and then extended it. So inheritance is the ability to take a class and make it and extend it to make a brand new class without harming the first class uh, in the first place. Now I want to talk a little bit now that we've talked about classes and inheritance about the more sophisticated bit of visibility. I've told you about two levels of, of uh, 
protection. One is public, which means that the variable can be accessed inside the class and outside the class. Uh, private means it can only be accessed inside the class. That's the new one we haven't shown before. Protected means it can be, it can be accessed in the class, not outside the class, but in any derived class, in any child class, in any subclass. So that's protected. And so I used protected earlier, but private is, is, the, is the most protective thing. Protected means I'm sharing this data with subclasses and not the outside world. So let's just take a look at some sample code um, with uh, protected and, and private. Um, so here's a class. We got a public variable. We got a protected variable and a private variable named pub, pro, and priv respectively. And so in this code, inside of a method that's inside the class, you can look at and touch the protected. You can look, I mean, touch the public, the protected, and the private. In the main code, this is the outside. So again, this is the inside, inside the class. This is outside. And part of this is to, so the class can sort of build a protective barrier around itself and say, look, I'm, I'm gonna let this little bit here sneak out so you can see it, but I am not going to let you see these things. You cannot see them. I'm hiding them from you, okay? And that's mostly because it doesn't want this outside code that might not understand what it means to change that variable to be changing the variable. So just please don't change the variable. Well, you're not allowed to change the variable. So a public variable, a public variable can be read, it can be modified outside of the code, but a protected and a private will blow up. It'll just fail, right? And, um, you know, and, and print hello is a public function. You can actually make private functions and protected functions as well. Methods, methods. Okay, so now assume all that. We've got my class with pub, pro, public, protected, and private. And now we're going to make a subclass, an extension. So we're going to extend it by extending my class, importing all of the attributes and methods into my class. And we <coughs> now have print hello. This print hello is not the same as print hello here. We've actually, oops, we've actually overridden it. And so now we have imported everything from this class except print hello we're going to define differently in the subclass. And so within print hello, we can talk, look at the public stuff, we can look at the protected stuff, but we cannot see the stuff that is private in my class, right? We, can't, we can look into the protected stuff of my class and modify it and touch it and look at it, but we can't look at the uh, private stuff. And so private means I am putting such a wall around this data that even if you make a derived class, you still can't see this variable. And don't worry so much about why, just understand that there is this notion of wrapping data and having different levels of protection uh, for that data. Um, the, and and if, when we make a new class here, we can still access the public data. That public data was originally from my class, not my class too, but that works. But of course, the private and protected cannot be seen here in the outside world. Okay, so that's that's how that works. Don't worry too much about it. I really am more interested in you understanding the concepts. And the last bit I want to talk about is something that uh, I don't recommend. You know, these days we mostly make classes exactly the way I just showed you, but a lot of older code uh, would actually construct objects from scratch without having a class. So this is kind of a class. This is an object without a class, okay? And it some people prefer this over uh, just putting a bunch of keys, string keeys in an array because it's a little cleaner. It's, a, it's more, it seems a little tighter than just strings. Um, and, so, and so here we go. And there's this thing called STD class, standard class. And so what it does is standard class is like a class that is empty. It has no constructors. It has no attributes. It has no methods. Okay. So you make it and you, you have a class. And so what happens now is there is a uh, object called player out here, All right? There's a player object and we start putting stuff into it. We start changing attributes, right? So we can make a name attribute and stick Chuck in there and we can put a score attribute and make it be zero. We can add, add one to the score attribute. And so what's happening is 
there was nothing defined here. It's like an empty class. And we're defining it as we write our code. We're just creating variables inside of it. And so that's one of the things is you can, you can take and put variables inside, uh, attributes inside classes if you really want, right? And, um, and so, so there we go. So that's, that's a, a class. Um, if we were gonna define the class, we could do something like this, class player. You know, there's a name variable and a score variable, but this is sort of inventing it uh, from scratch. And so here in the, in the non sort of uh, from scratch, you just make the class, you construct the class, the class has two variables in it, and then you can do things like access the attributes and print them out. So you can kind of achieve the exact same thing by defining a class. Um, this, is, this is kind of old school. And so the older the code is, the kind of less it feels comfortable about classes and it sort of treats classes as a variation on associative arrays. Um, the more modern stuff, and increasingly you're gonna see people really defining the classes and putting the attributes and the functions and the methods right in those classes and doing all that stuff. So, I'm, I would totally understand if you watched all these lectures and be like, oh, object-oriented programming just scrambled my brain. Because that is a completely rational uh, answer and reaction to the first time that you see object-oriented programming. And so all I'm doing here is desensitizing you to object-oriented programming. I'm not expecting you to be a whiz. I'm not gonna ask you to write objects. All I want you really to be able to do is read object-oriented documentation and construct PHP that makes use of objects. So we're gonna be using PDO and other kinds of things in this class. And I wanna be able to say, it's the PDO class. And then there's the you know, connect method and the XYZ method and the attribute that's this. And it's a static attribute, so that's the colon colon operator. I want you to be able to look at code and I want you to be able to look at documentation. And that's really what my goal was. But these concepts of templates and instances and inheritance are powerful and profound and if you go far enough in programming you will come back to this and you go like oh i'm so glad that they built that stuff but that's not here at the beginning so i hope this was helpful i hope you took out of this what you need uh, don't feel like you need to master this just kind of understand the terminology okay see you on the net hello and welcome to my lecture on mysql pdo and php now if you've been coming all along and listening to all my lectures up to this point, starting with the HTTP and HTML and SQL and PHP and PHP object orientation, and you have been sort of learning pieces. And this is the place where it's all gonna to come together. And I can use all those words that we've taught. Now, if you're watching this for the very first time, you might wanna go back and watch those other things to kind of catch up, because the words, I'm just gonna start using words that I hope to have covered in the previous stuff. but. If you are with me and you have been with me all along, then congratulations on getting this far. Let's kind of do a little happy dance. You can do happy dance too, you know, you're here, you've worked hard. You can actually now start connecting all the pieces here, like a high five to the television. There we go, we got a high five. So let's bring it all together, accessing MySQL using PDO. So here is, my favorite diagram, someone can someone will probably make a much more beautiful diagram, but it's got to capture all these things about the browser and the web server and the database server. We are now going to do what we wanted to do and that's send a request. It runs, it's going to run some code, and this is what we're going to do for the first time. We're going to use the PDO library to make another connection to the database server, send some SQL across that connection. SQL is going to do magic, super awesome magic stuff, which we love and send us back what's called a record set. And we're gonna write a loop that reads through the record set and then slowly but surely produces HTML. HTML will come back and then we'll have a page. And so, so for the first time, we're going to have dynamic content showing up on the screen that ultimately came out of a database. So if finally we're going end to end. We got a lot more to do. JavaScript, we haven't started talking about JavaScript. That's all sort of here, magic in here, So, but we're not doing that. What we're doing is finally making it all the way in, and PDO is what we're gonna talk about today. And the other thing that we're finally doing is we're finally sort of finishing this diagram that we started with, and that is how these web dynamic content web applications work. And that is, there's application software, in our case, we're writing it in PHP, and it does the request response cycle, and it talks to the database and sends the HTML back. And the developer builds this code. You're the developer, you're building this code. And the database administrator talks PHP MyAdmin. 
So we've kind of done this bit, we've kind of done this bit, we've been writing PHP code, but now we're going to finally do all the way in and all the way back out. And so all these things are going to finally connect together in this picture that we did days, weeks, or months ago. Okay? So, I often tell you that uh, PHP is evolving. That's one of the things that's charming about PHP. It's evolving in a way, and lots of languages are evolving, um, but PHP is very good at letting you have backwards and forwards compatibility of stuff. If you want to do something a little early, you can by sort of pulling it in, or if you want to keep something that PHP took out, you just check to see if it exists and you bring it in. The way database in PHP 5 was accessed has been changed. In prior to data, PHP 5, uh, there were these MySQL underscore routines. And when we talked about object-oriented, I said everything, when you don't have object-oriented, you prefix them. And so they had MySQL underscore, MySQL connect, MySQL query, MySQL underscore this. Well, when object orientation comes along, they're like, oh, let's use object oriented patterns because we can namespace all the functions. And so the first thing they did is a library that I don't like very well. I don't like this very well. And I don't like this other one, which is really kind of a almost one-to-one -one correspondence between taking out the prefix and making it an object, which you could do kind of like what they did with the date underscore and the date time object. But they also took the opportunity to kind of rethink from scratch the right way to build a database. And they were informed by lots of things in this. They were informed by Java, this thing called JDBC in Java, and other database patterns. And they wanted to be portable across multiple languages. It turns out if you wanted to talk to SQL, you had a set of SQL functions. If you want to, I mean, SQLite used SQLite functions. MySQL had MySQL functions. PDO, which the portable part, means that it works for Oracle, it works for MySQL, it works for SQLite, works for SQL Server from Microsoft, etc., etc. And data objects means that it's both an object-oriented pattern for its API, but it also returns you the record sets in a more object-oriented way. Um, I could go on and on and on and on about how wonderful PDO is. I'll just say PDO is wonderful. The things I did before, I, I kind of understood when we first looked at it, like, oh, PDO is different. I'm so used to this other stuff. But boy, once you start to use it, you're like, boy, how could we ever have survived with that old crappy MySQL underscore stuff? And so you can look on the internet, the different things, but I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend that there's a debate. Because as far as I'm concerned, if you're not using PDO, it, you're foolish for a lot of reasons. We'll talk about some of those reasons as we go forward. Okay, so the thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to make a database, and you may have done this already, um, or, or make a brand new one. So just create your database, misc, and then the thing that you haven't done before is these grant commands. So these are things that you type to your, S your MySQL, and what you're basically doing is taking all the tables, misc.star, all the tables in that misc database, to an account, you can put anything you want in here, at localhost, this is kind of IP filtering so that you can't connect to these things outside of your computer and that's really good to make it so your MySQL is not exporting your data to the internet. Um, and so this is basically limiting that says this FRED account that I'm making can only be used from localhost or 127.0.0.1. These are kind of two of the same things. And then this is a password identified by grant all on misc FRED so this ends up being the ID and the password. Sometimes MySQL sees it as localhost. Sometimes it sees it at 127.0.0.1. You probably need one or the other of these two things. I just put both in because I don't want to bother figuring out which one I need. Okay, and if you're, and then you're going to switch into that database. So we're going to make some tables. Um, and so make your database, drop misc and recreate it if you want. Then we're going to create a table and we're going to just do a basic table. By now, I hope I mean, it's been a while since we've done SQL, but I hope you sort of remember it, right? We're gonna make a table called users. That's the name of the table. We're gonna have some columns in there. This, we're gonna have user underscore ID, which is the primary key. We're gonna have name. We're gonna have email and password, all are 128 characters long. And uh, we're gonna do an index on email. That's kind of our way of saying logical key. Um, that in email is a logical key. In ODB, this is the thing that makes the foreign keys uh, the enforcement of foreign keys work, and then we're going to say char set equals UTF-8, so we can put in, you know, non-Latin characters and have it be okay. And so just go ahead and create yourself a table. If you don't remember how to create a table, go all the way back to the SQL lectures where we did that in great detail. 
So now let's put some users in, insert into users, name, email, and password. Here we've got Chuck and the password of 123 and Glenn and password of 456, right? And so we've created some records in our user database and because it is a, uh, we have this auto increment field, we're getting effectively a primary key for csev and gg at umich.edu. So what we've created now is sitting on our MySQL server, we've got a database named MISC with a table of users. And, you know, we might have other databases, dot, 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 with lots of tables in them, and that's fine. Because, you know, MySQL just kind of isolates them. And so now what we're going to do is we are going to show you how to, in effect, log into that database from PHP. Okay, so you're in the middle of a PHP request, and now you want to log into that database. And you do this with an object-oriented pattern. So I'm, I'm naming my variable PDO. This could be $x for all I care. It really doesn't matter. Dollar whatever equals new PDO. PDO is a class. See how useful that object-oriented lecture is? PDO is a class. It's a template that's going to give us back a variable. And we give it three parameters as part of its constructor. The first is a connection, what we call a connection string. And that's defined. You can go look up the PDO documentation. In this, it says we're going to connect to a MySQL database. The host is localhost. In production, usually the database is on a different piece of hardware than the application, but on your laptop, it's going to be on the same. So localhost is like, oh no, we're not going to a whole different database server, but you might in production put this as something quite different than localhost. And that and then you have to tell it what port, because this is really kind of a TCP IP connection that we're doing here. And if you're on a Mac with MAP, it's port 8889. And if you're on Linux or if you're on XAMPP or on sort of a normal, 3306 is the normal default and MAP's weird default is 8088. Then you have to put the database name and that's what name of the database because you can remember you can have lots of databases and we've seen that when we're playing with phpMyAdmin. And then you have to give the password and zap. And so this ends up being just one line of code in PHP, na, 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 and that makes a connection, a connection through which you can then send commands, SQL commands. Now you know SQL already, but now we're going to have PHP make the S a select or whatever, delete, insert, all those are going to be sent across this connection. So this variable represents much like an uh, open file, the variable represents our way to access and send data to this uh, send commands in the language SQL and then get results back um, through this PDO, through this PDO connection that we've made. But it's like logging into a system. And you're going to log in every time you get a new request response cycle. One of the first things you're going to do is log into the database and then down there you're going to send commands and get the data back. And we'll see how that, all that works. So here is a super, super simple first application. So this is a PHP program. Right, so it starts with less than question mark PHP. I want a pre tag, okay, just so that everything looks pretty. And the first line is make a connection to the database with these parameters Fred and Zap are the account and the password. And then now I'm going to call the query method within the PDO, the dollar PDO object, which is in my variable dollar PDO. And I just pass in some strings, the same strings that you might type into PHP MyAdmin or the MySQL command line. You just send it. So that's sending it to the database over that connection that you've made. And then what comes back is a record set. And so we get back this record set that we can access using this dollar statement. And this is kind of like a file handle. It's a handle to a record set. It, it, you're going to loop through it. It's going to have a fixed number of rows. It's, you're going to be told when you've reached the last one. And you're going to read it one row at a time. So every time you call statement fetch, the fetch method within the statement record set, and we're, this is how to fetch it, just for now, we'll leave that alone. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So you, each time you call the fetch, each time you call the fetch, you get a new row. And if you run out of rows, you get false. And so we're, we've kind of cheated here in that we put this in a while statement. So it's either going to get you the next row or it's going to be false, in which case it's going to leave the loop. Okay, so we've got, you could put this like a parenthesis, not equal, equal, equal false, but that's kind of implied. So we, we, well, I had one too many equals there. I'm sorry about that. But it's kind of implied there. This both runs the loop as long as there are legit rows there because row is not false when it has actual data. And then all we're going to do each time through the loop is we are going to print the row with print R. 
and then this will run however many rows that it, this select statement gets from the database and we're printing it out. So give me a row, give me a row, give me a row. We're done with rows. Okay, stop the loop. That's what's going on here. And given that this is what's in the tables, this is what we see. And this is, to me, the lovely bit of this fetch associate is each row is an associative array with a key value pair where the column name is the string key. So user ID, name, email. So those are really strings. They don't, it doesn't show you the quotes, but those are really strings. User ID maps to one, name maps to Chuck, email maps to CSEV, password maps to one, two, three. So this first row right here comes back to you as an array. And we're going to do more with that row. For now, we're just dumping it out for debugging. Then it goes up and runs again, and then it gets, goes up and runs again, and then it gets this row. And it comes in, and then it prints that out. So we see that bit right there. The primary key is two, the name is Glenn. And so we're just, it's as if we're reading a file or reading anything. Um, we're getting a set of arrays, one array per row. There's also a thing I think called fetch all which gives you an array of arrays. And it's not a bad way to go about it because you're not really supposed to fetch trillions of things through, the, through a single select statement anyways. So, so that's kind of the simplest example. And you know, when you're doing this stuff for the first time, stick with the simple examples. Don't get too complex. Okay. But generally, we don't want to write applications that have a pre-tag and print R as their data. And so this is all the stuff at the, above this. From here up, that's identical. And from, well, here down, it's not. Well, not quite. So we're going we're gonna to print out a table. So we're printing out HTML table border equals one new line. Prints this line out. Then we're going to do that while loop. And each time in the loop, we're going to print out a TR and a TD. Then we're going to print out the name. Then we're going to put out slash TD, start TD, which is this bit right here. Then we're going to print out the email. Then we're going to print out slash TD, start TD. Then we're going to print out the password, 123. This is a very secure system, prints the password right out. It's beautiful. It lot, makes it a lot easier. And then we end the TD and the TR, and we throw a new line at the end, so it looks pretty. Then we go up, grab a new row and do the same thing. And then when we hit this the third time, this becomes false. So it comes out and prints slash table. And that renders like this. And so this idea of go to the database, get back a record set, loop through the record set, generate HTML, that's what we're doing here. We are reading the record set and we are using with echo statements, we're transforming it into HTML. Now, in more sophisticated environments, you have templates that do this transformation, etc. And so, so yeah, you, there, there are different ways to do this, but this is the basic idea of taking a record set and turning it into HTML. Okay? It's... After a while, you just like send a select statement and then work with the data and do anything you darn well please with the data. Add it up, print it out, who knows what you're doing, right? You have all the power at that point. It's a simple concept and and, and absolutely beautiful. So one of the things as a pattern that we do is we don't like putting this stuff at the beginning of every file because you'll literally will eventually have 10 or 12 files and they will all want to make a database connection. And so you don't want to put the password in every database, every connection. So we refactored this code a little bit and put it from one file, put part of it into one file and part of it into another file and use include. So it also makes it so you don't, if you're using GitHub or something and checking it in, you don't want to check your database password into GitHub because that's kind of a security hole, especially if people can read your GitHub. And so the thing we then do is we take the PDO bit and we pull that into a file like pdo.php. And all we do is we, you know, do something, maybe a side effect of the PDO. Now this set attribute, we'll explain what this is. Um, what it really is, it's kind of like display errors. It's, uh, it's saying, please blow up when I make a syntax error in my SQL, because that's not the default. The default is to keep going, which if, you're, if your SQL is bad, and I'm, what I mean by SQL is bad is like your SQL that select star from users isn't right. So you don't want to do that. So I, I just put this in. It's just a nice thing to say, look, if I make a mistake in my PDO, please totally blow up because I'm mostly developing. You can change this perhaps in production, but in developing, that's like display errors. That's like quit now, give me some details as to what I did wrong, tell me what's going on. But that's not what we're doing right now. What we're doing right now is um, we're just saying require once pdo.php, we're putting on a pre-tag, we're pulling this in, 
require one.pdo.php. So in third.php, there's one of these and many of these, right? So this is like whatever, your this and your events and your book and your whatever, right? Bunch of stuff. So each file that wants to have access just says require once pdo.php and you only put the password in once and then the rest of this stuff is exactly the same. And so you have third, fourth, fifth, tenth, eleventh, and they all just require pdo.php. I probably talked a little too much about that. Okay, so up next what we're going to do is we're going to actually insert some data from PHP into the database. So welcome back. We just showed you how to do a select over a PDO connection to your MySQL database. But that's not the only thing we want to do. We want to insert, we want to delete, etc, etc, etc. So now we're going to talk about some code that's you know, going to do a little more sophisticated SQL. The basic idea of making a string and sending it to the SQL database at MySQL server, that's going to be the same. We're just going to see examples of how we might use insert or delete, etc, etc. And you should probably be downloading all this code and looking at it. Um, the slides really don't do it justice, but I kind of cover everything in the slides and then I go back and re-record little videos that are just showing the code and show the code as it's running. Um, so I go through them once in the slides and then once in sort of code demos. But you probably want to have the code up in a nice syntax color text editor and see what's going on. So this is user one. And I always have these little little things here down like this to say, oh, it's user one.php. So you know that if you go pdo.zip and it's user one.php. And so that's what I'm working with. Okay. Now this assumes that we have a pdo.php, so it requires it. So, it, so you'll see this pattern from now on that I don't put the pdo connection in. I just put it in one little file and then I require it all over the place. So this is now going to do the model view controller stuff. And so like any model view controller application, I have this line above which is like the, the model and below which is the view, the model and the view. And the controller is all these decisions and redirecting, et cetera, and routing, et cetera. And so what's going to happen is the first time through this code is going to um, not be a post, it's a get request, so it comes straight through and it produces this output right here. It produces a form with a post coming back and a, a name, uh, email, et cetera, et cetera. And so that, that's what happens when we do the get, the first request. So there's two request response cycles that are gonna happen. So it first paints it, then we type in this stuff, type, 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 and then we press the add new button. And when we do that, that causes, oops, that causes, oh, I want to change the color. That causes another request, and this time the post data. So we're going to use is set to say, is there a name field in the post data and an email field in the post data and a password field in the post data? That means that this stuff got filled in, right? Then this is the code that deals with the incoming post data. That got skipped the first time as we did the get request. <clears throat> and so then what happens is we write some SQL. So we say insert into users, parentheses, name, email, and password. That's just a list of the columns. And then values equals, and these are little placeholders, colon name, colon email, colon password. Say, these are the values that we're going to read. Now, those are placeholders. And I'll print out the SQL, and that causes this to print out right here. And then we do what's called a prepared statement. So instead of running the query directly, we say, we pass this SQL, the selects the insert statement, we pass it in and say parse it and read it and figure out where the little placeholders are. And then we have to do it in a two steps. We say execute and then we pass in as a parameter, as a parameter, the name maps to post sub name, email maps to post sub email, password. This, I could have made this be X and L and M and then this would be M, L and X down here. Oops, X. Um, I happen to call it name, email, and password, and they happen to have the same name as these things, but it's not automatic. The placeholders, names are stuff you come up with, and these values right here are effectively from the form. So, what that does is that basically puts this data in here, this data in here, and this data in here, and then when we say execute, it actually sends that insert statement to the database. Okay, and so it, right in here, at this moment here, it has done the insert, doesn't say anything, and then it falls through and puts out the form again. So it comes, we don't do anything here, we just kind of fall through and put the form again. So that's basically how user one works. It has this sort of model view controller. We run the code twice, right? We run the code twice, once as a get and bypasses this, that prints this out and prints out this. 
Then when we push this button, it runs the code again and comes in and now these things, this code's triggered because those ifs are all true and it runs through and runs an insert statement pulling the data from the form into the database. And so now those three values are now in the database. And so there we go. We take a look and we take a look at our database and we've got a third record. And of course, we didn't have to do anything with the user ID because that's an auto increment field when we define the database. It's the same. The SQL you send from PHP is identical to the SQL that you would type in PHP MyAdmin. It's just identical. It's, it's beautiful. I just can't get over how awesome it is. Okay, so now we're going to take a little bit of different tack on this. And what we're going to do is we are going to add a little pretty output. So it's not that different. Most of it's the same. This part up here is the same. If you look, it's the same. It just is the thing that checks to see when the post happens uh, away you go. But now what we're going to do is add this little part here. Okay. And so we're just going to do a select name, email, and password from users. So this is going to grab those three columns. We're not doing the user ID yet. And we're going to have a loop. We'll print out a table and then we're going to print out table rows, one for each row and end the table. And that's going to print this little bit out, right? So this is what was in the, it. A get request comes in, skips this part. Then it prints out the three things in the table and then it continues on. And then it puts out that form with a submit the way we did before. And so you can type a new thing in here, a new thing in here and hit the submit button. It runs here. It doesn't insert. And what will happen is you'll see a little fourth row there. It'll look exactly the way you want it to look. Okay, and so this is just now we've added a dump in a table of the contents of the a dump of that table in a, a dump of the database table into an HTML table. The word table is being used too many times. Okay, so now let's look at how you might delete something. And so uh, what we're going to do is we are going to make a little little delete form. It's going to We'll start just with this little form, just so you can take a look at it. And it's going to make it get the PDO connection. It has a little bit of code that it skips, you know, if it's a GET request. And the GET request just puts this screen up. And there is an, a user ID, a, val, a delete button, and we put in some ID, like three. And then we hit the submit. The, the, we put the word delete on the button. So we hit the submit, and it runs again. And this time, user ID is set. We say delete from users where user ID equals colon zip. Colon zip is again one of those placeholders. And we do a prepare of that, which parses the SQL and sees if we did something horrible. And then we're going to execute and we're going to say, okay, please take the post date of user ID, which is this three number, and then put that in here. So that effectively puts three into that right there. And then it runs it. And so that is what then deletes user ID number three from the database. So you hit that button and it'll delete that. Okay. <clears throat> and so it runs and you can see it prints out the SQL here, right? It deletes the user. It runs the delete user ID equals zip. It doesn't show you that little three number, but it, it does it. And so then you take a look and poof, user ID three is gone. Okay. And so that's how you run a delete. So now let's do user3.php, and this is just playing with the HTML, okay? This is just playing with the HTML. So if we look at what we're going to try to do here, we're going to have a table. We're going to have a form to do the add, this code we've seen before. But what we're doing is this little del trick, little delete trick, okay? So we're going to construct some HTML in that table cell. Literally everything else in this next program is identical, except we're going to put a delete button on the row. Now, it, these aren't very pretty, but you can make CSS and HTML to make them prettier. I'm just starting out making them crude to keep it simple. OK, so what we have is we have the up above there, we have the insert code up there. We have the delete code that we pulled in from that del code. And we have the table code that we haven't changed at all. This first three lines of the table code is unchanged. We pull the delete post handling and the inserts up there too. It, it just, you're not seeing it here. It's, if you go into the user3.php, you'll see the insert code and the delete code. The delete and the insert code are different because it knows that there's a post of delete and there's a user ID. But the fun thing is how to get this little thing to come out. Oops, come back, come back. No, no. How to get this little guy to come out. 
and that is in a table cell. So we're table cell, table cell, and a third table cell. This is the fourth table cell. It's a TD and a slash TD. And now I am going to put in the table cell an entire form. Okay, I'm putting a form in the table cell. I say it's a form method equals post, input type equals hidden. A hidden field is like a text field that doesn't show up in the UI. So in every one of those little table cells, the user ID, the name equals user ID will have the value of the user ID because this time I did a select asking for not just the name, email, and password. I also wanted the primary key for every row. And so then I print that out right here. So one, two, three will be that user ID. And then I put out a little input type equals submit with a name Dell and delete. And so if we take a look at this and we look at the view source of this, um, if we look at the view source, it'll look kind of like this, right? So in that table definition, there's a form. There's going to be a hidden field with a value equals five, whatever the primary key of this last added thing is. And, and this one will be like one, two, three, five. Each one will have, this, there's four forms on this screen, and this is just one of those forms. And we know which one to delete by the, it's different. So you can, there actually is five forms on this. One, two, three, four, and then this is a form two. So you can have many forms on a screen and you kind of know with things like this, what button is being pushed, right? So, um, so away we go. So we've got a little tiny form. When we click this button, it sends a post back to the user three, whatever it is, whatever, user3.php, right? It sends a post back and then that post runs this code right there and then does the delete. And then it falls through after the delete and then it reads everything out. So if you hit the delete button, it will come back and it will only show you four of them, right? So you can insert somebody, you could delete somebody. So you just play with this, insert, delete, insert, delete, insert, delete, until you really kind of understand what all that code is doing. <clears throat> so here is sort of the whole code bit um, for user three. We start out with require pdo.php. We have the code that we got that does the insert, uh, the form at the bottom. We have the little tiny delete forms that send to this. And because we've chosen our names and email and password have to be set for this code to execute, it knows whether to run this or whether to run this. So it only runs this when it's doing an insert and it only runs that when it's doing a delete. And if it's doing a get, it doesn't do any of it. it just goes right by it. So this is kind of the model of our model view controller. And the little line is right there at the bottom. So we're about to switch from the model part to the view part. So this bottom part is the view part. Okay, so now we'll take a look at the view. The top half of the view, the first part, is that little HTML table. Right, so the HTML, head, table, and then we're gonna do a query. Yeah, we're, we're doing a little bit of work inside the view, which is a little tacky, but it's okay. We're gonna do that. I could, we can move that up and put leave that in a variable and have it fall across as the context, but for now we're just gonna do a select. We're gonna do a little printing thing, all this stuff here to print the little Dell button. That's the Dell button, right? And then out we go. So that's the first half of the view. And the second half of the view is simply that form that is the form to add the new user. And so that, and then we're done with the, uh, uh, the, the entire thing and have a slash body tag. And so that's the overall outline of this user three. So take a look at it and try to understand every single line. I try to keep them as simple as possible and take a look at how they work. So up next, we're gonna talk about some of the issues on validation and security having to do with SQL injection. So we've seen how to read data from the database. We've seen how to send database commands like uh, delete and insert to add and to remove stuff from the database. But it's probably just, I've been doing stuff a little bit sloppy um, and I want to make sure we talk about some of the things uh, that you have to worry about when you're, when you're taking data from users and using it inside your code. So if you recall, we talked about HTML injection. And the problem with HTML injection is if a, a user with ill intent, uh, intentionally or even unintentionally, starts putting legitimate HTML into form tags and you simply echo that without thinking, um, 
they can sort of take over your background document. And usually they're not just putting out the word die, die, die. They're putting something like uh, JavaScript in. And so if you are putting um, you know, raw user input out, the, the browser parses it differently. The browser doesn't realize that this bit came from the user and it's a problem. And, uh, and so this is a danger when you don't clean up your data. And of course, the solution to that is uh, HTML entities, which then turns that into ampersand quote and all those other things, which you talked about before. There is a similar problem with SQL injection. It's the idea that the user can type something. And this turned out to be a giant problem in PHP because there was, it was so convenient in PHP to do the wrong thing. And beginning developers, PHP is a, a favorite language of beginning developers, so it was easy to make a mistake. Okay? And so PHP got a really bad reputation of highly insecure. It wasn't PHP's fault. PHP just made it really easy to be insecure. And as we talked about before, PHP is a language that expects that you're a responsible program, programmer. And actually, they did some silly things in PHP 4 to try to solve this problem, and it was really bad, and they've un undone that. We just... But PDO, which I'm going to show you, there's a happy ending. There's, they finally figured this out in like PHP 5, but they tried to fix it in PHP 4 and did a bad job of it. If you see things like strip slashes in existing code, then you're like, oh, that's from the dark times of HTML injection. But SQL injection is users who are trying to take form fields and do bad things to your database. So um, let's just say that you didn't want to do that two-step process where um, I did the prepare and the execute as two steps. That's good practice. But you say, oh, wow, PHP has this wonderful ability to use these dollar signs inside of a double quotes. Wouldn't it be great and simple if I just did this? I just did a select statement with double quotes, and then I grabbed the email into this variable dollar $E and the password in that, and I just put in, in a single quote inside here, Away we go, and so that'll just put the stuff right from the form fields right into this SQL, and then we're just going to run the SQL. This is bad. Bad, bad, bad. Really evil. Okay, so <laughs> let's show you what happens. Okay, the problem is, is we are taking end user entered stuff, and then they can do things like they can take over our SQL. And it's even worse to take over our SQL because then they can break into our whole database. If they break into our HTML, they kind of can steal cookies and stuff of one or a few users that get caught by it. But in the database, they're in. They've got all your stuff. If they can get a hold of your database password and they're in and run generic commands on your database, you are in deep, deep trouble. So SQL injection is worse in a way. Not that either one is good, but it's even worse than HTML injection. So let's see what happens here. So let's say we've got our little user table here, right? And so we've got user ID, we've got the password, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and so we type in a person's email and we uh, type the wrong password and we submit uh, the login. And it, it basically says, it, using that code I just showed you, it says select name from users where email equals c7umich.edu and password equals wrong. It simply take these two values and stuck them into that string, right? And then it does a select from that, and if it didn't get a record, then it says you didn't log in, right? Because it's matching both the email and the password. So that's pretty good, right? Worked just fine. That's a quick way, that's a quick way to log people in. You do, do a query and then see if you got a row. And if you didn't get a row, you don't log them in. If you did get a row, you do log them in. That's kind of how login works. Okay, so what could possibly go wrong? So this, I haven't done anything evil. The whole idea of these injection attacks is that you're going to do something evil in these forms that you can sneak into the SQL and do a bad thing. Okay, so here is an XKCD cartoon. That's a very important cartoon. It is the canonical cartoon about SQL injection. I'll read it to you. So there is a, a mom and she is making a call to the school. And she says, hi, or the, the school calls, says to the mom, hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. And mom says, oh, dear, did he break something? And they said, the school says, in a way. And the school says, did you really name your son Robert single quote parenthesis semicolon drop table student semicolon dash dash question mark? That's the school. 
And mom says, of course, we named him Little Bobby Tables. Um, and then the school says, well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And mom says, uh, the very technically astute mom says, I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. Or I would say, I hope you've learned an SQL injection lex uh, a lesson about how to do SQL injection and avoid it. Another way to say is, I, th I hope you've learned to use PDO rather than doing string substitution to do your queries, okay? Or prepared statements rather than string substitution. Um, now, th this is funny, and everyone loves this. Um, I once met a student who changed their login name to null. So another fun thing to put into fields is null, because null is a keyword. And so if your name is N-U-L-L, -L, but they use it wrong on the, in the wrong place, then some things will behave differently for null. So I've met people who have actually tried to do this. Uh, there's, there's things on the internet where people like create, uh, create a license plate that's like semicolon drop table traffic or something so that a computer will read this thing do vi uh, do image processing on the text, and then hopefully they'll they'll, they'll format the, the the database of the whatever. But you get the idea. So, okay, that's a joke. I probably ruined it for you because I just am not a bad, uh, not a good joke teller. But the key thing is to put this single quote in because the single quote is an active character, and they're expecting that they'll this will be in some SQL, and then this will be the end of that, and then they're going to run a second SQL command. Semicolon, as we saw in SQL, allows you to run more than one command on the same line. Now, it turns out that they've taken this particular thing, meaning that PDO doesn't, unless you ask it to, respect semicolons in a single query. So they've kind of fixed this. You can't quite do this one. It'd be so fun if you could. But the modern PDOs and the modern databases, they don't let this one happen because it's just too bad. But we can still do bad things. And, and there are ways that they figure this thing out, right? And so remember here how we have this, um, we're gonna make this select statement and then we are going to, a, whatever the user types, we're gonna put in right there. And what if I put in, I mean, P quote, or one equals one quote. So I now, with no modification, have put in this bit right here, okay? And not that single quote, not that close quote. Sorry, I, let me start that over again. Let me get this right. From the P to the one, but with neither quote. So the two quotes are part of the original SQL. And just like an HTML injection, that's not how SQL looks at it. It says the password, it, it, it's, it's where the email is c7 at umesh.edu and the password is p or one equals one. Well, one equals one is always going to be true. So this is always going to be true. So even though I don't know the password, I'm logged in. And so even though I'm not, I can't use the semicolon trick to do really bad things, right? That'd be more fun. It'd be fun to say drop tables right here, but you can't because it doesn't look in this string. Semicolons are not respected in that string, even though they are respected when you're doing PHP MyAdmin. When you're doing a PDO query here, it says, I think we're not going to do semicolons because it's so dangerous. And so you can tell it to put do semicolons, but you can't... Um, but by default, it doesn't do semicolons. But you, but it doesn't mean that this is without database, uh, without uh, HTML, the SQL sanitization, or um, pr pro doing this properly. Um, what they want to do is they want to break in and figure out and log into your administrator account and then start doing all kinds of stuff with your administrator account, or figure out what your password is, or figure out what your admin password is, or figure out what your database password is by surreptitiously logging in. And so. Um, even though you can't quite drop the tables the way XKCD wants us to drop tables. Um, so, now, that's the bad news. And prior to S uh, PHP 5, you had, there was a long description about how to do this. But with PHP 5 and PDO, and this is one of the reasons that I'm like, don't use anything but PDO, this prepare statement that I've already showed you the pattern for does this perfectly. And so what happens here is we have this little place that was going to have the email and the password, but we have just these two little placeholders, right? We're not actually putting the text. And the prepare is, reads through and finds these little placeholders, and then it puts in the user data. But in this act of executing, it is doing stuff to this to properly escape it, kind of like what HTML entities did for HTML, except we don't even do it. We just know that this works, meaning that this cannot suffer, the, if you're doing this, email and password cannot be used to do SQL injection because the prepared statement 
escapes the data properly automatically and you don't even have to escape the data. In the early days in MySQL underscore routines prior to PHP 5, prior to PDO, we had all these escaping routines that are kind of like HTML entities, but they were kind of ugly. You just use prepared statements and a story. You don't have SQL injection. If you start concatenating stuff together, including end user data, then you're in trouble, right? Don't concatenate things together that came from the end user. Um, just use prepared statements. They're just another extra line. It's elegant, it's simple. It makes your SQL look pretty. You're not doing ugly concatenations. And so away it goes, okay? So just use PDO, use prepared statements when you ever use, use it. So insert, delete, etc. Anything that you're putting user data in, you got to use these little placeholders, including selects. You might have a where clause in a select where name equal or email equals em. Well, this is a select, right? This one right here is a select. Even though this is a select, it's okay. We don't. We can get ourselves in trouble if we don't properly escape user input, even on a select statement. So, up next, we're going to talk a little bit about more what'll go wrong. This is less about the SQL injection that we just got done talking about, and more about when you have syntax errors in your SQL. So, like if you can't type select correctly, or you use a field that doesn't exist, and so it's a little bit tricky. And there's a lot of flexibility in how PDO errors are handled. I talked about this at the beginning of the previous uh, thing when we set up pdo.php, but now we're going to look at it in some greater detail. So welcome back. Let's talk a little bit about how things can go wrong. Everything I've shown you so far is syntactically correct, but rest assured as you start writing code, you're going to make uh, various syntax errors. And there's a whole bunch of uh, little error handling options that PDO has that we can play with. Um, and so here is a bit of code. Uh, it's, it's kind of like we're just doing this select. We're going to read a user, um, you know, select star from users where user ID equals whatever, and we're going to do a fetch. We're, we're looking at the, how things go wrong. We're either going to say the user is not found or, or is found. And so, you know, this is the default error mode warning. I'll talk about those in a second. And so this is going to work because this is the placeholder, and this is the placeholder, and there's a user ID. And whether it finds the user or not, it's, it's not whether the user, the, the first thing to say is, if you do a select and you don't get a record, as long as the select is syntactically correct, then that's not actually an error. That's okay. You just get no row, and in this case, you get a false row, versus a syntax error, like if you make a syntax error. So a, a, an example of a syntax error in, to, with this code right here is if, for example, I basically, in my, in my code, I say colon XYZ, and then in my little array, I say colon pizza. You will at this point, this point or this point, um, it will blow up. It'll say, whoa, you don't have the right thing. It's not going to work. And so I couldn't find a thing that maps pizza properly. So it doesn't. And so that is the kind of error that we're going to run into, a, a, a kind of a blow up error. It's like a syntax error. The, it's, a, it's like an SQL syntax error. Um, and so if you look and you look at the documentation, there is a couple of different things. And the problem is, is that there's, you can have it say, don't say anything, don't do any error messages whatsoever. You can say, put out a warning and keep going. And the one I prefer and the one I set up all the time is what's called error mode exception, which means blow up right then and there, tell me what line of code is wrong and quit. So that's why a couple of slides back, I did that. And so um, if you run this code with this mistake in it, this XYZ and pizza not matching, it'll complain and then it'll just keep on going, right? It'll just keep on going. Um, it's blowing up, uh, it's blowing up here in execute. Yeah, it's blowing up here, but it keeps on going. And that's kind of not what you want. That's not what you want. If you say exception, then it stops. And so it comes in here. We say, we set this attribute, so make it be exception. And then we make the same mistake and it blows up here and it says, oh, uncaught exception, blah, 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 blah. But what's important is it stops. It stops running the code so that you can actually, it's dangerous to keep on running this code because you don't know if that was supposed to do something or if it's going to have an unintended consequence. So this is the kind, this is the way that I like it a lot. I like to keep it that way. And um, you'll notice that, um, <clears throat> you, I mean, so, so if you set exception, you can actually do exception processing by enclosing the whole thing in a try catch block, right? So you can have a try and then you can have a catch and that'll gives you some data about the exception. So either it runs and it works and it goes, 
or it runs, blows up, and then runs the catch block. So once you do exception, if you want to catch it. But the interesting thing is that, well, I, you can do this and print out your own message, basically, and, and so you have some control over it, and that message now is coming out of my catch block right there. Um, and so, so it's not bad, but, but generally, you really want to quit. And you see how it says return here? It give up. It, it just stopped, and that's a way. Quit or exit return or exit because because you sort of want to print the message out and this way you're controlling what the message looks like but you're not continuing on because it, it, if this didn't work and it's it's like a syntax error it's like you made a mistake I mean this is a mistake it wasn't bad data or it wasn't missing data that's normal that's not going to cause an exception you cause an exception because you kind of have like a typographical error in your code okay so that's why you either use P error mode exception and let it just blow up like it does here with a traceback, or do your own try catch and print a message out under your own control. The nice thing about this, well, both of them are gonna log stuff and you might have to actually add here an error log so you can catch it later because that's the next thing we're gonna talk about is how error logs work. And so every time there's an error in your PHP, like what I caused you to, what I told you to fix in display errors early on, so you just say display errors on, if display errors is off, the errors go into a log, just not to the screen. And the reason I tell you to put display errors on is it's hard to find the log. So now we're gonna find the log. It's nice to look at the log and when everything is going wrong, I mean, I still do this, like what is going wrong? And the other thing that's nice about the log is even if it's not you that's using your application, if someone else is using your application, you still can read the log. So on a production system, you can read the log. How do you find where the error logs are? They're just files on the server system. In the case of your data of your desktop or your laptop, it's a file that's on your laptop. So go to PHP Info. However, you go find it in MAMP, you know, click on PHP Info or XAMP has its own place, or write a little script that prints out PHP Info yourself. Whatever it is, the location of the error log is just another configured value. And so this says, for my particular thing, it's in the folder Applications, MAMP, Logs, and it's called the file phpairlog.php. So you can find your way to the error log, whether it's MAMP or XAMP or uh, var log, something, something, something on Linux. Um, you can open that file, and some text editors will notice as the file gets appended to and then give you the additional information. In... Um, in uh, Mac and Linux, there's this really cool command called tail, which just sits at the end of the file and just prints out the new things that come on. It just waits until the file gets extended and then prints that stuff out from you. And you can get like a tail command for Windows. Um, um, Mac also has this thing called the console that, that can tail these things. But I tend to use command line and tail uh, because then I can see it. And this is kind of what it looks like if you're tailing that log. You could just open the log in a text editor, but you might have to reopen it to see the new files because it just adds to the end. And so this is what it looks like, and I'm using, on my Macintosh, I am using a tail command, tail minus F, and minus F says, show me the end of the file, but don't stop and keep showing me new things that get added to the file. So it just sits there, goes blurp, 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 and new little lines come out. And all of this, all these little mistakes, whether it's a syntax error, can I, you know, these are just all these errors that are happening as I'm writing code and I'm making mistakes in writing code. And you know, here's this error too, right? It shows that this thing was a, a, a it was thrown. It shows you the line of code, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so these error logs are super useful, especially when you're in production and there's like users all over that are using your application and they're causing errors. And so you want to watch those uh, logs roll by and make sure that you see the errors. I actually have little um, scripts that read the log every day and send me email for anomalies and production systems. And that's, that's so that I know when you're using one of my production systems and you start seeing error messages, actually 15 minutes later, I start seeing them on email. They show right up on my phone. So I get to see them. I, so I have a little script that reads these and then anything new gets sent to my phone. And professional companies have that all that, all that monitoring figured out. So. This was a super cool lecture. I mean, I'm really excited that you made it this far. 
We basically have shown how to make a database connection. I mean, it's like only three lines of code to make a database connection and send some data, send a SQL command, and then pull some data back, right? There are some fancier bits to it, prepared statements and these substitution parameters. We talked a little bit about SQL injection, why you don't want to do that, what can, you can, what can go wrong there. And as long as you use PDO and prepared statements for everything that ever comes to a user, then you'll be fine. Um, and then we took a look at about how errors uh, tend to happen. So uh, thanks for taking the time to listen. Cheers. See you on the net. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another code walkthrough on web applications for everybody. The code that we're going to walk through today is the code for uh, PDO. Now, one of the things that will be interesting is you, everything we've done up to now, you can actually run on web applications for everybody. But since this one needs a database, and I didn't set the database up for everybody to share on web applications, you actually have got to download the PDO.zip and get it somewhere onto your local hard drive, right? So I've got actually all the code sitting right here. Um, and uh, and so I've got all the code here, so you'll down pdo.zip and you'll extract it somewhere in your HD docs in a way that you can find things. And then eventually you'll have this stuff on your local host. So code pdo, that's all those files so that now I can, you know, run these things. This AA error check thing checks to see if you got display errors off, right? So that's nice. If you get a different, you might want to click on that and just see if it checks your errors. Always is a good idea. So one of the things that's important is it's got some notes in here and you got to run some SQL commands. And so um, I'm going to make a database here. So I'll do some SQL, go back to these notes, create database misc, yada, yada, make a thing called Fred and Zap. Otherwise the things won't work. Now I've got a new database. So I go into that misc database. If I am on command line or in Linux, I might have to say use misc. And then I want to create some tables, and they're going to have user ID, name, email, password, and I want to make the logical key be email. By now, you should know your SQL, right? And so this ought to be completely normal. Boom. I don't know what was mad about that. What was it complaining about when I typed that in? A comma or closing bracket was expected near key. Huh. But it worked. I don't know. Clear. Now... And the last thing I've got to do from the notes is insert a couple of users. Chuck and Glenn into it. Glenn is a real person, by the way. I'm a real person. So now in database misc, I've got um, users table. And if I take a look at that, I got two, two user accounts. So there we go. Now we can start playing with some PHP. So let's take a look at the very first bit of code. So this is important. So I'm going to put out a pre-tag and then I'm going to call and construct a PDO object using the PDO class. And there are three parameters to the constructor. The first parameter is what's called a connection string. And it tells what kind of database we're going to make, be connecting to, which is MySQL, where it's connected. Now most of the time in production you put your database on a different server and it's got an address. Here localhost just means we're on the same server and we are. And then there's a port. Now, if you're using uh, XAMPP on Windows or Linux, you're probably going to choose 3306 here instead of 8089. And then you have to have the name of the database. And that was the name of the database that I just created, the MISC database. Okay. And then you have to have the account and the password. And I did that in, oops, in these notes. I made the account name Fred and I named the password Zap. And you can just do this on your local computer. It doesn't really... There's not a lot of security holes of a database server because you have to be coming from localhost or from your 127.0.0.1 is another version of localhost. And so it, you, know, you can't connect from the outside world into this um, database unless your computer's been completely compromised and then it just doesn't matter. So this is, you don't really have to be too secure about this. Okay, so this creates a connection. It doesn't move any data. It just is a way for us to send SQL commands back and forth. And then we can use this returned object and then call the query method and send some SQL. So this is the same select star from users that we would type. There we go. The same SQL, select star users that we would type right there. Star from users, say go and it returns these four rows as a record set. 
And then what we get back here in PHP is a statement, and then we can use that statement to fetch one row at a time using, and, and so we, PDO colon colon fetch associative array says we would like each row given to us as a series of key value pairs where the name of the key is, oh, come back. The name of the key is the name of the column. User ID equals one, name equals Chuck, email equals CSEV, password equals 123. And so, and this will give us a false, row will give us a false, which will stop the while loop. So this is a quick way to loop through all of the rows that are gonna be retrieved and print them out with print R with a row. Now, if this database doesn't exist or something is wrong, this will cause trouble. But now I've got it all set fine. Um, I can say goodbye to that. And if I run first, it should show that. Now, there's lots of things I could change. Let me just change something here. If I change that to be the wrong password, we'll see what happens here. So I run first and it blows up. And that's because, and this is why errors are turned off because I just blurted my password to my database. So I'll fix that and it will work. And so it, so this PDO, this will blow up if you don't have these things right. And so sometimes making this stuff work, when you first start out, that is the hardest line to get working. Once you have that working, the SQL usually is correct. Now it'll make a different mistake if I make a mistake with the SQL, it'll blow up a different way. It says, oh, you bad, you got some bad um, uh, SQL there. So I'll fix that. We'll talk a little bit more later about um, how errors work. So there we go. Now, um, another way that we do this is we don't necessarily just use print R. And this is a good example of reading data from the database and turning it into a table. And we're just using echo statements cleverly to construct all of this data. So if I go to second, it looks nice. And if you just do a view source, you just see that, you know, there's table and then there's the beginning of a table and then the data that came from the database, the end of a table data, a new one, data that came from a database, on and on and on and on. And so we just construct, we loop through and instead of just dumping it, we actually produce some kind of pretty meaningful HTML. Now, Another thing that we do is we tend not to want in to put this, this statement in every line of every file that we're ever going to do because a lot of websites have like hundreds of files and we don't want to put the password and all the database connection information into every single file. So we refactor it and we use a require statement to pull in another file. The rest of this is just a, a read to read and print all the stuff. So if I look at third here, boom, out she comes. But then I look in pdo.php and all this does is does a um, sets up this variable dollar pdo. I could name this anything. I just happen to name it dollar pdo. The class is capital pdo and dollar pdo is the variable that I made. And I'm setting an error attribute and I'll talk about this in a bit. Um, this error mode, is, I'm saying be aggressive with your errors and blow up and stop rather than continue on. So that is this, all we did here between first and third, first we did it here, and in third we turned that into, oops, in, uh, let me select, save, and in third we just did it all in require and put it in a separate thing. And it's so you don't, you don't leak the passwords and you know, that, that's just a really uh, general good pattern. So that gets us sort of started talking about how we make a connection to the database and how we send an SQL command and how we loop through the data that we get back. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Right now we're working through some of the code uh, for the PDO, uh, Portable Data Objects. Now you have to run this on your own local host and you have to follow the notes to get things set up. We did that in a previous video. So what I'm gonna play with now is the, uh, a little more uh, useful code, uh, user1.php, okay? And so if I take a look at user1.php, it, uh, <clears throat> we follow the pattern of requiring pdo.php, and of course pdo.php has my database connection information with ID and password. And um, I'm gonna use sort of my model view controller pattern where I'm processing the data at the top and then I have my template at the bottom. So this is, all the silent processing code. Um, and then here is the logic. And so on a get request, 
it just is going to fall straight through here because there's no post data and it paints this post form which is exactly this and it gives me a name a password and an email and so I can say Sally Sally at uiuc.edu and Sally's password is 999 and then I hit post and then that's going to come back in the top of this script again and this time these three variables are going to be are going to be set okay so when I hit add new here it's going to add another value and so it runs through here and here's the SQL and this is PDO PDO basically has placeholders for colon name colon name and colon password and we'll talk about why this is later I just print out the SQL and that shows this insert and then it runs that statement taking the name email and password from the post data now I didn't have to name name email and password the same but sometimes you do that just to keep yourself um, uh, keep yourself sane and so that did the insert and so I did an insert as a result of a post so if I go take a look at my new rows you see that now I have a Sally row pretty cool huh okay so that's user one let's take a look at user two so user two basically is going to in addition this code here is the same it's the code to do the insert and this HTML is the same but the only thing I've done different is I'm printing out a table and then printing out all the data so if I go to user 2 instead of user 1 it looks exactly the same this form is going to be at the bottom and so but we see the old ones and so now I can say something like uh, Fred Uh, Fred at umich.edu and a password of some random set of numbers and this form here is the same the difference is is now when I do the uh, post it's going to come in here it's going to do another insert and that's going to fall through and then it's going to show me all the new ones and so now we have this thing where there you go and Caitlin So we'll put Caitlin in. So we now have this thing that's both showing us each time we, oh, I kind of messed that up. I'll have to fix that later. Her email is wrong. I didn't do any data validation. But you can see this one here where we're sort of also we're querying. We're reading and constructing the table. So we've kind of um, communicated a few of these things. And so if we look, let's take a look at our database, browse, and there's Kate. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we might delete. Now the key thing to deleting is you're not supposed to delete on a GET request. And so I'm going to write this thing called user del and pass in the user ID that I want to delete as a, as a, um, as a post parameter. So let's go into user to del. And so now I've just, pasted, I just painted a form right here user ID is a field and I'm going to delete the Kate one that I just made a mistake typing in so I'll put five in and send a post in so now I'm going to when I hit this delete button it's going to run here again and this time post will be set because it'll be set from that five and I'll delete from users where user ID equals colon zip that is a placeholder I'll print out the SQL and a pre I'll prepare it and then I'll run it mapping zip to the data that came in from this field over here. So this code's going to run when I click this button. Doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, so we'll go hide that. Doop. So it ran and the user's gone. Oop, that didn't look very big. So when I go over here and I browse it, Kate's gone. And I can get rid of four. I can say four delete. And I take a look and it's gone. Now here's the thing, just to remind you about SQL, if I delete 42, there's no 42 here, that's not an error. Because I said delete from users where user ID equals 42. Well, there was no user ID 42, so it did exactly what I asked. That's not a syntax error. It's a syntax error if I don't spell the word delete right or the word from right. But having uh, no records that get deleted is not itself an error. So that's how we do a delete. So the next thing I want to talk about is use the 3.php. And that is really just combining all these things together. So I have the add code here, right? 
and then I have the delete handling the delete handling and then I have the HTML so let's just bring user 3 up it's like doing all of it together so it shows everything but the interesting thing is this little tiny delete button here so most of it we've seen before we read and we put all the stuff out and then in this last field right here in this last field right there probably easier if I just in, uh, view source and show you what it looks like in this last field I put a form let's make this a little bigger make it bigger the last so TD is the last column and then uh, slash TD ends that and in that table is a little miniature form it's a method equals post input type equals hidden hidden input fields don't show user ID equals three and then I have a submit button that has a string del with a name equals delete <clears throat> so this form has actually four four forms on it there's I mean, this this page has four forms on it there's a form there's a form there's a form and this is a form as well and I can tell which of these buttons was pat was pushed and that's why I named I named this one delete so I know that that's a delete and then I have add new <clears throat> and I can also tell up in this code whether or not it was a delete that I a post or it was an add post so that add post code is right here and it looks if it is a delete none of these things will be set email password won't be set if it's a if it's a delete then a name password email will, won't be set but user ID will be set and remember I'm putting user ID in here as a hidden value which is the primary key of the user ID so how do I construct that text well it's pretty simple I have the table TD and then I print out the form this is just text a hidden user ID name equal name equals user ID value equals and then I concatenate the actual row to user ID I don't need to use HTML entities here because I know it's a number because it's an internal thing that I invented and then input type and new line and form I'm just kind of constructing a form from echo statements that's exactly what I do okay so if I click on Dell here Glenn is gone and it came back up to the top so it ran here it came down it ran this bit to delete because that's the button I hit and then it fell through and produced the table so for us it looked like this just vanished so we'll make a new one um, Rohita um, umish.edu password is some stuff and we'll add and poof it shows up so that time I pushed this and this postcode triggered instead and so I can have different forms doing every different thing here and it all just kind of works and so that is uh, user one user two and user three walking through hope this helps cheers hello and welcome to web applications for everybody we're working through some of the code that we have um, uh, the PDO code and uh, and we're in the middle of it and the code that I want to show you right now is code called login.php okay and so here's login.php so let's walk you through what it's going to do of course let's start with the data model so here's our people um, we have passwords like chalk one two three um, we should of course be hashing these passwords but for now we're just doing plain text passwords um, and we're gonna log people in and so we got so if it works I can uh, I can type in uh, c7 umich.edu and password 123 a perfectly fine password c7 umich.edu password 123 and it says yay you're logged in and if I say c7 at umich.edu and I say password of not 123 it says no you're not logged in isn't this cool so let's see how we do this login onephp so uh, require onep this is the post code and we'll just leave this for the moment we'll come back to that in a second and then I pay, put, put out this form that is a just to take the um, uh, <clears throat> it, it simply uh, gets the email and password and then posts it so so let's take a look at what we're doing here um, we're pulling in the post data 
We're pulling email and password out of the post data. And look how fun we've done this. We've done this with a double quote, and we're using the variable substitution that, double, that you can and put email equals single quote E single quote for the email and password. And we create the SQL. We run the query. We grab to see if there's one row. If there is one row, row is non-false. If there is a row, if there's no row, row is false. And basically, you're not logged in if the row is false, and you are logged in if, if you got one row and you're logged in success. And so that's how it works, All right? csev at umush.edu and 123 runs this select statement, right? And I can go run that select statement right here. Run the select statement. And I found a row. I got one row. So that means that I'm logged in, and that's exactly what we see. We see that we've got the row, the record set, name maps to the string Chuck. So we select name from users where email, and so login success, right? And if I do csev at umish.edu and I put in the wrong password, then it gets no row because there is no record that matches these two things. Okay? So that seems like a good idea. But... It's not a good idea at all. And that's because there is this thing called SQL injection. And so this is the classic explanation of SQL injection. It's a XKCD, XKCD um, comic. And mom is saying, hearing the, uh, hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Um, and mom says, oh dear, did he break something? And school says, in a way. And then the school says, did you really name your son Robert, single quote, semicolon, drop table student, semicolon, dash, dash, question mark? And mom says, of course, we named him Little Bobby Tables is his nickname. And then the school says, well, we've lost this year's student records. I hope you're happy. And then mom says, and I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. And the problem is just like with HTML, if we are taking data raw from the user and putting it into strings and then sending that to the database, a clever user can type an evil thing and take over. So let's try to become evil and break in to our thing. Now, what I need to do is I need to type into the password something that has a single quote in it because then I can convince it that it's a single quote. So here's, here's one that's pretty good. So I'll say csev at umich.edu, and I'm going to say that the password is single quote, or p single quote, or, oops, or single quote one, single quote equals single quote one. Now, again, it's just like when I was doing HTML entities, I am going to put this string right there. And, it's, and then SQL is going to interpret the single quotes that I just sent in. Okay, and so this is not the right password, but then when I submit it, look at the select statement. The select statement is, this is what I typed. This is the unescaped data that came from the user. So I can, I mean, I meant for it to be that this was the password, but that's not how SQL is going to read it. It's going to say this, or, and that's SQL, one equals one, which is always true. So there is a record that's going to come back. And we used in the code the existence of one record as login successful. And so away we go. So I just broke into this system by figuring out a cleverly constructed password to get in. Okay? That's bad. That's bad. Now, the, the, I, would want to, I wish I could show you a little drop table students, but they made it so that this query right here won't do semicolons unless you force it to do semicolons. So the more fun thing to do is to add a semicolon in there and do a second SQL command. But they took away all the fun, so I can't even demonstrate that. So I can just demonstrate cheating and logging in without actually knowing the password. So how do we solve this? Well, it's so easy. The way we solve this is we use login2.php instead. And we use PDO the way it was meant to be used. And if I put in the single, uh, the, the um, P quote or one equals, oops, P quote or one equals one, it's not gonna work. 
And that's because the SQL that's actually sent has these placeholders in it. It doesn't have the actual text. We actually pass in the text to this execute. And this execute carefully escapes as much as necessary all of these user entered values. It assumes anything that's being mapped in here might be dangerous. So it's like, create a little place, don't let this data escape. Create a little place, don't let this data escape. If they put funky characters in there, do whatever. It's kind of like HTML entities, and before we had PDO and prepared statements, there was a series of MySQL escape things that made the code look really nasty. Now we just use PDO, and many languages have these things where they parameterize all their SQL. Um, and so the, the, the answer to this is just use PDO prepared statements. Don't use string concatenation, especially when user entered data is present. Never ever use string concatenation to make SQL when end user data is part of the query. And end user data is inevit inevitably gonna be part of the query. So that's why uh, PDO is my best friend and I love PDO and I can't say enough good things about PDO. And so that is how we do uh, avoid SQL injection, okay? So I, uh, I hope this little code walkthrough was helpful. Cheers. Hello and welcome to our lecture on cookies and sessions. So cookies and sessions are highly related, but I think probably the most important part of this lecture is to understand the difference between cookies and sessions. Cookies are a part of the HTTP protocol. It is a relationship between the browser and any server. Cookies are a browser feature that then servers take advantage of to implement sessions. So sessions are data stored generally inside the server and sort of unlocked by a cookie. But so we're gonna look at each of these uh, separately, just keep them separate. So like I said, cookies are an HTTP thing. And so it is basically a way for the a script on the server to store a little bit of data in the browser. So there's this little database sitting there and we'll see that database in a second. And it, it can store data in there and then when new requests come in, the cookies come in with it, okay? And so it's a, it's like a, a temporary or semi-permanent storage on the browser that can be written by the server. And um, this is the way that, I mean, we just assume this now that somehow the servers know my browser on my laptop versus your browser running on your iPhone or whatever. But that, that wasn't always the case, right? These browsers originally were all kind of anonymous. They were all the same. And they would ask for documents and the, and the servers would show the documents in the most basic form, but things like logging in and logging out and having you know, access to your email on yours and mine on mine, that was something we kind of had to invent because the early days really were stateless, meaning that the brow every browser was treated the same. There was no way to mark a particular browser, but that didn't last very long at all. And so cookies are this idea of scribbling a little mark, a little sort of a breadcrumb as it were. So your, your browser gets one, my browser gets another one, and somehow the server now knows the 40 or a 2,000 or 100,000 browsers it's working with by putting a little different mark on each one of them as it encounters them. And so cookies are different than sessions and cookies are different than logging in. Although cookies are used for sessions and cookies are used for logging in, they are just part of the request response cycle. They don't sort of, cookies don't force their way into the server, uh, but we use cookies. So the way it often works on many sites is you have a cookie the first moment that you have a web page, to hit a web page. And you'll notice uh, there are some uh, EU laws that basically say you have to have a little top part that says, our site uses cookies. And they're saying that because they want to store data in your browser. And EU has basically said that uh, you have to ask permission, which is probably a good idea. Um, and so the browser comes for the first time to a website, notices that it has no cookies on this browser, and then wants to send a page back that marks that browser with a cookie and potentially ask permission to do so. And then once the permission is granted, then, it, then it, the cookie is sent. But then, so that's the first page or the first or second page. And then from that point on, every time that browser requests a page from that same server, it includes those cookies. There can be more than one of those cookies. And so it's like, hello, here's your little, here's your number, here's your serial number, dear browser, and please send me the serial number on all successive requests once the user has given permission. 
And so they're, they're siloed by web address. And so uh, you don't send a cookie from the bank site to your learning management system. And you don't send uh, your learning management system cookies to your social media. They have an expiration date. Uh, there is such a thing as a session cookie, which only lasts as long as the browser is open. And then they sort of are flushed out and others are written to the, the permanent storage, like the disk of your computer. And then that's why sometimes things know that you're logged in, you know, days later after you've shut your computer down and shut your browser down and then you come back. And so some of them are perm. They all have expiration dates. Some of them have, you know, expiration dates well over a year. And some of them have expiration dates as soon as you close the browser, they're gone. And that's why you have to log back in. And, and again, cookies and login aren't the same thing, but cookies are how login is kind of unlocked. Okay. PHP, of course, does a superb job of cookies. Um, we'll talk about with uh, uh, sessions and other things, but right now we're talking about cookies. Uh, there is a set cookie function and there is a, a super global called dollar underscore cookies that is like dollar underscore post or dollar underscore get. And so this is the, the simple thing. You know, it, the cookie processing is handled by PHP. And again, before the first line of your code runs, the cookies are pulled and extracted into a key value pair. Cookies are key value pairs. When you set the cookie, you have to set the, set the key and the value and an expiration time. And so here I'm saying, is there a cookie named Zap sitting in the browser? If there is not, uh, did the, here we're, we're processing a request, right? We've got a get request or a post request. Did that post request include a cookie from the browser? If it didn't, then we're going to send a cookie back on the response and then we're going to see that and we're going to say and this is like saying zap equals 42 and then sending that out to the browser so it's like they're an associative array or a dictionary of cookies or whatever and there's limits on how many cookies you can have and how big they can be and as long as you're reasonable you're not going to get into, into trouble but you can't send you know a hundred thousand characters there's other mechanisms in browsers that allow larger amounts of storage cookies have a significant because they're used so much they put reasonable limits on them okay and so uh, here is uh, the first time that uh, that we have hit this. You can go hit this this and you will and then look in your browser console and look at the response header. Okay, so this set cookie is part of the response, and it says basically zap equals forty two, and um, and so this is the response of that particular program, this particular program that says oh. I have to run this code, this set cookie code, and so it sends the set cookie header. Now, that can't you can't have any output before the set cookie and anything that has to do with headers, and we'll talk about a couple things that use headers, you've got to send them first, which is fine because in my sort of model view controller world, I have this part of the code that's the top part of the code and then the bottom part of the code, and this is always silent, so you can do things like headers in it. You could not send the cookie down here. You can't. Once you sent that first actual character of text to the page, you can't send cookies anymore. So this, you have to actually open the incognito browser or a brand new browser and then go to this URL and look immediately at the response that you get. And then you'll see the set cookie because you're never going to see it again because it only detects it once because then um, you can look at the cookies in your browser and you look in Chrome, you look under applications and then cookies and then you see the cookies and you see, oh, Zap is 42. Excellent. So that is the where it's stored. Now, in the earlier days of these consoles, you could change this value. Uh, you can still change it, <coughs> but I think they made it harder to change it or something. It was so fun to just change cookies. Mostly what you can do when you change cookies. So you have to assume that they're user data on the user's computer, so you can't trust them. We do have things that actually sign cookies securely, so if you alter them, at least we know they're altered. And, um, and so there are signed cookies that the server signs. The, it doesn't stop the user from altering the data, but it does allow the server to say, hmm, looks like you've been altering your cookie data, and I'll just throw that away. Okay, and so you can take a look at the cookies after that first request response cycle and you see the cookies. And then what you see is every request response cycle, the first thing you're going to see is that, you know, there is a cookie here, right? Zap42, this, this was from dollar underscore cookies. And you will see that the in the request headers, because there are request headers and response headers. Request headers are get and then a bunch of headers and then uh, and that's how it works. Response are header, 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 blank, content. 
right? And so you can hit this refresh as many times as you want and you will see that it sends that cookie because that's the job of the browser. It has received a cookie and now on every request it must send a cookie. So you can see how useful this might be. It's our way of the zap equals, we've chosen the name zap, but 42 is the mark that we put on this particular browser. Now, everyone gets 42, but that's okay. Okay, and so if we look at this sort of as a picture, right, the browser comes in, there is no cookie on it, and, and so then we use call set cookie once, and we send back a cookie, and then that cookie stays in the browser forever until we throw it away, or if it's a session cookie, and then every request from that point forward that the cookie shows up and ends up in the variable dollar cookie. Okay? So that's kind of how it works in PHP. Of course, you can clear them, closing the browser might, time expiring. Eventually, and the user owns this data, they can throw it away anytime they want. I mean, you can go into your developer console and wipe out that cookie. And if you wipe out the cookie in developer console, then you hit the refresh again, then it's going to send you a new cookie. It'll send it back to Zap42. So that's sort of a quick understanding of cookie. Up next, we're going to talk about PHP sessions. So now we're going to talk about sessions. So we got to keep cookies and sessions separate. That's a thing I told you you got to worry about. And so cookies are a little tiny key value store, key value in the browser, right? And uh, the PHP can send them, and then the browser sends them back on all future requests. And so that's what cookies are. They're small, there are not too many of them, but they're very, very useful. So one of the things that we use cookies for are sessions. So what we do is when we see a session is a, often a particularly named cookie, you'll see them in a bit, and we see, oh, this, sir, this browser we've seen for the first time. And so we pick a large random number, 42, and then we send the cookie back and say your number is 42 and at the same time we create a little file somewhere or a piece of memory or a piece of a database or something for that number. So we have this connection between the browser's number and uh, a server, a number of some piece of data on the server. And so now what we do when we get a new request coming in, we look at the cookie and then we grab that. And so we pull the session data in. So the cookie comes in, but we also pull the session data in. And this is another set of key value pairs that you can have um, pulling that data in. And then if there's another browser, right, comes in, we say, oh, welcome new browser from a different country or whatever. We'll pick a new number and send you out and mark you as browser 6F. And then from that point on, 6F comes in, but then when it comes in, the cookie comes in, but we also pull the session data. And then inside your program, you can change the session data and it gets written back. And so what happens is, is as the request response cycles happen, as the request response cycles happen, you are reading and writing the way we think of the session is it's just a place that you can read and write. So if you write in one request, you can read it back in the next request. And believe me, we're going to do that a whole lot. There's lots of really wonderful use cases of having some bit of data that persists across request response cycles. And that's the essence of a session is we do that. And we use cookies as the mechanism to make that possible so that we know that one browser is this session and a different browser is this session. And so when this script runs, it knows it has data that it's stored uh, for one browser and has data that's stored for another browser. So it's super awesome. It's just awesome. So we often create sessions right away when we first meet them, but first we have to send the cookie, pick the number, send the cookie, and away we go. And the session identifier is usually this really, really large random number that is encoded in hexadecimal, like all hexadecimal is, it's like zero through nine and A through F, and it's representing in a single character position, the numbers zero through 15 with only one character. And so it's a kind of a compressed form of numbers and we make them long because we want session identifiers to be a relatively large randomly selected number because li literally if you can guess the session identifier of someone else's session you can sort of break into their session okay and so part of the it's some security by if you know you can't hide it but this really large number trillions of numbers you know it's so it's hard to guess now if you can sort of sneak over somebody's computer and grab their session maybe but that's usually not there are way better ways to break into people's accounts than um, catching them in a coffee shop when they go to the bathroom and going and logging into their computer and pulling their session out 
there are way better ways to do that. Because one thing, you have to be in the same coffee shop. Or maybe you put crappy software on their computer, but whatever. Session identifiers are large random numbers. Server encounters a new browser, no session cookie, simply picks a large random number, sends it out a session cookie, and then creates a file that corresponds to that large random number. And the file, the session file, is the data that only the application can change. The cookie data belongs to the user, but the session data belongs to the application. And unless there's a bug in the application, the user cannot change the session data. And so you can just go to pretty much any old site. In this case, you can um, you know, go to my Sugi page and you can look at the, the first page. You gotta kinda open it and look at the first page and then you will see a session cookie. And then in this case, it's Sugi is a PHP application and it sets a PHP session cookie. And the, the PHP sesh ID, you're gonna see a bunch of those and you may have been seeing them in your browser as well um, because if you're using the auto grader, you'll see that it uses um, cookie-less sessions, and it has to protect itself a different way because it's using co cookie-less sections. Cookie sections, sessions, don't end up on the, you can't see, you don't see them because the cookie's kind of this hidden thing. Um, and so PHP sesh ID, you can even change that name inside PHP, but the default is PHP sesh ID, so you go to most sites, you look at your cookies, and if it says PHP sesh ID, it's like, well, that must be a PHP application because it's setting the session for me. So, if we take a look at this picture, as I've sort of described, we are marking browsers. So now what we have is different browsers, right? Different people's browsers. And we give them each a little different mark. We pick a random number. And then what we do is we have a corresponding bit of data on the server that allow us to store keys and values in here. KV, keys and values, X equals two, X equals four. Whatever it is we wanna store, it's, it, and then when this browser finally comes into us, we reassociate the session, and then we know that this particular browser, we set x equals four the previous time we talked to them, okay? And so that's the idea, that that's the basic code. I mean, that's the basic structure of what where the data lives. Now, in PHP, we have to call session underscore start to say, hey, PHP, uh, this script that we're running right now wants to use sessions. And so you tend to put that at, at early part of nearly all of your scripts, session start. And once session start has run, then the global array dollar underscore session exists. And so it's a super global like dollar get, dollar cookies, and dollar session. So dollar session is not the cookie data, but to find dollar session, it has to look at cookie data, right? And so, and when we, and, and the cool thing about dollar session is you can put it on the right side or the left side of an assignment statement, because if you modify session, at the end, it stores that back on disk. And so you can think of the session variable as a variable that lives from request response cycle to request response cycle, right? So here comes a browser, you know, and it writes something into session and it stores it. And then the response goes back, time passes. And then it comes in, now this, and this was a post, there's dollar post, but after this re response is sent, dollar post, that dollar post is gone, but you wrote something into the session. Now here it comes again on a get request and there's a dollar get variable, but then the session data comes up, and so the, the session data you stored here comes back for this later request. This is time passing, right? And so, you know, this one stores something else in session and it sends the response. The dollar get data doesn't exist, okay? And then more time passes, browser hits it again, in comes a post request that's all new, but the, then it pulls the session data out, and then it does something, and the session data is rewritten. And then the response goes, again, time passes, this post data is long gone, the post and the get own are ephemeral. They only exist for the period of that request response cycle. But whatever you store in session comes back for the next response request response cycle. So you tend to like say, oh, I'll store this at the end of this response and then I'll be able to grab it at the beginning of it. And we do that all the time. It's really pretty cool how that works. Pretty darn cool how that works. So if you really want to know something about your sessions, you can actually go into your PHP info and you can look for the key session underscore save path. And then you can go into a folder on your XAMPP or your MAMP. It'll be somewhere on your hard drive. And you can actually cruise down and look at that stuff. And you will see a bunch of files by default. You can store this stuff all kinds of places and, and production sites don't store them in files. Uh, big production sites tend to store them in fancier Redis or Memcache or some other fancy thing. But 
in the default and the way we're running for our dev development and for small to moderate sites, they just store them on disk. So they're little disk files and you can take a look at them and you can see that they are named ses underscore exactly the same as the, that big session ID that's in the cookie. And so you can figure out by looking at your cookie and looking at the name of the file and you can actually open your session data. Now this is a file on server. You can only do this on the server. The user can't do this. The user can see their cookie. They can't see their session. If you open it, don't write it or you can throw them away, but it's you can kind of see if you look carefully, it's just some key values. But some of these things that are in here are um, uh, some of those things that are that are in this are arrays, and so they kind of have a serialized version of those arrays, um, or it's just strings. And um, <clears throat> and so it, this is not something you're supposed to look at, but you can kind of see roughly the kind of stuff that's in there in those files. And some people get good at reading this and they actually debug applications by like, what? Oh, what's wrong? What ended up in that session? And some people go actually look at this stuff. But I'm just showing it to emphasize that these session bits are sitting on disk. So in PHP, the way we do this is we say session start. Now session start does a couple of things. It does whatever is necessary to get the session started. So if there's no cookie, session start does a lot more than if there is a cookie. If there is no cookie, session start picks a session identifier, creates the session on disk, sends the cookie back, and then creates the dollar session variable, which you can then use. Okay, so let's go through that again. When there is no session cookie, it picks a random number, makes a session file, sets the session cookie, and creates the dollar underscore session variable. Okay, if there is a cookie, it looks and it finds the file, it reads the file and sets the dollar session. The one thing you know is after session underscore start, as long as you do it before any output has been sent, you will have the dollar underscore session will be set. So this is make it, set it, find it, however you got to do it, get me a dollar underscore session. Okay, so that's what it does. And you put this way toward the top of your code. Maybe the first line, maybe the second line, but you don't certainly put this after any output. Session destroy effectively deletes all the keys in the session. And so here's a little bit of code. It's, it's a, you know, not, it's right now just to demonstrate how session works. It's not particularly uh, in, intuitive or it doesn't really solve a complex problem. So here we go, right? Session start first line, first executable line. You see I'm using kind of my model view controller pattern. I'm doing all kind of silent stuff up here, although I am sending echoes out, so it's kind of a little not perfect. So, so session start basically guarantees that dollar session, a new super global exists, okay? And I can say it's a key value, it's just an array. If is set session sub value, if it's not, then I'm going to print out that session is empty and set it to zero. So the key to session is you can have it on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. Super awesome. That is, without any further effort on your part, writing that key value onto the disk. And if you want to look at this and run this code on your own computer, you can go see the little disk file and you'll see, oh, there's a value and it's got a zero in it. Cool. So if it's not set, I set it to zero. And then else if, if the value is less than three, then I go pull the old one out and add one to it and send it back. So I, it's going to be zero first, then it's going to be one, then it's going to be two, then it's going to be, th but if it's then three, then it's going to come to here. So, so if the session value is greater than three, this will be false and it'll come to here, then it'll do a session destroy and then a session restart in a sense, and then away we go and print that out. And all I do with this little click me is click, click, click. There's a couple things you can do. You can uh, echo the session ID and that's showing that big random number. And then I'm doing, it's kind of often that you do just a print R of dollar underscore session. So you're like, what the heck's in my session? Because a lot of your code will be putting stuff into session and taking stuff out of session. So here's how that code runs. The first time it, um, oh, it's using pizza, not value, but you get the idea. So it's using pizza as the key on this particular one. Um, and so the session is empty and we set it to zero. Then we click it again. The next time you click it, the session is one. Oop, 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 come on, come on. All right, the next time you click it, the session is one, then the session is two, then the session is three, and then it just restarts the session and there's nothing in it, but then the next time you click, it'll go back and do the same thing. So you get the basic idea. So this code uses pizza instead of value in, these, in this little bit of code. So it's pretty much the same as that, okay? 
Okay, so one last small topic is Sessions Without Cookies. Now, if you've been using my auto grader, you have been seeing Sessions Without Cookies, and I'll just say that they're, they're trickier, and uh, we'll talk about that when we get back to Sessions Without Cookies. So now I want to talk a little bit about Sessions Without Cookies. Um, sessions Without Cookies is kind of an advanced topic. Uh, the only reason I kind of talk, like to talk about it at this point is if you've been using my auto graders, you've been seeing sessions without cookies and you've been seeing that uh, cookie list sessions, uh, you've been using them and so you're like scratch, 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 I'm, I'm using the auto grader but it's not setting a cookie. Um, if you have a simple full screen application that's got a web page and you go and you log in and you log out and all that stuff and shopping cart, normal cookie based sessions work great because if you have the whole page, one site, that you can set cookies. Um, but Increasingly, uh, browsers are not letting you set cookies in situations where you might be functioning in an iframe. Or if you want to open an application on multiple tabs and log in on different accounts in the different tabs, um, that doesn't work very well with a, with, a, with a global session cookie. On an incognito browser, if you open an incognito browser, they get a different copy. Each one gets a different copy of uh, the cookies. So you can log in as two people. Multiple tabs, you can't log in as two people, but uh, incognito browsers, you can log in as two people. And so uh, there are times that it's good for you to not use session cookies. And increasingly, as applications move from uh, running in the server to running in the client, uh, they tend to uh, use cookies less and less. And they use like tokens and stuff like that. And so it, it turns out that PHP has probably the nicest support of any programming language, any web programming language, any web framework that I've ever seen for maintaining sessions without cookies. Um, and they're a little weird because you have to still create this mark on each browser and then get the mark back and reassociate. And so the way this tends to work is um, you can, um, you set them either in form requests or uh, anchor tags, okay? And so here's a bit of code that we can play with and uh, just take a look at how this works. Um, let's go to nocookie.php. There's no cookie. We've got a session ID. And the best way to look at this is to view the source of it and see what's going on here. And so what's happening is if, this, if I click on this href, you'll see I've got a get parameter, which is PHP sesh ID. So the, the whole idea of a session is it's got to be the same from request to re request. Okay, and so if I click on that, you'll see how it, it, it reassociates with the same cookie. And um, also if I click on a form, I've got this input, a hidden tag, that is the key of PHP session ID and the value of the session. Okay. And so, regardless of what I click on this anchor tag, so look at that right there, see the PHP session ID there is, and I'm still adding one to the session and it's working. And so there are no cookies in this session. Um, and I can also send the form. And if I send the form, it still knows because the form is sending this hidden value because hidden values are like text, except you're not seeing it, right? So it's not, it's right here. There's a hidden, hidden text field, but it's not showing. And so this way I can, implement this little cookie, this little thing that updates the session 0, 1, 2, and then 3 resets it. The same thing, right? I can do this either with anchor tags or with form tags. And PHP actually has added all this stuff automatically. And this is what I, oops, I didn't mean to click there. This is what I like about PHP. It, if I tell it I'm going to not use cookies, then it does its best to maintain them. Okay? It, you, it alters You'll look at the source code and you'll see I didn't put this on here and I did not put that input tag. So when we take a look at source code, you'll see that. So that's how it works. It's cookie-less and that's why if you're running my auto graders, you keep seeing this. Now, my auto grader, go ahead and try to break in. I probably shouldn't say that. But my auto grader protects itself in different ways by checking the IP address that it comes from and the browser that it's coming from. And so it's it's a little harder to break in. If you do sessionless cookie uh, cookie-less sessions, and you don't protect yourself otherwise, you're actually kind of opening yourself up for a world of hurt. And that's why I wrote a whole bunch of code and that's why I encourage people to use frameworks rather than just roll their own. But okay, enough of that. This Sugi stuff that I've written is designed to run with multiple sessions and multiple tabs, work in iframes, et cetera, et cetera, which are the challenges of cookie-based sessions. That's where cookie-based sessions are uh, challenging. 
Okay, and so here's the code. And I'm, this is kind of advanced. I'm not really telling you that you're supposed to know every bit of this stuff. But basically, there's some settings that you set to say, hey, don't use cookies. Uh, don't only use cookies and whatever this is, you can go Google Stack Overflow and you say, how do I not use cookies in PHP? And they're like, put these three things in there. So you put these three things in there. And after you do that, these things are informing session start to use cookie-less sessions, which means they're not going to, session start at this point is not going to try to set a cookie and it's not going to look at any cookie. It's going to assume that the cookie detail is going to either be in dollar underscore get or dollar underscore post under the session ID, right? So if you saw those, it was PHP session ID equals as get or PHP session ID as post. And then from that point on, it's exactly the same code, right? You just use session, uh, cookie list sessions are no different except these three lines of code. And that's what I like about PHP and cookie list sessions. But don't overthink this, just understand that it's possible. And in other programming languages, in other web frameworks, it's possible you just have to manually put it on all of the gets and all the posts. But PHP friendly, thank you, PHP does it for us automatically. I don't know why they decided to do such a nice thing, but it's turned out to be very, very useful to me because like I said, I have applications that need to have different session information in different tabs. Now I'm a little, my applications are not the same as your typical social media site, but I have reason for needing this. And so that, the rest of that code is uh, no particular thing. The session ID is the same. It's all, everything, all the rest of that code is identical. You just say, hey, PHP, do this. Now, a couple of caveats. If you're doing things that we haven't done yet, like Ajax and JavaScript and things like that, or you're constructing URLs in the browser, you have to pass the session ID back to those folks. Um, so if you're using those kinds of things, um, and if you are bookmarking a URL or emailing a URL, you might actually be logged in. Um, because you are inadvertently compromising your session. And um, I, I have built ways in applications that use cookie list sessions to have an additional layer of protection to make sure that the session ID is not the only thing that, um, that we've got, okay? So even though that summary bit of the sessionless cookies was kind of advanced, the basic idea of cookies and sessions and how to use sessions in PHP is really simple and ultimately uh, very elegant. And up next, what we're going to talk about is how we use this session thing. So we're going to assume session, assume cookies, but then what do we do with it inside of our applications? So the applications of sessions is really the next topic. Hello, and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Today, we're going through some of the session and cookie examples. So this is a very simple example called cookie.php. And basically what it does is cookies are key value pairs that are stored in the browser. They're, they're a bit of data that the servers can store on the browser. And we store it using the set cookie. And we can say that what, it's almost like a dictionary that, or a associative array that lives on, this, on, the, on the browser. We say zap equals 42. And then we give it an expiration time of now plus 3,600 seconds, which is an hour from now. But we're only going to do this if the cookie is not set. Now, this turns into a header on the response. And the first time we do this, we'll, we'll sit, notice that it's not set, and then we'll set it. OK, so you got to set up. So I've got a fresh, brand new browser. And I'm going to go straight to that bit of um, straight to that bit of code. And so we can see on our developer console, hopefully, the cookie is going to be set. So here we come. And now I can take a look. And so I look at the request. The request, the request is a get to that URL. And so what happens here is now, because of this, this is a header. This is a response header that set the cookie. And what that basically says now is that every other request from this point forward, that cookie has to come in. Now we can actually see these cookies under application cookies HTTP. Now these other things have to do with automated thingies that are gathering data, whatever. But this is the zap cookie. Now, I can hit delete here and get rid of it. Matter of fact, I can delete all these guys, too. I just get rid of them. So I just got rid of those cookies. These cookies belong to me. They're my browser. In the old days, you could actually change these. I don't know how you change these as easily as you'd, but you can change these. And so cookies are not something, they're something the application sets on the browser, but they're not something that you'd think of as re uh, reliably owned by the browser. Now. 
So there's a cookie sitting here, and, and it set this cookie on that request response cycle. And that's because there, there, this, the current values of the cookies are copied into this very global, super global dollar underscore cookie in PHP. And because I was hitting it for the first time, there was nothing there, so we set it. But from now on, if I ask for this again with a refresh, it is not going to give me the cookie because it's going to notice that I've sent it. So if I take a look at this, the cookie array has zap equals 42. And the way that was populated is in the request header. The request header that the browser sent to the server, it sent a cookie header that says zap equals 42. And so what PHP does is it parses this zap equals 42 and puts it in this variable dollar underscore cookie, a super global, like post, like get, etc. And so because it saw that was already set, it didn't feel the need to set it again, right? And so you'll notice there is no set cookie, at least not for zap. There's all this other crap that got set again because I deleted it. I don't even know what those things are for, uh, but whatever. Now, if I go and I take a look at my application and I look here, this one got set again on that request. But if you hit refresh over and over and over again now, every time, Every time there's going to be, the cookie is going to be there and it's not going to have to be set again. Now, if I delete it, I delete it, and then I hit refresh, and I take a look at the cookies, it's back because this code detected that it wasn't there, but once I delete it, it doesn't get sent on the next request. Okay? So that's cookies. That's cookies. Cookies are key value pairs that come in the browser. Now, let's talk about sessions. So sessions are not the same as cookies, although they make use of cookies. And so in PHP, if we want to use sessions, we say session start. And what happens, this is called sesfun.php. I, I won't hit enter yet. What session start basically does a whole bunch of stuff. Session start, if there is no session cookie, and there is no session cookie here, we'll see one in a second it actually picks a large random number for the session ID, then sends that out as a cookie, session cookie, and then creates this super global called dollar underscore session. Now the data in dollar underscore session is not stored in the browser. It's actually stored in a magic place in the server in such a way that if you modify session in a request, it actually stores the data in a server. So once you've done session start, you have this magic variable that doesn't come from the client, doesn't come from the browser, it comes from the server on every request response cycle. So you can put data into it and then you can take data out of it. And so it's pretty cool from one request to the next, okay? And so let's go here to network to start. And I, I'm still on cookie.php, let's clear that. Now when I hit enter here, it's going to retrieve seshfun.php. And it's going to notice that there is no session cookie and it's going to pick and create a session cookie. Okay, so if I look here and I look at the response, you see a set cookie. The name of this cookie is PHP session ID. That's actually something you can change in PHP. And this is the large random number that was picked by, the, the, by it. Okay, and so the session is an array and I set this array to be pizza equals zero. If there, so dollar session was created on this first request, but it's empty because it's the first request. And so pizza is not set. And so it says session is empty. Look at that, session is empty. And then it sticks a zero in there. And then down at the bottom, it prints it out. So we see the zero is in the session. Now this zero in pizza has not come back to the application, uh, come back to our browser. If we look at the cookies, we have the session ID, which is kind of unlocks the session on the next request, but it doesn't store pizza equals zero. Pizza equals zero is stored magically in the server somewhere. Now, if I hit refresh, let's move this down a bit, uh, move it down a bit. If I hit refresh, you will it'll come back in. Session start will see a cookie this time. It'll send the cookie this time, and it'll say, oh, it pizza is set because of this code, not because of the cookie because it will be the same session because it will it will send this back again. And um, session sum pizza equals zero. 
And then it's going to say, oh, but it, it is set, so this is going to be false. So it's going to drop down here, and it's going to look at the current value of session sub pizza, which is zero right now. If it's less than three, we're going to retrieve it, add one to it, and stick it back in the session and say added one, and then print this stuff out. So pizza is now one. It's still on the server. The cookies haven't changed. If I click it again, that code will run. It'll be two, right? And then it'll be three. So now, next time I click it, session sub pizza, a server variable, this server variable that's going from request to request to request to request, the server variable is going to be greater than three. Oh, wait, maybe I got to click it one more time. Click it one more time. Oh, no. It's, oh, it's, it's, it is three because it's, it's only less than three. So it, because it was equal to three, it ran this, which is session destroy, which really takes out all the key value pairs from the session in the server and session start. But you'll notice that our session ID didn't change, but then when we print the dollar session variable, it is now empty. And so what session destroy really does is empties out the dollar session. The next time this runs, the session ID is still not gonna change because that's still in the cookie. That's still being sent every request and it unlocks the session. The session just on the server happens to be empty, but the next time we click it, it's gonna say, oh, session's empty and set it to zero. Session's empty, set it to zero. So um, now if you really, really, really want to, you can go to your localhost 8080 and go into your MAMP and go to PHP info and then look for the session session save path. So that is the session save path. Now I'm going to go show you what happens inside the session save path. I'll start open up a terminal and I'll change directory into the ah, come back session save path. So in this session, there are actual files. Uh, let me just do this, open dot, so you can see it here. But I can actually open these. Um, I'll, I'll use old school VI to take a look at one of these things. And these have what's called a serialized versions of the basic stuff that is um, uh, in a session, okay? And so uh, that is data. You're not supposed to mess with that, but in just so that you can kind of see that these sessions variables are stored on disk somewhere. And I don't particularly know why this one's not storing very well on disk, but that's a different problem. So there is sessions. And uh, I hope you found uh, this particular on cook uh, video on cookies and sessions uh, useful. So now that we understand sessions and cookies, we're going to start using them for useful things inside of our applications. And one of them has to do with moving between pages, sending data from one page to another, and then doing things like logging in and logging out. So if we take a look at my happy little picture, we're going to start by talking about how we inside the server can actually send a, a response back to the browser to tell it to go to a different page, and that's called the redirect. And then once we've kind of got the redirect understood, then we're going to learn about ways we use the redirect where we have a something that comes in and instead of just sending an answer back, it sends a, a redirect back which causes the browser to come in again and then actually gets the response. So that's called the post redirect. And then the next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how um, we have to use sessions when we're doing those things and how we at the end will implement a login. But right now, what we're going to talk about is how we can send a request and this application can send a response that says go somewhere else to cause it to go do a request to the same server or even a request to some other different server. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about right now. And the way this is going to work is it starts by, by pointing out that when we send a request and we get a response, as part of this, there is always a code. The code 200 means that everything was okay. Um, 404 is another code that many people mean you ask for a document that was not found. And so the code that we're going to learn and talk about right now is the 302 code, which is document moved, called, also known as the redirect. So there are these HTTP status codes. You can go look them up. When the server answers back with a legit response, it says 200 OK, which means, OK, go ahead and look at the rest of the stuff, read the HTML, display it. 404 says 404 not found. 
If you go to that URL, you, you know, nowhere.htm, you'll get a 404 not found. And if you go, you know, to drchuck.com without a dash, you will see that that redirects to dr-chuck.com. Now, you got to scroll way up, but you'll see that that does a redirect for you. And so, the way this redirect happens is that you send the 302 and then you tell it where you want to go with a location header. And if you remember, in the request response, you send the get or the post, and then back comes some headers and then a blank line and then the actual data for the screen. Location header is one of those things. And if you get a 302 as your status, then you look at the location header. And so there is a function inside PHP to allow us to send various headers. Location is just one of many headers. The set cookie command is actually a header that's part of the response header. When we looked at set cookie, we went down and saw the response headers and there was a set cookie one. Uh, you don't use set cookie with header, but for other headers, we just call the header function that says add something to the headers of this response. If you do an echo, it adds it to the to the body of the response, and if, or a print, and if you do a header, it adds to the header. So the format and the syntax of the header command is you say header, and then the name of the header is something something colon, followed by a space, followed by some parameter depending on that header. Now the key to that is, like many things, like session start, like set cookie, they all have to happen before the first line of output. And I don't know how many times I'm going to tell you, I'll just keep telling you every time I think about it. That's why when I structure a PHP application, I sort of have this line above which there is no output. No output above that line. And that's so I can do headers, I can do routing, etc., etc., etc. And so what we have here is a little form that just is one little input box where, and if it's set, I'm going to do a header which redirects to reader1.php. If it's a 2, it's going to redirect to reader2.php. You can put a parameter on the end of that. That's okay. Or you can redirect to an absolute URL, and that's okay too. Now, one of the things that's essential to this is you also do a return, because you don't want it falling through and producing that output. Pretty much when you're going to send a redirect, you want to send the redirect, but no output. Um, generally, you can send output, and it will sort of blink badly sometimes and follow the redirect. It tends to believe the redirect rather than the output, but return says stop processing in this script. It comes in, comes down here, sends the header, and then it's done. It doesn't put this out um, because the redirect is kind of like a null response that says this is not the right place, go somewhere else. And there's two redirects. There's a 301 and a 302. The 301 is supposed to be permanent and the 302 is supposed to be temporary. You can read up on the documentation. There's some subtleties to it, but we just use 302 for the redirect. So if we run this little application, reader1, and you type a 1, then it will end up sending itself back to reader1, right? It'll send it back. If you put a 2 in here, it's going to go to reader2, and you'll notice that you can put a parameter on that. And if you type a 3 in there, it's going to go to drchuck.com. So you hit submit. It went to this page, but then it went to that page, and the res response from that page was, hey, I'm not here. Don't, I'm not going to give you anything. I want you to just go to a different page. And so the browser got sent a post, and this thing sent back, go somewhere else. And so it went to drchuck.com, and then got the page for drchuck.com. And so you can really reroute the browser from within your PHP application using this location header. So here is how it looks if you watch it in the developer console. After I've entered a 2 in here, I put a 2 in here and press submit. You'll notice that the first thing it does is it does a post request to reader1.php. And that's because, well, I was on reader1 when I pressed it. So that did a post. And instead of getting a, a 200 back, I got a 302. And then, then it went and was forced to do a second get. So in this one, I post it. And then it does a get to reader1 with parm. parm equals one, two, three. And if you look at the second post, I mean the second response, you see that the actual page that we're seeing right here came back on the second one. If you look at the response of the first one, you will see that there is no data in the first one. There is simply a location header that says go somewhere else. So that's how it moves the browser around. We in the PHP can say, hey browser, go somewhere else. And it's, we use it for a lot of different things. So the first thing that we're going to use this is what's called a post redirect get pattern. So that's what we'll talk about next. 
So now that we understand the redirect, and the redirect is a simple HTTP level thing. It really doesn't care about PHP. It doesn't care about anything. When browsers receive a 302, they go somewhere else. Now the somewhere else might be right back to the same script. And that's what we're gonna talk about in this situation right here. So we have, um, you know, we, we send the request back and now we're gonna send a post. And then the post is going to, our response is gonna be a 302 to the post. And then it's immediately come back and do a get to the same page. And then it's gonna come back and parse the response. So we click a post in and it's gonna go on. Oh, that's, let, me, let me draw that a little more prettier. So we click on a post post, we're gonna go into PHP, the PHP is gonna do its work, and then it's gonna actually redirect and then cause the browser to come back in with a get request back to the same script and then actually send the real response that's gonna be parsed. So we call this the post redirect get pattern. And it's something that's necessary that we have to do on posts. But again, the, the 302 and the 200 and all that stuff and the post and the get, that's all happening with the request response cycle. Now we're gonna talk about a pattern that we use to accomplish that. Okay, so every bit of sample code that I have shown you so far in this class that uses POST is wrong. Every bit is wrong because you've never hit the refresh button and had this little nasty message come up. This message right here, this message right here is a unhappy message. And the way you do it is you get it by having a post form that you hit the submit button and then you press the refresh. So if I go all the way back to post, a couple lectures back, I told you the purpose of posting was when data is being changed. You never change data in a get. So the browser has sent the post request and got a page back. And if you pr press refresh, it's gonna send the same post again, which means you either have deleted money from an account or ordered something online. And it's like, hey, 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 you don't be wanting to do that. Don't do that. Are you sure you want to do this again? Because I'm going to send a post again. If you say continue, I'm sending the post twice. And this is not your application. This is the browser protecting you from doing something twice that you didn't really mean to do twice. So what we don't ever want to allow that to happen. And so there is a trick that we use when we write applications so that this never happens. If you ever hit refresh on a page in an application and you see this dialogue, that means that the programmer is very unprofessional. That's the best, best way to put it. Just like, are you kidding me? You are sending back a page to a post request. Are you kidding me? Okay, so it really means that the browser is gonna protect you from double posting. It'll do it if you say yes, but it's gonna stop you and it's just really tacky and it's ugly, it's a bad user experience. You never want the browser to be talking to your user. You want your application to be talking to your user, okay? And so the idea is, is that upon finishing the processing of a post, you do a redirect and you do a redirect right back to yourself. Now we'll see sometimes a redirect elsewhere that kind of becomes routing after a while and the next example will do that but it's post redirect get. Okay, and so here's kind of a, a, a picture from Wikipedia that kind of captures the same thing. We do the post, we do the work, we do a redirect, and then automatically there's a get which pulls the page back and the new page. And so what we see is we see just a brand new page, but if we hit refresh at this point, it rends the get again. So that's what this is really saying. This is like, oh, you do a post, and the data comes back with a 200, you hit refresh and it runs the post again, and that's the problem. So Wikipedia has a nice page on this whole concept of post redirect get. And so this is the code that I told you was so bad. This is the code that I'm now ashamed of that I even taught you in the first place. So I have to fix this. I have to kind of redeem myself. And so that if you remember this uh, code, it's got this top stuff, that's nice, that's the model, remember, this is the view and the controller and the context are going back and forth, right? Remember all that stuff, right? And if we go up to the top, we had this, the idea, we still have this line, we're not getting rid of the line, we like the line, we like this line, and basically the idea is these variables fall through. They either fall through this way or they come and modify and they're still falling through, and then they go down to the thing. But in the case of a post, it comes out and it continues, and that's, the get is okay but the post is the non-okay bit. We do not ever want to process, this is what I call processing the post data. 
We're doing something with it. We're reading it. We're evaluating it. We're sticking it in a database. Later, we'll stick it in a database. Or we're checking a database. Or who knows what it is we're doing. We're working with a post data. The key is, is you're not supposed to ever fall through in the bottom. And that's what's wrong with every post example I've given you so far. The problem is, is that coming out of the bottom of this, there is actual data. These old guesses and messages. And so the problem is, is we don't want to respond to the post, but the data in dollar post or dollar get, it's going to go away for the next response, right? So that's why session's important. So this all kind of adds up together. So we still have this bottom part, and this bottom part needs data. It needs the data for message and get, old guess, right? Is that old guess? Yeah, there's, okay, it's not called old guess, it's called guess. So good, I'm like a lot crazy there. So it needs these things to come in. But the problem is, is we can't allow a post to just filter down. We cannot have this be the response to a post. That is not allowed because that's when you hit refresh and it asks you, do you want to repost the data? So let's look at this done a little bit better. Now the problem is we still have got to pass the data from the, the, get, the, the data from the message in the guest. We've got to pass it to the future, but we're passing it to a future request response cycle. But hooray! We have got the session and we can do that with session. So this is the right way to do this, okay? So you come in, start a session. Yay, we talked about that last time. If we've got a guess, we're gonna remember the old guess and then we're gonna store it in a key called guess in the session. And then we're gonna do our message logic and then we're gonna put the message in the session as well. And then we're gonna redirect back to ourselves, guess2.php. So now it's gonna come back with a get request and then a return to get us out. So redirect, tell the browser to go somewhere else and return says we're done with this script, meaning we never fall through. That was the part that was the problem. The falling through was the problem. Okay, so if we look at this code, if we look at this code on a get request, it just drives straight through. On a post request, it comes in and then it leaves and then it forces another get request. Okay, so in that case, there's three requests. The first get request to show the form. The second is the post request that receives the form and processes it and sets data in the session. And the third request is the get request that's gonna show our little picture and we'll show you in a second just how that happens. And that is, it happens because now there's a get request once to show the form in the first place and a second get request that comes after the post request. The post request never even happened. It, it happened above us but now we're coming in with this post. But we still need to know whether or not there was an old guess and whether or not there was a message. And we simply look, oh, if there is in the session a guess and in the session a message, that must mean we are on the second get request, not the first get request. So that's what we do, is set session guess, we pull out session guess or a blank, and if there's a message or false, depending on whether or not it's, we're really telling, tell, teaching ourselves or determining whether we came from the first get request or the get request after the post redirect. This is cool stuff. I mean, if you've been watching all along, now you understand. This is like, it's beautiful. It's simple. It's elegant. It's like amazing. Okay. I'm too excited. I'm too excited. So this comes through two get requests. One of them, it has messages false so that it doesn't print out the message and their guess is empty so it doesn't print out. The second one, oops, oop, no, color. The second one, this is, so it prints the message out and it prints the guess out. And so that's how it works. And so if you press 41 and enter submit, you will see that there is a post request that gives us back a 302 that redirects back to the thing. And then the browser without, in, in an instant, in a blinking instant, the browser goes and grabs the get request, except now this get request can put in the word too low and put in the old guess because it pulls those out of session. And if you hit refresh, if you hit refresh, it still knows what the old guess was, and it's still, because the session, now we've had a third thing, we've done another get. We did a, a, a get, a post, a get, and a, third, and, a, and, a, and a last get, but it just pulled that data out of session because we didn't take it out of session. Everything we put into session stays until we explicitly remove it. We could have removed it if we wanted to, but we didn't. And so even in refresh, even when we, well, come back, come back. Even when we press refresh, it knows this information that came out of the session. And 
it's a get request. It's not a get. It's not a post request. It's a get request. So the post and the redirect. So that is your basic post redirect get. Meaning that if you're processing post data, don't put output. Stick everything in session and then redirect it. And then in the get, you pull it back out of session and, and do it. So it takes two steps to produce that page. So understand this, because up next, we are going to talk about log in and log out and sort of bringing all these things to, together. That, that thing I just showed you was what's called a flash message, meaning that it shows up. So log in and log out using session. We're going to show some error messages and how other ways that we can use session and redirect uh, to even start routing between uh, different files as well. So now that we've learned about redirect, we've learned about post redirect, now we're going to start sort of just using post redirect to accomplish things. And the thing that we're going to look at first is the patterns that we tend to use for login and log out and how the session and the cookies work together for login and log out. So recall that when we first looked at sessions, we weren't really logging anybody in. What we were doing is creating a key value store that's associated with a particular browser. So if you have 100 browsers, you'd have 100 little sessions, and each one has its own key value store. And the cookie is the way you look up the session, but the cookie is not the session itself, because the user can change the cookie. And it, in effect, it's presenting the cookie unlocks the right session. But you don't want to like set a cookie that says, this person is logged in and their username is Chuck. You don't want to do that because the user can change the cookie anytime they want and they can lie to you. That we can sign cookies and there are ways to create cryptographically secure cookies and that's a little better because at least they can they can throw them away but they can't sort of change them you know, once they're crypt cryptographically signed. So, the, But let's not worry about that. The cookie unlocks the session and whether you're logged in or not you want to put that in session data. And so the act of logging in you need a session but then whether you're logged in or logged out is checking to see if something's in the session. And when you log, you check their password and you put something in the session, as long as that stays there, then they're logged in. And when you log them out, you just take that thing out of the session. So all the rest of your application checks to see if the, there's a certain piece in the session. The user can't touch the session directly. They can touch the cookie directly. They can only touch the, the application reads and writes it. So it's protected. Um, and that's really important. Because you don't want the user to write, read and write everything. You want to read and write the things that you want them to use. So away we go. So this is the application that we're going to run. Uh, it's a sample application with uh, login, log out, flashing error messages, post redirect, and using the session to indicate logged in and logged out. And you can download all this code and take a look at it. And I'll record a little code walkthrough for this as well if that is a more fun way for you to see it. But let's just kind of go through these slides and take a look at how this works. So um, the first thing we're going to look at is the login. Second, we'll look at index.php. Um, and so here's your login code. And the key thing here is we will see this in a second. Yeah, let's look at this slide first. Now, doesn't matter. We got to start somewhere. So let's look at this slide first. So a get comes through and you put out this form. And the form has an account and a password. For now, I'm just making it type text so you can read your own password. And then you submit. So you submit back to login. It's method equals post. We're submitting a post to login.php. And so then, oops, once the post comes in, right, the get comes in and just goes through and paints that screen. The post comes in, session start. If we see that there are these variables set, um, we are going to first log the person out by taking the account key out of the session. And the account key is what we're going to use in the session to indicate that they're logged in. So somewhere here, you're going to check the password. And for this particular application, we're just going to make it be UMSI is always the password. So that means password is correct. To make indicate that it's correct, we're going to set in the session the account is the post account. So that would be Chuck or csav at umesh.edu or whatever. And then we're going to put a little flash message in. This is called a flash message, name success. And we're going to say logged in. And then we're going to call the header to redirect to app.php because we're in login.php. And then we're going to return if that's what happens. On the other hand, if you don't have the right password, you're going to set a message in the session, kind of like the too high, too low in the previous example, and then redirect back to ourselves and then return to get out. And so it's either going to come back to us with an error 
or success in the session, well, error in the session, or it's gonna go over to app.php with the person logged in or not, okay? And so now, let's take a look, oops, oops. Take a look at this code, and that is, here we are in the body of the login, and now we check to see if there is this, an error key is set, and if it is, we're gonna print it out with a color red and unset it, so we're taking it out of the session. This is a pattern we call flash, meaning that if you get a bad login error, then it shows a red message like bad login, but then if you hit refresh, you don't see it again. So we're gonna take the error out. We didn't do that in the previous example with the guessing game, we kept the message in the session, but now we're gonna take it out, and we're gonna have the same pattern if there's a success string, and we're gonna print it out and then take it out. And then we, then we paste the, do the form. And that basically is how we get to uh, an, a, a screen that looks like this, that has the incorrect password, this came, and this is still a get. So there was a, you hit this button, it does a post, a redirect, and then this flash message. And if you hit refresh at this point, you would see that screen again. That's because it's a flash message. And so post redirect get flash is the idea of putting a message in the session, then you redirect, and then that screen pulls the data out of the session and then removes it from the session, displays it on the screen once, and then deletes it. And then if you hit refresh on this page, you don't see the message because it flashed at you once, and then it was deleted. So that's called a flash message. And it's just another pattern. And so the, if we look through how the flash message, flash message works, so, you know, you're sitting here on the login screen, you send a bad password, and so then it says, oh, and it, it can't send a real HTML, but it does put the string bad password into the session under the error key, and then it redirects the browser immediately to login.php and says, Re hit me with a get. And so then the browser instantly does a get request, login.php wakes up, it reads the flash message, and then it produces the output, but then it wipes it, oops, come back, but it wipes it out of the session, right? And so the user sees bad password. And then what happens is if they then hit refresh, on the next screen that they see, there is no bad password because it's been removed from the session. The act of producing this actually wiped it out of the session. And that's the idea of a post redirect get with a flash message. We throw the message in the session, we show it once, and then we wipe it out, and it's not there anymore. So it's only on the next GET request that we see a flash message. And it's, it's very common for little error messages that you'd, you don't want to be hitting refresh and the error message stays there. Refresh, bad password, refresh, bad password. Mm. The old guess was not so bad, so we didn't really want it, that old guess to be uh, too low in the message. It wasn't a bad design, but for a login screen, you probably want to use a flash message, which only lasts for one next request response cycle, and the further ones don't do it, right? So it, it takes it out. So that's a flash message. Okay, and there is the code that does the flash message, and, and you'll see, I mean, when I write my code, I kind of pretty much always use the string error and success, and I put them in, and pretty much I just do this over and over, and the next thing you know, I make a utility function that just does these things, because I do the same pattern in the beginning of my code over and over and over again. Um, I just, I'm, you're doing flash messages all the time. Sometimes they're good and you want them to be green. Sometimes they're bad and you want them to be red. Okay? Okay, so um, let's take a look at the application code, the app.php. Um, and so if the, the way the app.php works, if we go all the way back up here, should have this screens, these screens a little lower. Um, it, when you first go to app.php, it says, please log in. And once you're logged in, app.php says, please log out. And so we have to look at how you write app.php in a way to do this. So here's app.php. App.php comes in and it says, it, it puts out a flash message, checks to see if there's a success message, that's the little green logged in, and puts that out and then unsets it, that's the flash pattern. And then we are gonna to check to see if we're logged in. We say, if the account key is set in the session, if it's not set, not, then press log in to start. Else, this is where your whole cool application would be, or press log out to get out when you're done. And so that's how the presence of the account key in the session tells you that you're logged in. And in the code that does the successful login, 
that sets that key. So if we, if we follow this through now, <clears throat> you are in the login screen, you send a post request, and it's good now, it's a happy post request because you got the password right. And so we set the account key in the, in the uh, session and we stick a success message in called logged in and then we redirect, but now we're redirecting to app.php. Uh, we're not redirecting back to ourselves. In the error case, we are redirecting back to login.php and this is why I call this kind of routing, right? We're choosing in the first part, which is a, routing is a controller function in the model view controller. So we are being a controller and we're saying, oh, I've got this data and I'm good shape. And the next thing I want the user to see is app.php versus I've got this data, the password's wrong. I'm going to set an error message. But the next thing I want the user to see is login.php because I want them to log in and try again. So the routing decision is controller. And you see that in that code. So it redirects to app.php, it sets logged in in the session of under, dollar, uh, under success, and sets the account in the session. So now we're at app.php, the browser does a get request to app.php, and it checks the account and use that to generate the if then else, but it also sees logged in, and so it says, oh, that's a success message. I will send that back to the browser in a flash, but then I will wipe out, right? I will wipe out that flash message, the success message, but I didn't wipe out account. Okay, so account stays in the session to indicate we're logged in. We're logged in until that goes away. So now every time it goes back to app.php, account is still in the session. So it reads it and it knows that you're logged in. And so as many times as you do this, you're going to stay logged in the whole time. Now, the most fun code to write is the logout because it almost always looks the same. And that is you start the session, you throw away all the keys in the session, and then you just redirect back to app.php and poof, you are logged out. So you press logout, you go through this code, and then you come back to the same file and now it says login because the account is no longer in the session. And so that's login, logout, etc. right? And so now you've come in, came in before, now you're back to logged out because you remove that by doing the session destroy. So, in this series of uh, lectures, we've talked about cookies, we've talked about sessions, we've talked about how we do sessions in PHP, we talked about post redirect, we talked about the redirect header, we talked about the post redirect pattern, we talked about flash messages, etc., etc., etc. Thanks. See you on the net. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Now we're doing a bit of code walkthrough. Uh, we're in the section on how things happen with routing. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, this redirection code. And it's really dumb code. Um, it's really just a, a post form that I put in a number. And depending on the number, I am going to redirect to different places. So um, let's first take a look at the notion of uh, what redirecting is in general. Right, and so the location header is basically one of the HTTP headers that you can uh, send. You send a get and it returns and says 302 found and then it says location colon where you're supposed to go. And so just as an example, if you go to doctor, my normal URL is drchuck.com, but I also have drchuck.com with no dash. I got it much later. So what I do is I just automatically redirect it using that uh, redirect to my drchuck.com. So you notice the URL changed here. So I switched it from one to the other using this location header. So you went to the Dr. Chuck with no dash and then you were told to go to Dr. Chuck with a dash and that's a redirect and that whole notion is there. And so we have ways in PHP to set these response headers. Um, using the header function. So echo or print sends data to the, the body of the response and header sends data to the header, the part that comes out first. Um, and so let me do a view developer console so we can watch the uh, network go by. Network. So here we go. Um, so let's take a look at reader1.php. So I'm doing a session uh, I'm not really using the session in this particular one. I'll use it in the next one. So I probably could get rid of that. Ah, okay. It won't have session next time you download that source code because it does not need a session. It really doesn't. There's no session in it. So 
if I post a one, it's really simple. If I post a one, I run the code redirect back to itself because you can redirect back to the same script and then I return. Or if I post two, I redirect to a location and in this case I add a get parameter to it which is reader2.php which is really just a copy of the exact same thing. So reader2.php is just so that I can sort of be at a different place. And then if I put a three in, it completely redirects to some other place, right? drchuck.com. Okay? So I'll put in a one here and let's watch the network console. I hit submit. And so this was a post of the value one to this URL. And what it gave me back is a 302 found, which is not the same as a 200. 200 means good news. 302 means like, I know what's going on, but you're at the wrong place. You need to go here. So what happens is immediately, without us even seeing a blink of the eye, the browser stops talking to this URL and switches to that URL and then sends a get request to that URL. And so that's what we actually see. <clears throat> now I'll refresh this so we only have one thing in there. And if I say two, you will see that I do a post back to reader one because that's where the post goes. But then reader one is going to say, oh, go somewhere else. And the place I want you to go is reader2.php parm equals one, two, three. So then it goes and instantly grabs this zip. It grabs it with a get request. And so that's the screen that we're seeing. Okay. And so if I type a three and remember reader one and reader two are the exact same code. If I type a three, it is going to go to location www.drchuck.com. So let's put a three in, clear the network, put a three in and watch what happens. Boom. Now we're at drchuck.com. So there's all kind of crap that comes out, HTML and CSS and whatever. So let's just look at the first two requests. I scrolled all the way back up. The first one, I did a post to reader2.php with a value of three and it responded 302, go away. And it said, here's the place you're supposed to go. So it immediately, my browser immediately saw this and then did a get request to drchuck.com. It of course retrieved all that HTML and then it said, oh, I got to bring a picture and yada, 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 yada. And so that's all these other 71 requests are the rest of that. The redirect is what happened here from this post, from this post with this redirect to this get, okay? Okay, so that gives you a quick overview of the redirect and uh, come back, we'll talk about some of the ways that we can use the redirect. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Today we are going through some of the code for the routing. We, we've done some redirecting and now I wanna play with this code guest.php and so this guest.php code. This is the code that I use to introduce uh, model view controller. And so the model part here is the silent data processing bit and the view is the part below it with a few little bits and pieces being injected, kind of a, a, an HTML template with some dynamic bits in it. Um, and then the context sort of falls from this top part to this bottom part. But I wanna show you a flaw in this. So if I do uh, 41 and it's too low, um, that's fine and I do 42 and it's just right and I'm really happy. Uh, the problem is, is that I'm sitting on a post. The last thing I sent was a post. And if I hit refresh, because posts are considered by the browser to be expecting to modify data, like if you were gonna decrement your savings account, you would do it in a post. The browser doesn't wanna resend a post request for you just without your knowledge. Now, this is not coming from my application. This is coming from my browser that's keeping me from doing something stupid right? It says you might be decrementing your bank account balance or transferring $100 twice or something, right? So to run that, I have to do this. We as application developers, we have lost control of the user experience at this point. And so, you know, that's pretty tacky and we're not very happy about that. And so um, there is a way to fix that, okay? And that is to never generate output on post. And you can say post, you can Google post, redirect get and you will see some wikipedia pages which i love so much and i even use this in my lecture that basically says the problem with the post and then a, a 200 that comes back and then you hit refresh and it sends the post again to generate the page and that's the dangerous moment right so what we want to do is we want to do a post and then we do the work 
and then we redirect back to our cells with a get request and then we put the actual page out on the get request and then if you refresh it it's doing a get request over and over and so that's all cool the problem is is what if we want to put a message out on this screen and we are generating the message here in this postcode like success or message or guess too low or whatever what we're going to do is we're going to use the session <coughs> to copy the data from this moment to that moment okay we're going to look at the session to copy from this to this so we have to use the session to get the message because otherwise what we were doing is we're just putting the too low message out right here but we got to do a post redirect so we're going to know the too low message here and we're going to send it in the session to the next one and it's going to pull it out and then print it okay so this is the bad one falls through produces output as a result of the post here is the good one now one of the first things we see in the good one is we have to use the session because we're going to pass data uh, pretty much Almost everything, except this little bit right here, is the same. All the HTML entities and all that stuff is the same. And let's go to guess2.php. Okay. Now the problem is, is that this data up here in the model part has the old guess and um, the message, and it wants to communicate it, but it's going to come through here and then come through again. So it's not the post data is gone, the get data is gone, but the session data is not. So one of the things we do is get the context, and that is the data we pass from the model to the controller, get the context into the session. So if we have a post of guess, we calculate the guess, and then we stick the old guess into the session with a key guess. Because remember, you can write this, <clears throat> you can put stuff into the session, and it just stores it for later. And then we do the old logic, and we say a session sub message is the high, low, great job, and then we redirect back to ourselves, and that causes the browser to immediately grab and get a new copy of us, so it comes down, but this is a get request, so uh, th this was a post re request, but we say, don't do it, right, and we're right here in this picture, we're, we're, we're sending back a post, the answer to the post request, which is do a get request, which immediately turns into a get request to the same page, right, so it's gonna come back in, post is no longer defined, but session is defined. So we look down here and we go like, oh, okay, well, let's grab the old guess. If there's a guess in the session, we'll grab that. And if there's a message in the session, we'll grab that. Oops, that should say false right there. I don't quite know why it doesn't say false right there. So we'll save that. So if message is not equal to false, we print it out and then we print the old guess, but we pulled them out of the session because we're in a second request response cycle. The second request response cycle. So we pulled the data out of the session to produce that page. So let's do it. So let's do a guess of 41. Now, oh, let's do view developer console. Okay, so look at the network. So we're gonna do a post to, to guess two. And there you go, a post to guess two, and we send the guess in 41. And we got back a redraw of 302 which says it's not really a page, it's something else, and the something else sits here in the location says go back to guess two. So we're redirecting back to the exact same script, and so the browser immediately grabs that script, and it sends a get request to it. And that get request comes down here, grabs the old guess out of session, grabs the old message out of session, and then it renders this. And so the actual output is here to the get request. If we look at the output of the post request, there is nothing, and that's because up here, after we did the redirect, we returned and got the heck out of there. So we didn't fall through. We kind of caused us to come back by saying, come back, come back to this same script again, please. And away it goes. And so there you go. That's sort of a post redirect implementation. And the pattern will be when you have post data, you eventually have to put things in the session, do a redirect and return. And so we'll see more complex code, but this pattern of set the session up, do a redirect, return, will be done over and over and over again so that we can follow the best practice rules of post redirect get. So, I hope you found this helpful. Hello and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Uh, this In this little bit, we're talking about some of the routing, the redirecting, the post redirecting, the no refresh on the posting. We did all that before. Now we're gonna actually sort of talk about the login function where we're talking about all these things together. So here we have this application. 
And this application is pretty smart. It detects that you're not logged in, and then it sends you to a login screen. And so you can log in on any account as long as the password is UMSI. And now we're logged in, and there's a little success message here, and then you can log out, and now you're logged out. Okay, so there's several files. There's app.php. This is made up of app.php, login.php, and logout.php. So um, login, at least so far, this application doesn't do much. It actually doesn't have any post handling, so the, the model part is just get the session started, and then we drop into HTML, blah, 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 blah. We'll come back to this success bit in a second. This is what's called a flash message. Um, but what we're doing is we are basically using as the indicator, whether you're logged in or not, the keys account being present in the session. So if you're not, if the account key is not in the session, which it is not there when you first start out, it says please log in. But if the account, if you have logged in, then it's then the account is in the session, and that's where we say, hey, here's a cool application, go ahead and log out. Okay. So it comes in, starts a session. There is no account key in it, so it says please log in, and that's just a standard href. So we go over there. Uh, while we're doing, let's look at developer console, get that start up, get that ready for us because that'll be so much fun. Now, login is where the fun begins. So here we have login. We have model code up here at the top, session start of course, and here is our post code. Um, and let, we'll come back to that really quick. And so now here is our, our body. And the first thing we're gonna do is these things we call flash messages. And so I'm gonna put errors in the session under the key error, and I'm gonna put good good things that happen to us in the key, under the key success, okay? And so at the beginning of this please log in, right here between those two things, I'm gonna to check to see if there is an error in the session. And if it is, I'm gonna print that out red, and I'm gonna unset it, and that's why we call it a flash message. And so in this case, uh, and the same would be true if there's a success, except I print it out green and then I unset it. So right here between login and the start of the form, there might be a message or may not. And so um, if in the case now where I have a bad login, right, right, and I press login, it's going to come up here, it's going to see the post, and it's going to unset the session sub account. That logs out the current user. Remember I said that when the account key is in the session array, then we're logged in. So that's kind of a logout. If the password is equal to UMSI, then you're good, and we're gonna log in. And if it's not, we're gonna not log in. So we're gonna do this code first. We're gonna set the error to incorrect password, and then we're gonna redirect back to ourself. We are in login.php, and we're gonna redirect back to ourself. So we did a post, that's a post, and then a redirect back to ourselves. But we also sneaked into session this little thing. So after the redirect, a git comes back in, and this code triggers and runs, and out comes incorrect password. Now the interesting thing is because we have removed it, if I refresh this page, and it is legit to refresh it because I'm sitting on a get request, if I reset it, that password, that error is not there. It only showed up once. It's a flash message. That's why we call it flash. It flashes on this, but then if I do another request response cycle, it's not there. And we achieve the flash by getting it out of the session once we've displayed it. Okay? So now let's talk about what happens when you have a successful password. So we'll go, you know, Sarah and then UMSI as the password. It's going to come up here. And this is now really starting to get very controller -y feeling because the controller routes. In this case, it decided to route back to the existing script that we were coming from. But now, once the password matches, we're going to put up a little cute little success message in the session, and we're going to set the account. And this account signals to app.php that login worked. So we're sending a message in the session from one script to the other script. So this redirect is going to happen. So I'm going to log in correctly. So login is a post, and then it redirects. But in this case, you see that redirects to app.php, and then it does a get and so this is the response that comes from that get. But then if we look at app.php, we see it checks to see if there's a success, a success message in the session and it prints it out in green and then it unsets it. So it's a flash. So if I re refresh it, that's no longer in the session, okay? And this is where we would have some cool application stuff, playing a game or something. 
And then we're going to go to logout.php. So logout.php is always my favorite script to write because it all pretty much has three lines. We start the session. We wipe out the session, removing the account, and then we redirect back to app.php. So let's clear this bit out. Um, and I'll press logout. And we're going to do a get request to logout. There's not a post request to logout. And it clears the session. So it was a get request. And we sent a 302 as a result of a get request after having wiped out the session and then said go back to app.php. So then it goes back to app.php and it runs through. Uh, there's no success message and there is no key. And the account key has been gone, it's been taken out. And so we just logged out. Okay, so I hope that's useful to you. Um, it gets kind of brings all this stuff, a model view controller and post redirect and all that stuff is uh, now working uh, quite a bit in this particular small application that just has uh, three files. So hello and welcome to our lecture titled CRUD, Create, Read, Update, and Delete. We have been a long way coming, uh, you know, to get to this lecture. In a sense, there's nothing new in this lecture. It is, we've been doing all these things. We've been deleting data. We know how to talk to the database. Things like redirect are important. Things like flash message are important. And so now what we're going to do is we're gonna, in a sense, take the code we've been writing all along in these various application and refactor it so that it looks more like a typical application. Um, and, and, and then we'll use this, the idea of the ability to insert, delete, update, and read records in the database as a pattern for lots of applications. So this, this is where we, we kind of review everything we've talked about for the last so many uh, lectures. So we've done most of it, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently. And, and um, you know, we have this database. This is a one from a couple of, couple of um, lectures back, and it's got this little delete button, and it's got an add button, and then it, it does a, so this is like the read, this is delete, this is the C button. Uh, we are not doing any updating yet, and so that's the new thing we're going to do. But usually we take these things and don't put them all on the same screen. So we're going to like break these pieces into different screens and put them in different files, and that's typically how we do these things. And so we'll end up with a bunch of files, like a file to do the add screen, a file to do the edit screen, a file to do the delete and edit, and all those things. And so we're just going to pull stuff out. So it's not really all that new. So just as an example, the first thing we'll do is we're going to have an insert screen that's add.php, add.php, and then we'll have the index.php that does nothing more than lists all of the items and then gives us an edit button, delete button, and an add new button. And so it's code we've written, but we're going to move it around. So let's take a look at some of the index.php. Um, we are removing all of the insert code into its own add.php, and so there's, there's less in the index.php code. Um, we're going to require pdo.php, we're going to start the session, and then start our HTML, and there's no posting here. So this is a, this is a script that's only going to do gets, because the add was the reason we did post in this, in this kind of code before. So we, we have sort of, we have our, our model up at top, but there's no model. And so the view down here, um, we start our body and the first thing we do is print out this flash. And so this notion of the flash messages, and that's checking to see if either error or success is out, and then printing out a red version of the error or a green version of a paragraph with the error in it, and then unsetting them. Unsetting removes those keys. So if ever this index starts and it sees one of those two things in the, in the session, it's going to print it out and away we go. So that, that's going to become a pattern we're going to do over and over again. And then we print out a table because we're just going to print the table out. And we do a basic select, um, you know, a select statement. And we pull out, and in addition, we get the user ID, the primary key. And then we make out table rows and use HTML entities, show out the name, password. And then we put in, and then this time we're not going to use a form, we're just going to use an href. We're not actually posting back because in those other ones we posted back and we'll see why we do that in a moment. So we simply do a get request to edit.php user ID equals and then you know one or four or whatever and delete.php because now we've made those other files. So this code is getting a little bit simpler in a way as we're sort of pulling it out into pieces and then we just have a link to add new. So this is a relatively simple program. It, <laughs> it checks, it, it has no post data it doesn't expect to be posted to, it's only a get, 
but it will print out flash messages and then it just loops through and prints out our data and has a couple of links to the other pages that are properly farmed. And so this leads to these edit buttons. If we take a look at what's underneath these edit buttons, they are, you know, just get messages, get user ID equals two or whatever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we just go to those pages, edit.php and delete.php. So add.php is code that we've just really pulled out from that old uh, code that we were doing in a couple of, couple of slides back or a couple of lectures back. Um, and so it's pretty much the same. We, we're going to have a session. We pull in our database. We have some view code, a model code right up here that's doing our database. And this looks exactly like the add code from before. We set up the, this, you know, the insert statement and we execute it with the, the stuff. And the difference is now that when we are done with that, we, we put a little flash message in the, um, a flash message in the session, and then we redirect back to index.php and always remember return afterwards, return afterwards. And so on a post, this is gonna come in like this, do this work and then leave. And then on a get, it's gonna come in, fall through and display the form, okay? So that that is code we've done before, but it's also simpler. So the last time we looked at this code, it was all the index and the ad was all one, but by pulling them out, we're keeping them a little easier to understand. And so that, that's helpful. Okay, and so when, the, when we finally hit the add button, right, we press the add button, it comes in, it does the post, it does the insert, and then it sets the stuff in the session, and then it redirects to index.php, and there's that little bit of code in index.php, when we get back here to index.php, that pulls that thing out and puts out the little green message. So that's the flow. We're in index.php, we hit the add button, we come to here, we hit the submit button, go back through, and then we go back to index.php with the word record added upon success. Now, there's, we, this code is a little simple. We might wanna check for errors. We might ch check for data validity. I'm keeping that out of here just so that it fits on the screen nicely. But you know, it's, it all, the data val validation actually fits right here because you do wanna do all the data validation uh, before you do any inserts into the database. Now, the delete.php, again, is code that we've done kind of similarly before. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that um, deletes often have pop-ups or some other page. They, because, and part of that is to get to the point where the actual delete is done as a result of the post. So in this code, delete.php, we're going to have a get parameter, user ID equals four. We're going to grab our database. We're going to start our session. We're doing a get, so the post isn't there yet. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to pull up the, the data because this user ID for or whatever may or may not be a valid user ID in our database. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a select, pull up the person's name so that we can then echo it. We're doing it and pull out that for in that get parameter. So where user ID equals four. And then we're gonna do a, a fetch. And if we didn't find a row, that means that somehow this number is bad and we're gonna pr put a error message in and then redirect back to index.php and then leave, don't fall through. Each one, of each, pretty much when you say header, you pretty much wanna return is the next statement. And if the get falls all, uh, the, that comes through here, the get actually comes through here. If the get gets to this point, then we're going to put out the person's name with, uh, with HTML entities, of course, because they might have a single quote in their name or something dangerous. And then we have the user ID as a hidden field. That's the user ID and we pulled that in with a select statement. And then we have a delete button and we just have a simple href to go back to index.php for canceling. So we make this a post, gotta make it a post because if the post comes back in, you know, when we hit this post button, it's gonna come back in here. And so we only want that to be a post so that for all the rules that you're not supposed to modify data on a post. And then when we finally hit the post button, press the post button, it comes up, it runs the delete, does the delete, and then says record deleted in success, and then redirects to index.php and ends the script. So what happens is now you know all these things, these patterns will get more and more uh, comfortable for you. So that's a delete. Um, and this is the flow, right? You go from, you, you click a delete button, which has a get parameter on it, which goes to here, it produces this, 
This is a post back and then it runs the postcode, sets this thing in session and redirects to index.php. And there, of course, the code is in the index.php to pull out the flash message and remove it from the flash message. And so that's the flow. So we do a get request here, a post request here, and then a redirect and another get request. So we're still redirecting from a post to a get, but we're redirecting to a get of a different script. And we are sending this session, using this session, to send that message to a different script and so that it's, it's okay. And so that's part of the controller function, is the routing from one thing to another. And so the only thing that's really new, everything else of that code was kind of stuff we'd seen other than the fact that it's using post and redirect and flash messages, but the edit is the only thing that's a little bit weird. And the, the weird thing that the edit has to do that's different than the, all the other screens is, is it wants to put the old values from the database in. Okay, and so, so we're on a get request, so this it's going to go right past the post stuff, okay? So on a get request, a, you know, delete ID equals 7 or whatever it is, user ID equals 7. And so we're going to go pull out the data, select star, which is name and email and user ID and everything from the database. We're going to get one row or zero rows. And so we'll run this thing and we'll fetch our row. And if we get a false, that means that something bad happened, so we send it. You know, when you know you just put in an error message and go back to index.php and leave. So you kind of know that's a safe thing. Just get out of here. But chances are good if the link came from index.php, this is going to work, and you're going to have an actual row, and then row is going to have the key value pairs of all the columns of that row, and it'll fall down now into this next bit of code. And so what I do here is I, you know, I'm, I'm going to take and make an HTML entity, so the name and email and password, and then pull out the user ID. And I'm kind of now in the view part. So all of a sudden it says edit user, blah, 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 blah. And then you have this typed in stuff, the name for the value, email, password, and the user ID. And I make the user ID hidden. The, no the notion of having a form with a hidden tag that's like the primary key of what's being updated, that's a pretty common notion. So in here is the user ID for whatever it is, so that when you press the update button, it knows what user ID that you mean to update. And we name these things name, email, password, and user ID, so we can then take a look at them when we're responding to the postcode. And so what happens then is, of course, you go to the edit, edit, and that's a get request, you know, with an ID equals on the end of this thing, and it has the old stuff in it, and then we modify it, right? We, we make changes to it. It has pulled these out, and now we're about to hit the update, which is a post request coming in, and there is the hidden variable of the user ID that we don't see in there. And so we can check to see if the name, email, password, and user ID is set in the post data. That's just kind of a sanity checking. If we were going to do any error checking of the valid validity, which we should, I'm just not doing it here, it'd be right here, and this next code of, of running the SQL, the update statement, update user set name equals colon name, email equals colon email. These colons, remember, are just placeholders for PDO. And then we're going to prepare that, and then we're going to run it based on pulling the post data in from the form, and then that'll work. And then here we go, these three lines. You're going to type these three lines so many times. Set a success message of record updated, and then redirect to index.php, and then return so we don't fall down into the get code. And then that'll cause a get request to happen here. And then index.php will pull out that success message and wipe it out and print everything. And so there's not really all that much new in here. Pretty much the idea is, is this looks kind of like an add form, except that the add form now has value equals for all these things, which then we pulled out of the database. We pulled out of the database right here. So we pull the record out of the database. We complain if we don't find it. If we do find it, we write the same form, but we just put value equals in to have all the old values, which means now you can just go in, drive around and edit them, and then hit the submit button, and then send the data in and run an update statement, and then come back to index.php with a success message. So I encourage you to take a look at that code. I encourage you to understand pretty much every single line of the CRUD example. It's not that hard, right? But it, it wraps up a whole lot of things about posting and redirecting and PDO and 
like so many things. Now you can look at that and understand hopefully every single line. And now we can go from just sort of learning the basic mechanics of HTTP and how we manipulate HTTP and what are some of the underlying things we have to do. But instead now we can start building more fun applications because they're all slight variations on CRUD, create, read, update, and delete. And so going forward, it'll be more fun than it has been because we know enough at the end of this lecture to build basic PHP applications. Hello everybody, welcome to Web Applications for Everything, yet another code walkthrough. The code we're walking through right now is um, CRUD, the CRUD application. Now you'll notice if you click on the CRUD application, it won't let you run it on Web Applications for Everybody, and that's because it requires a database connection. So you're going to have to download it and run it somehow on your local host to sort of see what's going on. And, and so there we are, we got uh, CRUD running here. Make it a little bigger so you can see it. Um, because it has to be set up, and I have this MISC folder, make that a little smaller, uh, MISC, uh, this MISC database. And if you're a little concerned or confused about how to get things set up in the CRUD folder, there is a uh, SQL uh, notes on how to uh, set this database up and then insert some users into it. Um, and so so basically the idea of this CRUD application is it's not really that different than anything else we've done. We're really kind of moving code around and cleaning it up and, and bringing it to sort of the best practices. So before we have done things like, oh, in the PDO file, we did things like user3.php where we sort of had a delete and an insert and a table all showing in the same thing. So in a way, this is the file from several several lectures ago that's the closest to what we're going to do in CRUD. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a set of all, we're going to pull some of the functionality out and kind of clean it up out of user three and move it around and then come up with a pattern where we have a file each for the insert, the delete, and the update, and the list. And so this turns out like the index file is the thing that does the list. Let's just play with this application for a second. So here's our index, and it shows what's in the table. We can add a new thing. Um, oops. Caitlin, um, C-A-T-Y-L-Y-N, at umesh.edu. And then, you know, 987. So we have an add page that does the add, and everything has a cancel to go back. And then it, it redirects itself back to index.php with a little success message. And then if um, we got a uh, delete, we can delete this and delete it. Now it's gone. And then we have like on um, edit and we can make changes. And then update it and it changed it. So we're kind of routing between these four main files. There's sometimes a view file like a view.php that we click on but we have so little data that we just kind of do it in the index.php. So this is not that different than anything we've done before. So let's go ahead and start with index.php. One thing you'll notice about index.php is I'm using hrefs to go into edit with a get parameters user ID equals one and into delete. So there's no forms on this and so there's no posting going on. There are just hrefs. These are hrefs and this is href. So if you look at the top, the kind of the model part of index, there's nothing there. All I do is pull in the PDO and I start the session. And then I have flash messages and pretty soon this is gonna, it won't take long, I'm gonna stick these in a utility file and just include them. But basically they check to see if there is a kind of a residual from whatever previous thing was executing, if there's an error or a success, printing it out and then deleting it to implement the flash pattern. This table, is pretty much code we've done before. We make a table, we make a row, and then we make one, two, three, and then the fourth column is this edit slash delete. And all we do is we put an anchor tag in, edit.php with a, with a query parameter, user ID equals the primary key of the user ID, and that's the edit text, and then the delete.php, and that's the ID equals and the delete text. And so that's how we end up with hrefs. And then we just go to add.php to go to add new. So let's take a look at the add code. This yellow stuff, this is just my browser. I wish I could convince the browser to stop doing that. That's the browser pre-filling stuff in. And the add code is kind of like um, the user3.php code. 
the it's got some post intelligent post code um, you know it requires PDO PHP session start gets things going and then it has a it's not doing a very good job but here's the beginning of the view it's not got a doc type or HTML sorry about that but it does check to see if there's an add flash and we'll see when we'll, we'll use that in a second and then we just have a simple form and then we have a cancel. I'm just making the cancel be a href rather than a fancy button. Now, if we take a look at the postcode, this postcode does a bit of data validation. Now I'm finally doing some data validation. And, and this is the model code that says if there is these three variables that are in the post, you know, a, a at a.com, and a is the password. If those are set, first we're going to check to see if the name or password uh, is less than one in terms of length. And if that's not true, then I'm going to say missing data. Oh, so let's let's execute. And then I'm going to redirect, right? Set an error, redirect back to the script, and then quit so we don't fall through. So we're going to be doing that all the time. So let's, let's send bad data, and here we go. So if I do a view uh, developer console on this and take a look at the network tab, and let's make another mistake. Get rid of that, get rid of that you know, blah, 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 but we'll keep the rest of it blank and we're just going to say add new, you will see that it does a post to add.php and then it sets the error and then it does a redirect back to add.php, which immediately does a get to add.php, which is what then gives us back this page with missing data, right? So that comes out. So that's a post redirect and this is a error checking, a data validation error checking uh, post redirect, and that's that's exactly what we want. We're going to check to see if there is an at sign in the middle of the email, and so if we we have non blank stuff here, um, right? But there's no at sign here. It's going to complain. It's going to come. It'll make it through these stir lens, but it won't make it. So this is my pattern: data validation looking good. Check this one looking good. Anytime you quit, just quit. Right? There are other ways to do this, but. I try to make my data allocation kind of in a protector pattern where I'm not going to let you go any farther. I'm out of here if something's bad. So this one's going to say bad data <clears throat> with a post a post redirect. And if everything is fine, it does an insert using PDO with key with the uh, substitution parameters, name, email, and password. We prepare the statement. One of the things is you don't put debug print in here because we're still above the line and so we don't get to print the SQL out. I tend to, to uh, it's a little harder. You can print this stuff out, but then you don't want to, you want to sort of comment out the header um, because you want to be able to see the output if you're debugging in here. But we just do the insert. We've done this before and then we put a success message and then we go to index.php. So we're doing controller function to go there. So x, x at y.com and some password and we hit new and so it redirects and goes back to index.php and index.php has a success message and because it's been wiped out at the end we hit refresh or get and that message goes away but the data doesn't go away the data is still there so that's the flow for insert so let's do delete next so delete remember it just is a href coming out right here it does an href user ID equals and then the primary key. Now let's take a look at the delete code. So here's our model. So we're going to ignore that. Now we are going to check to make sure that the user ID we've been given is correct. So if I don't, if I somehow can find my way to delete.php, it says missing user ID, sets an error and goes right back to index.php. So somehow that didn't work well. But if it's a URL that we constructed, the user ID probably is in there. So then it's going to demand that. Then it's going to do a select where the user ID is whatever this number is, eight in this case. And if we don't get a row, then we're going to say bad value for user ID. So if I do user ID equals, come on, 800, it's going to say bad value for user ID and then redirect to index.php. See how easy this is? You just like, Check a problem, boom, set a flash variable, send it back. Okay, so now, <laughs> finally, we're going to get to the point where um, we're going to put out a confirmation dialog, and we're going to use HTML entities. We're using the short print this variable out. 
but we call HTML entities just in case the user has named themselves Mr. Double Quote Input Type Equals Button or whatever, or little Johnny Tables for all we know. Um, and so we're just putting that out and that comes up here. And so X is the person's name. And we have a little form with a hidden variable, which is the user ID, the primary key of this, of this, um, of this user. And then we have a little uh, delete button or cancel button that's really kind of routing us back to index.php. Um, but then the post comes in and the, we, we post the delete. We're checking that's the delete that comes from the submit button, right? Post sub delete the name. So if, if set post sub delete, that really means that delete button was pressed and there is a user ID. We wanna double check these. Don't, don't skimp on these. Check for everything you're going to use because the last thing you want is some kind of a trace back in here. So just double check stuff. This kind of guardian pattern is what it's called to make sure that we don't run code when we're not sure the post is set. So we're, we're, we're not just deciding when to run this code, but we're also making sure that all the preconditions necessary to run it are okay. So we're gonna run a delete statement, delete from user ID, whatever. We're using prepared statement and all that PDO goodness. We say record deleted and we redirect to index.php and we return these three lines. And these three lines are like, yup, you better get it because it's what you do. I want to go here and I will please display a green message record deleted. And so when I say delete, it does that, right? And goes back to index.php and has a nice little success message. And I keep saying this, if I refresh, the success message goes away, but the data doesn't change. Okay, so that's a flash. So we're zooming through this. So the only thing that's a little new, actually most of that was code we'd already had, it's just a lot cleaner now, right? So now let's go into edit. Let's take a look at edit. Edit's a little bit different. It's kind of like an ad. Here's Here we go again in the model part. We're going to say if these things are set in the post, I'll come back to that. Again, we're going to um, we're going to be clever and we're going to check to make sure that we know the data, but now we're going to select all of the stuff, right? So select and we, we wait if there's no row. So if someone had like somehow gone to a user ID number that doesn't exist up here, but we won't do that. It works just the same as the delete code. I probably just grab this code right here from the delete. Looks like it's exactly the same as the delete code. Um, and then I'm going to start printing the, the data out. And so I'm going to, I'm going to use a little, uh, I'm going to do HTML entities, row sub name, email, and password, and put them in the variables N, E, and P, and pull out the user ID. That's just to make this a little more con concise. Here's some HTML with some little bits of PHP variables being dropped in for the existing old values. Now I've already called HTML entities on these three, so they're okay, so we're, we're safe. And so that's how these old values that were pulled from the database in row number one get there. Now I'm sitting here waiting and I'm gonna say uh, Chuck, all right, Chuck, and I'm gonna do a post and then the post is gonna come in here. So this is the first time we've seen an update but it works just the same as anything else. It's exactly as you would type update users set column equals placeholder, comma, column equals placeholder, column equals placeholder, where user ID equals placeholder. Then we prepare that statement and then we execute with the data from the post. And of course, this is solving our problem of SQL injection because we're using prepared statements in PDO. And we should, in time, we'll put error messages here, et cetera. But for now, this is mostly going to work unless it blows up because we have a syntax error in the SQL, which we don't. We set a success message, record updated, and then we redirect, and then we stop. You always, pretty much as soon as you say header location, you're gonna quit. So I've changed this to Chuck. I say update, and there is my data. And of course, it's a post redirect. I don't have to tell you that by now. I think you kind of got it. Edit, we do post to edit get no response, but then it redirects and then it, it gets this thing back. So that's pretty much it, right? That's pretty much the CRUD code. It, it's not that compared to everything else we've done so far, it's not all that new. It's just coming up with a nice organization for the code so that we can make sense of it and not make these uh, applications too complex. So I hope this was helpful. And I hope the rest of the code walkthroughs have been helpful, helpful as well. Hello, and welcome to my lecture on JavaScript. Um, 
JavaScript was invented in 1995 by Brendan Eich uh, while he was working at the Netscape Corporation. Uh, and he sort of invented the first prototype of it in 10 days. Uh, it was invented in a great hurry. And it was really designed to be a language that was very approachable, that people sort of would view source in their browsers and figure things out. And um, it would make programming available to lots and lots of people. Uh, it eventually became standardized as what's called ECMAScript. So you'll hear it sometimes referred to as JavaScript and other times it re referred to as ECMAScript. So basically, if we take a look at a, uh, a document, um, you know, we got some HTML. It is interspersed with the HTML, which is really different from PHP because we sort of have the uh, less than uh, question mark PHP. Um, that switches to server-side code, but this is not server-side. This is actually run in the browser. So the PHP code, if it has JavaScript in it, simply emits this, and then as the browser, as the browser is reading the page that it's reading, it's like, oh, wait, I've got to switch into code. And so this is a HTML tag, and it actually comes back to the browser and is run in the browser. And so we intersperse the JavaScript in with the rest of the HTML. Now, JavaScript looks a lot different in between the script and the slash script tags because it itself is a programming language. And so it's got for loops and all this stuff. And so we, we, we flip back and forth. Now, important thing, just sort of looking at this bit of code right here, this is all interpreted in order. So the, the browser is like, oh, I saw um, a paragraph, out comes a paragraph, right? And then it hits this JavaScript and document.write. Document is an object inside of JavaScript that is the access to the actual sort of the, not the screen, but the backing document that's behind the screen. So document.write with a P tag, this is actual HTML, this actually produces output HTML. And it happens between one paragraph and second paragraph because that's where it happens. The no script tag is in the situation where the browser doesn't support uh, JavaScript. Uh, these days it's less and less common for browsers to not support JavaScript. Um, used to be that there was a, when JavaScript first came out, there was sort of a debate as to whether or not you support JavaScript, but most full-featured websites demand JavaScript at this point. There might be some other thing like NoScript, might, if you're talking to a web scraper or a web crawler or something like that. So, but this, and so this NoScript tag is a way for you to print something out in the, in the case of if JavaScript is not enabled on the browser that you're sending it to. But basically, we start in script and we end in slash script, and then we put some code in the language JavaScript, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So one of the first things I always like to do when I am programming is how to get a debug statement, okay? And um, the alert function takes as a parameter a single string and it prints it out. So here's a very simple bit of JavaScript. Uh, the browser sort of runs this. Oops, hang on. Turn the scribbler back on. The browser kind of runs this and uh, it stops. And depending on your browser, it may actually stop when the, um, in the middle while the page is still displaying. So let's take a look at this particular one. Let me clear this and go and run this one. Here's the sample code. We'll run this first one. We already saw that one. Let me make this just a little bigger here. And so you see, and you see this little thing is still spinning. Right over here, it's still spinning, and that's because it's sort of still processing the page, and the alert has actually completely stopped the JavaScript. So the, the, the thing that's going to happen right after the alert won't happen until I press OK, and then it finishes. Okay, so, so the alert stops right now, and it's really stopping the interpretation of this page. So alert is... Um, it, it, it doesn't just print out output, but it stops JavaScript processing. So it's a pretty strong form of debugging, if that makes any sense. And so alert's just an executable statement. Um, there are three ways that you can put JavaScript into a document. One is inline within the document using the script tag. Uh, you can also put it on things like uh, on-click methods, on, on things like uh, hrefs, etc. Or you can include a whole file. We'll see all of these examples. So 
this is some code that we've sort of been playing with all along, but now it is time to sort of understand what's going on here. So this is an anchor tag that is this tag right here. And we have an onClick method. So this is within the anchor tag, right? And it says, when someone clicks on this anchor tag, I want to run this JavaScript right here. So the bit in between double quotes is JavaScript. And JavaScript can use single quotes or double quotes as strings. So we tend to reserve the double quotes for HTML. So onClick equals double quote something, double quote, that's HTML. And then quote, high quote, single quotes in this case, is some JavaScript, and we're calling alert. Now, return false has to do with, normally if you were to click on an href, it would actually follow that link, okay? <clears throat> but if you say return false, it won't follow the link, and it'll just run this code and not follow the link, okay? So let's take a look at that one. So if I click, it's going to actually run the JavaScript rather than doing what it normally would do. And if you recall, it, was, it would go to jso1.htm, but it's not going to because we did the return false. Okay. So return false is the way to indicate that we don't actually want to do what normally would have happened if the click happened. So you can do both the onClick method and then let the tag do what it normally would do, or you can say, I'm taking over and doing that. So, the, so this is just one form where we're putting JavaScript right on a tag. So here's another way to do it. And, um, and so <clears throat> this one we showed before where we just did a uh, script tag and an end script tag and then had document write. You might see something like this. Uh, in HTML5, we tend not to do this, but this is validation to make sure that the JavaScript passes an H a strict HTML4 validation, but that's, uh, that's less important as we're moving to HTML5. So we talked about this one. And then the, the third way to do this is to actually use the same script tag and say, I would like to load this file. And this then script.js has to be a file that has some content in it. And in this case, we just have one line of JavaScript. We don't have a script tag, it's just JavaScript itself. It knows that it's JavaScript by the fact that we're inlining it. And so that's as if we typed all that stuff here. Now, this is kind of a silly little example. It actually just you know, moves that document right into the file, but that's another form of uh, including JavaScript that you will uh, commonly see. So, syntax errors in JavaScript are a little bit different. I mean, we can make mistakes, it's a programming language, but the problem is, is that most of the time you're using a JavaScript page that you did not write, and you're just using, you know, Twitter. And if there's a JavaScript error on a Twitter page, you as the Twitter user, it doesn't do much good for you to be told that there's a JavaScript error, because you can't fix it. Syntax error, missing semicolon, who knows what it's going to be. So the browsers tend to uh, be very, very silent about any kind of a JavaScript error, but the code dies. Um, sometimes there's a little red icon that shows up in the, in the lower left-hand corner. So here's just an example of a bit of bad JavaScript where, um, where we're just going to have a double quote that starts and ends in a single quote. So that's a syntax error. And what we will see is that this will run. It will die here. So this code doesn't finish, but then it actually gives up on that script block and then continues, and you'll see that this, this one will run later. Okay, so let's go ahead and show this. In JS05, oops. So it, it did not tell us anything about that first syntax error. And, but, it didn't say, but it didn't run that second alert, and then it actually finishes, okay? So, like I said, the end user is really not supposed to see the error, but we as a developer need to look for errors. And so as we're writing JavaScript, you instinctively, something won't work. You'll make a change and it won't work, and your brain's got to go like, oh, wait, 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 I made an error. I've got to actually explicitly look for it. And so there are uh, developer modes 
in all of these browsers. I'll play with the Chrome one here. So let's take a look at how you turn on developer mode. And sometimes you have to enable this, like this little message to just show up. But at, at the end of the day, I can like the view JavaScript uh, console. And I'm gonna hit refresh and you will sort of see what's going on here. It runs, but it's, I see the error and I can even click right here and I can see the exact place that the error happens. So increasingly these browsers all have nice debugger modes in them and I've just popped up a debugger and it's got this little thing and I can look at the console, I can look at the code and go back and forth. And so this is, can I make that a little bigger? Yeah, so this is a useful thing and you as a developer, you'll tend to often just leave this sitting down here at the bottom when you're working on code all the time where it's like, you know, I just leave this on all the time. You kind of do it with console and you run it and you see something like, oh, wait, 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 wait. And then you know how to go look for that error. Okay. So that's very important because there's no good way to see these things unless you've got this console turned on. Sometimes your browser will say, go look up JavaScript errors, but it really wants to hide these from end users. You as the developer of the website have to get this stuff right. So alert is kind of a, a blunt instrument in that it's, it stops running the code. And sometimes you, got, you have a loop or something. You want to put some debugging in it. And so uh, these debuggers have uh, added a console.log method. And you can pass in a string and you can, you can console log all kinds of stuff. And, um, and so basically what you can do with the debugger turned on is you say, you know, console.log and it'll come out in the log. And so this same console.log that we were seeing allows you to see things and um, it, it just runs. And so that, that console.log is a very useful thing and it allows you to even inside of a loop or inside of an event or an onclick method to be logging stuff without stopping. If you do an alert, it stops. But if you do a console log, it, sh it just streams by in the debugger window. And if you don't, if, you, if the end user doesn't see this, only developers might see it. So I tend to, in some of my sites, you can go look at them and you'll see the console talking. And you can see, you know, a play-by-play -play of what's going on inside of one of my sites. Now, depending on the browser, the, 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 ob the console object uh, may or may not always be there. Sometimes it's there when the, when the debugger's on. Sometimes it's not there when the debugger's off. So the, my favorite thing to do is whenever I'm going to do a console log, I say window.console, which won't cause an error, and so that means that if a console exists, then I will call console.log. This is just a real succinct way of saying that, window.console and console.log. Another way to do it, you, you can look up all kinds of ways to deal with console.log. This is my preferred way to do it, but you can also just, if the console is doesn't the console function doesn't exist, console variable doesn't exist, it sort of sets that up and sets a log function. But this is my favorite way to do that. So the the debugger, as we mentioned, is a great tool for debugging JavaScript. Um, you can uh, pause the debugger. So let me show you how to do that. Let me go back. You can pause code. Oh, sorry. I've got to clear that. Pause code. So here's JavaScript 01, right? And I can look at the source. And I can put a breakpoint here by clicking right there. So I now have a breakpoint at that point. Now, the page is already run, so once I set the breakpoint, I've got to hit refresh once to load the page. Now that it knows where the breakpoint is supposed to be, it'll run up and stop at the breakpoint. Okay, and so now it is paused in the debugger. You can see that it's paused in the debugger. You see this little spinny guy, meaning the page isn't done loading yet because we've stopped it. And we can look at variables and global variables. There's all kinds of stuff that we can look at. Document, object, model, all kinds of things. And I just click right here to continue the debugger. And so the page completes. Now that's a very, very, very simple introduction to using the JavaScript debugger, but it's very, very valuable. And you'll get used to how this all works after a while. 
So let's now talk a little bit about the JavaScript programming language. So JavaScript is a programming language. And it's just like other languages, it has its little quirky things. So JavaScript was informed by lots of languages that came before it. It has two basic forms of, com of comments. One is a double slash, which is like a C++ form of content comment that says from here to the end of the line. And you can also have multi-line comments that start with slash star to end, and that's like a C language comment, which, you know, this is what we like. We like both single line comments and multi-line comments in JavaScript, and that's quite nice. Uh, white space and new lines do not matter, although we, you know, rigorously indent to make our code easier to read. Statements end in semicolon. There's places you can leave the semicolon off, but it's a little different than Java and C and other C-like languages, but most programmers just program as if they were in Java and put all the semicolons in and don't try to remember the complex rules as to when you don't need semicolons. So here's a good example of a white space that simply does not matter, right? You know, here is, you know, x equals 3 plus 5 times 4. It doesn't matter if there's a new line or lots of white space. The same is true if there's a new line. I mean, it just, it's as if that white space, a new line, uh, doesn't exist. Variable names are pretty typical. Um, the only thing that's kind of weird is you can have dollar signs. They're optional. Uh, I'm not sure exactly quite why JavaScript allowed this. I think sometimes language designers are trying to appeal to people coming from different languages, and so maybe people coming from PHP or Perl might have felt more comfortable. The problem is, is that if you're in a file where you're mixing PHP and JavaScript, it's sort of considered tacky to use the dollar sign in your JavaScript code. You want to really use that in your PHP code. PHP requires dollar sign. JavaScript allows it, but again, we tend not to do it. Okay? But other than that, it's pretty much standard stuff. Start with a letter, case matters, underscore. We tend to use underscores uh, for variables that are internal, that are you don't just have random underscore variables unless it's sort of like global variables or internal variables or some kind of a special variable. Uh, string constants are nice. Single quotes and double quotes kind of work the same. You have things like new lines that work in either single quotes or double quotes. Again, not all languages are similar like this. Single quotes, but they're equivalent. But what we tend to do is we tend to use single quotes in our JavaScript constants, unless we absolutely need to use double quotes, because we want to use double quotes for the HTML elements. And sometimes you're writing JavaScript that's writing HTML. And so it's nice to sort of, in your mind, just say if it's a double quote, we're using an HTML. If it's a single quote, it's, our Java, it's, a, it's a JavaScript string constant. And it uses standard C-like backslash, either in single quote or double quoted strings. Oh, clicking the wrong place to clear the screen, but we got this screen cleared. Numbers, floating point, integers, just exactly what you would expect. Uh, we'll talk a little bit in another lecture about um, more detail about arrays, but if you just have a standard array, the syntax is pretty natural. Uh, you have their zero based and use the index operator with, with square brackets, and so uh, kind of like lists and, 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 and uh, integer indexed arrays in PHP as well. Uh, standard operators, plus, minus, uh, modulo. We have our post increment, which is, you know, K plus plus is, you know, pull out the value for K and then add one. I'm using the console here. I'm actually just typing these into the console. K plus plus says, Take the, give me the old value of k and add 1, and that's why k is 4. This is a pre-decrement, which means take out the 4, subtract 1, put it back in, and give me the post-decrement value. So, but, yeah, don't use those too much. But we do use modulo, and we use plus, minus, and those guys like that. So operators are pretty basic. Uh, like many C-like languages, we have the side effect operators, uh, plus equals, minus equals, star equals, standard side effect operators. <clears throat> Comparison operators are uh, very much like uh, C and very much like PHP in that there's also a triple equals as well as a double equals. 
where there's uh, less conversion going on and the triple equals is kind of like equivalent to uh, where there's no type conversion going on, uh, much like PHP actually. Logical operators, again, like PHP, um, double AND is AND, double ampersand is AND, double vertical bar is uh, OR, and NOT is exclamation point. String concatenation. This is probably the part when I switch from one language to another that drives me nuts. I like how PHP uses the dot, but JavaScript uses the Java and other languages more common syntax of plus for concatenation. And it does do uh, aggressive type conversion where needed, and so it uh, there's no like string function or anything like that that you might use in Python. You can concatenate a string in a, in a journal. It's like, oh, I'll turn that in a journal to a string for you and it concatenates, okay? Uh, variables, of course, have types. Um, it is a little counterintuitive, like for example, here we're adding a string and a number. Uh, in PHP, we would expect that to be a number, but in JavaScript, it's a string. Um, here, we're doing a multiplication, so that's gonna turn that into a number and then add 10 to it, so we get a number. And then you will see in JavaScript this thing called NAN. Okay, NAN is a, a, a floating point concept called not a number. And that usually you get it by dividing by zero or, or doing something else illegal. And you'll see it often in um, uh, dynamic web pages where you'll see NAN and you're like, oh, that means JavaScript's in action and probably divided by zero or something like that. Um, NAN is sticky. So like if X ends up being Fred times one, it has no idea what to do with that, although PHP would know what to do with that. Um, Fred times one is not a number, but then not a number stays not a number. If I can add one to it, not a number plus one is still not a number. So it's kind of a sticky uh, value. Once you end up with a computation that's not a number, there is no way to do more computations to that value and change it back to a number. It does variable conversion. It's a little bit, uh, little bit different. Um, we can also end up with uh, infinity by dividing by zero by mistake. Um, there is an is nan function, and so we can do these kinds of things, but in general, we just sort of avoid doing silly things like multiplying Fred by one or dividing an integer by zero in JavaScript. So there's just some functions that you can play with. There is an operator called type of, um, which basically tells you what kind of a thing you've got. Um, and it returns a string. And uh, so type of y, because, you know, that's crazy y is equal to quote why question mark, and it is a string. And so you can check, and you can also find out if something is undefined by looking at the type of an undefined variable. Uh, functions are as you would expect. Uh, the keyword is function, and you got a function name followed by your, your arguments. And of course, the arguments are really just temporary placeholders so that they kind of correspond to the call first and second thing, and they sort of work, and there's a return, and the return value becomes the residual in the expression from whence it was called. That part all looks pretty straightforward. The thing that's not straightforward, and I find it really annoying, I find it really, really, really annoying, because in this respect, JavaScript works differently than virtually every other language that I'm used to, that any of us are used to, and that is, if a variable exists, like this gl variable, if that variable exists before the function sort of is defined, then this gl is a global gl. Not because I called it gl, but just because it goes like, oh, does gl exist? And it does, so I'll just hook those two things together. So if you look at this code, right, it sets gl to 123. This function is defined that changes gl to 456. We call the function, and then we print out GL at the end, and the global GL, the outer GL, the GL outside the function, has been changed to 456 because this hooks up with that global variable, okay? Counterintuitive. In every other sane language, this GL would be a local GL within that function, right? But that's not particularly sane. So we have to sort of have a way of overriding that. In any insane language, you'd say have to say global to make it escape the bonds of the function. But in uh, JavaScript, we use the var keyword to force it to be local. 
So you'll see var all the time. Var says, make this a local copy. And even if there is a global version of it, then this is local. And that's why when this code runs, the global 123 is separate from the local 123. And it stays 123 uh, globally. Now, let's talk a little bit about arrays. JavaScript supports both linear arrays and key value ar associative arrays, but they're kind of actually a little different than associative arrays in PHP. So linear arrays are really simple. You can effectively append into them, and then you have a linear array. <coughs> you can create an array. Looks a lot like PHP there. And then you can set the zero item and the one item. That works as well. And then you just print them out and you've got an array that's just got two items in it and, and away you go and use the index operator as you might expect. You can also use the array constructor where you say array and then you have a thingy and a thingy and you got a, a two item list or you can use the constant syntax which is square brackets and you get the same kind of a thing. Let's talk a little bit about control structures for, uh, for JavaScript. They're very much like most of them. If statements work like you would expect, while loops work like you'd expect, uh, counted for loops work like you'd expect, um, and in loops break and continue work like you'd expect because it's all very C influenced. Um, so here is the definite loop for four, the in, right? And so so if we have a, in this case, this is an, uh, this is an object with three member variables, for ball and balls, that's going to sort of iterate. Ball is now going to iterate through these three things. And if we print out golf, which is a string, and then we look up balls sub ball, so that is a string, balls sub golf, balls sub tennis. So it prints these guys out, right? So that's an in. It uses the in keyword similar to Python. Hello, and welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. Uh, in this uh, walkthrough, we're going to walk through the assignment that's associated with the basic uh, JavaScript lesson. Um, here it is. It's the auto. Uh, it's the um, uh, the assignment is to basically build a profile database. Now, part of the philosophy of this assignment is I assume that you just finished the autos CRUD assignment with an autos table and a users table, and I I want you to sort of build a second CRUD application. You can really look back at your old one for inspiration, but this, this is going to be the basis for the next couple of assignments for this course. So you ought to get this right. And, and um, if you just barely got it working in the previous assignment, then you should sort of take this opportunity to really understand what's going on. So let's play a little bit with it. It's got some JavaScript in it, some in-browser JavaScript data validation. So let's take a look at this. Um, Actually, I'm going to show it to you on my uh, local host. Okay. Um, but before I do, I want to set up my tables. And I've got some tables here in my MISC database. <clears throat> and I'm going to just drop those and show you how I have to start with tables. Obviously, if I run my code now, I think <sighs> blew up, right? Um, but I give you some code to set this up. we got to create table for users. Copy that over, create the table for the users, then create the table for profile. You got to create these in the order because there is the um, foreign key constraint. So if the user table doesn't exist, you won't be able to create the profile table. Kablooey, there that goes. Um, so that makes that work now. Um, and if I go back to the assignment, I got to insert these hashed passwords. So I'm going to insert uh, UMSI and the hash password. I explain all this stuff, but then I kind of give you cheaty, cheaty steps that make your life a little easier. So now, so here we are at the resume. I'm going to use my local host one here, not the global one. So you can watch what's happening in the database. I've got a, a, a profile, a, data, a table, and a, and a user's table. So the first thing is that um, you're supposed, this is the JavaScript bit, you're supposed to do in-browser validation. And so if I do a view source on this page, you can see what I've got. I've got a, um, on the click of the login button, I've got 
I'm going to run do validate. Okay. And it's either going to give me a true if it's valid and then actually submit the form or it's going to give me a false and blow up. And so you see there's a return true and return false, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the interesting thing about JavaScript is I can't hide it from you. I mean, the JavaScript runs in the browser. And so, you know, deep in the request response cycle, this is out here in your browser. No server actions going on at all right now. And so, um, you know, I, I can't hide it from you. So I even show you all this. I give you all this code somewhere in here. Yeah, here, JavaScript validation. So I mean, I might as well tell it to you because I'm going to show it to you. If you're smart enough to do view source, you can figure it out. So what happens is, is when I type this stuff, so I type this with no at sign and I'm hit login, JavaScript is going to run. And now what's going on is this alert invalid email address has popped up. If I blank them all out and I hit it, the JavaScript will stop and say both fields must be filled out. Now, if I get it right, so let's just put in like, the wrong stuff. That's going to be a server side check. <laughs> no, that was a client side check. Service. Now it's a server side check. That's a server side check with a redirect, with a flash message, the whole thing, right? And so if I take a look at login.php, um, you know, this looks a lot like the login.php you've been doing all along. You know, this is a, a, a redirect. And then here is the do validate. And then there's the script code. So I, I put that all together in the login. That's very similar to the login that you've been working in uh, before. Okay, so let's log in successfully. UMSI. That's really the JavaScript here. Um, PHP 123. Login. Add a new entry. There's no, no JavaScript in these, although soon we will, in the next assignment, we'll be going crazy in these add things. This will, we'll be changing the add and edit more in the next few assignments. Let's do a valid thing. There you go. Yeah. And th this is just crud, right? We're just, we're just going into like the profile table and got first name, last name, email summary. It's a little different than the previous one that you did, but not, not that difficult to do. Um, and so there's no real JavaScript here. You just got to make the edit work. You got to do things like, you know, be able to put nasty characters in and do validation, you know, drop, drop table, students, right? So you got to be able to put evil characters in and um, not have anything go bad. Either, of course, SQL injection is not going to happen because we're using PDO but also not HTML injection either. And of course, if we take a look at this, we just see, oh, that's what's in there, okay? And and then uh, and then away we go with that. And so that's pretty, uh, and then the delete just has a verification. Don't always make sure your HTML entities on this stuff as well. And there you go. And then you log out. So now I wanna log back in and show you a little bit about how the foreign key works. So let me <clears throat> get logged back in. Log in. Okay, so let me start by showing you something about login. And it's in it's it's in the assignment. So it basically says when you're logging in, you're supposed to um, put you set up the session. We've been doing this before where you put user ID in into the session. So if we're in the login, right, we have the user ID, we do a select for user ID. And what user ID, of course, is, is the primary key of the user record. So in this case, it's one for this one that I just inserted, right? And so the idea is, is that you're going to take this, pull that out of the database, and then we're going to store it into the session. We're storing the user ID, which is the number, the primary key of the current user, and we're going to use that later, okay? And then we redirect back to index.php. So now we are logged in, and we're at add new entry, and so this and add new entry, of course, we're using these pieces of information to tell whether or not we're allowing the add to happen. We've been protecting these this way for a while. And basically, if there is no user ID in the session, that die with access denied. Okay? So now, let's go ahead and add the entry. Now, 
part of what it says is when you add this, you need to have a foreign key. So let's, let's go back to the foreign key. The foreign key is the pointer in the profile that goes to user ID. So this is the profile ID is the primary key in this table. User ID is the foreign key in this table. And so you're supposed to, when you're adding a record, there are no records currently in, you're supposed to set this user ID to the current logged in user. The current logged in user's primary key is sitting in session because you put it in session in the login code. So, and I give you this, I give you most of it in the handout, right? So the user ID, which is going to be inserted in the user ID with a little placeholder UID, and then that's going to pull it out of the session. So that is creating a new record in profile that has a foreign key into the user table that has the user ID. Okay. Um, and so let's let's that's pretty much it, right? So here's that code. Here's this code in here, right? We're going to do the insert and we're going to pull this number out. And so I'm logged in as user number one. And so now when I run this thing successfully, I'm going to do an add and it's going to run that insert. But if I go look in my table right now, in the profile table, you see that there's that foreign key. And because we told MySQL that that's a foreign key, it actually is a hyperlink, then we can jump into the user table to find the corresponding record in the user table. Okay, And so that you have to do. And in an upcoming assignments, you're going to have to be creating these uh, foreign key links. Uh, the next assignment is going to be a many, uh, many to one relationship and the last assignment is going to be a many to many relationship. And so that's an important part of, of uh, this assignment. Um, and so I, I hope that you pretty much, I think I covered most everything I wanted to cover. Um, good luck in this assignment and I just want to emphasize that do this one really well. Take your time, understand every line of code. I know I say that in every assignment. That's because it, that's the only way we can build to increasingly difficult assignments. Okay, thanks for listening. The whole purpose of JavaScript is to mess with the browser's document object model. So JavaScript was built to run in the browser. It was built to manipulate the text that is the page. So the document model is like this thing that we can make changes to, and then the browser is rendering whatever is in the document object model. And so it, it manipulates the HTML document, and it is a object-oriented syntax where we say document dot this dot this dot this dot this that we can hierarchically go and we can find all kinds of things. But the problem is, is the document object models Weren't, aren't universal. It's universal that there is a document object model, and if you know the structure of the document object model for a particular browser, the syntax to get to a piece of a page is well understood. And so we can read and write this thing. And so it's, you know, document.head.title.something or document.body.h1. And so there's this hierarchical structure that represents the page. But unfortunately, the shape of this, the shape of this picture is different for different browsers. So not all the browsers represent their page exactly the same. The exact same HTML would produce a different document object model in different browsers. So you have to test your code over and over and over on each browser. If you are doing that you're actually sort of just going straight down the document object model to find a form or a header one or something that's in there. And so you end up with these bugs. This is just a bug in Sakai, an open source project I work on. And all of a sudden you're just always seeing these Internet Explorer bugs because, you know, if you're going deep into the code and using the document object model and you test it on Firefox and test it on Chrome and you don't test it on IE, then it blows up and you get all these ugly bugs. And so using the document object model directly is generally kind of tacky, right? It's just, just life's too short to deal with the vagaries of the difference between document object models. So the first thing that they added to JavaScript to make life a little simpler was a method called getElementById. And that allows you to mark a particular piece of the DOM with an ID tag, and that's why there can only be one ID tag anywhere in it. And then you can say, 
don't, I'm not going to look down hierarchically to find this thing. Just go find the thing that has an ID of Fred and give me back that thing and let me manipulate that thing. So it's a way to, in effect, very simply query the document object model and find something by an ID tag. And so here's an example. So here is a string chuck. It's wrapped in a span tag and the span has an ID of person. Okay. And so here in my JavaScript, I say document, everything starts with document, get element by ID, and then I give the, the ID that I'm looking for. And then that basically looks through the whole page, looks through the whole page, and it finds the thing that has the ID of person. And then, let me clear this. Then this little expression right here is this tag. So you basically have got yourself a handle. ST is the variable, this ST variable. That ST variable is a handle to that little part, okay? And then you can do things. And we can do stuff to the outer part, the tag, and everything. But if we just want this HTML, we have to say, give me the inner HTML. So I say dot inner HTML, and that dives into the tag and pulls out the actual HTML text. That's the child of that tag. And I can print that out, and I can also change it, right? I can also change it. So I can put it on the document, get element ID person dot inner HTML equals Joseph. Well, that is an assignment statement that's going to overwrite this part of the document object model and change it. And I have a couple log statements. So let's play with this particular one right here. This is JS12. Okay, so if we recall, it goes in, it finds the ID tag of person, then it prints out, um, let's, let's switch to console, I can't, oh wait, 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 that's, let me switch to console here. <laughs> I mean, once the alert's up, I can't switch, right, because the alert has taken over the whole browser. So I'm going to switch to console so I can watch it in console, and then I'm going to clear the console, and then I'm going to press refresh so that I can sort of watch it all happen in the console. Okay, <clears throat> so it looked up the span with ID equals person, pulled out the inner HTML, it both logged it in console.log, and it did it in an alert box. Okay, <clears throat> now this browser is frozen. This browser is frozen because the alert box is up, and it's not going to do anything until we press OK. So I'll press OK, which means the JavaScript is going to start back up again. If you recall what it does, it first puts out a log that shows what kind of a thing that object is, that ST object, and then it changed it to Joseph. And you'll notice that it changed it to Joseph. Literally, my JavaScript code changed the document object model, and the browser is always rendering whatever's in the document object model. So my JavaScript Change the document object model. The browser's just poof, rendered it. So I'll do this in faster motion. So the original HTML had Chuck. We look that thing up. As soon as I hit this OK, it's going to change it to Joseph, and it just changes to Joseph. Okay? So if I didn't have the alert, it would happen instantaneously. It would happen so fast you wouldn't see it. And I can use console.log to kind of keep track of stuff, right? And so you can sort of work through this thing and see all the stuff that's happening. I, I, I make it go in slow motion by putting this alert in. I could also use the debugger and a breakpoint if I wanted to uh, to see that. But I just want to stop it. So it's this is looking it up, pulling stuff out, and logging it. And then it alerts to stop it mostly. And then it changes it and continues on. So here's another one that basically is sort of combining an on click. And so what we're go what's going on here is I have two links. Well, it's probably easier just for me to show you how this works. This is JS13. Oh. This is JS13. Okay. So if I look, the word stuff is in here. Oops. So I have a span, 
ID equals stuff. And I have an on click, the word back and forth, right? So I do a document get element ID stuff, inner HTML equals the string back. If I click on that, then I return false. Remember, you got to return false. And then if you click on fourth, it's going to change that text to be fourth. So what I'm doing is I'm overwriting this stuff, right? I'm, I'm grabbing it, and I want to take, I'm going to change it to back, then I'm going to change it to fourth. I'm going to change it to back, and then I'm going to change it to fourth. And this is all done on these clicks. But it starts out coming from the server with stuff there, right? Because that's what's in there in the first place. Then I click on this href, this href, and it changes the DOM to be back. And I click on this href, and it changes it to be fourth. Okay. This won't be very exciting. I click on back. It looks it up in the on click. It looks it up and then changes the word back. Oh, sorry. There we go. Click on back. I click on fourth. I actually don't have any JavaScript to reset it back to stuff unless, of course, I hit refresh and then it pulls another copy from the server and it's its original form. These are just going back and forth and changing it. Okay? Ah, fascinating. Hit the back and forth. Fascinating. Okay? And so that's basically causing things to happen as response to clicks. The, the previous example, we just sort of had straight line code that ran. Now we're going to see stuff that happens by clicks. Now, um, in an upcoming chapter slash lecture, we will talk about jQuery. And uh, this get element ID is sort of old school. Uh, jQuery is a library that was designed originally to uh, greatly reduce the confusion uh, between browsers. And we tend to use jQuery a lot. Uh, lots of people just sort of assume jQuery now. But it is a library, and we will cover that in the future. But I want you to also see, before we do jQuery, I want you to see how we did it before jQuery existed. Because you will see that kind of code, the get element by ID code. We tend not to do too much without jQuery, but the, sometimes you don't want that library and you want to do a real simple thing, so you kind of fall back to this code. Everything I've shown you so far does not require any libraries. Once you have jQuery, your JavaScript can be a lot simpler and more elegant. Okay? So thanks. See you in the next lecture. So I want to continue our discussion of uh, jQuery and JSON and just do a small modification to our, our CRUD application, our Create, Read, Update, and Delete application. And you can grab the code from php intro slash code slash json03 uh, crud.zip. Um, and you have to, this one needs a, a little database connection and there's some instructions that uh, get your database set up. So what this is, is this is our standard CRUD application. So here's our, here's our CRUD application. If you recall, you can add something, um, I don't know, um, Greece, 10, 10. And so we can uh, delete things. And remember all these, it's our CRUD application. But I've done something different in this CRUD application. I've actually used uh, JSON to uh, give us the list of in this add and so it's sort of like a hybrid thing um, So we have JSON that we can look at and so there's this I've, what I've done is uh, Let me let me take a quick look at the code that the way it, it used to work So um, Let me edit the way it worked before just to sort of review how it works. So we've got our our code here, we got our little flash messages, we create a table, we start the table body, we do a query, then we write a loop that goes through all the rows, and then we print all the stuff out, right? The rating, the plays, all those things. We, we make up a little edit.php for the edit button in each of the rows, and away we go. And that's how we did it the first time. We're going to do this a little bit differently. We're going to, in this one, we're going to do it in two steps. So we are going to do this in uh, JavaScript with jQuery and pull the list of the tracks using JSON. So I need to have an HTML entities inside of 
of um, JavaScript because I, I don't want to have HTML injection. Um, and so I make a function that does that. I have standard, these are just flash messages so I can see if ad worked or not. And then I do this interesting thing where I make a table, right? I have a table with a border of one, I have a table body, and I give it an ID, okay? So I've got a table body where that's nothing. It's, it's totally empty. And then after that, I go and I lapse into JavaScript, okay? And then what I do is I call $getJSON, just like I did in the chat list. And I call getJSON.php, and I, I have a function that is called when that JSON is successful and parsed. Okay, so getJSON.php, and um, I set a variable found. Now data itself is going to be a list, and that's because... That's what it does. It makes an array of the rows, and then it JSON encodes the exact rows, and then prints, gives them to me in JSON. So it is a list. It has a length. It's, it's a full-fledged JavaScript object at this moment. So I loop through, and I pull out the row, and the row has key value pairs. So let's take a look at what the row looks like. If I... Um, Go here and I say get json.php. So this is what the JSON is going to look like. This is JSON, it's a list, and title plays rating ID. That is the data coming straight from my database. And if I take a look at the code, all I did was did a fetch and I created an array of rows. Now each row is an array, so this is like an array of arrays, and that's why it looks like this. Actually, it's an array of objects because they're key value pairs, sorry. So row is an associative array. Rows is a linear array. Row is an associative array. So this is a linear array of associative arrays, which in JavaScript becomes a linear list of JavaScript objects. And key, that's the column from the table, column from the table, key value pair, key value pair, key value pair. So get JSON, again, just reads all these things, select title, plays, rating, and ID from tracks, and then loops through that result set, and then encodes it at the very, very end. I probably should put a, a, a header here to uh, indicate that it's a uh, application JSON to be cleaner, but we get away with it. Um, <clears throat> and, so, and so I have this is each of these items, in this case, there's going to be two of them, right? Two of those items. Each of these items, I'm going to log it. And then what I do is I go with jQuery and I grab my tab. Now, my tab is this table body. And I'm going to append some HTML to the end of it. And it's this big, long string. It's a table row, table identity, uh, HTML entities of the entity title. This looks a lot like the old PHP that I had. Except now I'm doing this, so let's take a look at the index.old, right? So I was doing all these echoes of the data. This was doing it all in PHP, but now the PHP has sent JSON to the, to the, to the JavaScript, and now I'm doing the exact same thing in JavaScript. And so I end the table and start a new one, a table, the TD, and I put out the plays and the rating, and then I create the href for the edit tag, and I take the ID, right? The ID is this guy right here. It's one, right? It, it gives me that number, and I can put that in. And I create a delete. And so this basically creates the table rows, right? So if I hit index.php, if I do a view source here, if I do a view source, you will notice the table doesn't have anything in it. And that's because the JavaScript is actually what put that code in. I put those table, these things came from JavaScript. These lines in the table came from JavaScript. Okay? And so this is, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not that super amazing. I mean, if, 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 uh, if, there's, if it goes through this loop and it doesn't find any data, then it, it just says uh, no entries are found. Um, but basically, this is a simple example of 
how you take a database query and you take the results of that database query and then you just send it back as a bunch of JSON and then you parse the results. Now, you could debate what's the best way to do it. Is this the better way to do it? It's a little more complex than this way, um, but these kind of techniques allow you to dynamically update. So, for example, you might have a, a table and then you might have it so that new entries just are added at the bottom automatically, which is kind of more like our chat application. And so it's really up to you to decide what combination of sort of server-side rendering like this. This is server-side rendering because it just comes back with a table fully formed in the request response cycle. If I change this to uh, index old.php, if I go to index old.php, all the rendering is going to be done on the server side. And if I do a view source of that, you will see that my table is fully formed, right? That was all rendered inside PHP as it came back in the response to the HTTP response. Whereas in this one, when I look at the view source, my table appears to be empty, but then this JavaScript code filled it up. And so it, I'm not trying to tell you that one of these techniques is better than the other. I'm just sort of showing you that this is a technique that is used on some websites where they would prefer to, in a sense, give you a relatively empty web page and in the background, fill it in piece by piece. And that's why you see a lot of the spinning things and things go pop, 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 because they're using this technique to sort of do all the rendering in the browser, pulling data through JSON for the various pieces of the screen. And it's sort of a six of one, half a dozen on the other, and different designs will prefer uh, different approaches, okay? So that's sort of our, our exploration of doing a CRUD-like application, uh, but adding some JSON capabilities to it. In general, object-oriented programming is an abstract concept in that uh, across many languages, it functions pretty much the same. We have this notion of a class, which is a, a template which says these are the kind of variables and methods. And, uh, um, and then we have instances where we make many of these things. And so um, these are the definitions from the previous lecture where I talked about PHP classes. Um, so again, it's the, it has attributes, fields, properties, and then methods. Sometimes we, some OO patterns would call methods messages. Um, and then it's a template, just like a cookie cutter. And uh, instance is when we take that template, say, I'd like to make one of these things, so it makes one. And if we're going to make bunches of them, we would make many different instances. And we use the word object and instance often very interchangeably. Method is code, and then there's data as well as code. And so the concepts, we use the word class and Things like that are very similar, but there is some differences in JavaScript object-oriented approaches. Um, function itself, function itself is in effect an executable statement. It itself is a function and it creates the function, but it also returns a value. Okay, hard to explain this. It, it, when you have function, it makes the function and then returns it. You can either name it or have what's called anonymous functions. And so this concept is called first class functions. And it really, there's lots of aspects to it, but if you can basically take a function and stick it in a variable, then you have first class functions, okay? And there's, there's some more subtle details to that. So it's probably just as easy to just show you how this works. So here is a very simple class. So we don't use the word class. We have this function, and I'll, it'll be called party animal. It currently takes no parameters, and it has a beginning and an end, and it executes. So unlike the PHP that we saw, which has an const explicit constructor, this turns out to be the constructor itself. This code here is the constructor itself. So when we say, I would like a new party animal, it actually runs this code, all of it, all the way down, and then the function that comes back is returned and put in the variable an, okay? 
So function makes a new function, basically. It, in effect, clones the code. And it runs this. Now, all functions need a way, all object-oriented classes and objects need a way to reference themselves. And the this in JavaScript is the way we do that. So this means this instance, the instance that we're dealing with. And we make a member variable just by saying this.x equals zero. That is, create a variable called x and set it to zero in the current object that we're creating. And this next bit is the, is the tricky part and the cool part, both tricky and cool. We're going to say this.party, which is a member variable, is an anonymous function. So you see this function, but with no name, that's an anonymous function. Currently takes no parameters. And then this is the code. We can look at this.x equals this.x plus one. That's this same variable and put out a console log message. And so when it's all said and done, this ends up with a uh, method named party and a member variable named x. Okay. And so we run through this code, which creates everything. It's kind of the constructor code of constructing and setting the variable to zero and then creating the method. Okay. And then we get the object back, the instance back called an. And we can say an.party, which runs this code once over and over and over again. Okay. Oops, let me clear some of this. So it runs the code and it runs that over and over again. And so that member variable gets incremented. And so the output of this will be so far one, so far two, so far three. And that's because this, this x variable is getting incremented as the code is running. Okay, so that's the key, right? This an variable has a x bit of data in it and a, a method named party. And we define it in the constructor, basically. We both, both those things are defined in the constructor. Okay? So the constructor is a little bit different, right? In an object lifecycle, we make objects, we destroy them, we run the constructor code when we start it. JavaScript doesn't have the concept of destructors, but if we go back to the PHP object-oriented, destructors in most object-oriented environments are seldom used. Okay, so we can think of this bit of code is in the constructor, and so at the moment we're running the new, it actually is running the constructor code, and so out comes that log message. Now, again, part of the whole idea is to create the class, which in this case is a sort of function with a special, a special capability, and then we're going to make, make many instances. So here we have uh, a couple of examples where we are going to pass in a parameter to this function, which is going to come from the constructor. So we're saying make a new party animal, and then this Sally is passed in to be Nam. And so we then end up with, you know, this.x equals zero, just like before. This.name, a member variable name, set to be whatever that is. In this case, it'll be Sally. And then console log, we've built the Sally object. And then we're going to create a member function, uh, <coughs> a method. This.party is a function that adds one to the x member variable and then prints it out. So we create s, the variable s creates a new party animal with a parameter Sally. So it runs through this, builds the object, and then effectively implicitly returns the object, and that gets stuck into S. And then we call the party method within that, and that says both what the, the name of this function is and what the current value for this is. Then what we do is we run down to here. We call it again with Jim this time sets all this stuff up, sets the x member variable, name member variable, console logs, gem, creates the party method, and then returns, and it ends up in the variable j, and then we call j.party, and that comes through, and it's going to say gem, and then gem's x value is 1, because we started at 0, added 1 to it, and now we have this other member variable, I mean, other instance, still in S, 
We can call that, and that still holds inside of S the name of Sally, and we add one to X, and so it is now two. Okay, so this is two instances of the same class. So this is the template. These are the instance, uh, instances of the class. So if you run through this, right, and the code basically comes through here. I mean, it just sort of defines the class at this point as JavaScript's interpreting through here. It's defined the class as to what's going to happen. Now, the code doesn't actually execute. It's just remembered at this point. And now when we're going to make a new party animal, it passes the Sally in, right? And then it starts running this code. And it creates basically an instance. This dot x is zero. This dot nam equals Sally. This dot name equals Sally. And then we're going to have there's a party method as well. And so that's all running. And then it returns and puts that into s. And so now we have this variable s. It has zero and Sally. And then we call S party. All right, so we finish this. X is zero, Sally. And then we call S party. Well, it goes and looks at this, which is currently S, right? Because we're going S dot party. This is this dot X equals this dot X plus one. So this becomes one. Then it runs through console log out Sally one, because this is now one. Then we come down to here. And we make another one. And we make another one, and it comes in this time, and its x is set to zero, and the name is set to Jim. And then it comes through, and it comes back, and it has a party method, and then that stores in the variable j. So here's j. Then we call j.party, and that goes and runs this code, except in with this instance. So this particular one is now incremented to one, and then it prints out Jim equals one. Then we go back to s dot party. Well, that means that this is s, and it runs this code, and it adds one again, so that becomes two, and then it prints out Sally two, and then we're done. Okay. So this is two instances, instance, instance. Okay. So again. The constructor in JavaScript is effectively the function itself. It's sort of implicit in the class. Hello, and welcome to our lecture on jQuery, APIs, and JSON. We're going to roll a whole bunch of stuff into this lecture. Um, I'm not going to talk long time, but a long time about each thing. Uh, so some some of the things you may have to look at twice because it's kind of compressed, and you don't want to don't want to miss anything because they build from kind of tiny to big really fast. So, we talked about JavaScript, we talked about the document object model and how they're very incompatible in terms of their shapes. And so there was a bunch of libraries that came out and, uh, you know, we had this thing like get ID, uh, get, get element by ID that, that I kind of characterized as old school JavaScript. It was the old way we did portable stuff. But um, jQuery is the thing that really has solved the mess that is the browser incompatibility. Now it turns out that there was lots and lots of libraries that were being developed at the same time that were trying to become like the the low-level utilities for JavaScript and jQuery was the one that kinda won in this in this space. And the reason in, uh, that uh, many people think that it won is because it had the best documentation and it still has outstanding documentation. There's a lot of JavaScript libraries that were there and the people who wrote them could use them, but jQuery was this thing that like anybody could use. It was well enough documented and the pattern to the point where I'm not going to put a lot of jQuery slides in is that they, they also show you just little snippets of code that you cut and paste and then adapt and make work. And so in general, if you need a way to you know animate the opening of a window with jQuery, you go into Google and you type animate the opening of a window with jQuery and you will find often on the jQuery site, a little five-line snippet of code that'll give you the starting point and then you'll adapt. So, so I'm not going to talk too much about that. So this is sort of some very simple jQuery. So what we do here is we are going to, in our head document, sometimes folks prefer to put this down near the end of the body, but um, I'll just 
sort of use the style of putting in the head, and you go download a version of the jQuery library, and we're going to pull this library in. And what it does is it jacks itself into lots of the doc, doc, document object model, and then makes it so that this variable dollar sign, dollar sign ends up being a function name. jQuery takes over. They just picked it. Now you can actually tell jQuery to pick a different one, but dollar sign is the one that jQuery uh, kind of picked. And so uh, dollar sign is a function call, and document is a parameter to that function. And it returns an object, a JavaScript object, that has um, many methods. Dot ready is one of those methods. So that the jQuery syntax takes a little getting used to because this is like a function call, and then this is a method within that function that happens to be a function call that goes all the way to here. And so we tend to connect these things together, and we're also seeing the use in here of first-class functions. So the, the parameter, the first parameter to the jQuery-ready method is this function. It's actually code. Now, at a high level, what we're saying here is we are saying when the document is ready, when it's fully loaded and all the images have loaded, at that moment, please run some of our code. And we wrote this, this code. And we have a function, it's got two lines in it, one's an alert, and one says, in the console log, it says, hello jQuery. And this is really common, because often what you want to do is, after the page is loaded, you want to sort of jack in various places and add interactive elements to pieces of the page uh, using jQuery, and then having jQuery respond to the, the interactive things in that page. And we'll build stuff that looks like that. So let's go ahead and uh, run this. By the way, um, you can download the code here for this set of examples on uh, phpintro.com slash code uh, jQuery uh, zip. I've got that all downloaded. Um, and uh, jQuery 01. Oops. Sorry, I've got to clear that so I can click. jQuery 01. And uh, hello.php. That was the code I just showed you. Uh, let me turn on Developer Console while I'm doing this. So I got the Developer Console. Uh, I'm going I'm to watch the console. And I'm going to say hello.php. So what happens is this page will load. It'll run the JavaScript. It loads the jQuery library. Let's start with the network look view of this. I'll hit this page, hello.php. And you'll see that my PHP request response happened. And then in that, it said, oh, go load some more JavaScript. And then in that JavaScript, it executed JavaScript and said, when the document is finished loading, call my function. And in that function, it called an alert. That's my alert. So this function happens at the end of page loading. Turns out this is important because it takes a while for the browser to get the page all put together. And if you're going to write JavaScript, it's going to start looking at pieces of the pages. It's useful. So the first thing you kind of learn in jQuery is how to trigger things that happen after the page is loaded, and that's what this ready method does. And if I look at the console, you see that there's a console message as well. And if I hit refresh, I'll clear this, and I hit refresh, you will see, you know, out comes the alert, and the alert happens first, but we know that the page is finished loading, and then the console message comes out. So that's how it was in the code. It did an alert, console, but this is basically saying wait until all the document is loaded. So it goes all that and it loads all the, the subsidiary pieces, et cetera, et cetera. So document ready is very, very, very intelligent. So again, we use this to jack in, and we'll see some things here. So another thing we can do, for example, is jack in to the, I keep saying jack in, it's like register an event is what really is going on. And the dollar sign here is a function. Uh, it has a parameter of window, which returns an object, so the function dollar pass in window get back jQuery object has a method of dot resize. And what we're saying here is we would like to register a resize event and we would like this code right here, this code right here from here to here to be called whenever the screen is resized, whenever the window is resized. The window is the part of the browser that's on the screen. Okay. And <clears throat> so at while the page is loading, we're saying, connect us up so that as resizes happen, our code is called. And there's lots and lots of things like that. So let's take a look at that one. 
Oh, sorry, got to turn that back. So the resize runs, and at this point, we have just registered a bit of code that we want to run on the resize event. Okay, now the way resize happens, got to move this little guy. I should have resized that all along. Okay, so this the resize event is as I move this window and make it smaller and larger, and you can see my code is being called over and over and over. Let me let me just clear this, and now when I resize this, my code is being called because I told jQuery, please call me every time the screen resizes. Sometimes it does it while you're dragging on the resize, and sometimes it does it when you let go of the resize, but it, eventually my code will be informed that the page has been resized. And so I do. I did that with this window.resize function that says, hey jQuery, call me, register this bit of code to be called when the resize happens. When the window's resized, call me. Now I wouldn't normally just print this stuff out. I might do something like resize something or show or hide something. Who knows what I want to do in this code. It just shows another pattern of jacking into a different event than the dot ready, which is the ready event, which is called when the page is fully loaded. Okay. Here is another bit of jQuery, and this is a, a pattern called the query do. And um, so we're going to, I'm going to have this code toggle.php. And uh, I've got a paragraph. The paragraph goes from here to here. And I've got this spinner inside the paragraph. And I've got it set up to be hidden when the page first shows up. But I've got an ID tag on the paragraph and an ID tag on the spinner. And so then what I do is I make an A tag so that when I hit the toggle, it runs this JavaScript. And this JavaScript is jQuery. It's a dollar. And now I pass in a string, string which is pound sign spinner, and that means ID tag name spinner. Go find an, the ID tag name spinner, returns an object, and then I call the toggle method in that ID. So that flips the display none off and on. So I can click this toggle button, we'll see me do this in a second, as many times as I like, and then that will hide and show the spinner. Later we'll hide and show the spinner for a more useful purpose. Here's another one. Here is dollar, dollar, Go find, I have another little tag called red, which says go find the paragraph tag, which is this whole tag right here, and call the method CSS and change the background color to red of the paragraph. And when I click on green, it says go find the paragraph, change, use, call the CSS method, change the background color to green. And so these are queries that look up a piece. So this is like a query. Dollar para says grab the tag with an idea pair. So that's what that does. It's a lookup, and then you call a method on the tag, basically. You get back a jQuery object, which represents the tag. Okay, so let's play with this code. Let's play with this code. <clears throat> so if I say toggle, well, if you do a view source, let me just do a view source here. If you do view source, you see my paragraph from here to here. You see my spinner, which has an ID of spinner, and it's currently not shown because display is none. So when I sit, hit toggle, it's going to say, go find that, that, was that a span? No, it's just an image tag, but it's okay. The image tag is hidden, so it's as if it's not there. When I say toggle, go find that image tag with an ID of spinner, and toggle its visibility on off. So I just toggle it on and I can toggle it off. Toggle it on. I'm not changing the HTML at this point. I'm changing the CSS associated with the tag and specifically this display value, the CSS. And if you recall, I've got this, you know, when I click red, I'm going to go grab the paragraph, which is all of this actually. And I'm going to set its background color to red or green, toggling back and forth. Red, green, red, green red, green. So none of this is a request response cycle and none of this is really changing the 
document object model, we will do other things that will actually add to add tags and remove tags. But for now, I'm just changing the CSS on tags using jQuery commands. And again, I'm just giving you the simplest of stuff. There are literally, you know, many, many things you can call here. You toggle and CSS are just two of many things that you can do. You can animate, you can do this, you can set transparency. Who knows what you can do? Got to go look at the jQuery documentation. This is the notion of grabbing a bit of the HTML DOM and doing something to it. Query do syntax in jQuery. And the rest of it, just go look at the jQuery documentation. There's tons of it. Okay, so now I want to switch to um, this, this code that's going to do a post. And it's probably easier for me to start with this by showing you um, how the code works. So let me go back. Oops, gotta turn that off, turn that off. I gotta go back. So I'm gonna do, um, I won't click auto echo, I'll do auto post. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna make it so there's no submit value here. Let me, let me click on network. Let me clear the screen. I'm going to be able to change this text and when I move out of this field, it's gonna trigger a post. Not, normally I would have to hit a submit button, but this is a, and, and you see this all the time where things dynamically update, you just go change them, some new stuff, and then it's updated and away we go, okay? And so, You'll also notice that I show a spinner. This, it, I have to navigate away and click elsewhere, but then it detects that the text has changed. It sends it, turns a spinner on, and then it takes a while for the thing to come back. Now, I've got this little code so that it takes a bit of time before it comes back, and so you actually see the, the spinner, right? So spinner, send it, receive the result, turn off the spinner. Okay, so let's take a look at how this code works. Okay, let's take a look at how the code works, how it achieves it. Okay, so this little auto echo guy, auto echo simply takes um, the post data and echoes it, and it sleeps for a second, just so we can see the spinner. Okay, so then I have a form in the main thing. So auto echo is its own little guy. And then the auto post is a form and it has input type equals text with a name equals one um, and the value is hello there. So that's the default value. And then I have an ID of spinner, an image tag with an ID of spinner that's hidden. So it's hidden by default. It's there in the HTML when that comes out. It's there in the HTML when it comes out. Okay. So, so then what happens is in the JavaScript, oops, come back, come back, come back, come back. I have to show you this in the page. Um, I'll go through this twice so you'll actually see it. So, so in the JavaScript, what we're going to do is we're going to look up dollar pound sign target, and dollar pound sign target is this form. So what we're saying is go find that form and register a change. Whenever a change happens, call my function passing in the event. And this function goes from here to here. That's all the function code that is like, it's kind of like an on change, but we're basically saying, you know, go use jQuery to find this thing, find the thing with an ID of target, and then register a change event. And when the change event fires, change event fires, call my code. So if we kind of work through this code a little bit, the first thing it does is it prevents the default, which is, don't submit the form. Then we go using jQuery, go find the spinner and show it. So showing turns the display to on. Then we go grab the form, which is, the, that's the whole form tag. It's this whole thing right here, the whole form tag. And then we can actually query form.find, and that is a jQuery again. And this is a little thing that's a little tricky, but basically what it does is it grabs the value of the input tag with a form name of one. So 
go find the input tag with a name of one and then get me the value. So that string, that string is exactly this. Now, when we're running, that means it's changed. Somebody changed the text and the browser noticed it, jQuery noticed it and said, oh, this text has been changed, so I'm gonna call you. So your code's gonna run. So you'll notice that then we say sending post in the log and then we have another jQuery call. But this time we just call the post method right within jQuery and there's a couple of parameters. One is the URL to post to. We're not, we're not, this is coming from, uh, it's, it's, uh, we're in auto post.php. We're going to post to auto echo.php. And the next is a, is an, uh, an array or an object of key value pairs. And this val is a post key. And then text is the text that we pulled out of that form field. So we pulled it out of the form field. We're going to put it in a post and send it to auto echo.php. And then the third parameter, let me get this real clear. The, this is the first parameter is what to post to. This is the post data. And this, all the way down to here, is the function to call when the post returns. And when the post returns, it's going to call this function that we just built. And, actually, no, sorry. The function that's going to get called is this function right here. And when the data, so it's going to, in the background, it's going to post the data with val equals whatever that value is to echo.php. And then data is the response. So date, remember, it's a request response cycle. So we send post data in, we get a response back, and it's in this variable data at this point. So then I'm going to console log the data, and I'm going to take the result and result is this empty div. Now I'm, so it's an empty div just to place an, a currently empty space. Okay. And I am going to take the, re, I'm going to, the dollar quote result, uh, pound sign result says, look up a tag with an ID of result, then empty that tag, pull all the HTML out of it, and then append the thing I got back from the, uh, post response. Okay. And then I hide the spinner. And then there's one more thing. And that is then this dollar post returns an object and I call the error method on that object that says, if there is an error on my post, call my function and do a window console.log of error. And then return false is like the uh, suppression of the default behavior. Okay, so let me show you again in somewhat slow motion what's going on here. Let me clear this. Oh, sorry, gotta clear that first. So, so let me uh, cl clear the network and press refresh. Now I've got an HR. If you take a look at the view source on this one. I've got an HR before and after the result, and the result is this empty div. And so you see this right there. It's like there's nothing there. And that, and that is currently a div with nothing in it. And we see our form. We've got name equals one. That's going to be where our value comes from. And then we've got this hidden spinner. And so as this cruises by, we have to put this code after this, this code because Otherwise, dollar pound sign target will not find anything. So it, you can't put this script above it. This form target must exist. And we're registering saying, oh, go look up, go grab this thing. And anytime anything changes in that form, call our function. Here's the function that gets called. And, and the function that gets called just starts up in JavaScript. And the first thing it does is shows the spinner. Then it looks up the form, right? Then it extracts the value right there. 
then it logs the word sending post, then it actually sends a post to the URL autoecho.php with a post value of val, with a value that is in this text variable, variable text which we just retrieved right there, okay? And when the post comes back, we are going to log the data that is the response data. Data is the HTTP response from that post. We're going to log it. We're going to empty the result, which is this div. It's already, it starts out empty, but the second time and later, it'll actually have stuff in it. So we're going to empty it out, and then we're going to append the data that we got back from autoecho.php, and then we're going to hide the spinner. And if I take a quick look at... All auto echo does is sleeps for a second and prints out you sent and then post sub val. That's the post variable value, val. Okay, that's all auto echo does. Okay. So request response cycle, we got auto post, which is our HTML source. It loads jQuery because it's told to load jQuery in the head. And then it loads the spinner GIF, which is right there, but it's not shown. Okay, so then I make a change, hide there, Glenn, and then I move out and I click the button. It's going to show the spinner, look up, hello, Glenn. Let me go into console log. <laughs> it, it did it, so hang on. Hello, Sally. Okay. So I, as soon as I move out and click anywhere, I moved out and clicked it to show you the con show you the console, but now I'm seeing the console. So, uh, hello, Sally. I'm going to move out. It's going to show the spinner. It's going to do this in about a second. It's going to show the spinner. It's going to look up the string, hello there, Sally, by finding the form and then finding the input tag within the form and then extracting the input tag with, from the form. And then it's going to call a post to autoecho.php passing, hello, Sally, then I'm going to get the output. Oh, I did it. <laughs> okay, so this is the output. I'm, as soon as I move the cursor to show you something, then it does it. So it sent the post and came back, hello there, Sally. And if I look at the network, you can see autoecho.php and the, the, the request had form data of Hello there, Sally. I mean, URL, it's really val equals hello, hello there, Sally, right? Val equals hello there, Sally. Um, and then the response is just this text you sent, hello there, Sally. And that is the code from autoecho.php. That comes back in that little function. Right here, that function right there. Okay, that function right there is the response at that point. Okay, and that's why I can console log it, and I put it in the in the result. Then I hide the spinner, and if there was an error, so let me let me just trigger an error just for yucks. Okay, let's see if I can trigger an error. If I if I trigger if I edit autoecho.php and um, just call this like some bad function that's not going to work, hopefully that will blow me up, and then I will be able to see in the console. That little error guy working. So it'll trigger it as soon as I hit click outside. Yeah. Actually, no, it just returned it. So that error didn't trigger the right way. But here's an error that came back. And if you're doing stuff with uh, jQuery and um, these dollar posts, you, you got to be careful. And it's really good that I logged the stuff that I got back as soon as I got it. Because, oh, that's pretty, I just made a mistake in my autoecho.php. I better fix that. Now, I happen to show it on my screen too, but it's always good to throw console logs in there when you're doing something as tricky as this. So now I'll shut that back to sleep. And um, and it works. Okay? So that is a race through sort of jQuery. Um, jQuery itself is an infinitely rich set of things, the power that you can do. I'm not going to sort of explain it all to you because it's so well documented, okay? And so um, 
you know, this is just a start, but the concepts I put in this lecture are very important. So make sure you understand them all so that when you're reading jQuery documentation, you're always learning more. Okay. Welcome to Web Applications for Everybody. In this little video, we're going to talk a little bit about the code that it takes to build this assignment, the auto grader with profiles and positions. The focus of this, of course, is uh, jQuery. So here's the assignment. And it really, like most assignments, builds heavily on the previous assignment. So we're keeping where we have that. Hopefully that code works. It, if you're just trying to type it in from this lecture, you're not going to do so well. So go back and do it one piece at a time. That's how it's intended to be done. So um, <laughs> I keep saying that. So we're going to need another table. This one's going to be a, a, a position. Um, let's just walk through the code first. I'll come back to that. So I'm going to walk through it on my local uh, system. Actually, to, to walk through it on my local system, I'm going to have to make this table because I have a um, the profile and users table already from the previous and I'm going to say go. Okay, so now I've got all three of them. So I'm going to log in and if all goes well, um, umsimphp123, that of course is checking in the users table and checking, you know, with an SQL query, hashing the password and checking to see if the hash password matches. So log in. And so we're going to add a new entry. So this is the exactly the same. And the only real difference here is we can add multiple positions. So this is going to be a many to one relationship. The positions, there's a user depending on how you did it, you might end up with a many to one uh, profile to user, but right now it's kind of a one to one profiles and users. Um, and so, but then we're going to allow many positions. So there, what we've done is we're, we're using jQuery. We've got this little plus box and, and I can put my first position and then I can add another one. I can say 2001 and then I can add this whole thing. Oh, so put some of that in. And now if I take a look, you will see that I have two positions. And if you take a look in the database, what you will see is we have one user, we have one profile, and then we have two positions, two positions that are foreign keyed to the same profile. So this is the many part to the one part in the profile. So there's one profile and then there are many positions to that one profile. So continuing along, we got the view code that had to change. Um, notice that we keep sending this get parameter along because that's how we got to move things back and forth so we know which one it is. Um, the edit code's a little tricky, right? Now you're supposed to be able to do, right, make the normal changes. This is kind of like from the previous assignment. Uh, let's go ahead and start in this index code. Uh, here we are. So let's see, a couple of bits of information here. Let's make this a little bigger. Um, util. I, I've collected some common things that I want to do over and over into this util and put them into functions. We'll go through these uh, as I go through later. And I just pull it in very beginning. I kind of in, pull my PDO to get my database connection. Then I just define all these functions. It's kind of a perfect little thing where it's got no side effects. There's a less than question mark PHP. It's, you don't put a question mark, uh, oops, question mark like that at the end in case, because you don't want to put an extra space after that, or it will trigger the, you know, the output that says you can't do headers. So when you make library code like that, um, so the first thing I did is I got, I, 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 and I don't want to repeat myself. And so this is flash messages that we've been typing this over and over and over again. Well, for the rest of the semester, I am not going to type that anymore. So uh, some in we're not here. Every time I want to put those flash messages out after this H1, I'm going to put them out right there. And that's basically those eight lines of code. So we got logging in and logging out. And you'll notice that um, oh, this will show the profiles even when you're logged out. And so, uh, but if you're, if you're not logged in, so if there is no user ID in the session, no primary key of the user in the session, it's going to show you, please log in oh, right here, or it's going to show you, please log out. 
So then let's go ahead into the login. If we take a look at login.php, it's kind of similar to what we've been doing all along. Uh, let's see, you know, setting the session up. If it was a successful, we do the, we do the, the lookup. We did that on the last assignment. Um, do the do validate all that and that's really just from the same uh, the previous assignment so uh, there's not much in there that's different I do use uh, flash messages right I use flash messages in login so that's about all I need to show you in login uh, so let's go ahead and log in it's going to do the same I mean it's it just it it, it carries over um, carries over from the previous account PHP one two three log in okay so now let's take a look at the um oh let's look at one more thing here just just so you know because i got all this sort of bootstrappy stuff going on like we have and i got tired of typing that all over over and over again so i have this require once head.php and head.php head.php uh this doesn't it's not really php code this is really html code so i'm oops this is just HTML, and that's this. That's a set of links that get me into, um, get me get my Bootstrap and Java, Bootstrap JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that that I sort of grab from a uh, from a website to tell me how to do that. Let's get out of there. Okay, so let's go into the ad code because the ad code is uh, the interesting stuff. So this is again code that's very similar to the code that we did before, right? I mean, a lot of this is coming across. These these lines here, I'm bringing in util, of course, um, but these lines here, the exact same thing, the the model part of checking to see, this is a little bit different, and I'll, I'll show you that in a second. There's some more stuff. I'll get to that. And then, you know, flash messages, and then we have a form, and there's a few little things in here, but a lot of this is the same, and that's why it's really important that you do a good job on the previous assignment before you dig into this assignment, okay? So let's uh, follow a few things through. So I've changed some of this code. Let's take a look here. So um, this part here is pretty similar, but this part here is different. So this is sort of the model code that's going to uh, execute if, uh, if there's some post data. Now, normally we would validate the data, but I've moved that into util.php because I have to do it both in the add and the edit. And so here we are in the utility code in util.php. So I'm doing the kinds of things that I'm supposed to do. Remember dollar $post is a super global, so it passes uh, seamlessly between main code and utility code. So I'm checking to see if the lengths of the fields, just like we always do, um, and I return a string. And if something's wrong with the email, I return a string, but if everything's fine, I return true. This notion of returning a string or a, a, a something else I'm, I'm changing both the type and the value that I'm returning. And, and in a language like PHP that handles this sort of mixed typing, uh, we can do that. And so if we take a look here in add.php, I get back message. I don't know if that's a true or if it's a string, but if it is a string, I know that I've got an error and that the message contains the error. So I'm kind of sending two pieces of information back in one variable uh, using sort of the pattern of mixed. If something's wrong, I just redirect back to add.php. And again, my, by taking the code that would normally be here and moving it into util.php, I can save myself um, effort. Now here's validating the position. I'll show you that later. Um, here is one new thing, getting the insert ID, because when we're putting in the positions, we're gonna connect them to profiles. We need to get the key, the primary key. I've mentioned this before, that, oh, it'll be easy in PHP because you'll get to see the primary key. Well, this is the call to say, hey, you just did an insert. Tell me what key that you gave to that. So that's pretty cool, okay? This next bit I'll show as we're doing it. Then walking through the code, we basically see, you know, normal stuff, last meshes of the form, pretty much the same. And then there is this bit here, which is the plus sign, right? Here's the plus sign, hang on, it's, it's this plus sign right here that makes it so that you can do, do the add. And, and we're going to do something to that in JavaScript using jQuery in a second. Oh, I want to inspect it. So it's just sitting there in the, at some point. And then jQuery is going to attach something to it. I'll show you that in a second. And again, like JavaScript to jQuery, I have a little div. This little div 
lives carefully, carefully between, this div is empty, and it lives between the plus and the add and the cancel, right? The plus and the add and the cancel. And then this is the add and the cancel, and then that's the end of the form. So we're going to have sort of a little code that runs at the beginning. That's what this is. And um, just I'll print a message. So dollar pound sign add pose. That looks up this. It says go find the element that has add pose as its ID. And dot click says let's register an event, meaning when we click on the plus, when we click on the plus, click, I'm not going to do it right now, call this code. So what we're, it's kind of a, it's kind of inception here where we're having a thing that call is called when jQuery declares that the document is completely loaded. And then what we're going to do is add an event. So this is the code that runs every time I have a plus. Now let's take a look at what happens here when I add the plus. So let's even come down here and look at position fields. So what's going to happen is this plus is going to add HTML to this div. And I'll show you how it works. So now all of a sudden, there is actually stuff inside here. There's stuff in there. And it's all the document. The document model has been changed. That's what's going on here. So let's see how I change it. So this is the code that ran right from here to here is the code that runs when the click happens. I say event prevent default. That's kind of like returning false in old style JavaScript. We're going to have a global variable called, called count position. Remember, JavaScript is funky in that variables are global unless you use uh, you tell them otherwise. Yikes. But that's OK. I'm going to use that global variable to keep track of how many times this click has happened. And, and, and what that does is if you hit the plus too many times, plus, 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 it says, OK, you can only have nine of these things. I just made that. So let's get out of here and we get back in. So I'm hit plus again, so a thing's going to show up. So then I'm adding one, and that basically says I can't keep doing this forever. Because you'll see later, I depend on this going from uh, one to nine. OK. So I'm also showing in the con a nice little console log view developer console. I, I'm adding position one. See that? That console came out. Then what I do is I go grab that div position fields. That's that empty div. And then I'm going to append this bit right here. So at this point, this is just a big, long string concatenation. And so I'm going to put a div with an ID. And then string position is probably easier for you to see at this point with inspect element what I produced. Make this as tall as I can. Come on. So, so I have a div that is generated, right? I made this up, right? And inside there, there's position one. Now you'll see why I have to do that in a second. And then I have a paragraph. So there's a P tag and then the year. And I have an input type text and then year one. So what I'm doing is I'm putting more form fields in. So this is name year one, right? And this is a text area with desk one right here, count pose. So I've added one to count pose here, but I just am concatenating. These are just concatenation, just a big long string concatenation. Okay. Now the only bit right here that is kind of tricky is right there. Okay. We look at this. This is again jQuery. So I'm saying dollar go find position one. Well, that's a div I just made. Go find it and then remove it. Dot remove and then return false. And that's so that this doesn't actually submit it. So what happens is I've got a little on click event. I'm going to say minus. And it's going to just wipe this guy out. So watch the watch the DOM change when I hit the minus. Kachunk. Now it's gone. See? I can add it. And now if I look in position fields, it's back. It's two now because this count pause didn't go back down. So I've got position two, description two, and then I've got this little on click guy that's going to go wipe out the position two div. So that gets rid of that. So you see how I'm sort of constructed this. Form. I'm really extending the form at this point. So let me cancel and do another one. So then let me show you what happens when we submit the form. Okay. So when we submit the form, and then I'm going to say one, two, three, blah. I'm going to add another one. 
four, five, six. Blah. So let, let's inspect the element and take a look at what we got as a result of this. So I've got two of these things, two divs. I got a desk one and I got a year one. So I have a series of post values. When I hit add, when I hit add, boom, when I hit that add, it's going to send year one, desk one, whatever I've typed in. This is going to be the year two variable, and this is going to be the, the year one variable, desk one, year two, desk two. And I constructed that by carefully building this little bit of string. Okay, so then when I hit that post, so when I hit the post, it's going to go and send in not just the top fields, but however many of these fields, and they've been named very carefully. So I have to validate the profile. That's the top bit of fields, but then validate all the positions. And that is code in util.php. So let's take a look at that. So validate the positions. So here what we're doing is um, we're going through, because remember they're somewhere between year one and year nine. That's just a string, right? That's not an array, it's just a string. So what I'm doing is I'm checking to see all of the years from one to nine. If it's not set, I'm going to continue. And if the description is not there for this particular, I'm going to continue. And then I'm going to basically say, oh, I'm going to grab the year out, year one, year two, year three, year four, whichever one is there. And then I, if they're missing, then I'm going to complain about required. And if it's not a, if the year is not numeric, I'm going to say it's not numeric. Otherwise, I'll return true. So in the add.php, this is going to validate all of those entries up from one through nine. And I get an error message and I go back if there's a mistake. But let's assume that works. So it's coming down here. So now, because I'm down at this point right here, I know that I've got valid data in year. There might be no year data. There might be year one through nine might not exist, desk one. But if they do, they're valid. So I'm going to go through and loop through again. And now what I'm going to do is check to see if there is data. If there's not, I'm just skipping. If there is, I'm going to pull it out. I don't have to validate it here because I pre-validated it before. And then I'm going to insert into the position, which is the year I got, the description, and then rank. I just use rank as a way to put these in order. So they're order by, so they're the same order. So rank is going to be one for this one, two for that one. It's just a way to make sure that they show up in order. You can see this, the rank is just goes up one, two for each of the uh, profile. But then what I need to do is I need to set the foreign key, right? I need to set the foreign key to the profile that this position is associated. I'm inserting a position, it's going to be associated with a profile, and I just got done inserting the profile, profile ID. So that is the foreign key for the new position row pointing back to the profile. So let me go ahead and after all that fuss, press the add button. Hopefully I don't have any errors. So there we go. And it has two of these guys. So let's take a look at the edit code. I just talk, got done talking about add. Let's take a look at the edit code. Most of this is pretty cool. Now recall that when we're in the middle of an edit, you have to have a um, get parameter. So let's go through the first thing. We'll talk a little bit about this, but first I'm going to just make a mistake, okay? And I'm going to post it. So this is going to be posted. And so when I hit the post button, and I hit save, it says all fields are required. But the biggest mistake that you're going to find is that you need to add this on the redirect, right? So this edit.php because there was a post and then there was a redirect because of the header. So let's take a look at the validate profile. And so you'll see that what I'm doing is I'm in, in add, I didn't have to do this. Because add, you're not really, we just redirected back to add.php, right? Oops. In edit, we have to redirect, but we're still editing the profile, right? So we need that as a get parameter because we're going to use that later down here in the you know, we're going to use this to load up the positions and go to that stuff is in util, right? Load pause loads an array of positions for from a particular database connection for a particular profile ID. And so that's going to do that. And then we're going to loop through those things in our edit. 
And we did that to, <laughs> to create these things. We had to loop through and reconstruct all of the, you know, we had to reconstruct all of the, the HTML for these things. Position, submit, add pose, position fields. These things are all here now. These are, I had to reconstruct these. But in this case, they're not coming from JavaScript. They're coming from the database. Okay, so that's all down here. But it just know that you've got to, when you're redirecting with a get parameter, you want to make sure you put the get parameter on there. So the get parameter, you're redirecting to it so you don't lose track of which profile you're editing. Here's a tricky thing. So validate positions. It's nice that that's sitting in util. Thank heaven. I wrote that once. I use it in the ad and I use it in the, I use both these things in both the ad and the edit. It saves me a little bit of coding over and over. But here's the trick. So let me show you what I need to be able to do, right? It's one thing if I'm going to make a change. One, two, let's just make this be 999. Hello. Just edit stuff. Okay, so what will happen is what I'm going to do is as a simplifying thing, I am actually going to wipe out all of these rows every time I edit because all the data that I'm submitting of all the positions, it's kind of like a new ad. All right, and so what I'm going to actually do, I could write much more complex code, but what I'm really doing is I'm just going to wipe out the old positions, not the old profile, with a single delete and then I'm going to reinsert them. And so this is pretty much the code straight out of add. So it's re-editing. So the net effect of this